Short Fiction By Fritz Lieber Later Than You Think Obviously the archaeologist study belonged to an era vastly distant from today. Familiar similarities here and there only sharpened the feeling of alienage. The sunlight that filtered through the windows in the ceiling had a wan and greenish cast and was augmented by radiation from some luminous material impregnating the walls and floor. Even the wide desk and the commodious hassocks glowed with a restful light. Across the former were scattered metal-backed wax tablets, styluses, and a pair of large and oddly formed spectacles. The crammed bookcases were not particularly unusual, but the books were bound in metal and the script on their spines would have been utterly unfamiliar to the most erudite of modern linguists. One of the books, lying open on a hassock, showed leaves of a thin, flexible, rustless metal covered with luminous characters. Between the bookcases were phosphorescent oil paintings, mainly of sea bottoms, in somber greens and browns. Their style, neither wholly realistic nor abstract, would have baffled the historian of art. A blackboard with large colored crayons hinted equally at the schoolroom and the studio. In the center of the room, midway to the ceiling, hung a fish with iridescent scales of breathtaking beauty. So invisible was its means of support that, also taking into account the strange paintings and the greenish light, one would have sworn that the object was to create an underwater scene. The explorer made his entrance in a theatrical swirl of movement. He embraced the archaeologist with a warmth calculated to startle that crusty old fellow. Then he settled himself on a hassock. Looked up and asked a question in a speech and idiom so different from any we know that it must be called another means of communication rather than another language. The import was, well, what about it? If the archaeologist were taken aback, he concealed it. His expression showed only pleasure at being reunited with a long-absent friend. What about what? He queried. About your discovery. What discovery? The archaeologist's incomprehension was playful. The explorer threw up his arms. Why, what else but your discovery, here on earth, of the remains of an intelligent species? It's the find of the age. Am I going to have to coax you? Out with it. I didn't make the discovery, the other said tranquilly. I only supervised the excavations and directed the correlation of material. You ought to be doing the talking. You're the one who's just returned from the stars. Forget that. The explorer brushed the question aside. As soon as our spaceship got within radio range of Earth, they started to send us a continuous newscast covering the period of our absence. One of the items, exasperatingly brief, mentioned your discovery. It captured my imagination. I couldn't wait to hear the details. He paused, then confessed, you get so eager out there in space, a metal-filmed droplet of life lost in immensity. You rediscover your emotions, he changed color, then finished rapidly, as soon as I could decently get away, I came straight to you. I wanted to hear about it from the best authority, yourself. The archaeologist regarded him quizzically. I'm pleased that you should think of me and my work, and I'm very happy to see you again. But admit it now, isn't there something a bit odd about your getting so worked up over this thing? I can understand that after your long absence from Earth, any news of Earth would seem especially important. But isn't there an additional reason? The explorer twisted impatiently. Oh, I suppose there is. Disappointment, for one thing. We were hoping to get in touch with intelligent life out there. We were specially trained in techniques for establishing mental contact with alien intelligent life forms. Well, we found some planets with life upon them, all right. But it was primitive life, not worth bothering about. Again he hesitated embarrassedly. Out there you get to thinking of the preciousness of intelligence. There's so little of it, and it's so lonely. And we so greatly need intercourse with another intelligent species to give depth and balance to our thoughts. I suppose I set too much store by my hopes of establishing a contact. He paused. At any rate, when I heard that what we were looking for, you had found here at home, even though dead and done for, 
I felt that at least it was something. I was suddenly very eager. It is odd, I know, to get so worked up about an extinct species, as if my interest could mean anything to them now, but that's the way it hit me. Several small shadows crossed the windows overhead. They might have been birds, except they moved too slowly. I think I understand, the archaeologist said softly. So get on with it and tell me about your discovery, the explorer exploded. I've already told you that it wasn't my discovery, the archaeologist reminded him. A few years after your expedition left, there was begun a detailed resurvey of Earth's mineral resources. In the course of some deep continental borings, one party discovered a cache, either a very large box or a rather small room, with metallic walls of great strength and toughness. Evidently its makers had intended it for the very purpose of carrying a message down through the ages. It proved to contain artifacts. Models of buildings, vehicles, and machines, objects of art, pictures, and books, hundreds of books, along with elaborate pictorial dictionaries for interpreting them. So now we even understand their languages. Languages, interrupted the explorer. That's queer. Somehow one thinks of an alien species as having just one language. Like our own, this species had several, though there were some words and symbols that were alike in all their languages. These words and symbols seem to have come down unchanged from their most distant prehistory. The explorer burst out, I am not interested in all that dry stuff. Give me the wet. What were they like? How did they live? What did they create? What did they want? The archaeologist gently waved aside the questions. All in good time. If I am to tell you everything you want to know, I must tell it my own way. Now that you are back on earth, you will have to reacquire those orderly and composed habits of thought which you have partly lost in the course of your wild interstellar adventurings. Curse you, I think you're just trying to tantalize me. The archaeologist's expression showed that this was not altogether untrue. He casually fondled an animal that had wriggled up onto his desk, and which looked rather more like an eel than a snake. Cute little brute, isn't it? he remarked. When it became apparent that the explorer wasn't to be provoked into another outburst, he continued, it became my task to interpret the contents of the cache. To reconstruct its maker's climb from animalism and savagery to civilization, their rather rapid spread across the world's surface, their first fumbling attempts to escape from the earth. They had spaceships? It's barely possible. I rather hope they did, since it would mean the chance of a survival elsewhere, though the negative results of your expedition rather lessen that. He went on, the cache was laid down when they were first attempting space flight, just after their discovery of atomic power, in the first flush of their youth. It was probably created in a kind of exuberant fancifulness, with no serious belief that it would ever serve the purpose for which it was intended. He looked at the explorer strangely. If I am not mistaken, we have laid down similar caches. After a moment the archaeologist continued, my reconstruction of their history, subsequent to the laying down of the cache, has been largely hypothetical. I can only guess at the reasons for their decline and fall. Supplementary material has been very slow in coming in, though we are still making extensive excavations at widely separated points. Here are the last reports. He tossed the explorer a small metal leaf pamphlet. It flew with a curiously slow motion. That's what struck me so queer right from the start, the explorer observed, putting the pamphlet aside after a glance. If these creatures were relatively advanced, why haven't we learned about them before? They must have left so many things, buildings, machines, engineering projects, some of them on a large scale. You'd think we'd be turning up traces everywhere. I have four answers to that, the archaeologist replied. The first is the most obvious. Time. Geologic ages of it. The second is more subtle. What if we should have been looking in the wrong place? I mean, what if the creatures occupied a very different portion of the Earth than our own? Third, it's possible that atomic energy, out of control, finished the race and destroyed its traces. 
The present distribution of radioactive compounds throughout the Earth's surface lends some support to this theory. Fourth, he went on, it's my belief that when an intelligent species begins to retrogress, it tends to destroy, or, rather, debase all the things it has laboriously created. Large buildings are torn down to make smaller ones. Machines are broken up and worked into primitive tools and weapons. There is a kind of unraveling or erasing. A cultural second law of thermodynamics begins to operate, whereby the intellect and all its works are gradually degraded to the lowest level of meaning and creativity. But why? The explorer sounded anguished. Why should any intelligent species end like that? I grant the possibility of atomic power getting out of hand, though one would have thought they'd have taken the greatest precautions. Still, it could happen. But that fourth answer, it's morbid. Cultures and civilizations die, said the archaeologist evenly. That has happened repeatedly in our own history. Why not species? An individual dies, and is there anything intrinsically more terrible in the death of a species than in the death of an individual? He paused. With respect to the members of this one species, I think that a certain temperamental instability hastened their end. Their appetites and emotions were not sufficiently subordinated to their understanding and to their sense of drama, their enjoyment of the comedy and tragedy of existence. They were impatient and easily incapacitated by frustration. They seem to have been singularly guilty in their pleasures, behaving either like gloomy moralists or gluttons. Because of taboos and an overgrown possessiveness, he continued, each individual tended to limit his affection to a tiny family, in many cases he focused his love on himself alone. They set great store by personal prestige, by the amassing of wealth and the exercise of power. Their notable capacity for thought and manipulative activity was expended on things rather than persons or feelings. Their technology outstripped their psychology. They skimped fatally when it came to hard thinking about the purpose of life and intellectual activity, and the means for preserving them. Again the slow shadows drifted overhead. And finally, the archaeologist said, they were a strangely haunted species. They seemed to have been obsessed by the notion that others, greater than themselves, had prospered before them and then died, leaving them to rebuild a civilization from ruins. It was from those others that they thought they derived the few words and symbols common to all their languages. Gods, mused the explorer. The archaeologist shrugged. Who knows? The explorer turned away. His excitement had visibly evaporated, leaving behind a cold and miserable residue of feeling. I am not sure I want to hear much more about them, he said. They sound too much like us. Perhaps it was a mistake, my coming here. Pardon me, old friend, but out there in space even our emotions become undisciplined. Everything becomes indescribably poignant. Moods are tempestuous. You shift in an instant from zenith to nadir, and remember, out there you can see both. I was very eager to hear about this lost species, he added in a sad voice. I thought I would feel a kind of fellowship with them across the eons. Instead, I touch only corpses. It reminds me of when, out in space, there looms up before your prow, faint in the starlight, a dead sun. They were a young race. They thought they were getting somewhere. They promised themselves an eternity of effort. And all the while there was wriggling toward them out of that future for which they yearned, oh, it's so completely futile and unfair. I disagree, the archaeologist said spiritedly. Really, your absence from Earth has unsettled you even more than I first surmised. Look at the matter squarely. Death comes to everything in the end. Our past is strewn with our dead. That species died, it's true. But what they achieved, they achieved. What happiness they had, they had. What they did in their short span is as significant as what they might have done had they lived a billion years. The present is always more important than the future. And no creature can have all the future, it must be shared, left to others. Maybe so, the explorer said slowly. Yes, I guess you're right. 
but I still feel a horrible wistfulness about them, and I hug to myself the hope that a few of them escaped and set up a colony on some planet we haven't yet visited. There was a long silence. Then the explorer turned back. You old devil, he said in a manner that showed his gayer and more boisterous mood had returned, though diminished, you still haven't told me anything definite about them. So I haven't, replied the archaeologist with guileful innocence. Well, they were vertebrates. Oh? Yes. What's more, they were mammals. Mammals? I was expecting something different. I thought you were. The explorer shifted. All this matter of evolutionary categories is pretty cut and dried. Even a knowledge of how they looked doesn't mean much. I'd like to approach them in a more intimate way. How did they think of themselves? What did they call themselves? I know the word won't mean anything to me, but it will give me a feeling, of recognition. I can't say the word, the archaeologist told him, because I haven't the proper vocal equipment. But I know enough of their script to be able to write it for you as they would have written it. Incidentally, it is one of those words common to all their languages, that they attributed to an earlier race of beings. The archaeologist extended one of his eight tentacles toward the blackboard. The suckers at its tip firmly grasped a bit of orange crayon. Another of his tentacles took up the spectacles and adjusted them over his three-inch protruding pupils. The eel-like glittering pet drifted back into the room and nosed curiously about the crayon as it traced, rat. How do you find this book? Any thoughts about the book or the author? Any suggestion for improvement? Please take a moment to share your thoughts in a comment. If you like it, share it with your friends who might enjoy it as well. Subscribe to keep in touch. Visit completeaudiobooks.com for more quality content. Coming attraction. The coop with the fish hooks welded to the fender shouldered up over the curb like the nose of a nightmare. The girl in its path stood frozen, her face probably stiff with fright under her mask. For once my reflexes weren't shy. I took a fast step toward her, grabbed her elbow, yanked her back. Her black skirt swirled out. The big coop shot by, its turbine humming. I glimpsed three faces. Something ripped. I felt the hot exhaust on my ankles as the big coop swerved back into the street. A thick cloud like a black flower blossomed from its jouncing rear end, while from the fish hooks flew a black shimmering rag. Did they get you? I asked the girl. She had twisted around to look where the side of her skirt was torn away. She was wearing nylon tights. The hooks didn't touch me, she said shakily. I guess I'm lucky. I heard voices around us. Those kids. What'll they think up next? They're a menace. They ought to be arrested. Sirens screamed at a rising pitch as two motor police, their rocket-assist jets full-on, came whizzing toward us after the coop. But the black flower had become a thick fog obscuring the whole street. The motor police switched from rocket assists to rocket brakes and swerved to a stop near the smoke cloud. Are you English? The girl asked me. You have an English accent. Her voice came shudderingly from behind the sleek black satin mask. I fancied her teeth must be chattering. Eyes that were perhaps blue searched my face from behind the black gauze covering the eye holes of the mask. I told her she'd guessed right. She stood close to me. Will you come to my place tonight? She asked rapidly. I can't thank you now. And there's something you can help me about. My arm, still lightly circling her waist, felt her body trembling. I was answering the plea in that as much as in her voice when I said, certainly. She gave me an address south of Inferno, an apartment number and a time. She asked me my name and I told her. Hey, you. I turned obediently to the policeman's shout. He shooed away the small clucking crowd of masked women and barefaced men. Coughing from the smoke that the black coop had thrown out, he asked for my papers. I handed him the essential ones. He looked at them and then at me. British barter? How long will you be in New York? 
suppressing the urge to say, for as short a time as possible, I told him I'd be here for a week or so. May need you as a witness, he explained. Those kids can't use smoke on us. When they do that, we pull them in. He seemed to think the smoke was the bad thing. They tried to kill the lady, I pointed out. He shook his head wisely. They always pretend they're going to, but actually they just want to snag skirts. I've picked up rippers with as many as fifty skirt snags tacked up in their rooms. Of course, sometimes they come a little too close. I explained that if I hadn't yanked her out of the way, she'd have been hit by more than hooks. But he interrupted, if she'd thought it was a real murder attempt, she'd have stayed here. I looked around. It was true. She was gone. She was fearfully frightened, I told him. Who wouldn't be? Those kids would have scared old Stalin himself. I mean frightened of more than kids. They didn't look like kids. What did they look like? I tried without much success to describe the three faces. A vague impression of viciousness and effeminacy doesn't mean much. Well, I could be wrong, he said finally. Do you know the girl? Where she lives? No, I half lied. The other policeman hung up his radiophone and ambled toward us, kicking at the tendrils of dissipating smoke. The black cloud no longer hid the dingy facades with their five-year-old radiation flash burns, and I could begin to make out the distant stump of the Empire State Building. Thrusting up out of inferno like a mangled finger. They haven't been picked up so far, the approaching policeman grumbled. Left smoke for five blocks, from what Ryan says. The first policeman shook his head. That's bad, he observed solemnly. I was feeling a bit uneasy and ashamed. An Englishman shouldn't lie, at least not on impulse. They sound like nasty customers, the first policeman continued in the same grim tone. We'll need witnesses. Looks as if you may have to stay in New York longer than you expect. I got the point. I said, I forgot to show you all my papers, and handed him a few others, making sure there was a five-dollar bill in among them. When he handed them back a bit later, his voice was no longer ominous. My feelings of guilt vanished. To cement our relationship, I chatted with the two of them about their job. I suppose the masks give you some trouble, I observed. Over in England we've been reading about your new crop of masked female bandits. Those things get exaggerated, the first policeman assured me. It's the men masking as women that really mix us up. But, brother, when we nab them, we jump on them with both feet. And you get so you can spot women almost as well as if they had naked faces, the second policeman volunteered. You know, hands and all that. Especially all that, the first agreed with a chuckle. Say, is it true that some girls don't mask over in England? A number of them have picked up the fashion, I told him. Only a few, though, the ones who always adopt the latest style, however extreme. They're usually masked in the British newscasts. I imagine it's arranged that way out of deference to American taste, I confessed. Actually, not very many do mask. The second policeman considered that. Girls going down the street bare from the neck up. It was not clear whether he viewed the prospect with relish or moral distaste. Likely both. A few members keep trying to persuade Parliament to enact a law forbidding all masking, I continued, talking perhaps a bit too much. The second policeman shook his head. What an idea. You know, masks are a pretty good thing, brother. Couple of years more and I'm going to make my wife wear hers around the house. The first policeman shrugged. If women were to stop wearing masks, in six weeks you wouldn't know the difference. You get used to anything, if enough people do or don't do it. I agreed, rather regretfully, and left them. I turned north on Broadway, Old Tenth Avenue, I believe, and walked rapidly until I was beyond Inferno. Passing such an area of undecontaminated radioactivity always makes a person queasy. I thanked God there weren't any such in England, as yet. The street was almost empty, 
though I was accosted by a couple of beggars with faces tunneled by H-bomb scars, whether real or of makeup putty, I couldn't tell. A fat woman held out a baby with webbed fingers and toes. I told myself it would have been deformed anyway and that she was only capitalizing on our fear of bomb-induced mutations. Still, I gave her a seven and a half cent piece. Her mask made me feel I was paying tribute to an African fetish. May all your children be blessed with one head and two eyes, sir. Thanks, I said, shuddering, and hurried past her. There's only trash behind the mask, so turn your head, stick to your task, stay away, stay away, from, the, girls. This last was the end of an anti-sex song being sung by some religionists half a block from the circle and cross insignia of a femalist temple. They reminded me only faintly of our small tribe of British monastics. Above their heads was a jumble of billboards advertising predigested foods, wrestling instruction, radio handies and the like. I stared at the hysterical slogans with disagreeable fascination. Since the female face and form have been banned on American signs, the very letters of the advertiser's alphabet have begun to crawl with sex, the fat-bellied, big-breasted capital B. The lascivious double O. However, I reminded myself, it is chiefly the mask that so strangely accents sex in America. A British anthropologist has pointed out that, while it took more than 5,000 years to shift the chief point of sexual interest from the hips to the breasts, the next transition to the face has taken less than 50 years. Comparing the American style with Muslim tradition is not valid. Muslim women are compelled to wear veils, the purpose of which is concealment, while American women have only the compulsion of fashion and use masks to create mystery. Theory aside, the actual origins of the trend are to be found in the anti-radiation clothing of World War III, which led to masked wrestling, now a fantastically popular sport. And that in turn led to the current female fashion. Only a wild style at first, masks quickly became as necessary as brassieres and lipsticks had been earlier in the century. I finally realized that I was not speculating about masks in general, but about what lay behind one in particular. That's the devil of the things. You're never sure whether a girl is heightening loveliness or hiding ugliness. I pictured a cool, pretty face in which fear showed only in widened eyes. Then I remembered her blonde hair, rich against the blackness of the satin mask. She'd told me to come at the 22nd hour, 10 p.m. I climbed to my apartment near the British consulate. The elevator shaft had been shoved out of plumb by an old blast, a nuisance in these tall New York buildings. Before it occurred to me that I would be going out again, I automatically tore a tab from the film strip under my shirt. I developed it just to be sure. It showed that the total radiation I'd taken that day was still within the safety limit. I'm not phobic about it, as so many people are these days, but there's no point in taking chances. I flopped down on the day bed and stared at the silent speaker and the dark screen of the video set. As always, they made me think, somewhat bitterly, of the two great nations of the world. Mutilated by each other, yet still strong, they were crippled giants poisoning the planet with their dreams of an impossible equality and an impossible success. I fretfully switched on the speaker. By luck, the newscaster was talking excitedly of the prospects of a bumper wheat crop, sown by planes across a dust bowl moistened by seeded rains. I listened carefully to the rest of the program, it was remarkably clear of Russian telejamming, but there was no further news of interest to me. And, of course, no mention of the moon. Though everyone knows that America and Russia are racing to develop their primary bases into fortresses capable of mutual assault and the launching of alphabet bombs toward Earth. I myself knew perfectly well that the British electronic equipment I was helping trade for American wheat was destined for use in spaceships. I switched off the newscast. It was growing dark and once again I pictured a tender, frightened face behind a mask. I hadn't had a date since England. It's exceedingly difficult to become acquainted with a girl in America, where as little as a smile, often, can set one of them yelping for the police, 
to say nothing of the increasing puritanical morality and the roving gangs that keep most women indoors after dark. And naturally, the masks which are definitely not, as the Soviets claim, a last invention of capitalist degeneracy, but a sign of great psychological insecurity. The Russians have no masks, but they have their own signs of stress. I went to the window and impatiently watched the darkness gather. I was getting very restless. After a while a ghostly violet cloud appeared to the south. My hair rose. Then I laughed. I had momentarily fancied it a radiation from the crater of the hell bomb. Though I should instantly have known it was only the radio-induced glow in the sky over the amusement and residential area south of Inferno. Promptly at twenty-two hours I stood before the door of my unknown girlfriend's apartment. The electronic say who please said just that. I answered clearly, Wisson Turner, wondering if she'd given my name to the mechanism. She evidently had, for the door opened. I walked into a small empty living room, my heart pounding a bit. The room was expensively furnished with the latest pneumatic hassocks and sprawlers. There were some midgy books on the table. The one I picked up was the standard hard-boiled detective story in which two female murderers go gunning for each other. The television was on. A masked girl in green was crooning a love song. Her right hand held something that blurred off into the foreground. I saw the set had a handy, which we haven't in England as yet, and curiously thrust my hand into the handy orifice beside the screen. Contrary to my expectations, it was not like slipping into a pulsing rubber glove, but rather as if the girl on the screen actually held my hand. A door opened behind me. I jerked out my hand with as guilty a reaction as if I'd been caught peering through a keyhole. She stood in the bedroom doorway. I think she was trembling. She was wearing a gray fur coat, white speckled, and a gray velvet evening mask with shirred gray lace around the eyes and mouth. Her fingernails twinkled like silver. It hadn't occurred to me that she'd expect us to go out. I should have told you, she said softly. Her mask veered nervously toward the books and the screen and the room's dark corners. But I can't possibly talk to you here. I said doubtfully, there's a place near the consulate. I know where we can be together and talk, she said rapidly. If you don't mind. As we entered the elevator I said, I'm afraid I dismissed the cab. But the cab driver hadn't gone for some reason of his own. He jumped out and smirkingly held the front door open for us. I told him we preferred to sit in back. He sulkily opened the rear door, slammed it after us, jumped in front and slammed the door behind him. My companion leaned forward. Heaven, she said. The driver switched on the turbine and televisor. Why did you ask if I were a British subject? I said, to start the conversation. She leaned away from me, tilting her mask close to the window. See the moon, she said in a quick, dreamy voice. But why, really? I pressed, conscious of an irritation that had nothing to do with her. It's edging up into the purple of the sky. And what's your name? The purple makes it look yellower. Just then I became aware of the source of my irritation. It lay in the square of writhing light in the front of the cab beside the driver. I don't object to ordinary wrestling matches, though they bore me, but I simply detest watching a man wrestle a woman. The fact that the bouts are generally on the level, with the man greatly outclassed in weight and reach and the masked females young and personable, only makes them seem worse to me. Please turn off the screen, I requested the driver. He shook his head without looking around. Uh uh, man, he said. They've been grooming that babe for weeks for this bout with little Zerk. Infuriated, I reached forward, but my companion caught my arm. Please, she whispered frightenedly, shaking her head. I settled back, frustrated. She was closer to me now but silent and for a few moments I watched the heaves and contortions of the powerful masked girl and her wiry masked opponent on the screen. His frantic scrambling at her reminded me of a male spider. I jerked around, facing my companion. Why did those three men want to kill you? 
I asked sharply. The eye holes of her mask faced the screen. Because they're jealous of me, she whispered. Why are they jealous? She still didn't look at me. Because of him. Who? She didn't answer. I put my arm around her shoulders. Are you afraid to tell me? I asked. What is the matter? She still didn't look my way. She smelled nice. See here, I said laughingly, changing my tactics, you really should tell me something about yourself. I don't even know what you look like. I half playfully lifted my hand to the band of her neck. She gave it an astonishingly swift slap. I pulled it away in sudden pain. There were four tiny indentations on the back. From one of them a tiny bead of blood welled out as I watched. I looked at her silver fingernails and saw they were actually delicate and pointed metal caps. I'm dreadfully sorry, I heard her say, but you frightened me. I thought for a moment you were going to. At last she turned to me. Her coat had fallen open. Her evening dress was Cretan Revival, a bodice of lace beneath and supporting the breasts without covering them. Don't be angry, she said, putting her arms around my neck. You were wonderful this afternoon. The soft gray velvet of her mask, molding itself to her cheek, pressed mine. Through the mask's lace the wet warm tip of her tongue touched my chin. I'm not angry, I said. Just puzzled and anxious to help. The cab stopped. To either side were black windows bordered by spears of broken glass. The sickly purple light showed a few ragged figures slowly moving toward us. The driver muttered, It's the turbine, man. We're grounded. He sat there hunched and motionless. Wish it had happened somewhere else. My companion whispered, Five dollars is the usual amount. She looked out so shudderingly at the congregating figures that I suppressed my indignation and did as she suggested. The driver took the bill without a word. As he started up, he put his hand out the window and I heard a few coins clink on the pavement. My companion came back into my arms, but her mask faced the television screen, where the tall girl had just pinned the convulsively kicking little zerk. I'm so frightened, she breathed. Heaven turned out to be an equally ruinous neighborhood, but it had a club with an awning and a huge doorman uniformed like a spaceman, but in gaudy colors. In my sensuous days I rather liked it all. We stepped out of the cab just as a drunken old woman came down the sidewalk, her mask awry. A couple ahead of us turned their heads from the half-revealed face, as if from an ugly body at the beach. As we followed them and I heard the doorman say, Get along, Grandma and watch yourself. Inside, everything was dimness and blue glows. She had said we could talk here, but I didn't see how. Besides the inevitable chorus of sneezes and coughs, they say America is 50% allergic these days, there was a band going full blast in the latest robop style. In which an electronic composing machine selects an arbitrary sequence of tones into which the musicians weave their raucous little individualities. Most of the people were in booths. The band was behind the bar. On a small platform beside them, a girl was dancing, stripped to her mask. The little cluster of men at the shadowy far end of the bar weren't looking at her. We inspected the menu in gold script on the wall and pushed the buttons for breast of chicken, fried shrimps and two scotches. Moments later, the serving bell tinkled. I opened the gleaming panel and took out our drinks. The cluster of men at the bar filed off toward the door, but first they stared around the room. My companion had just thrown back her coat. Their look lingered on our booth. I noticed that there were three of them. The band chased off the dancing girl with growls. I handed my companion a straw and we sipped our drinks. You wanted me to help you about something, I said. Incidentally, I think you're lovely. She nodded quick thanks looked around, leaned forward. Would it be hard for me to get to England? No, I replied, a bit taken aback. Provided you have an American passport. Are they difficult to get? Rather, I said, surprised at her lack of information. 
your country doesn't like its nationals to travel, though it isn't quite as stringent as Russia. Could the British consulate help me get a passport? It's hardly there. Could you? I realized we were being inspected. A man and two girls had paused opposite our table. The girls were tall and wolfish-looking, with spangled masks. The man stood jauntily between them like a fox on its hind legs. My companion didn't glance at them, but she sat back. I noticed that one of the girls had a big yellow bruise on her forearm. After a moment they walked to a booth in the deep shadows. Know them? I asked. She didn't reply. I finished my drink. I'm not sure you'd like England, I said. The austerity's altogether different from your American brand of misery. She leaned forward again. But I must get away, she whispered. Why? I was getting impatient. Because I'm so frightened. There were chimes. I opened the panel and handed her the fried shrimps. The sauce on my breast of chicken was a delicious steaming compound of almonds, soy, and ginger. But something must have been wrong with the radionic oven that had thawed and heated it, for at the first bite I crunched a kernel of ice in the meat. These delicate mechanisms need constant repair and there aren't enough mechanics. I put down my fork. What are you really scared of? I asked her. For once her mask didn't waver away from my face. As I waited I could feel the fears gathering without her naming them, tiny dark shapes swarming through the curved night outside, converging on the radioactive pest spot of New York. Dipping into the margins of the purple. I felt a sudden rush of sympathy, a desire to protect the girl opposite me. The warm feeling added itself to the infatuation engendered in the cab. Everything, she said finally. I nodded and touched her hand. I'm afraid of the moon, she began, her voice going dreamy and brittle as it had in the cab. You can't look at it and not think of guided bombs. It's the same moon over England, I reminded her. But it's not England's moon anymore. It's ours and Russia's. You're not responsible. I pressed her hand. Oh, and then, she said with a tilt of her mask, I'm afraid of the cars and the gangs and the loneliness and inferno. I'm afraid of the lust that undresses your face. And, her voice hushed, I'm afraid of the wrestlers. Yes? I prompted softly after a moment. Her mask came forward. Do you know something about the wrestlers? She asked rapidly. The ones that wrestle women, I mean. They often lose, you know. And then they have to have a girl to take their frustration out on. A girl who's soft and weak and terribly frightened. They need that, to keep them men. Other men don't want them to have a girl. Other men want them just to fight women and be heroes. But they must have a girl. It's horrible for her. I squeezed her fingers tighter, as if courage could be transmitted, granting I had any. I think I can get you to England, I said. Shadows crawled onto the table and stayed there. I looked up at the three men who had been at the end of the bar. They were the men I had seen in the big coop. They wore black sweaters and close-fitting black trousers. Their faces were as expressionless as dopers. Two of them stood above me. The other loomed over the girl. Drift off, man, I was told. I heard the other inform the girl, we'll wrestle a fall, sister. What shall it be? Judo, Slapsy, or kill who can? I stood up. There are times when an Englishman simply must be maltreated. But just then the fox-like man came gliding in like the star of a ballet. The reaction of the other three startled me. They were acutely embarrassed. He smiled at them thinly. You won't win my favor by tricks like this, he said. Don't get the wrong idea, Zerk, one of them pleaded. I will if it's right, he said. She told me what you tried to do this afternoon. That won't endear you to me, either. Drift. They backed off awkwardly. Let's get out of here, one of them said loudly, as they turned. I know a place where they fight naked with knives. 
Little Zerk laughed musically and slipped into the seat beside my companion. She shrank from him, just a little. I pushed my feet back, leaned forward. Who's your friend, baby? He asked, not looking at her. She passed the question to me with a little gesture. I told him. British, he observed. She's been asking you about getting out of the country? About passports? He smiled pleasantly. She likes to start running away. Don't you, baby? His small hand began to stroke her wrist, the fingers bent a little, the tendons ridged, as if he were about to grab and twist. Look here, I said sharply. I have to be grateful to you for ordering off those bullies, but... Think nothing of it, he told me. They're no harm except when they're behind steering wheels. A well-trained fourteen-year-old girl could cripple any one of them. Why, even Theta here, if she went in for that sort of thing, he turned to her, shifting his hand from her wrist to her hair. He stroked it, letting the strand slip slowly through his fingers. You know I lost tonight, baby, don't you? he said softly. I stood up. Come along, I said to her. Let's leave. She just sat there. I couldn't even tell if she was trembling. I tried to read a message in her eyes through the mask. I'll take you away, I said to her. I can do it. I really will. He smiled at me. She'd like to go with you, he said. Wouldn't you, baby? Will you or won't you? I said to her. She still just sat there. He slowly knotted his fingers in her hair. Listen, you little vermin, I snapped at him, take your hands off her. He came up from the seat like a snake. I'm no fighter. I just know that the more scared I am, the harder and straighter I hit. This time I was lucky. But as he crumpled back, I felt a slap and four stabs of pain in my cheek. I clapped my hand to it. I could feel the four gashes made by her dagger finger caps, and the warm blood oozing out from them. She didn't look at me. She was bending over little Zerk and cuddling her mask to his cheek and crooning, There, there, don't feel bad, you'll be able to hurt me afterward. There were sounds around us, but they didn't come close. I leaned forward and ripped the mask from her face. I really don't know why I should have expected her face to be anything else. It was very pale, of course, and there weren't any cosmetics. I suppose there's no point in wearing any under a mask. The eyebrows were untidy and the lips chapped. But as for the general expression, as for the feelings crawling and wriggling across it. Have you ever lifted a rock from damp soil? Have you ever watched the slimy white grubs? I looked down at her, she up at me. Yes, you're so frightened, aren't you? I said sarcastically. You dread this little nightly drama don't you? You're scared to death. And I walked right out into the purple night, still holding my hand to my bleeding cheek. No one stopped me, not even the girl wrestlers. I wished I could tear a tab from under my shirt, and test it then and there, and find I'd taken too much radiation, and so be able to ask to cross the Hudson and go down New Jersey. Past the lingering radiance of the Narrows bomb, and so on to Sandy Hook to wait for the rusty ship that would take me back over the seas to England. Nice girl with five husbands. To be given paid-up leisure and find yourself unable to create is unpleasant for any artist. To be stranded in a cluster of desert cabins with a dozen lonely people in the same predicament only makes it worse. So Tom Dorset was understandably irked with himself and the Tosker Brown vacation fellowships as he climbed with the sun into the valley of red stones. He accepted the chafing of his camera strap against his shoulder as the nagging of conscience. He agreed with the disparaging hisses of the grains of sand rutched by his sneakers, and he wished that the occasional breezes, which faintly echoed the same criticisms, could blow him into a friendlier, less jealous age. He had no way of knowing that just as there are winds that blow through space, so there are winds that blow through time. Such winds may be strong or weak. The strong ones are rare and seldom blow for short distances, 
or more of us would know about them. What they pick up is almost always world far into the future or past. This has happened to people. There was Ambrose Bierce, who walked out of America and existence, and there are thousands of others who have disappeared without a trace. Though many of these may not have been caught up by time tornadoes and I do not know if a time gale blew across the deck of the Marie Celeste. Sometimes a time wind is playful, snatching up an object, sporting with it for a season and then returning it unharmed to its original place. Sometimes we may be blown about by whimsical time winds without realizing it. Memory, for example, is a tiny time breeze, so weak that it can ripple only the mind. A very few time winds are like the monsoon, blowing at fixed intervals, first in one direction, then the other. Such a time wind blows near a balancing rock in a valley of red stones in the American Southwest. Every morning at ten o'clock, it blows a hundred years into the future. Every afternoon at two, it blows a hundred years into the past. Quite a number of people have unwittingly seen time winds in operation. There are misty spots on the sea's horizon and wavery patches over desert sands. There are mirages and will o the wisps and ice blinks. And there are dust devils, such as Tom Dorset walked into near the balancing rock. It seemed to him no more than a spiteful upgust of sand, against which he closed his eyes until the warm granules stopped peppering the lids. He opened them to see the balancing rock had silently fallen and lay a quarter buried, no, that couldn't be, he told himself instantly. He had been preoccupied. He must have passed the balancing rock and held its image in his mind. Despite this rationalization he was quite shaken. The strap of his camera slipped slowly down his arm without his feeling it. And just then there stepped around the giant bobbin of the rock an extraordinarily pretty girl with hair the same pinkish copper color. She was barefoot and wearing a pale blue playsuit rather like a Grecian tunic. But most important, as she stood there towing his rough shadow in the sand, there was a complete naturalness about her, an absence of sharp edges, as if her personality had weathered without aging. Just as the valley seemed to have taken another step toward eternity in the space of an instant. She must have assumed something of the same gentleness in him, for her faint surprise faded and she asked him, as easily as if he were a friend of five years standing, tell now. Do you think a woman can love just one man? All her life? And a man just one woman? Tom Dorset made a dazed sound. His mind searched wildly. I do, she said, looking at him as calmly as at a mountain. I think a man and woman can be each other's world, like Tristan and Isolde or Frederick and Catherine. Those old authors were wise. I don't see why on earth a girl has to spread her love around, no matter how enriching the experiences may be. You know, I agree with you, Tom said, thinking he'd caught her idea, it was impossible not to catch her casualness. I think there's something cheap about the way everybody's supposed to run after sex these days. I don't mean that exactly. Tenderness is beautiful, but, she pouted. A big family can be vastly crushing. I wanted to declare today a holiday, but they outvoted me. Jock said it didn't chime with our mood cycles. But I was angry with them, so I put on my clothes. Put on. To make it a holiday, she explained bafflingly. And I walked here for a tantrum. She stepped out of Tom's shadow and hopped back. Ow, the sand's getting hot, she said, rubbing the grains from the pale and uncramped toes. You go barefoot a lot? Tom guessed. No, mostly digitals, she replied and took something shimmering from a pocket at her hip and drew it on her foot. It was a high-ankled, transparent moccasin with five separate toes. She zipped it shut with the speed of a card trick, then similarly gloved the other foot. Again the metal-edged slit down the front seemed to close itself. I'm behind on the fashions, Tom said, curious. They were walking side by side now the way she'd come and he'd been going. How does that zipper work? Magnetic. They're on all my clothes. Very simple. She parted her tunic to the waist, then let it zip together. Clever, 
Tom remarked with a gulp. There seemed no limits to this girl's naturalness. I see you're a button man, she said. You actually believe it's possible for a man and woman to love just each other? His chuckle was bitter. He was thinking of Eleanor Murphy at Tosker Brown and a bit about cold-faced Miss Tosker herself. I sometimes wonder if it's possible for anyone to love anyone. You haven't met the right girls, she said. Girl, he corrected. She grinned at him. You'll make me think you really are a monogamist. What group do you come from? Let's not talk about that, he requested. He was willing to forego knowing how she'd guessed he was from an art group, if he could be spared talking about the vacation fellowships and those nervous little cabins. My group's very nice on the whole, the girl said, but at times they can be nefandously exasperating. Jock's the worst, quietly guiding the rest of us like an analyst. How I loathe that man. But Larry's almost as bad, with his shamefaced bumptiousness, as if we'd all sneaked off on a joyride to Venus. And there's Jokichi at the opposite extreme, forever scared he won't distribute his affection equally. Dividing it up into mean little packets like candy for jealous children who would scream if they got one chewy less. And then there's Sasha and Ernest. Who are you talking about? Tom asked. My husband's. She shook her head dolefully. To find five more difficult men would be positively Martian. Tom's mind backtracked frantically, searching all conversations at Tosker Brown for gossip about cultists in the neighborhood. It found nothing and embarked on a wider search. There were the Mormons, was that the word that had sounded like Martian, but it wasn't the Mormon husbands who were plural. And then there was Oneida, weren't husbands and wives both plural there? But that was 19th century New England. Five husbands, he repeated. She nodded. He went on, do you mean to say five men have got you alone somewhere up here? To be sure not, she replied. There are my quives. Quives? Co-wives, she said more slowly. They can be fascinorously exasperating, too. Tom's mind did some more searching. And yet you believe in monogamy? She smiled. Only when I'm having tantrums. It was civilized of you to agree with me. But I actually do believe in monogamy, he protested. She gave his hand a little squeeze. You are nice, but let's rush now. I've finished my tantrum and I want you to meet my group. You can fresh yourself with us. As they hurried across the heated sands, Tom Dorset felt for the first time a twinge of uneasiness. There was something about this girl, more than her strange clothes and the odd words she used now and then, something almost, though ghosts don't wear digitals, spectral. They scrambled up a little rise, digging their footgear into the sand, until they stood on a long flat. And there, serpentining around two great clumps of rock, was a many-windowed adobe ranch house with a roof like fresh soot. Oh, they've put on their clothes, his companion exclaimed with pleasure. They've decided to make it a holiday after all. Tom spotted a beard in the group swarming out to meet them. Its cultish look gave him a momentary feeling of superiority, followed by an equally momentary apprehension, the five husbands were certainly husky. Then both feelings were swallowed up in the swirl of introduction. He told his own name, found that his companion's was Lois Wolver, then smiling faces began to bob toward his, his hands were shaken, his cheeks were kissed. He was even spun around like blind man's bluff, so that he lost track of the husbands and failed to attach Mary, Rachel, Simone and Joyce to the right owners. He did notice that Jokichi was an oriental with a skin as tight as enamel china, and that Rachel was a tall slim negro girl. Also someone said, Joyce isn't a wolver, she's just visiting. He got a much clearer impression of the clothes than the names. They were colorful, costly looking, and mostly Egyptian and Cretan in inspiration. Some of them would have been quite immodest, even compared to Miss Tosker's famous playsuits, except that the wearers didn't seem to feel so. There goes the middle morning rocket. One of them eagerly cried. Tom looked up with the rest, but his eyes caught the dazzling sun. 
However, he heard a faint roaring that quickly sank in volume and pitch, and it reminded him that the army had a rocket testing range in this area. He had little interest in science, but he hadn't known they were on a daily schedule. Do you suppose it's off the track? he asked anxiously. Not a chance, someone told him, the beard, he thought. The assurance of the tones gave him a possible solution. Scientists came from all over the world these days and might have all sorts of advanced ideas. This could be a group working at a nearby atomic project and leading its peculiar private life on the side. As they eddied toward the house he heard Lois remind someone, but you finally did declare it a holiday, and a husband who looked like a gay pharaoh respond. I had another C at the mood charts and I found a subtle surge I'd missed. Meanwhile the beard, a black one, had taken Tom in charge. Tom wasn't sure of his name, but he had a tan skin, a green sarong, and a fiercely jovial expression. The swimming pools around there, the landing spots on the other side, he began, then noticed Tom gazing at the sooty roof. Sun power cells, he explained proudly. They store all the current we need. Tom felt his idea confirmed. Wonder you don't use atomic power, he observed lightly. The beard nodded. We've been asked that. Matter of aesthetics. Why waste sunlight or use hard radiations needlessly? Of course, you might feel differently. What's your group, did you say? Tosca Brown, Tom told him, adding when the beard frowned, the fellowship people, you know. I don't, the beard confessed. Where are you located? Tom briefly described the ranch house and cabins at the other end of the valley. Comic, I can't place it. The beard shrugged. Here come the children. A dozen naked youngsters raced around the ranch house, followed by a woman in a vaguely African dress open down the sides. Yours? Tom asked. Ours, the beard answered. Say un um. Regard as devetments. No need to practice, kids, this is a holiday, the beard told them. Tom, Helen, he said, introducing the woman with the air-conditioned garment. Her turn today to companion die kinder. One of the latter rapped on the beard's knee. May we show the stranger our things? Instantly the others joined in pleading. The beard shot an inquiring glance at Tom, who nodded. A moment later the small troop was hurrying him toward a spacious lean-to at the end of the ranch house. It was chuckful of strange toys, rocks and plants, small animals in cages and out, and the oddest model airplanes, or submarines. But Tom was given no time to look at any one thing for long. See my crystals? I grew them. Smell my mutated gardenias. Tell now, isn't there a difference? There didn't seem to be, but he nodded. Look at my squabbits. This referred to some long-eared white squirrels nibbling carrots and nuts. Here's my newest model spaceship, a DS-57B notice the detail. The oldest boy shoved one of the submarine affairs in his face. Tom felt like a figure that is being tugged about in a Rococo painting by wide pink ribbons in the chubby hands of naked cherubs. Except that these cherubs were slim and tanned, fantastically energetic, and apparently of depressingly high IQ, what these scientists did to children. He missed Lois and was grateful for the single little girl solemnly skipping rope in a corner and paying no attention to him. The odd lingo she repeated stuck in his mind, Giclo, I.O., Rico, Giso. Giclo, I.O. Suddenly the air was filled with soft chimes. Lunch, the children shouted and ran away. Tom followed at a soberer pace along the wall of the ranch house. He glanced in the huge windows, curious about the living and sleeping arrangements of the Wolvers, but the panes were strangely darkened. Then he entered the wide doorway through which the children had scampered and his curiosity turned to wonder. A resilient green floor that wasn't flat, but sloped up toward the white of the far wall like a breaking wave. Chairs like giants' hands tenderly cupped. Little tables growing like mushrooms and broad-leafed plants out of the green floor. A vast picture window showing the red rocks. 
yet it was the wood-paneled walls that electrified his artistic interest. They blossomed with fruits and flowers, deep and poignantly carved in several styles. He had never seen such work. He became aware of a silence and realized that his hosts and hostesses were smiling at him from around a long table. Moved by a sudden humility, he knelt and unlaced his sneakers and added them to the pile of sandals and digitals by the door. As he rose, a soft and comic piping started and he realized that beyond the table the children were lined up, solemnly puffing at little wooden flutes and recorders. He saw the empty chair at the table and went toward it, conscious for the moment of nothing but his dusty feet. He was disappointed that Lois wasn't sitting next to him, but the food reminded him that he was hungry. There was a charming little steak, striped black and brown with perfection, and all sorts of vegetables and fruits, one or two of which he didn't recognize. Flown from Africa, someone explained to him. These sly scientists, he thought, living behind their security curtain in the most improbable world. When they were sitting with coffee and wine, and the children had finished their concert and were busy at another table, he asked, how do you manage all this? Jock, the gay pharaoh, shrugged. It's not difficult. Rachel, the slim negro, chuckled in her throat. We're just people, Tom. He tried to phrase his question without mentioning money. What do you all do? Jock's a uranium miner, Larry, the beard, answered, briskly taking over. Rachel's an algae farmer. I'm a rocket pilot. Lois. Although pleased at this final confirmation of his guess, Tom couldn't help feeling a surge of uneasiness. Sure you should be telling me these things? Larry laughed. Why not? Lois and Jokichi have been exchange workers in China the last six months. Mostly digging ditches, Jokichi put in with a smile. And Sasha's in an assembly plant. Helen's a psychiatrist. Oh, we just do ordinary things. Now we're on grand vacation. Grand vacation? When all of us have a vacation together, Larry explained. What do you do? I'm an artist, Tom said, taking out a cigarette. But what else? Larry asked. Tom felt an angry embarrassment. Just an artist, he mumbled, cigarette in mouth, digging in his pockets for a match. Hold on, said Joyce beside him and pointed a silver pencil at the tip of the cigarette. He felt a faint thrill in his lips and then started back, coughing. The cigarette was lighted. Please mutate my poppy seeds, mommy. A little girl had darted to Joyce from the children's table. You're a very dirty little girl, Joyce told her without reproof. Hold them out. She briefly directed the silver pencil at the clay pellets on the grimy little palm. The little girl shivered delightedly. I love ultrasonics, they feel so funny. She scampered off. Tom cleared his throat. I must say I'm tremendously impressed with the wood carvings. I'd like to photograph them. Oh, Lord. What's the matter? Rachel asked. I lost my camera somewhere. Camera? Jokichi showed interest. You mean one for stills? Yes. What kind? A Leica, Tom told him. Jokichi seemed impressed. That is interesting. I've never seen one of those old ones. Tom's a button man, Lois remarked by way of explanation, apparently. Was the camera in a brown case? You dropped it where we met. We can get it later. Good, I'd really like to take those pictures, Tom said. Incidentally, who did the carvings? We did, Jock said. Together. Tom was grateful that the scamper of the children out of the room saved him from having to reply. He couldn't think of anything but a grunt of astonishment. The conversation split into a group of chats about something called a psych machine, trips to Russia, the planet Mars, and several artists Tom had never heard of. He wanted to talk to Lois, but she was one of the group gabbling about Mars like children. He felt suddenly uneasy and out of things, 
and neither Rachel's deprecating remarks about her section of the wood carvings nor Joyce's interesting smiles helped much. He was glad when they all began to get up. He wandered outside and made his way to the children's lean-to, feeling very depressed. Once again he was the center of a friendly naked cluster, except for the same solemn-faced little girl skipping rope. A rather malicious but not very hopeful whim prompted him to ask the youngest, what's one and one? Ten, the shaver answered glibly. Tom felt pleased. It could also be two, the oldest boy remarked. I'll say, Tom agreed. What's the population of the world? About seven hundred million. Tom nodded noncommittally and, grabbing at the first long word that he thought of, turned to the eldest girl. What's poliomyelitis? Never heard of it, she said. The solemn little girl kept droning the same ridiculous chant, Gicklo, Io, Rico, Giso. His ego eased, Tom went outside and there was Lois. What's the matter? she asked. Nothing, he said. She took his hand. Have we pushed ourselves at you too much? Has our jabbering bothered you? We're a loud-mouthed family and I didn't think to ask if you were loaning. Loaning? Solituding. In a way, he said. They didn't speak for a moment. Then, are you happy, Lois, in your life here? he asked. Her smile was instant. Of course. Don't you like my group? He hesitated. They make me feel rather no good, he said, and then admitted, but in a way I'm more attracted to them than any people I've ever met. You are? Her grip on his hand tightened. Then why don't you stay with us for a while? I like you. It's too early to propose anything, but I think you have a quality our group lacks. You could see how you fit in. And there's Joyce. She's just visiting, too. You wouldn't have to loan unless you wanted. Before he could think, there was a rhythmic rush of feet and the wolvers were around them. We're swimming, Simone announced. Lois looked at Tom inquiringly. He smiled his willingness, started to mention he didn't have trunks, then realized that wouldn't be news here. He wondered whether he would blush. Jock fell in beside him as they rounded the ranch house. Larry's been telling me about your group at the other end of the valley. It's comic, but I've whirled down the valley a dozen times and never spotted any sort of place there. What's it like? A ranch house and several cabins. Jock frowned. Comic I never saw it. His face cleared. How about whirling over there? You could point it out to me. It's really there, Tom said uneasily. I'm not making it up. Of course, Jock assured him. It was just an idea. We could pick up your camera on the way, Lois put in. The rest of the group had turned back from the huge oval pool and the dark blue and flashing thing beyond it, and stood gay-colored against the pool's pale blue shimmer. How about it? Jock asked them. A whirl before we bathe? Two or three said yes besides Lois, and Jock led the way toward the helicopter that Tom now saw standing beyond the pool, its beetle body as blue as a scarab, its veins flashing silver. The others piled in. Tom followed as casually as he could, trying to suppress the pounding of his heart. Wonder you don't go by rocket, he remarked lightly. Jock laughed. For such a short trip? The veins began to thrum. Tom sat stiffly, gripping the sides of the seat, then realized that the others had sunk back lazily in the cushions. There was a moment of strain and they were falling ahead and up. Looking out the side, Tom saw for a moment the sooty roof of the ranch house and the blue of the pool and the pinkish umber of tanned bodies. Then the helicopter lurched gently around. Without warning a miserable uneasiness gripped him, a desire to cling mixed with an urge to escape. He tried to convince himself it was fear of the height. He heard Lois tell Jock, that's the place, down by that rock that looks like a wrecked spaceship. The helicopter began to fall forward. Tom felt Lois' hand on his. You haven't answered my question, she said. What, 
he asked dully. Whether you'll stay with us. At least for a while. He looked at her. Her smile was a comfort. He said, if I possibly can. What could possibly stop you? I don't know, he answered abstractedly. You're strange, Lois told him. There's a weight of sadness in you. As if you lived in a less happy age. As if it weren't twenty-fifty. Twenty, he repeated, awakening from his thoughts with a jerk. What's the time? he asked anxiously. Two, Jock said. The word sounded like a knell. You need cheering, Lois announced firmly. Amid a whoosh of air rebounding from earth, they jounced gently down. Lois vaulted out. Come on, she said. Tom followed her. Where? He asked stupidly, looking around at the red rocks through the settling sand cloud stirred by the veins. Your camera, she told him, laughing. Over there. Come on, I'll race you. He started to run with her and then his uneasiness got beyond his control. He ran faster and faster. He saw Lois catch her foot on a rock and go down sprawling, but he couldn't stop. He ran desperately around the rock and into a gust of upwhirling sand that terrified him with its suddenness. He tried to escape from the stinging, blinding gust, but there was the nightmarish fright that his wild strides were carrying him nowhere. Then the sand settled. He stopped running and looked around him. He was standing by the balancing rock. He was gasping. At his feet the rusty brown leather of the camera case peeped from the sand. Lois was nowhere in sight. Neither was the helicopter. The valley seemed different, rawer, one might almost have said younger. Hours after dark he trailed into Tosker Brown. Curtained lights still glowed from a few cabins. He was footsore, bewildered, frightened. All afternoon and through the twilight and into the moonlit evening that turned the red rocks black, he had searched the valley. Nowhere had he been able to find the soot-roofed ranch house of the Wolvers. He hadn't even been able to locate the rock like a giant bobbin where he'd met Lois. During the next days he often returned to the valley. But he never found anything. And he never happened to be near the balancing rock when the time winds blew at ten and two, though once or twice he did see dust devils. Then he went away and eventually forgot. In his casual reading he ran across popular science articles describing the binary system of numbers used in electronic calculating machines, where one and one make ten. He always skipped them. And more than once he saw the four equations expressing Einstein's generalized theory of gravitation. Gamma I equals zero. Rick equals zero. He never connected them with the little girl's chant, Gicklo. I O, Ricko, Giso. Appointment in tomorrow. The first angry rays of the sun, which, startlingly enough, still rose in the east at twenty-four hour intervals, pierced the lacy tops of Atlantic combers and touched thousands of sleeping Americans with unconscious fear. Because of their unpleasant similarity to the rays from World War III's atomic bombs. They turned to blood the witch circle of rusty steel skeletons around Inferno in Manhattan. Without comment, they pointed a cosmic finger at the tarnished brass plaque commemorating the martyrdom of the three physicists after the dropping of the hell bomb. They tenderly touched the rosy skin and strawberry bruises on the naked shoulders of a girl sleeping off a drunk on the furry and radiantly heated floor of a nearby roof garden. They struck green magic from the glassy blot that was old Washington. Twelve hours before, they had revealed things as eerily beautiful, and as ravaged, in Asia and Russia. They pinked the white walls of the colonial dwelling of Morton Opperly near the Institute for Advanced Studies. Upstairs they slanted impartially across the pharaoh-like and open-eyed face of the elderly physicist and the ugly, sleep-surly one of young Willard Farquhar in the next room. And in nearby New Washington they made of the spire of the Thinker's Foundation a blue and optimistic glory that outshone White House, Jr. It was America approaching the end of the twentieth century. America of jukebox burlesque and your local radiation hospital. America of the mask fad for women and mystic Christianity. 
America of the Off the Bosom Dress and the New Blue Laws. America of the Endless War and the Loyalty Detector. America of Marvelous Maisie and the Monthly Rocket to Mars. America of the Thinkers and, a few remembered, the Institute. Knock on titanium, what do you do for blackouts, please, lover, don't think when I'm around, America, as combat shocked and crippled as the rest of the bomb shattered planet. Not one impudent photon of the sunlight penetrated the triple paned, polarizing windows of George Helmuth's bedroom in the Thinker's Foundation, yet the clock in his brain awakened him to the minute. Or almost. Switching off the educational Sandman in the midst of the phrase, applying tensor calculus to the nucleus, he took a deep. Even breath and cast his mind to the limits of the world and his knowledge. It was a somewhat shadowy vision, but, he noted with impartial approval, definitely less shadowy than yesterday morning. Employing a rapid mental scanning technique, he next cleared his memory chains of false associations, including those acquired while asleep. These chores completed, he held his finger on a bedside button, which rotated the polarizing window panes until the room slowly filled with a muted daylight. Then, still flat on his back, he turned his head until he could look at the remarkably beautiful blonde girl asleep beside him. Remembering last night, he felt a pang of exasperation. Which he instantly quelled by taking his mind to a higher and dispassionate level from which he could look down on the girl and even himself as quaint, clumsy animals. Still, he grumbled silently, Caddy might have had enough consideration to clear out before he awoke. He wondered if he shouldn't have used his hypnotic control of the girl to smooth their relationship last night. And for a moment the word that would send her into deep trance trembled on the tip of his tongue. But no, that special power of his over her was reserved for far more important purposes. Pumping dynamic tension into his twenty-year-old muscles and confidence into his sixty-year-old mind, the forty-year-old thinker rose from bed. No covers had to be thrown off. The nuclear heating unit made them unnecessary. He stepped into his clothing, the severe tunic, tights and sacassins of the modern businessman. Next he glanced at the message tape beside his phone, washed down with ginger ale a vita amino enzyme tablet, and walked to the window. There, gazing along the rows of newly planted mutant oaks lining Decontamination Avenue, his smooth face broke into a smile. It had come to him, the next big move in the intricate game making up his life, and mankind's. Come to him during sleep, as so many of his best decisions did, because he regularly employed the time-saving technique of somnothought, which could function at the same time as somno-learning. He set his who, where? Robot 4, rocket physicist, and genius class. While it worked, he dictated to his steno-robot the following brief message. Dear fellow scientist. A project is contemplated that will have a crucial bearing on man's future in deep space. Ample non-military government funds are available. There was a time when professional men scoffed at the thinkers. Then there was a time when the thinkers perforce neglected the professional men. Now both times are past. May they never return. I would like to consult you this afternoon, three o'clock sharp, Thinkers Foundation I. George Helmuth. Meanwhile the who, where? Had tossed out a dozen cards. He glanced through them, hesitated at the name, Willard Farquhar, looked at the sleeping girl, then quickly tossed them all into the addresser robot and plugged in the steno robot. The buzz light blinked green and he switched the phone to audio. The president is waiting to see Maisie, sir, a clear feminine voice announced. He has the general staff with him. Martian peace to him, George Helmuth said. Tell him I'll be down in a few minutes. Huge as a primitive nuclear reactor, the great electronic brain loomed above the knot of hush-voiced men. It almost filled a two-story room in the Thinker's Foundation. Its front was an orderly expanse of controls, indicators, telltales, and terminals, the upper ones reached by a chair on a boom. Although, as far as anyone knew, it could sense only the information and questions fed into it on a tape. The human visitors could not resist the impulse to talk in whispers and glance uneasily at the great cryptic cube. After all, 
it had lately taken to moving some of its own controls, the permissible ones, and could doubtless improvise a hearing apparatus if it wanted to. For this was the thinking machine beside which the Marks and Eniacs and Maniacs and Matadas and Minervas and Mimirs were less than morons. This was the machine with a million times as many synapses as the human brain. The machine that remembered by cutting delicate notches in the rims of molecules, instead of kindergarten paper punching or the Coney Island shimmying of columns of mercury. This was the machine that had given instructions on building the last three quarters of itself. This was the goal, perhaps, toward which fallible human reasoning and biased human judgment and feeble human ambition had evolved. This was the machine that really thought, a million plus. This was the machine that the timid cyberneticists and stuffy professional scientists had said could not be built. Yet this was the machine that the thinkers, with characteristic Yankee push, had built. And nicknamed, with characteristic Yankee irreverence and girl fondness, Maisie. Gazing up at it, the President of the United States felt a chord plucked within him that hadn't been sounded for decades, the dark and shivery organ chord of his Baptist childhood. Here, in a strange sense, although his reason rejected it, he felt he stood face to face with the living God, infinitely stern with the sternness of reality, yet infinitely just. No tiniest error or willful misstep could ever escape the scrutiny of this vast mentality. He shivered. The grizzled general, there was also one who was gray, was thinking that this was a very odd link in the chain of command. Some shadowy and usually well-controlled memories from World War II faintly stirred his ire. Here he was giving orders to a being immeasurably more intelligent than himself. And always orders of the, tell me how to kill that man, rather than the, kill that man, sort. The distinction bothered him obscurely. It relieved him to know that Maisie had built-in controls which made her always the servant of humanity, or of humanity's right-minded leaders, even the thinkers weren't certain which. The Grey General was thinking uneasily, and, like the President, at a more turbid level, of the resemblance between papal infallibility and the dictates of the machine. Suddenly his bony wrists began to tremble. He asked himself, was this the second coming? Mightn't an incarnation be in metal rather than flesh? The austere Secretary of State was remembering what he'd taken such pains to make everyone forget, his youthful flirtation at Lake Success with Buddhism. Sitting before his guru, his teacher, feeling the Occidental's awe at the wisdom of the East, or its pretense, he had felt a little like this. The burly Secretary of Space, who had come up through United Rockets, was thanking his stars that at any rate the professional scientists weren't responsible for this job. Like the grizzled general, he'd always felt suspicious of men who kept telling you how to do things, rather than doing them themselves. In World War III he'd had his fill of the professional physicists, with their eternal taint of a misty sort of radicalism and free thinking. The thinkers were better, more disciplined, more human. They'd called their brain machine Maisie, which helped take the curse off her. Somewhat. The president's secretary, a paunchy veteran of party caucuses, was also glad that it was the thinkers who had created the machine though he trembled at the power that it gave them over the administration. Still, you could do business with the thinkers. And nobody, not even the thinkers, could do business, that sort of business, with Maisie. Before that great square face with its thousands of tiny metal features, only George Helmuth seemed at ease. Busily entering on the tape the complex questions of the day that the high officials had handed him, logistics for the endless war in Pakistan, optimum size for next year's sugar corn crop. Current thought trends in average Soviet minds, profound questions, yet many of them phrased with surprising simplicity. For figures, technical jargon, and layman's language were alike to Maisie, there was no need to translate into mathematical shorthand, as with the lesser brain machines. The click of the taper went on until the Secretary of State had twice nervously fired a cigarette with his ultrasonic lighter and twice quickly put it away. No one spoke. George looked up at the Secretary of Space. Section 5, Question 4, Whom would that come from? The burly man frowned. That would be the physics boys, Opperly's group. 
Is anything wrong? George did not answer. A bit later he quit taping and began to adjust controls, going up on the boom chair to reach some of them. Eventually he came down and touched a few more, then stood waiting. From the great cube came a profound, steady purring. Involuntarily the six officials backed off a bit. Somehow it was impossible for a man to get used to the sound of Maisie starting to think. George turned, smiling. And now, gentlemen, while we wait for Maisie to celebrate, there should be just enough time for us to watch the takeoff of the Mars rocket. He switched on a giant television screen. The others made a quarter turn, and there before them glowed the rich ochres and blues of a New Mexico sunrise and, in the middle distance, a silvery mighty spindle. Like the generals, the Secretary of Space suppressed a scowl. Here was something that ought to be spang in the center of his official territory, and the thinkers had locked him completely out of it. That rocket there, just an ordinary Earth satellite vehicle commandeered from the Army, but equipped by the thinkers with Maisie designed nuclear motors capable of the Mars journey and more. The first spaceship, and the Secretary of Space was not in on it. Still, he told himself, Maisie had decreed it that way. And when he remembered what the thinkers had done for him in rescuing him from breakdown with their mental science. In rescuing the whole administration from collapse he realized he had to be satisfied. And that was without taking into consideration the amazing additional mental discoveries that the thinkers were bringing down from Mars. Lord, the president said to George as if voicing the secretary's feeling, I wish you people could bring a couple of those wise little devils back with you this trip. Be a good thing for the country. George looked at him a bit coldly. It's quite unthinkable, he said. The telepathic abilities of the Martians make them extremely sensitive. The conflicts of ordinary Earth minds would impinge on them psychotically, even fatally. As you know, the thinkers were able to contact them only because of our degree of learned mental poise and errorless memory chains. So for the present it must be our task alone to glean from the Martians their astounding mental skills. Of course, some day in the future, when we have discovered how to armor the minds of the Martians. Sure, I know, the president said hastily. Shouldn't have mentioned it, George. Conversation ceased. They waited with growing tension for the great violet flames to bloom from the base of the silvery shaft. Meanwhile the question tape, like a New Year's streamer tossed out a high window into the night, sped on its dark way along spinning rollers. Curling with an intricate aimlessness curiously like that of such a streamer, it tantalized the silvery fingers of a thousand relays, saucily evaded the glances of ten thousand electric eyes. Impishly darted down a narrow black alleyway of memory banks, and, reaching the center of the cube, suddenly emerged into a small room where a suave fat man in short sat drinking beer. He flipped the tape over to him with practiced finger, eyeing it as a stockbroker might have studied a ticker tape. He read the first question, closed his eyes and frowned for five seconds. Then with the staccato self-confidence of a hack writer, he began to tape out the answer. For many minutes the only sounds were the rustle of the paper ribbon and the click of the taper, except for the seconds the fat man took to close his eyes, or to drink or pour beer. Once, too, he lifted a phone, asked a concise question, waited half a minute, listened to an answer, then went back to the grind until he came to section 5, question 4. That time he did his thinking with his eyes open. The question was, does Maisie stand for Maelzel? He sat for a while slowly scratching his thigh. His loose, persuasive lips tightened, without closing, into the shape of a snarl. Suddenly he began to tape again. Maisie does not stand for Maelzel. Maisie stands for amazing, humorously given the form of a girl's name. Section 6, Answer 1, the midterm election view casts should be spaced as follows. But his lips didn't lose the shape of a snarl. 500 miles above the ionosphere, the Mars rocket cut off its fuel and slumped gratefully into an orbit that would carry it effortlessly around the world at that altitude. The pilot unstrapped himself and stretched, but he didn't look out the viewport at the dried mud disk that was Earth, cloaked in its haze of blue sky. 
he knew he had two maddening months ahead of him in which to do little more than that. Instead, he unstrapped Sappho. Used to free fall from two previous experiences, and loving it. The fluffy little cat was soon bounding about the cabin in curves and gyrations that would have made her the envy of all back alley and parlor felines on the planet below. A miracle cat in the dream world of free fall. For a long time she played with a string that the man would toss out lazily. Sometimes she caught the string on the fly, sometimes she swam for it frantically. After a while the man grew bored with the game. He unlocked a drawer and began to study the details of the wisdom he would discover on Mars this trip, priceless spiritual insights that would be bombed to war-battered mankind. The cat carefully selected a spot three feet off the floor, curled up on the air, and went to sleep. George Helmuth snipped the emerging answer tape into sections and handed each to the appropriate man. Most of them carefully tucked theirs away with little more than a glance, but the Secretary of Space puzzled over his. Who the devil would Malesel be? he asked. A remote look came into the eyes of the Secretary of State. Edgar Allan Poe, he said frowningly, with eyes half closed. The grizzled general snapped his fingers. Sure. Malesel's chess player. Read it when I was a kid. About an automaton that was supposed to play chess. Poe proved it hit a man inside it. The Secretary of Space frowned. Now what's the point in a fool question like that? You said it came from Operlis Group? George asked sharply. The Secretary of Space nodded. The others looked at the two men puzzledly. Who would that be? George pressed. The group, I mean. The Secretary of Space shrugged. Oh, the usual little bunch over at the Institute. Hindman, Gregory, Opperly himself. Oh, yes, and young Farquhar. Sounds like Opperly's getting senile, George commented coldly. I'd investigate. The Secretary of Space nodded. He suddenly looked tough. I will. Right away. Sunlight striking through French windows spotlighted a ballet of dust motes untroubled by air conditioning. Morton Opperly's living room was well kept but worn and quite behind the times. Instead of reading tapes, there were books, instead of steno robots, pen and ink, while in place of a 4 by 6 TV screen, a Picasso hung on the wall. Only Opperly knew that the painting was still faintly radioactive, that it had been riskily so when he'd smuggled it out of his bomb singed apartment in New York City. The two physicists fronted each other across a coffee table. The face of the elder was cadaverous, large-eyed, and tender, fined down by a long life of abstract thought. That of the younger was forceful, sensuous, bulky as his body, and exceptionally ugly. He looked rather like a bear. Opperly was saying, so when he asked who was responsible for the Malesel question, I said I didn't remember. He smiled. They still allow me my absent-mindedness, since it nourishes their contempt almost my sole remaining privilege. The smile faded. Why do you keep on teasing the zoo animals, Willard, he asked without rancor. I've maintained many times that we shouldn't truckle to them by yielding to their demand that we ask mazy questions. You and the rest have overruled me. But then to use those questions to convey veiled insults isn't reasonable. Apparently the Secretary of Space was bothered enough about this last one to pay me a copter call within twenty minutes of this morning's meeting at the Foundation. Why do you do it, Willard? The features of the other convulsed unpleasantly. Because the thinkers are charlatans who must be exposed, he rapped out. We know their Maisie is no more than a tea-leaf reading fake. We've traced their Mars rockets and found they go nowhere. We know their Martian mental science is bunk. But we've already exposed the thinkers very thoroughly, Opperly interposed quietly. You know the good it did. Farquhar hunched his Japanese wrestler's shoulders. Then it's got to be done until it takes. Opperly studied the bowl of mutated flowers by the coffee pot. I think you just want to tease the animals, for some personal reason of which you probably aren't aware. Farquhar scowled. 
We're the ones in the cages. Opperly continued his inspection of the flowers' bells. All the more reason not to poke sticks through the bars at the lions and tigers strolling outside. No, Willard, I'm not counseling appeasement. But consider the age in which we live. It wants magicians. His voice grew especially tranquil. A scientist tells people the truth. When times are good, that is, when the truth offers no threat, people don't mind. But when times are very, very bad, a shadow darkened his eyes. Well, we all know what happened to, and he mentioned three names that had been household words in the middle of the century. They were the names on the brass plaque dedicated to the martyred three physicists. He went on, a magician, on the other hand, tells people what they wish were true, that perpetual motion works, that cancer can be cured by colored lights. That a psychosis is no worse than a head cold, that they'll live forever. In good times magicians are laughed at. They're a luxury of the spoiled wealthy few. But in bad times people sell their souls for magic cures, and by perpetual motion machines to power their war rockets. Farquhar clenched his fist. All the more reason to keep chipping away at the thinkers. Are we supposed to beg off from a job because it's difficult and dangerous? Opperly shook his head. We're to keep clear of the infection of violence. In my day, Willard, I was one of the frightened men. Later I was one of the angry men and then one of the minds of despair. Now I'm convinced that all my reactions were futile. Exactly. Farquhar agreed harshly. You reacted. You didn't act. If you men who discovered atomic energy had only formed a secret league. If you'd only had the foresight and the guts to use your tremendous bargaining position to demand the power to shape mankind's future. By the time you were born, Willard. Opperly interrupted dreamily, Hitler was merely a name in the history books. We scientists weren't the stuff out of which cloak and dagger men are made. Can you imagine Oppenheimer wearing a mask or Einstein sneaking into the old White House with a bomb in his briefcase? He smiled. Besides, that's not the way power is seized. New ideas aren't useful to the man bargaining for power, only established facts or lies are. Just the same, it would have been a good thing if you'd had a little violence in you. No, Opperly said. I've got violence in me, Farquhar announced shoving himself to his feet. Opperly looked up from the flowers. I think you have, he agreed. But what are we to do? Farquhar demanded. Surrender the world to charlatans without a struggle? Opperly mused for a while. I don't know what the world needs now. Everyone knows Newton as the great scientist. Few remember that he spent half his life muddling with alchemy, looking for the philosopher's stone. Which Newton did the world need then? Now you are justifying the thinkers. No, I leave that to history. And history consists of the actions of men, Farquhar concluded. I intend to act. The thinkers are vulnerable, their power fantastically precarious. What's it based on? A few lucky guesses. Faith healing. Some science hocus-pocus, on the level of those jukebox burlesque acts between the strips. Dubious mental comfort given to a few nerve-torn neurotics in the inner cabinet, and their wives. The fact that the thinker's clever stage-managing won the president a doubtful election. The erroneous belief that the Soviets pulled out of Iraq and Iran because of the thinker's mind-bomb threat. A brain machine that's just a cover for Jan Tregeron's guesswork. Oh, yes and that hogwash of Martian wisdom. All of it mere bluff. A few pushes at the right times and points are all that are needed, and the thinkers know it. I'll bet they're terrified already, and will be more so when they find that we're gunning for them. Eventually they'll be making overtures to us, turning to us for help. You wait and see. I am thinking again of Hitler, Opperly interposed quietly. On his first half-dozen big steps, he had nothing but bluff. His generals were against him. They knew they were in a cardboard fort. Yet he won every battle, until the last. Moreover, 
he pressed on, cutting Farquhar short, the power of the thinkers isn't based on what they've got, but on what the world hasn't got, peace, honor. A good conscience. The front door knocker clanked. Farquhar answered it. A skinny old man with a radiation scar twisting across his temple handed him a tiny cylinder. Radiogram for you, Willard. He grinned across the hall at Opperly. When are you going to get a phone put in, Mr. Opperly? The physicist waved to him. Next year, perhaps, Mr. Barry. The old man snorted with good-humored incredulity and trudged off. What did I tell you about the thinkers making overtures? Farquhar chortled suddenly. It's come sooner than I expected. Look at this. He held out the radiogram, but the older man didn't take it. Instead he asked, who's it from? Tregeron? No, from Helmuth. There's a lot of sugar corn about man's future in deep space, but the real reason is clear. They know that they're going to have to produce an actual nuclear rocket pretty soon, and for that they'll need our help. An invitation? Farquhar nodded. For this afternoon. He noticed Opperly's anxious though distant frown. What's the matter? he asked. Are you bothered about my going? Are you thinking it might be a trap, that after the Malesel question they may figure I'm better rubbed out? The older man shook his head. I'm not afraid for your life, Willard. That's yours to risk as you choose. No, I'm worried about other things they might do to you. What do you mean? Farquhar asked. Opperly looked at him with a gentle appraisal. You're a strong and vital man, Willard, with a strong man's prides and desires. His voice trailed off for a bit. Then, excuse me, Willard, but wasn't there a girl once? A Miss Arcady? Farquhar's ungainly figure froze. He nodded curtly, face averted. And didn't she go off with a thinker? If girls find me ugly, that's their business. Farquhar said harshly, still not looking at Opperly. What's that got to do with this invitation? Opperly didn't answer the question. His eyes got more distant. Finally he said, in my day we had it a lot easier. A scientist was an academician, cushioned by tradition. Willard snorted. Science had already entered the era of the police inspectors, with laboratory directors and political appointees stifling enterprise. Perhaps, Opperly agreed. Still, the scientist lived the safe, restricted, highly respectable life of a university man. He wasn't exposed to the temptations of the world. Farquhar turned on him. Are you implying that the thinkers will somehow be able to buy me off? Not exactly. You think I'll be persuaded to change my aims? Farquhar demanded angrily. Opperly shrugged his helplessness. No, I don't think you'll change your aims. Clouds encroaching from the west blotted the parallelogram of sunlight between the two men. As the slideway whisked him gently along the corridor toward his apartment, George was thinking of his spaceship. For a moment the silver-winged vision crowded everything else out of his mind. Just think, a spaceship with sails. He smiled a bit, marveling at the paradox. Direct atomic power. Direct utilization of the force of the flying neutrons. No more ridiculous business of using a reactor to drive a steam engine. Or boil off something for a jet exhaust, processes that were as primitive and wasteful as burning gunpowder to keep yourself warm. Chemical jets would carry his spaceship above the atmosphere. Then would come the thrilling order set sail for Mars. The vast umbrella would unfold and open out around the stern. Its rear or earthward side a gleaming expanse of radioactive ribbon perhaps only an atom thick and backed with a material that would reflect neutrons. Atoms in the ribbon would split, blasting neutrons astern at fantastic velocities. Reaction would send the spaceship hurtling forward. In airless space, the expanse of sails would naturally not retard the ship. More radioactive ribbon, manufactured as needed in the ship itself, would feed out onto the sail as that already there became exhausted. A spaceship with direct nuclear drive, and he, a thinker, 
had conceived it completely except for the technical details. Having strengthened his mind by hard years of somno learning, mind casting, memory straightening, and sensory training, he had assured himself of the executive power to control the technicians and direct their specialized abilities. Together they would build the true Mars rocket. But that would only be a beginning. They would build the true mind bomb. They would build the true selective microbe slayer. They would discover the true laws of ESP and the inner life. They would even, his imagination hesitated a moment, then strode boldly forward, build the true Maisie. And then, then the thinkers would be on even terms with the scientists. Rather, they'd be far ahead. No more deception. He was so exalted by this thought that he almost let the slideway carry him past his door. He stepped inside and called, Caddy. He waited a moment, then walked through the apartment, but she wasn't there. Confound the girl, he couldn't help thinking. This morning, when she should have made herself scarce, she'd sprawled about sleeping. Now, when he felt like seeing her, when her presence would have added a pleasant final touch to his glowing mood, she chose to be absent. He really should use his hypnotic control on her, he decided, and again there sprang into his mind the word, a pet form of her name, that would send her into obedient trance. No, he told himself again, that was to be reserved for some moment of crisis or desperate danger, when he would need someone to strike suddenly and unquestioningly for himself and mankind. Caddy was merely a willful and rather silly girl, incapable at present of understanding the tremendous tensions under which he operated. When he had time for it, he would train her up to be a fitting companion without hypnosis. Yet the fact of her absence had a subtly disquieting effect. It shook his perfect self-confidence just a fraction. He asked himself if he'd been wise in summoning the rocket physicists without consulting Tregoron. But this mood, too, he conquered quickly. Tregoron wasn't his boss, but just the thinker's most clever salesman, an expert in the mumbo-jumbo so necessary for social control in this chaotic era. He himself, George Helmuth, was the real leader in theoretics and all over strategy, the mind behind the mind behind Maisie. He stretched himself on the bed, almost instantly achieved maximum relaxation, turned on the somno learner, and began the two-hour rest he knew would be desirable before the big conference. Jan Tregeron had supplemented his shorts with pink coveralls, but he was still drinking beer. He emptied his glass and lifted it a lazy inch. The beautiful girl beside him refilled it without a word and went on stroking his forehead. Caddy, he said reflectively, without looking at her, there's a little job I want you to do. You're the only one with the proper background. The point is, it will take you away from George for some time. I'd welcome it, she said with decision. I'm getting pretty sick of watching his push-ups and all his other mind and muscle stunts. And that damn somno learner of his keeps me awake. Tregoron smiled. I'm afraid thinkers make pretty sad sweethearts. Not all of them, she told him, returning his smile tenderly. He chuckled. It's about one of those rocket physicists in the list you brought me. A fellow named Willard Farquhar. Caddy didn't say anything, but she stopped stroking his forehead. What's the matter? he asked. You knew him once, didn't you? Yes, she replied and then added, with surprising feeling, the big, ugly ape. Well, he's an ape whose services we happen to need. I want you to be our contact girl with him. She took her hands away from his forehead. Look, Jan, she said, I wouldn't like this job. I thought he was very sweet on you once. Yes, as he never grew tired of trying to demonstrate to me. The clumsy, overgrown, bumbling baby. The man's disgusting, Jan. His approach to a woman is a child wanting candy and enraged because mama won't produce it on the instant. I don't mind George, he's just a pipsqueak and it amuses me to see how he frustrates himself. But Willard is. A bit frightening? Tregoron finished for her. No. Of course you're not afraid, Tregoron purred. You're our beautiful, clever caddy, 
who can do anything she wants with any man, and without whose. Look, Jan, this is different, she began agitatedly. And without whose services we'd have got exactly nowhere. Clever, subtle Caddy, whose most charming attainment in the ever-appreciative eyes of Papa Jan is her ability to handle every man in the neatest way imaginable and without a trace of real feeling. Kitty Caddy, who? Very well, she said with a sigh. I'll do it. Of course you will, Jan said, drawing her hands back to his forehead. And you'll begin right away by getting into your nicest sugar and cream war clothes. You and I are going to be the welcoming committee when that ape arrives this afternoon. But what about George? He'll want to see Willard. That'll be taken care of, Jan assured her. And what about the other dozen rocket physicists George asked to come? Don't worry about them. The president looked inquiringly at his secretary across his littered desk in his homey study at White House, Jr. So Opperly didn't have any idea how that odd question about Maisie turned up in Section 5? His secretary settled his paunch and shook his head. Or claimed not to. Perhaps he's just the absent-minded prof, perhaps something else. The old feud of the physicists against the thinkers may be getting hot again. There'll be further investigation. The president nodded. He obviously had something uncomfortable on his mind. He said uneasily, Do you think there's any possibility of it being true? What? asked the secretary guardedly. That peculiar hint about Maisie. The secretary said nothing. Mind you, I don't think there is, the president went on hurriedly, his face assuming a sorrowful scowl. I owe a lot to the thinkers, both as a private person and as a public figure. Lord, a man has to lean on something these days. But just supposing it were true, he hesitated, as before uttering blasphemy, that there was a man inside Maisie, what could we do? The secretary said stolidly, the thinkers won our last election. They chased the commies out of Iran. We brought them into the inner cabinet. We've showered them with public funds. He paused. We couldn't do a damn thing. The president nodded with equal conviction, and, not very happily, summed up, so if anyone should go up against the thinkers, and I'm afraid I wouldn't want to see that happen. Whatever's true, it would have to be a scientist. Willard Farquhar felt his weight change the steps under his feet into an escalator. He cursed under his breath, but let them carry him, a defiant hulk, up to the tall and mystic blue portals, which silently parted when he was five meters away. The escalator changed to a slideway and carried him into a softly gleaming, high-domed room rather like the antechamber of a temple. Martian peace to you, Willard Farquhar, an invisible voice intoned. You have entered the Thinker's Foundation. Please remain on the slideway. I want to see George Helmuth, Willard growled loudly. The slideway carried him into the mouth of a corridor and paused. A dark opening dilated on the wall. May we take your hat and coat? A voice asked politely. After a moment the request was repeated, with the addition of, just pass them through. Willard scowled, then fought his way out of his shapeless coat and passed it and his hat through in a lump. Instantly the opening contracted, imprisoning his wrists, and he felt his hands being washed on the other side of the wall. He gave a great jerk which failed to free his hands from the snugly padded jives. Do not be alarmed, the voice advised him. It is only an aesthetic measure. As your hands are laved, invisible radiations are slaughtering all the germs in your body, while more delicate emanations are producing a benign rearrangement of your emotions. The rather amateurish curses Willard was gritting between his teeth became more sulfurous. His sensations told him that a towel of some sort was being applied to his hands. He wondered if he would be subjected to a face-washing and even greater indignities. Then, just before his wrists were released, he felt, for a moment only, but unmistakably, the soft touch of a girl's hand. That touch, like the mysterious sweet chink of a bell in darkness, brought him a sudden feeling of excitement, wonder. Yet the feeling was as fleeting as that caused by a lurid advertisement, for as the slideway began to move again, 
carrying him past a series of depth pictures and inscriptions celebrating the thinker's achievements, his mood of bitter exasperation returned doubled. This place, he told himself, was a plague spot of the disease of magic in an enfeebled and easily infected world. He reminded himself that he was not without resources, the thinkers must fear or need him, whether because of the Maelzel question or the necessity of producing a nuclear power spaceship. He felt his determination to smash them reaffirmed. The slideway, having twice turned into an escalator, veered toward an opalescent door, which opened as silently as the one below. The slideway stopped at the threshold. Momentum carried him a couple of steps into the room. He stopped and looked around. The place was a Sybarite's modernistic dream. Sponge carpeting thick as a mattress and topped with down. Hassocks and couches that looked butter soft. A domed ceiling of deep glossy blue mimicking the night sky, with the constellations tooled in silver. A wall of niches crammed with statuettes of languorous men, women, beasts. A self-service bar with a score of golden spigots. A depth TV screen simulating a great crystal ball. Here and there barbaric studs of hammered gold that might have been push buttons. A low table set for three with exquisite ware of crystal and gold. An ever-changing scent of resins and flowers. A smiling fat man clad in pearl-gray sports clothes came through one of the curtained archways. Willard recognized Jan Tregeron from his pictures, but did not at once offer to speak to him. Instead he let his gaze wander with an ostentatious contempt around the crammed walls, take in the bar and the set table with its many wine glasses, and finally returned to his host. And where, he asked with harsh irony, are the dancing girls? The fat man's eyebrows rose. In there, he said innocently, indicating the second archway. The curtains parted. Oh, I am sorry, the fat man apologized. There seems to be only one on duty. I hope that isn't too much at variance with your tastes. She stood in the archway, demure and lovely in an off-the-bosom frock of pale blue skylon edged in mutated mink. She was smiling the first smile that Willard had ever had from her lips. Mr. Willard Farquhar, the fat man murmured, Miss Arkady Sims. George Helmuth turned from the conference table with its dozen empty chairs to the two mousily pretty secretaries. No word from the door yet, master, one of them ventured to say. George twisted in his chair, though hardly uncomfortably, since it was a beautiful pneumatic job. His nervousness at having to face the twelve rocket physicists, a feeling which, he had to admit, had been unexpectedly great, was giving way to impatience. What's Willard Farquhar's phone? He asked sharply. One of the secretaries ran through a clutch of desk tapes, then spent some seconds whispering into her throat mic and listening to answers from the soft speaker. He lives with Morton Opperly, who doesn't have one, she finally told George in scandalized tones. Let me see the list, George said. Then, after a bit, try Dr. Welcome's place. This time there were results. Within a quarter of a minute he was handed a phone which he hung expertly on his shoulder. This is Dr. Asa Welcome, a reedy voice told him. This is Helmuth of the Thinkers Foundation, George said icily. Did you get my communication? The reedy voice became anxious and placating. Why, yes, Mr. Helmuth, I did. Very glad to get it too. Sounded most interesting. Very eager to come. But. Yes? Well, I was just about to hop in my copter, my son's copter, when the other note came. What other note? Why, the note calling the meeting off. I sent no other note. The other voice became acutely embarrassed. But I considered it to be from you, or just about the same thing. I really think I had the right to assume that. How was it signed? George rapped. Mr. Jan Tregeron. George broke the connection. He didn't move until a low sound shattered his abstraction and he realized that one of the girls was whispering a call to the door. He handed back the phone and dismissed them. They went in a rustle of jackets and skirtlets, 
hesitating at the doorway but not quite daring to look back. He sat motionless a minute longer. Then his hand crept fretfully onto the table and pushed a button. The room darkened and a long section of wall became transparent, revealing a dozen silvery models of spaceships, beautifully executed. He quickly touched another. The models faded and the opposite wall bloomed with an animated cartoon that portrayed with charming humor and detail the designing and construction of a neutron drive spaceship. A third button and a depth picture of deep star-speckled space opened behind the cartoon, showing a section of Earth's surface and in the far distance the tiny ruddy globe of Mars. Slowly a tiny rocket rose from the section of Earth and spread its silvery sails. He switched off the pictures, keeping the room dark. By a faint table light he dejectedly examined his organizational charts for the Neutron Drive project, the long list of books he had boned up on by Somna Learning. The concealed table of physical constants and all sorts of other crucial details about rocket physics, a cleverly condensed encyclopedic pony to help out his memory on technical points that might have arisen in his discussion with the experts. He switched out all the lights and slumped forward, blinking his eyes and trying to swallow the lump in his throat. In the dark his memory went seeping back, back, to the day when his math teacher had told him, very superciliously. That the marvelous fantasies he loved to read and hoarded by his bed weren't real science at all, but just a kind of lurid pretense. He had so wanted to be a scientist, and the teacher's contempt had cast a damper on his ambition. And now that the conference was cancelled, would he ever know that it wouldn't have turned out the same way today? That his somno learning hadn't taken? That his pony wasn't good enough? That his ability to handle people extended only to credulous farmer presidents and mousy girls in skirtlets? Only the test of meeting the experts would have answered those questions. Tregoron was the one to blame. Tregoron with his sly tyrannical ways, Tregoron with his fear of losing the future to men who really understood theoretics and could handle experts. Tregoron, so used to working by deception that he couldn't see when it became a fault and a crime. Tregoron, who must now be shown the light, or, failing that, against whom certain steps must be taken. For perhaps half an hour George sat very still, thinking. Then he turned to the phone and, after some delay, got his party. What is it now, George? Caddy asked impatiently. Please don't bother me with any of your moods, because I'm tired and my nerves are on edge. He took a breath. When steps may have to be taken, he thought, one must hold an agent in readiness. Cadams, he intoned hypnotically, vibrantly. Cadams. The voice at the other end had instantly changed, become submissive, sleepy, suppliant. Yes, master. Morton Opperly looked up from the sheet of neatly penned equations at Willard Farquhar, who had somehow acquired a measure of poise. He neither lumbered restlessly nor grimaced. He removed his coat with a certain dignity and stood solidly before his mentor. He smiled. Granting that he was a bear, one might guess he had just been fed. You see, he said. They didn't hurt me. They didn't hurt you? Opperly asked softly. Willard slowly shook his head. His smile broadened. Opperly put down his pen folded his hands. And you're as determined as ever to expose and smash the thinkers? Of course. The menacing growl came back into the bear's voice, except that it was touched with a certain pleased luxuriousness. Only from now on I won't be teasing the zoo animals, and I won't embarrass you by asking any more malesal questions. I have reached the objective at which those tactics were aimed. After this I shall bore from within. Bore from within, Opperly repeated, frowning. Now where have I heard that phrase before? His brow cleared. Oh, yes, he said listlessly. Do I understand that you are becoming a thinker, Willard? The other gave him a faintly pitying smile and stretched himself on the couch, gazed at the ceiling. All his movements were deliberate, easy. Certainly. That's the only realistic way to smash them. Rise high in their counsels. Out-trick all their trickeries. 
organize a fifth column. Then strike. The end justifying the means, of course, Opperly said. Of course. As surely as the desire to stand up justifies your disturbing the air over your head. All action in this world is nothing but means. Opperly nodded abstractedly. I wonder if anyone else ever became a thinker for those same reasons. I wonder if being a thinker doesn't simply mean that you've decided you have to use lies and tricks as your chief method. Willard shrugged. Could be. There was no longer any doubt about the pitying quality of his smile. Opperly stood up, squaring together his papers. So you'll be working with Helmuth? Not Helmuth. Tregeron. The bear's smile became cruel. I'm afraid that Helmuth's career as a thinker is going to have quite a setback. Helmuth, Opperly mused. Morgenschein once told me a bit about him. A man of some idealism, despite his affiliations. Best of a bad lot. Incidentally, is he the one with whom? Miss Arkady Sims ran off. Willard finished without any embarrassment. Yes, that was Helmuth. But that's all going to be changed now. Opperly nodded. Goodbye, Willard, he said. Willard quickly heaved himself up on an elbow. Opperly looked at him for about five seconds, then, without a word, walked out of the room. The only obvious furnishings in Jan Tregeron's office were a flat-topped desk and a few chairs. Tregeron sat behind the desk, the top of which was completely bare. He looked almost bored, except that his little eyes were smiling. George Helmuth sat across the desk from him, a few feet back, erect and grim-faced, while shadowy in the muted light, Caddy stood against the wall behind Tregeron. She still wore the fur-trimmed Skylon frock she'd put on that afternoon. She took no part in the conversation, seemed almost unaware of it. So you just went ahead and cancelled the conference without consulting me? George was saying. You called it without consulting me. Tregeron playfully wagged a finger. Shouldn't do that sort of thing, George. But I tell you I was completely prepared. I was absolutely sure of my ground. I know, I know, Tregeron said lightly. But it's not the right time for it. I'm the best judge of that. When will be the right time? Tregeron shrugged. Look here, George, he said, every man should stick to his trade, to his forte. Technology isn't ours. George's lips thinned. But you know as well as I do that we are going to have to have a nuclear spaceship and actually go to Mars someday. Tregeron lifted his eyebrows. Are we? Yes. Just as we're going to have to build a real Maisie. Everything we've done until now have been emergency measures. Really? George stared at him. Look here, Jan, he said, gripping his knees with his hands, you and I are going to have to talk things through. Are you quite sure of that? Jan's voice was very cool. I have a feeling that it might be best if you said nothing and accepted things as they are. No. Very well. Tregeron settled himself in his chair. I helped you organize the thinkers, George said, and waited. At least, I was your first partner. Tregeron barely nodded. Our basic idea was that the time had come to apply science to the life of man on a large scale, to live rationally and realistically. The only things holding the world back from this all-important step were the ignorance, superstition, and inertia of the average man. And the stuffiness and lack of enterprise of the academic scientists, their worship of facts, even when facts were clearly dangerous. Yet we knew that in their deepest hearts the average man and the professionals were both on our side. They wanted the new world visualized by science. They wanted the simplifications and conveniences, the glorious adventures of the human mind and body. They wanted the trips to Mars and into the depths of the human psyche, they wanted the robots and the thinking machines. All they lacked was the nerve to take the first big step, and that was what we supplied. It was no time for half-measures, for slow and sober plotting. 
The world was racked by wars and neurosis, in danger of falling into the foulest hands. What was needed was a tremendous and thrilling appeal to the human imagination, an earth-shaking affirmation of the power of science for good. But the men who provided that appeal and affirmation couldn't afford to be cautious. They wouldn't check and double-check. They couldn't wait for the grudging and jealous approval of the professionals. They had to use stunts, tricks, fakes, anything to get over the big point. Once that had been done, once mankind was headed down the new road, it would be easy enough to give the average man the necessary degree of insight to heal the breach with the professionals. To make good in actuality what had been made good only in pretense. Have I stated our position fairly? Tregeron's eyes were hooded. You're the one who's telling it. On those general assumptions we established our hold on susceptible leaders and the mob, George went on. We built Maisie and the Mars rocket and the mind bomb. We discovered the wisdom of the Martians. We sold the people on the science that the professionals had been too high-toned to advertise or bring into the marketplace. But now that we've succeeded, now that we've made the big point, now that Maisie and Mars and science do rule the average human imagination, the time has come to take the second big step. To let accomplishment catch up with imagination, to implement fantasy with fact. Do you suppose I'd ever have gone into this with you, if it hadn't been for the thought of that second big step? Why, I'd have felt dirty and cheap, a mere charlatan, except for the sure conviction that someday everything would be set right. I've devoted my whole life to that conviction, Jan. I've studied and disciplined myself, using every scientific means at my disposal, so that I wouldn't be found lacking when the day came to heal the breach between the thinkers and the professionals. I've trained myself to be the perfect liaison man for the job. Jan, the days come and I'm the man. I know you've been concentrating on other aspects of our work. You haven't had time to keep up with my side of it. But I'm sure that as soon as you see how carefully I've prepared myself, how completely practical the neutron drive rocket project is, you'll beg me to go ahead. Tregeron smiled at the ceiling for a moment. Your general idea isn't so bad, George, but your time scale is out of whack and your judgment is a joke. Oh, yes. Every revolutionary wants to see the big change take place in his lifetime. Cha. It's as if you were watching evolutionary vaudeville and wanted the ape-to-man act over in twenty minutes. Time for the second big step. George, the average man's exactly what he was ten years ago, except that he's got a new god. More than ever he thinks of Mars as a Hollywood paradise, with wise men and yummy princesses. Maisie is mama magnified a million times. As for professional scientists, they're more jealous and stuffy than ever. All they'd like to do is turn the clock back to a genteel dream world of quiet quadrangles and caps and gowns, where every commoner bows to the passing scholar. Maybe in ten thousand years we'll be ready for the second big step. Maybe. Meanwhile, as should be, the clever will rule the stupid for their own good. The realists will rule the dreamers. Those with free hands will rule those who have deliberately handcuffed themselves with taboos. Secondly, your judgment. Did you actually think you could have bossed those professionals, kept your mental footing in the intellectual melee? You a nuclear physicist? A rocket scientist? Why, it's, take it easy now, boy, and listen to me. They'd have torn you to pieces in twenty minutes and glad of the chance. You baffle me, George. You know that Maisie and the Mars rocket and all that are fakes, yet you believe in your somno-learning and consciousness expansion and optimism pumping like the veriest yokel. I wouldn't be surprised to hear you taken up ESP and hypnotism. I think you should take stock of yourself and get a new slant. It's overdue. He leaned back. George's face had become a mask. His eyes did not flicker from Tregeron's, yet there was a subtle change in his expression. Behind Tregeron, Caddy swayed as if in a sudden gust of intangible wind and took a silent step forward from the wall. That's your honest opinion? George asked, very quietly. It's more than that, Tregeron told him, 
just as unmelodramatically. It's orders. George stood up purposefully. Very well, he said. In that case I have to tell you that. Casually, but with no wasted motion, Tregoron slipped an ultrasonic pistol from under the desk and laid it on the empty top. No, he said, let me tell you something. I was afraid this would happen and I made preparations. If you've studied your Nazi, fascist and Soviet history, you know what happens to old revolutionaries who don't move with the times. But I'm not going to be too harsh. I have a couple of the boys waiting outside. They'll take you by copter to the field, then by jet to New Mexico bright and early tomorrow morning, George, you're leaving on a trip to Mars. George hardly reacted to the words. Caddy was two steps nearer Tregoron. I decided Mars would be the best place for you, the fat man continued. The robot controls will be arranged so that your visit to Mars lasts two years. Perhaps in that time you will have learned wisdom, such as realizing that the big liar must never fall for his own big lie. Meanwhile, there will have to be a replacement for you. I have in mind a person who may prove peculiarly worthy to occupy your position, with all its perquisites. A person who seems to understand that force and desire are the motive powers of life, and that anyone who believes the big lie proves himself strictly a jerk. Caddy was standing behind Tregoron now, her half-closed, sleepy eyes fixed on George's. His name is Willard Farquhar. You see, I too believe in cooperating with the scientists, George, but by subversion rather than conference. My idea is to offer the hand of friendship to a selected few of them, the hand of friendship with a nice big bribe in it. He smiled. You were a good man, George, for the early days, when we needed a publicist with catchy ideas about mind bombs, ray guns, plastic helmets, fancy sweaters, space braziers, and all that other corn. Now we can afford a soldier. George moistened his lips. We'll have a neat explanation of what's happened to you. Callers will be informed that you've gone on an extended visit to imbibe the wisdom of the Martians. George whispered, Cadams. Caddy leaned forward. Her arms snaked down Tregoron's, as if to imprison his wrists. But instead she reached out and took the ultrasonic pistol and put it in Tregoron's right hand. Then she looked up at George with eyes that were very bright. She said very sweetly and sympathetically, Poor Superman. A pail of air. Pa had sent me out to get an extra pail of air. I just about scooped it full and most of the warmth had leaked from my fingers when I saw the thing. You know, at first I thought it was a young lady. Yes, a beautiful young lady's face all glowing in the dark and looking at me from the fifth floor of the opposite apartment, which hereabouts is the floor just above the white blanket of frozen air. I'd never seen a live young lady before, except in the old magazines, Sis is just a kid and Ma is pretty sick and miserable, and it gave me such a start that I dropped the pail. Who wouldn't, knowing everyone on earth was dead except Pa and Ma and Sis and you? Even at that, I don't suppose I should have been surprised. We all see things now and then. Ma has some pretty bad ones, to judge from the way she bugs her eyes at nothing and just screams and screams and huddles back against the blankets hanging around the nest. Pa says it is natural we should react like that sometimes. When I'd recovered the pail and could look again at the opposite apartment, I got an idea of what Ma might be feeling at those times. For I saw it wasn't a young lady at all but simply a light, a tiny light that moved stealthily from window to window. Just as if one of the cruel little stars had come down out of the airless sky to investigate why the earth had gone away from the sun, and maybe to hunt down something to torment or terrify. Now that the earth didn't have the sun's protection. I tell you, the thought of it gave me the creeps. I just stood there shaking, and almost froze my feet and did frost my helmet so solid on the inside that I couldn't have seen the light even if it had come out of one of the windows to get me. Then I had the wit to go back inside. Pretty soon I was feeling my familiar way through the thirty or so blankets and rugs Pa has got hung around to slow down the escape of air from the nest, and I wasn't quite so scared. I began to hear the tick-ticking of the clocks in the nest and knew I was getting back into air, 
because there's no sound outside in the vacuum, of course. But my mind was still crawly and uneasy as I pushed through the last blankets, Paz got them faced with aluminum foil to hold in the heat, and came into the nest. Let me tell you about the nest. It's low and snug, just room for the four of us and our things. The floor is covered with thick woolly rugs. Three of the sides are blankets, and the blankets roofing it touch Pa's head. He tells me it's inside a much bigger room, but I've never seen the real walls or ceiling. Against one of the blanket walls is a big set of shelves, with tools and books and other stuff, and on top of it a whole row of clocks. Pa's very fussy about keeping them wound. He says we must never forget time, and without a sun or moon, that would be easy to do. The fourth wall has blankets all over except around the fireplace, in which there is a fire that must never go out. It keeps us from freezing and does a lot more besides. One of us must always watch it. Some of the clocks are alarm and we can use them to remind us. In the early days there was only Ma to take turns with Pa, I think of that when she gets difficult, but now there's me to help, and Sis too. It's Pa who is the chief guardian of the fire, though. I always think of him that way, a tall man sitting cross-legged, frowning anxiously at the fire, his lined face golden in its light. And every so often carefully placing on it a piece of coal from the big heap beside it. Pa tells me there used to be guardians of the fire sometimes in the very old days, Vestal Virgins, he calls them, although there was unfrozen air all around then and you didn't really need one. He was sitting just that way now, though he got up quick to take the pail from me and ball me out for loitering, he'd spotted my frozen helmet right off. That roused Ma and she joined in picking on me. She's always trying to get the load off her feelings, Pa explains. He shut her up pretty fast. Sis let off a couple of silly squeals too. Pa handled the pail of air in a twist of cloth. Now that it was inside the nest, you could really feel its coldness. It just seemed to suck the heat out of everything. Even the flames cringed away from it as Pa put it down close by the fire. Yet it's that glimmery white stuff in the pail that keeps us alive. It slowly melts and vanishes and refreshes the nest and feeds the fire. The blankets keep it from escaping too fast. Pod like to seal the whole place, but he can't, building's too earthquake twisted, and besides he has to leave the chimney open for smoke. Pa says air is tiny molecules that fly away like a flash if there isn't something to stop them. We have to watch sharp not to let the air run low. Pa always keeps a big reserve supply of it in buckets behind the first blankets, along with extra coal and cans of food and other things, such as pails of snow to melt for water. We have to go way down to the bottom floor for that stuff, which is a mean trip, and get it through a door to outside. You see, when the earth got cold, all the water in the air froze first and made a blanket ten feet thick or so everywhere, and then down on top of that dropped the crystals of frozen air. Making another white blanket sixty or seventy feet thick maybe. Of course, all the parts of the air didn't freeze and snow down at the same time. First to drop out was the carbon dioxide, when you're shoveling for water, you have to make sure you don't go too high and get any of that stuff mixed in, for it would put you to sleep. Maybe for good, and make the fire go out. Next there's the nitrogen, which doesn't count one way or the other, though it's the biggest part of the blanket. On top of that and easy to get at, which is lucky for us, there's the oxygen that keeps us alive. Pa says we live better than kings ever did, breathing pure oxygen, but we're used to it and don't notice. Finally, at the very top, there's a slick of liquid helium, which is funny stuff. All of these gases in neat separate layers. Like a pussy cafe, Pa laughingly says, whatever that is. I was busting to tell them all about what I'd seen, and so as soon as I ducked out of my helmet and while I was still climbing out of my suit, I cut loose. Right away Ma got nervous and began making eyes at the entry slit in the blankets and wringing her hands together, the hand where she'd lost three fingers from frostbite inside the good one. As usual. I could tell that Pa was annoyed at me scaring her and wanted to explain it all away quickly, yet could see I wasn't fooling. 
and you watched this light for some time, son? He asked when I finished. I hadn't said anything about first thinking it was a young lady's face. Somehow that part embarrassed me. Long enough for it to pass five windows and go to the next floor. And it didn't look like stray electricity or crawling liquid or starlight focused by a growing crystal, or anything like that. He wasn't just making up those ideas. Odd things happen in a world that's about as cold as can be, and just when you think matter would be frozen dead, it takes on a strange new life. A slimy stuff comes crawling toward the nest, just like an animal snuffing for heat, that's the liquid helium. And once, when I was little, a bolt of lightning, not even Pa could figure where it came from, hit the nearby steeple and crawled up and down it for weeks, until the glow finally died. Not like anything I ever saw, I told him. He stood for a moment frowning. Then, I'll go out with you, and you show it to me, he said. Ma raised a howl at the idea of being left alone, and Sis joined in, too, but Pa quieted them. We started climbing into our outside clothes, mine had been warming by the fire. Pa made them. They have plastic headpieces that were once big double-duty transparent food cans, but they keep heat and air in and can replace the air for a little while. Long enough for our trips for water and coal and food and so on. Ma started moaning again, I've always known there was something outside there, waiting to get us. I've felt it for years, something that's part of the cold and hates all warmth and wants to destroy the nest. It's been watching us all this time, and now it's coming after us. It'll get you and then come for me. Don't go, Harry. Pa had everything on but his helmet. He knelt by the fireplace and reached in and shook the long metal rod that goes up the chimney and knocks off the ice that keeps trying to clog it. Once a week he goes up on the roof to check if it's working all right. That's our worst trip and Pa won't let me make it alone. Sis, Pa said quietly, come watch the fire. Keep an eye on the air, too. If it gets low or doesn't seem to be boiling fast enough, fetch another bucket from behind the blanket. But mind your hands. Use the cloth to pick up the bucket. Sis quit helping Ma be frightened and came over and did as she was told. Ma quieted down pretty suddenly, though her eyes were still kind of wild as she watched Pa fix on his helmet tight and pick up a pail and the two of us go out. Pa led the way and I took hold of his belt. It's a funny thing, I'm not afraid to go by myself, but when Pa's along I always want to hold on to him. Habit, I guess, and then there's no denying that this time I was a bit scared. You see, it's this way. We know that everything is dead out there. Pa heard the last radio voices fade away years ago, and had seen some of the last folks die who weren't as lucky or well protected as us. So we knew that if there was something groping around out there, it couldn't be anything human or friendly. Besides that, there's a feeling that comes with it always being night, cold night. Pa says there used to be some of that feeling even in the old days but then every morning the sun would come and chase it away. I have to take his word for that, not ever remembering the sun as being anything more than a big star. You see, I hadn't been born when the dark star snatched us away from the sun, and by now it's dragged us out beyond the orbit of the planet Pluto, Pa says, and taking us farther out all the time. I found myself wondering whether there mightn't be something on the dark star that wanted us, and if that was why it had captured the Earth. Just then we came to the end of the corridor and I followed Pa out on the balcony. I don't know what the city looked like in the old days, but now it's beautiful. The starlight lets you see it pretty well, there's quite a bit of light in those steady points speckling the blackness above. Pa says the stars used to twinkle once, but that was because there was air. We are on a hill and the shimmery plain drops away from us and then flattens out, cut up into neat squares by the troughs that used to be streets. I sometimes make my mashed potatoes look like it, before I pour on the gravy. Some taller buildings push up out of the feathery plain, topped by rounded caps of air crystals, like the fur hood Ma wears, only whiter. On those buildings you can see the darker squares of windows, underlined by white dashes of air crystals. Some of them are on a slant, 
for many of the buildings are pretty badly twisted by the quakes and all the rest that happened when the dark star captured the earth. Here and there a few icicles hang, water icicles from the first days of the cold, other icicles of frozen air that melted on the roofs and dripped and froze again. Sometimes one of those icicles will catch the light of a star and send it to you so brightly you think the star has swooped into the city. That was one of the things Pa had been thinking of when I told him about the light, but I had thought of it myself first and known it wasn't so. He touched his helmet to mine so we could talk easier and he asked me to point out the windows to him. But there wasn't any light moving around inside them now, or anywhere else. To my surprise, Pa didn't bawl me out and tell me I'd been seeing things. He looked all around quite a while after filling his pail, and just as we were going inside he whipped around without warning, as if to take some peeping thing off guard. I could feel it, too. The old piece was gone. There was something lurking out there, watching, waiting, getting ready. Inside, he said to me, touching helmets, if you see something like that again, son, don't tell the others. Your ma's sort of nervous these days and we owe her all the feeling of safety we can give her. Once, it was when your sister was born, I was ready to give up and die, but your mother kept me trying. Another time she kept the fire going a whole week all by herself when I was sick. Nursed me and took care of the two of you, too. You know that game we sometimes play, sitting in a square in the nest, tossing a ball around? Courage is like a ball, son. A person can hold it only so long, and then he's got to toss it to someone else. When it's tossed your way, you've got to catch it and hold it tight, and hope there'll be someone else to toss it to when you get tired of being brave. His talking to me that way made me feel grown up and good. But it didn't wipe away the thing outside from the back of my mind, or the fact that Pa took it seriously. It's hard to hide your feelings about such a thing. When we got back in the nest and took off our outside clothes, Pa laughed about it all and told them it was nothing and kidded me for having such an imagination, but his words fell flat. He didn't convince Ma and Sis any more than he did me. It looked for a minute like we were all fumbling the courage ball. Something had to be done, and almost before I knew what I was going to say, I heard myself asking Pa to tell us about the old days, and how it all happened. He sometimes doesn't mind telling that story, and Sis and I sure like to listen to it, and he got my idea. So we were all settled around the fire in a wink, and Ma pushed up some cans to thaw for supper, and Pa began. Before he did, though, I noticed him casually get a hammer from the shelf and lay it down beside him. It was the same old story as always, I think I could recite the main thread of it in my sleep, though Pa always puts in a new detail or two and keeps improving it in spots. He told us how the earth had been swinging around the sun ever so steady and warm. And the people on it fixing to make money and wars and have a good time and get power and treat each other right or wrong, when without warning there comes charging out of space this dead star. This burned out sun, and upsets everything. You know, I find it hard to believe in the way those people felt, any more than I can believe in the swarming number of them. Imagine people getting ready for the horrible sort of war they were cooking up. Wanting it even, or at least wishing it were over so as to end their nervousness. As if all folks didn't have to hang together and pool every bit of warmth just to keep alive. And how can they have hoped to end danger, any more than we can hope to end the cold? Sometimes I think Pa exaggerates and makes things out too black. He's cross with us once in a while and was probably cross with all those folks. Still, some of the things I read in the old magazines sound pretty wild. He may be right. The Dark Star, as Pa went on telling it, rushed in pretty fast and there wasn't much time to get ready. At the beginning they tried to keep it a secret from most people, but then the truth came out, what with the earthquakes and floods, imagine, oceans of unfrozen water. And people seeing stars blotted out by something on a clear night. First off they thought it would hit the sun, and then they thought it would hit the earth. There was even the start of a rush to get to a place called China, because people thought the star would hit on the other side. But then they found it wasn't going to hit either side, but was going to come very close to the earth. 
most of the other planets were on the other side of the sun and didn't get involved. The sun and the newcomer fought over the earth for a little while, pulling it this way and that, like two dogs growling over a bone. Pa described it this time, and then the newcomer won and carried us off. The sun got a consolation prize, though. At the last minute he managed to hold on to the moon. That was the time of the monster earthquakes and floods, twenty times worse than anything before. It was also the time of the big jerk, as Pa calls it, when all earth got yanked suddenly, just as Pa has done to me once or twice, grabbing me by the collar to do it. When I've been sitting too far from the fire. You see, the dark star was going through space faster than the sun, and in the opposite direction, and it had to wrench the world considerably in order to take it away. The big jerk didn't last long. It was over as soon as the earth was settled down in its new orbit around the dark star. But it was pretty terrible while it lasted. Pa says that all sorts of cliffs and buildings toppled, oceans slopped over, swamps and sandy deserts gave great sliding surges that buried nearby lands. Earth was almost jerked out of its atmosphere blanket and the air got so thin in spots that people keeled over and fainted, though of course, at the same time. They were getting knocked down by the big jerk and maybe their bones broke or skulls cracked. We've often asked Pa how people acted during that time, whether they were scared or brave or crazy or stunned, or all four, but he's sort of leery of the subject, and he was again tonight. He says he was mostly too busy to notice. You see. Pa and some scientist friends of his had figured out part of what was going to happen, they'd known we'd get captured and our air would freeze, and they'd been working like mad to fix up a place with airtight walls and doors. And insulation against the cold, and big supplies of food and fuel and water and bottled air. But the place got smashed in the last earthquakes and all Pa's friends were killed then and in the big jerk. So he had to start over and throw the nest together quick without any advantages, just using any stuff he could lay his hands on. I guess he's telling pretty much the truth when he says he didn't have any time to keep an eye on how other folks behaved, either then or in the big freeze that followed, followed very quick. You know, both because the dark star was pulling us away very fast and because Earth's rotation had been slowed in the tug of war, so that the nights were ten old nights long. Still, I've got an idea of some of the things that happened from the frozen folk I've seen, a few of them in other rooms in our building. Others clustered around the furnaces in the basements where we go for coal. In one of the rooms, an old man sits stiff in a chair, with an arm and a leg in splints. In another, a man and woman are huddled together in a bed with heaps of covers over them. You can just see their heads peeking out, close together. And in another a beautiful young lady is sitting with a pile of wraps huddled around her, looking hopefully toward the door, as if waiting for someone who never came back with warmth and food. They're all still and stiff as statues, of course, but just like life. Pa showed them to me once in quick winks of his flashlight, when he still had a fair supply of batteries and could afford to waste a little light. They scared me pretty bad and made my heart pound, especially the young lady. Now, with Pa telling his story for the umpteenth time to take our minds off another scare, I got to thinking of the frozen folk again. All of a sudden I got an idea that scared me worse than anything yet. You see, I just remembered the face I'd thought I'd seen in the window. I'd forgotten about that on account of trying to hide it from the others. What, I asked myself, if the frozen folk were coming to life? What if they were like the liquid helium that got a new lease on life and started crawling toward the heat just when you thought its molecules ought to freeze solid forever? Or like the electricity that moves endlessly when it's just about as cold as that? What if the ever-growing cold, with the temperature creeping down the last few degrees to the last zero, had mysteriously wakened the frozen folk to life, not warm-blooded life. But something icy and horrible? That was a worse idea than the one about something coming down from the dark star to get us. Or maybe, I thought, both ideas might be true. Something coming down from the dark star and making the frozen folk move, using them to do its work. That would fit with both things I'd seen, the beautiful young lady in the moving, star-like light. 
the frozen folk with minds from the dark star behind their unwinking eyes, creeping, crawling, snuffing their way, following the heat to the nest. I tell you, that thought gave me a very bad turn and I wanted very badly to tell the others my fears, but I remembered what Pa had said and clenched my teeth and didn't speak. We were all sitting very still. Even the fire was burning silently. There was just the sound of Pa's voice and the clocks. And then, from beyond the blankets, I thought I heard a tiny noise. My skin tightened all over me. Pa was telling about the early years in the nest and had come to the place where he philosophizes. So I asked myself then, he said, what's the use of going on? What's the use of dragging it out for a few years? Why prolong a doomed existence of hard work and cold and loneliness? The human race is done. The earth is done. Why not give up, I asked myself, and all of a sudden I got the answer. Again, I heard the noise, louder this time, a kind of uncertain, shuffling tread, coming closer. I couldn't breathe. Life's always been a business of working hard and fighting the cold, Pa was saying. The Earth's always been a lonely place, millions of miles from the next planet. And no matter how long the human race might have lived, the end would have come some night. Those things don't matter. What matters is that life is good. It has a lovely texture, like some rich cloth or fur, or the petals of flowers, you've seen pictures of those, but I can't describe how they feel, or the fires glow. It makes everything else worthwhile. And that's as true for the last man as the first. And still the steps kept shuffling closer. It seemed to me that the inmost blanket trembled and bulged a little. Just as if they were burned into my imagination, I kept seeing those peering, frozen eyes. So right then and there, Pa went on, and now I could tell that he heard the steps, too, and was talking loud so we maybe wouldn't hear them. Right then and there I told myself that I was going on as if we had all eternity ahead of us. I'd have children and teach them all I could. I'd get them to read books. I'd plan for the future, try to enlarge and seal the nest. I'd do what I could to keep everything beautiful and growing. I'd keep alive my feeling of wonder even at the cold and the dark and the distant stars. But then the blanket actually did move and lift. And there was a bright light somewhere behind it. Pa's voice stopped and his eyes turned to the widening slit and his hand went out until it touched and gripped the handle of the hammer beside him. In through the blanket stepped the beautiful young lady. She stood there looking at us the strangest way, and she carried something bright and unwinking in her hand. And two other faces peered over her shoulders, men's faces, white and staring. Well, my heart couldn't have been stopped for more than four or five beats before I realized she was wearing a suit and helmet like Pa's homemade ones, only fancier, and that the men were. Two, and that the frozen folk certainly wouldn't be wearing those. Also, I noticed that the bright thing in her hand was just a kind of flashlight. The silence kept on while I swallowed hard a couple of times, and after that there was all sorts of jabbering and commotion. They were simply people, you see. We hadn't been the only ones to survive, we just thought so, for natural enough reasons. These three people had survived, and quite a few others with them. And when we found out how they'd survived, Pa let out the biggest whoop of joy. They were from Los Alamos and they were getting their heat and power from atomic energy. Just using the uranium and plutonium intended for bombs, they had enough to go on for thousands of years. They had a regular little airtight city, with airlocks and all. They even generated electric light and grew plants and animals by it. At this Pa let out a second whoop, waking Ma from her faint. But if we were flabbergasted at them, they were double flabbergasted at us. One of the men kept saying, but it's impossible, I tell you. You can't maintain an air supply without hermetic sealing. It's simply impossible. That was after he had got his helmet off and was using our air. Meanwhile, the young lady kept looking around at us as if we were saints, and telling us we'd done something amazing, and suddenly she broke down and cried. They'd been scouting around for survivors, but they never expected to find any in a place like this. 
they had rocket ships at Los Alamos and plenty of chemical fuel. As for liquid oxygen, all you had to do was go out and shovel the air blanket at the top level. So after they'd got things going smoothly at Los Alamos, which had taken years, they decided to make some trips to likely places where there might be other survivors. No good trying long-distance radio signals, of course, since there was no atmosphere to carry them around the curve of the Earth. Well, they'd found other colonies at Argonne and Brookhaven and way around the world at Harwell and Tanatuva. And now they'd been giving our city a look, not really expecting to find anything. But they had an instrument that noticed the faintest heat waves and it had told them there was something warm down here, so they'd landed to investigate. Of course we hadn't heard them land, since there was no air to carry the sound, and they'd had to investigate around quite a while before finding us. Their instruments had given them a wrong steer and they'd wasted some time in the building across the street. By now, all five adults were talking like sixty. Pa was demonstrating to the men how he worked the fire and got rid of the ice in the chimney and all that. Ma had perked up wonderfully and was showing the young lady her cooking and sewing stuff, and even asking about how the women dressed at Los Alamos. The strangers marveled at everything and praised it to the skies. I could tell from the way they wrinkled their noses that they found the nest a bit smelly, but they never mentioned that at all and just asked bushels of questions. In fact, there was so much talking and excitement that Pa forgot about things, and it wasn't until they were all getting groggy that he looked and found the air had all boiled away in the pail. He got another bucket of air quick from behind the blankets. Of course that started them all laughing and jabbering again. The newcomers even got a little drunk. They weren't used to so much oxygen. Funny thing, though, I didn't do much talking at all and Sis hung on to Ma all the time and hid her face when anybody looked at her. I felt pretty uncomfortable and disturbed myself, even about the young lady. Glimpsing her outside there, I'd had all sorts of mushy thoughts, but now I was just embarrassed and scared of her, even though she tried to be nice as anything to me. I sort of wished they'd all quit crowding the nest and let us be alone and get our feelings straightened out. And when the newcomers began to talk about our all going to Los Alamos, as if that were taken for granted, I could see that something of the same feeling struck Pa and Ma, too. Pa got very silent all of a sudden and Ma kept telling the young lady, but I wouldn't know how to act there and I haven't any clothes. The strangers were puzzled like anything at first, but then they got the idea. As Pa kept saying, it just doesn't seem right to let this fire go out. Well, the strangers are gone, but they're coming back. It hasn't been decided yet just what will happen. Maybe the nest will be kept up as what one of the strangers called a survival school. Or maybe we will join the pioneers who are going to try to establish a new colony at the uranium mines at Great Slave Lake or in the Congo. Of course, now that the strangers are gone, I've been thinking a lot about Los Alamos and those other tremendous colonies. I have a hankering to see them for myself. You ask me, Pa wants to see them, too. He's been getting pretty thoughtful, watching Ma and Sis perk up. It's different, now that we know others are alive, he explains to me. Your mother doesn't feel so hopeless anymore. Neither do I for that matter, not having to carry the whole responsibility for keeping the human race going, so to speak. It scares a person. I looked around at the blanket walls and the fire and the pails of air boiling away and Ma and Sis sleeping in the warmth and the flickering light. It's not going to be easy to leave the nest, I said, wanting to cry, kind of. It's so small and there's just the four of us. I get scared at the idea of big places and a lot of strangers. He nodded and put another piece of coal on the fire. Then he looked at the little pile and grinned suddenly and put a couple of handfuls on, just as if it was one of our birthdays or Christmas. You'll quickly get over that feeling son, he said. The trouble with the world was that it kept getting smaller and smaller, till it ended with just the nest. Now it'll be good to have a real huge world again the way it was in the beginning. I guess he's right. You think the beautiful young lady will wait for me till I grow up? I'll be twenty in only ten years. Dr. Komtevsky's day. But it's all predicted here. 
It even names this century for the next reshuffling of the planets. Celeste Wolver looked up unwillingly at the book her friend Madge Carnap held aloft like a torch. She made out the ill-stamped title, The Dance of the Planets. There was no mistaking the time of its origin, only paper from the twentieth century aged to that particularly nasty shade of brown. Indeed, the book seemed to Celeste a brown old witch resurrected from the last age of madness to confound a world growing sane. And she couldn't help shrinking back a trifle toward her husband Theodore. He tried to come to her rescue. Only predicted in the vaguest way. As I understand it, Komtevsky claimed, on the basis of a lot of evidence drawn from folklore, that the planets and their moons trade positions every so often. As if they were playing going to Jerusalem, or musical chairs, Celeste chimed in, but she couldn't make it sound funny. Jupiter was supposed to have started as the outermost planet, and is to end up in the orbit of Mercury, Theodore continued. Well, nothing at all like that has happened. But it's begun, Madge said with conviction. Phobos and Deimos have disappeared. You can't argue away that stubborn little fact. That was the trouble you couldn't. Mars' two tiny moons had simply vanished during a period when, as was generally the case, the eyes of astronomy weren't on them. Just some hundred-odd cubic miles of rock, the merest cosmic flyspecks, yet they had carried away with them the security of a whole world. Looking at the lovely garden landscape around her, Celeste Wolver felt that in a moment the shrubby hills would begin to roll like waves. The charmingly aimless paths twist like snakes and sink in the green sea, the sparsely placed skyscrapers dissolve into the misty clouds they pierced. People must have felt like this, she thought, when Aristarchs first hinted and Copernicus told them that the solid earth under their feet was falling dizzily through space. Only it's worse for us, because they couldn't see that anything had changed. We can. You need something to cling to, she heard Madge say. Gar. Komtevsky was the only person who ever had an inkling that anything like this might happen. I was never a Komtevskyite before. Hadn't even heard of the man. She said it almost apologetically. In fact, standing there so frank and anxious-eyed, Madge looked anything but a fanatic, which made it much worse. Of course, there are several more convincing alternate explanations, Theodore began hesitantly, knowing very well that there weren't. If Phobos and Deimos had suddenly disintegrated, surely Mars' base would have noticed something. Of course there was the disordered space hypothesis, even if it was little more than the chance phrase of a prominent physicist pounded upon by an eager journalist. And in any case, what sense of security were you left with if you admitted that moons and planets might explode, or drop through unseen holes in space? So he ended up by taking a different tack. Besides, if Phobos and Deimos simply shot off somewhere, surely they'd have been picked up by now by scope or radar. Two balls of rock just a few miles in diameter. Madge questioned. Aren't they smaller than many of the asteroids? I'm no astronomer, but I think I'm right. And of course she was. She swung the book under her arm. Phew, it's heavy she observed, adding in slightly scandalized tones, never been microfilmed. She smiled nervously and looked them up and down. Going to a party? she asked. Theodore's scarlet cloak and Celeste's green culottes and silver jacket justified the question, but they shook their heads. Just the normally flamboyant garb of the family, Celeste said, while Theodore explained, as it happens, we're bound on business connected with the disappearance. We Wolvers practically constitute a subcommittee of the Congress for the discovery of new purposes. And since a lot of varied material comes to our attention, we're going to see if any of it correlates with this bit of astronomical sleight of hand. Madge nodded. Give you something to do, at any rate. Well, I must be off. The Buddhist temple has lent us their place for a meeting. She gave them a woeful grin. See you when the earth jumps. Theodore said to Celeste, Come on, dear. We'll be late. But Celeste didn't want to move too fast. You know, Teddy, she said uncomfortably, 
all this reminds me of those old myths where too much good fortune is a sure sign of coming disaster. It was just too much luck, our great-grandparents missing World 3 and getting the world government started a thousand years ahead of schedule. Luck like that couldn't last, evidently. Maybe we've gone too fast with a lot of things, like spaceflight and the deep shaft and, she hesitated a bit, complex marriages. I'm a woman. I want complete security. Where am I to find it? In me, Theodore said promptly. In you? Celeste questioned, walking slowly. But you're just one-third of my husband. Perhaps I should look for it in Edmund or Ivan. You angry with me about something? Of course not. But a woman wants her source of security whole. In a crisis like this, it's disturbing to have it divided. Well, we are a whole and, I believe, indivisible family, Theodore told her warmly. You're not suggesting, are you, that we're going to be punished for our polygamous sins by a cosmic catastrophe? Fire from heaven and all that? Don't be silly. I just wanted to give you a picture of my feeling. Celeste smiled. I guess none of us realized how much we've come to depend on the idea of unchanging scientific law. Knocks the props from under you. Theodore nodded emphatically. All the more reason to get a line on what's happening as quickly as possible. You know, it's fantastically far-fetched, but I think the experience of persons with extrasensory perception may give us a clue. During the past three or four days there's been a remarkable similarity in the dreams of E.S.P.S all over the planet. I'm going to present the evidence at the meeting. Celeste looked up at him. So that's why Rosalind's bringing Frida's daughter. Dottie is your daughter, too, and Rosalind's, Theodore reminded her. No, just Frida's, Celeste said bitterly. Of course you may be the father. One third of a chance. Theodore looked at her sharply, but didn't comment. Anyway, Dottie will be there, he said. Probably asleep by now. All the ESP. S have suddenly seemed to need more sleep. As they talked, it had been growing darker, though the luminescence of the path kept it from being bothersome. And now the cloud rack parted to the east, showing a single red planet low on the horizon. Did you know, Theodore said suddenly, that in Gulliver's travels Dean Swift predicted that better telescopes would show Mars to have two moons? He got the sizes and distances and periods damned accurately, too. One of the few really startling coincidences of reality and literature. Stop being eerie, Celeste said sharply. But then she went on, those names Phobos and Dimas, they're Greek, aren't they? What do they mean? Theodore lost a step. Fear and terror, he said unwillingly. Now don't go taking that for an omen. Most of the mythological names of major and minor ancient gods had been taken, the bodies in the solar system are named that way, of course, and these were about all that were available. It was true, but it didn't comfort him much. I am a god, Dottie was dreaming, and I want to be by myself and think. I and my god friends like to keep some of our thoughts secret, but the other gods have forbidden us to. A little smile flickered across the lips of the sleeping girl, and the woman in gold tights and gold spangled jacket leaned forward thoughtfully. In her dignity and simplicity and straight spined grace, she was rather like a circus mother watching her sick child before she went out for the trapeze act. I and my god friends sail off in our great round silver boats, Dottie went on dreaming. The other gods are angry and scared. They are frightened of the thoughts we may think in secret. They follow us to hunt us down. There are many more of them than of us. As Celeste and Theodore entered the committee room, Rosalind Wolver, a glitter of platinum against darkness, came in through the opposite door and softly shut it behind her. Frida, a fair woman in blue robes, got up from the round table. Celeste turned away with outward casualness as Theodore kissed his two other wives. She was pleased to note that Edmund seemed impatient too. A figure in close fitting black, unrelieved except for two red arrows at the collar, he struck her as embodying very properly the serious, fateful temper of the moment. 
he took two briefcases from his vest pocket and tossed them down on the table beside one of the microfilm projectors. I suggest we get started without waiting for Ivan, he said. Frida frowned anxiously. It's ten minutes since he phoned from the deep space bar to say he was starting right away. And that's hardly a two minutes walk. Rosalind instantly started toward the outside door. I'll check, she explained. Oh, Frida, I've set the mic so you'll hear if Dottie calls. Edmund threw up his hands. Very well, then, he said and walked over, switched on the picture and stared out moodily. Theodore and Frida got out their briefcases, switched on projectors, and began silently checking through their material. Celeste fiddled with the TV and got a newscast. But she found her eyes didn't want to absorb the blocks of print that rather swiftly succeeded each other, so, after a few moments, she shrugged impatiently and switched to audio. At the noise, the others looked around at her with surprise and some irritation, but in a few moments they were also listening. The two rocket ships sent out from Mars base to explore the orbital positions of Phobos and Deimos, that is. The volume of space they'd be occupying if their positions had remained normal, report finding masses of dust and larger debris. The two masses of fine debris are moving in the same orbits and at the same velocities as the two vanished moons, and occupy roughly the same volumes of space. Though the mass of material is hardly a hundredth that of the moons. Physicists have ventured no statements as to whether this constitutes a confirmation of the disintegration hypothesis. However, we're mighty pleased at this news here. There's a marked lessening of tension. The finding of the debris, solid, tangible stuff, seems to lift the whole affair out of the supernatural miasma in which some of us have been tempted to plunge it. One hundredth of the moons has been found. The rest will also be. Edmund had turned his back on the window. Frida and Theodore had switched off their projectors. Meanwhile, earthlings are going about their business with a minimum of commotion, meeting with considerable calm the strange threat to the fabric of their solar system. Many, of course, are assembled in churches and humanist temples. Komatevskyites have staged helicopter processions at Washington, Peking, Pretoria, and Christiana, demanding that instant preparations be made for, and I quote, Earth's coming leap through space. They have also formally challenged all astronomers to produce an explanation other than the one contained in that strange book so recently conjured from oblivion, The Dance of the Planets. That about winds up the story for the present. There are no new reports from interplanetary radar, astronomy, or the other rocket ships searching in the extended Mars volume. Nor have any statements been issued by the various groups working on the problem in astrophysics, cosmic ecology, the Congress for the Discovery of New Purposes, and so forth. Meanwhile, however, we can take courage from the words of a poem written even before Dr. Komtevsky's book. This earth is not the steadfast place. We lands men build upon. From deep to deep she varies pace. And while she comes is gone. Beneath my feet I feel. Her smooth bulk heave and dip. With velvet plunge and soft april. She swings and steadies to her keel. Like a gallant, gallant ship. While the TV voice intoned the poem, growing richer as emotion caught it up, Celeste looked around her at the others. Frida, with her touch of feminine helplessness showing more than ever through her businesslike poise. Theodore leaning forward from his scarlet cloak thrown back, smiling the half-smile with which he seemed to face even the unknown. Black Edmund, masking a deep uncertainty with a strong show of decisiveness. In short, her family. She knew their every quirk and foible. And yet now they seemed to her a million miles away, figures seen through the wrong end of a telescope. Were they really a family? Strong sources of mutual strength and security to each other? Or had they merely been playing family, experimenting with their notions of complex marriage like a bunch of silly adolescents? Butterflies taking advantage of good weather to wing together in a glamorous, artificial dance, until outraged nature decided to wipe them out? As the poem was ending, Celeste saw the door open and Rosalind come slowly in. 
the golden woman's face was white as the paths she had been treading. Just then the TV voice quickened with shock. News. Lunar Observatory 1 reports that, although Jupiter is just about to pass behind the Sun, a good coronagraph of the planet has been obtained. Checked and rechecked, it admits of only one interpretation, which Lunar 1 feels duty-bound to release. Jupiter's 14 moons are no longer visible. The chorus of remarks with which the Wolvers would otherwise have received this was checked by one thing, the fact that Rosalind seemed not to hear it. Whatever was on her mind prevented even that incredible statement from penetrating. She walked shakily to the table and put down a briefcase, one end of which was smudged with dirt. Without looking at them, she said, Ivan left the deep space bar twenty minutes ago, said he was coming straight here. On my way back I searched the path. Midway I found this half buried in the dirt. I had to tug to get it out, almost as if it had been cemented into the ground. Do you feel how the dirt seems to be in the leather, as if it had lain for years in the grave? By now the others were fingering the small case of microfilms they had seen so many times in Ivan's competent hands. What Rosalind said was true. It had a gritty, unwholesome feel to it. Also, it felt strangely heavy. And see what's written on it, she added. They turned it over. Scrawled with white pencil in big, hasty, frantic letters were two words. Going down. The other gods, Dottie dreamt, are combing the whole universe for us. We have escaped them many times, but now our tricks are almost used up. There are no doors going out of the universe and our boats are silver beacons to the hunters. So we decide to disguise them in the only way they can be disguised. It is our last chance. Edmund rapped the table to gain the family's attention. I'd say we've done everything we can for the moment to find Ivan. We've made a thorough local search. A wider one, which we can't conduct personally, is in progress. All helpful agencies have been alerted and descriptions are being broadcast. I suggest we get on with the business of the evening, which may very well be connected with Ivan's disappearance. One by one the others nodded and took their places at the round table. Celeste made a great effort to throw off the feeling of unreality that had engulfed her and focus attention on her microfilms. I'll take over Ivan's notes, she heard Edmund say. They're mainly about the deep shaft. How far have they got with that? Frida asked idly. Twenty-five miles? Nearer thirty, I believe, Edmund answered, and still going down. At those last two words they all looked up quickly. Then their eyes went toward Ivan's briefcase. Our trick has succeeded, Dottie dreamt. The other gods have passed our hiding place a dozen times without noticing. They search the universe for us many times in vain. They finally decide that we have found a door going out of the universe. Yet they fear us all the more. They think of us as devils who will someday return through the door to destroy them. So they watch everywhere. We lie quietly smiling in our camouflaged boats, yet hardly daring to move or think, for fear that the faintest echoes of our doings will give them a clue. Hundreds of millions of years pass by. They seem to us no more than drugged hours in a prison. Theodore rubbed his eyes and pushed his chair back from the table. We need a break. Frida agreed wearily. We've gone through everything. Good idea, Edmund said briskly. I think we've hit on several crucial points along the way and half disentangled them from the great mass of inconsequential material. I'll finish up that part of the job right now and present my case when we're all a bit fresher. Say half an hour? Theodore nodded heavily, pushing up from his chair and hitching his cloak over a shoulder. I'm going out for a drink, he informed them. After several hesitant seconds, Rosalind quietly followed him. Frida stretched out on a couch and closed her eyes. Edmund scanned microfilms tirelessly, every now and then setting one aside. Celeste watched him for a minute, then sprang up and started toward the room where Dottie was asleep. But midway she stopped. Not my child, she thought bitterly. Frida's her mother, 
Rosalind her nurse. I'm nothing at all. Just one of the husband's girlfriends. A lady of uneasy virtue in a dissolving world. But then she straightened her shoulders and went on. Rosalind didn't catch up with Theodore. Her footsteps were silent and he never looked back along the path whose feeble white glow rose only knee-high, lighting a low strip of shrub and mossy tree trunk to either side, no more. It was a little chilly. She drew on her gloves, but she didn't hurry. In fact, she fell farther and farther behind the dipping tail of his scarlet cloak and his plodding red shoes, which seemed to move disembodied, like those in the fairy tale. When she reached the point where she had found Ivan's briefcase, she stopped altogether. A breeze rustled the leaves, and, moistly brushing her cheek, brought forest scents of rot and mold. After a bit she began to hear the furtive scurryings and scuttlings of forest creatures. She looked around her half-heartedly, suddenly realizing the futility of her quest. What clues could she hope to find in this knee-high twilight? And they'd thoroughly combed the place earlier in the night. Without warning, an eerie tingling went through her and she was seized by a horror of the cold. Grainy earth underfoot, an ancestral terror from the days when men shivered at ghost stories about graves and tombs. A tiny detail persisted in bulking larger and larger in her mind, the unnaturalness of the way the earth had impregnated the corner of Ivan's briefcase. Almost as if dirt and leather coexisted in the same space. She remembered the queer way the partly buried briefcase had resisted her first tug, like a rooted plant. She felt cowed by the mysterious night about her, and literally dwarfed, as if she had grown several inches shorter. She roused herself and started forward. Something held her feet. They were ankle-deep in the path. While she looked in fright and horror, they began to sink still lower into the ground. She plunged frantically, trying to jerk loose. She couldn't. She had the panicky feeling that the earth had not only trapped but invaded her, that its molecules were creeping up between the molecules of her flesh, that the two were becoming one. And she was sinking faster. Now knee-deep, thigh-deep, hip-deep, waist-deep. She beat at the powdery path with her hands and threw her body from side to side in agonized frenzy like some sinner frozen in the ice of the innermost circle of the ancient's hell. And always the sense of the dark, grainy tide rose inside as well as around her. She thought, he'd just have had time to scribble that note on his briefcase and toss it away. She jerked off a glove, leaned out as far as she could, and made a frantic effort to drive its fingers into the powdery path. Then the earth mounted to her chin, her nose, and covered her eyes. She expected blackness, but it was as if the light of the path stayed with her, making a little glow all around. She saw roots, pebbles, black rot, worn tunnels, worms. Tier on tier of them, her vision penetrating the solid ground. And at the same time, the knowledge that these same sorts of things were coursing up through her and still she continued to sink at a speed that increased, as if the law of gravitation applied to her in a diminished way. She dropped from black soil through gray clay and into pale limestone. Her tortured, rock-permeated lungs sucked at rock and drew in air. She wondered madly if a volume of air were falling with her through the stone. A glitter of quartz. The momentary openness of a foot-high cavern with a trickle of water. And then she was sliding down a black basalt column, half inside it, half inside gold-flecked ore. Then just black basalt. And always faster. It grew hot, then hotter, as if she were approaching the mythical eternal fires. At first glance Theodore thought the deep space bar was empty. Then he saw a figure hunched monkey-like on the last stool, almost lost in the blue shadows, while behind the bar, her crystal dress blending with the tears of sparkling glasses. Stood a grave-eyed young girl who could hardly have been fifteen. The TV was saying, in addition, a number of mysterious disappearances of high-rating individuals have been reported. These are thought to be cases of misunderstanding, illusory apprehension, and impulse traveling, a result of the unusual stresses of the time. Finally, a few suggestible individuals in various parts of the globe, especially the Indian Peninsula, 
have declared themselves to be gods, and in some way responsible for current events. It is thought. The girl switched off the TV and took Theodore's order, explaining casually, Joe wanted to go to a Komatevskyite meeting, so I took over for him. When she had prepared Theodore's highball, she announced, I'll have a drink with you gentlemen, and squeezed herself a glass of pomegranate juice. The monkey-like figure muttered, scotch and soda, then turned toward Edmund and asked, and what is your reaction to all this, sir? Theodore recognized the shrunken wrinkle-seamed face. It was Colonel Fortescue, a military antique long retired from the peace patrol and reputed to have seen actual fighting in the last age of madness. Now, for some reason, the face sported a knowing smile. Theodore shrugged. Just then the TV, big news, light blinked blue and the girl switched on audio. The colonel winked at Theodore. Confirming the disappearance of Jupiter's moons. But two other utterly fantastic reports have just been received. First, Lunar Observatory 1 says that it is visually tracking 14 small bodies which it believes may be the lost moons of Jupiter. They are moving outward from the solar system at an incredible velocity and are already beyond the orbit of Saturn. The colonel said, ah. Second, Palomar reports a large number of dark bodies approaching the solar system at an equally incredible velocity. They are at about twice the distance of Pluto, but closing in fast. We will be on the air with further details as soon as possible. The colonel said, aha. Theodore stared at him. The old man's self-satisfied poise was almost amusing. Are you a Komatevskyite? Theodore asked him. The colonel laughed. Of course not, my boy. Those poor people are fumbling in the dark. Don't you see what's happened? Frankly, no. The colonel leaned toward Theodore and whispered gruffly, the divine plan. God is a military strategist, naturally. Then he lifted the scotch and soda in his claw-like hand and took a satisfying swallow. I knew it all along, of course, he went on musingly, but this last news makes it as plain as a rocket blast, at least to anyone who knows military strategy. Look here, my boy, suppose you were commanding a fleet and got wind of the enemy's approach, what would you do? Why, you'd send your scouts and destroyers fanning out toward them. Behind that screen you'd mass your heavy ships. Then. You don't mean to imply, Theodore interrupted. The girl behind the bar looked at them both cryptically. Of course I do. The colonel cut in sharply. It's a war between the forces of good and evil. The bright suns and planets are on one side, the dark on the other. The moons are the destroyers, Jupiter and Saturn are the big battleships, while we're on a heavy cruiser, I'm proud to say. We'll probably go into action soon. Be a corking fight, what? And all by divine strategy. He chuckled and took another big drink. Theodore looked at him sourly. The girl behind the bar polished a glass and said nothing. Dottie suddenly began to turn and toss, and a look of terror came over her sleeping face. Celeste leaned forward apprehensively. The child's lips worked and Celeste made out the sleepy fuzzy words, they found out where we're hiding. They're coming to get us. No. Please, no. Celeste's reactions were mixed. She felt worried about Dottie and at the same time almost in terror of her, as if the little girl were an agent of supernatural forces. She told herself that this fear was an expression of her own hostility, yet she didn't really believe it. She touched the child's hand. Dottie's eyes opened without making Celeste feel she had quite come awake. After a bit she looked at Celeste and her little lips parted in a smile. Hello, she said sleepily. I've been having such funny dreams. Then, after a pause, frowning, I really am a god, you know. It feels very queer. Yes, dear? Celeste prompted uneasily. Shall I call Frida? The smile left Dottie's lips. Why do you act so nervous around me, she asked. Don't you love me, mummy? Celeste started at the word. Her throat closed. 
Then, very slowly, her face broke into a radiant smile. Of course I do, darling. I love you very much. Dottie nodded happily, her eyes already closed again. There was a sudden flurry of excited voices beyond the door. Celeste heard her name called. She stood up. I'm going to have to go out and talk with the others, she said. If you want me, dear, just call. Yes, mummy. Edmund rapped for attention. Celeste, Frida, and Theodore glanced around at him. He looked more frightfully strained, they realized, than even they felt. His expression was a study in suppressed excitement, but there were also signs of a knowledge that was almost too overpowering for a human being to bear. His voice was clipped, rapid. I think it's about time we stopped worrying about our own affairs and thought of those of the solar system. Partly because I think they have a direct bearing on the disappearances of Ivan and Rosalind. As I told you, I've been sorting out the crucial items from the material we've been presenting. There are roughly four of those items, as I see it. It's rather like a mystery story. I wonder if, hearing those four clues, you will come to the same conclusion I have. The others nodded. First, there are the latest reports from Deep Shaft, which, as you know, has been sunk to investigate deep earth conditions. At approximately 29 miles below the surface, the Delvers have encountered a metallic obstruction which they have tentatively named the Durosphere. It resists their hardest drills, their strongest corrosives. They have extended a side tunnel at that level for a quarter of a mile. Delicate measurements, made possible by the mirror-smooth metal surface, show that the Durosphere has a slight curvature that is almost exactly equal to the curvature of the Earth itself. The suggestion is that deep borings made anywhere in the world would encounter the Durosphere at the same depth. Second, the movements of the moons of Mars and Jupiter, and particularly the debris left behind by the moons of Mars. Granting Phobos and Deimos had Durospheres proportional in size to that of Earth, then the debris would roughly equal in amount the material in those two Durospheres' rocky envelopes. The suggestion is that the two Durospheres suddenly burst from their envelopes with such titanic velocity as to leave those disrupted envelopes behind. It was deadly quiet in the committee room. Thirdly, the disappearances of Ivan and Rosalind. And especially the baffling hint, from Ivan's message in one case and Rosalind's downward-pointing glove in the other, that they were both somehow drawn into the depths of the earth. Finally, the dreams of the ESP. S, which agree overwhelmingly in the following points, a group of beings separate themselves from a godlike and telepathic race because they insist on maintaining a degree of mental privacy. They flee in great boats or ships of some sort. They are pursued on such a scale that there is no hiding place for them anywhere in the universe. In some manner they successfully camouflage their ships. Ian's pass and their still fanatical pursuers do not penetrate their secret. Then, suddenly, they are detected. Edmund waited. Do you see what I'm driving at? he asked hoarsely. He could tell from their looks that the others did, but couldn't bring themselves to put it into words. I suppose it's the time scale and the value scale that are so hard for us to accept, he said softly. Much more, even, than the size scale. The thought that there are creatures in the universe to whom the whole career of man, in fact, the whole career of life, is no more than a few thousand or hundred thousand years. And to whom man is no more than a minor stage property, a trifling part of a clever job of camouflage. This time he went on, fantasy writers have at times hinted all sorts of odd things about the earth, that it might even be a kind of single living creature, or honeycombed with inhabited caverns. And so on. But I don't know that any of them have ever suggested that the earth, together with all the planets and moons of the solar system, might be. In a whisper, Frida finished for him. A camouflaged fleet of gigantic spherical spaceships. Your guess happens to be the precise truth. At that familiar, yet dreadly unfamiliar voice, all four of them swung toward the inner door. Dottie was standing there, a sleep-stupefied little girl with a blanket caught up around her and dragging behind. Their own daughter. 
but in her eyes was a look from which they cringed. She said, I am a creature somewhat older than what your geologists call the Archaeozoic Era. I am speaking to you through a number of telepathically sensitive individuals among your kind. In each case my thoughts suit themselves to your level of comprehension. I inhabit the disguised and jetless spaceship which is your Earth. Celeste swayed a step forward. Baby, she implored. Dottie went on, without giving her a glance, it is true that we planted the seeds of life on some of these planets simply as part of our camouflage. Just as we gave them a suitable environment for each. And it is true that now we must let most of that life be destroyed. Our hiding place has been discovered, our pursuers are upon us, and we must make one last effort to escape or do battle. Since we firmly believe that the principle of mental privacy to which we have devoted our existence is perhaps the greatest good in the whole universe. But it is not true that we look with contempt upon you. Our whole race is deeply devoted to life, wherever it may come into being, and it is our rule never to interfere with its development. That was one of the reasons we made life a part of our camouflage, it would make our pursuers reluctant to examine these planets too closely. Yes, we have always cherished you and watched your evolution with interest from our hidden lairs. We may even unconsciously have shaped your development in certain ways, trying constantly to educate you away from war and finally succeeding, which may have given the betraying clue to our pursuers. Your planets must be burst asunder, this particular planet in the area of the Pacific, so that we may have our last chance to escape. Even if we did not move, our pursuers would destroy you with us. We cannot invite you inside our ships, not for lack of space, but because you could never survive the vast accelerations to which you would be subjected. You would, you see, need very special accommodations, of which we have enough only for a few. Those few we will take with us, as the seed from which a new human race may, if we ourselves somehow survive, be born. Rosalind and Ivan stared dumbly at each other across the egg-shaped silver room, without apparent entrance or exit, in which they were sprawled. But their thoughts were no longer of thirty-odd mile journeys down through solid earth, or of how cool it was after the heat of the passage, or of how grotesque it was to be trapped here. The Fragment of a Marriage They were both listening to the voice that spoke inside their minds. In a few minutes your bodies will be separated into layers one atom thick, capable of being shelved or stored in such a way as to endure almost infinite accelerations. Single cells will cover acres of space. But do not be alarmed. The process will be painless and each particle will be catalogued for future assembly. Your consciousness will endure throughout the process. Rosalind looked at her gold-shod toes. She was wondering, will they go first, or my head? Or will I be peeled like an apple? She looked at Ivan and knew he was thinking the same thing. Up in the committee room, the other wolvers slumped around the table. Only little Dottie sat straight and staring, speechless and unanswering, quite beyond their reach, like a telephone off the hook and with the connection open, but no voice from the other end. They had just switched off the TV after listening to a confused medley of denials, prayers, Komatevskyite chatterings, and a few astonishingly realistic comments on the possibility of survival. These last pointed out that, on the side of the Earth opposite the Pacific, the convulsions would come slowly when the entombed spaceship burst forth, provided, as seemed the case, that it moved without jets or reaction. It would be as if the Earth's vast core simply vanished. Gravity would diminish abruptly to a fraction of its former value. The empty envelope of rock and water and air would slowly fall together. Though at the same time the air would begin to escape from the debris because there would no longer be the mass required to hold it. However, there might be definite chances of temporary and even prolonged survival for individuals in strong, hermetically sealed structures, such as submarines and spaceships. The few spaceships on Earth were reported to have blasted off, or be preparing to leave, with as many passengers as could be carried. But most persons, apparently, could not contemplate action of any sort. They could only sit and think, like the Wolvers. A faint smile relaxed Celeste's face. She was thinking, 
how beautiful. It means the death of the solar system, which is a horrifying subjective concept. Objectively, though, it would be a more awesome sight than any human being has ever seen or ever could see. It's an absurd and even brutal thing to wish, but I wish I could see the whole cataclysm from beginning to end. It would make death seem very small, a tiny personal event. Dottie's face was losing its blank expression, becoming intent and alarmed. We are in contact with our pursuers, she said in the familiar unfamiliar voice. Negotiations are now going on. There seems to be, there is a change in them. Where they were harsh and vindictive before, they now are gentle and conciliatory. She paused, the alarm on her childish features pinching into anxious uncertainty. Our pursuers have always been shrewd. The change in them may be false, intended merely to lull us into allowing them to come close enough to destroy us. We must not fall into the trap by growing hopeful. They leaned forward, clutching hands, watching the little face as though it were a television screen. Celeste had the wild feeling that she was listening to a communique from a war so unthinkably vast and violent, between opponents so astronomically huge and nearly immortal. That she felt like no more than a reasoning amoeba, and then realized with an explosive urge to laugh that that was exactly the situation. No, said Dottie. Her eyes began to glow. They have changed. During the eons in which we lay sealed away and hidden from them, knowing nothing of them. They have rebelled against the tyranny of a communal mind to which no thoughts are private, the tyranny that we ourselves fled to escape. They come not to destroy us, but to welcome us back to a society that we and they can make truly great. Frida collapsed to a chair, trembling between laughter and hysterical weeping. Theodore looked as blank as Dottie had while waiting for words to speak. Edmund sprang to the picture window, Celeste toward the TV set. Climbing shakily out of the chair, Frida stumbled to the picture window and peered out beside Edmund. She saw lights bobbing along the paths with a wild excitement. On the TV screen, Celeste watched two brightly lit ships spinning in the sky, whether human spaceships or Phobos and Deimos come to help Earth rejoice, she couldn't tell. Dottie spoke again, the joy in her strange voice forcing them to turn. And you, dear children, creatures of our camouflage, we welcome you, whatever your future career on these planets or like ones, into the society of enlightened worlds. You need not feel small and alone and helpless ever again, for we shall always be with you. The outer door opened. Ivan and Rosalind reeled in, drunkenly smiling, arm in arm. Like rockets, Rosalind blurted happily. We came through the durosphere and solid rock, shot up right to the surface. They didn't have to take us along, Ivan added with a bleary grin. But you know that already, don't you? They're too good to let you live in fear, so they must have told you by now. Yes, we know, said Theodore. They must be almost godlike in their goodness. I feel, calm. Edmund nodded soberly. Calmer than I ever felt before. It's knowing, I suppose, that, well, we're not alone. Dottie blinked and looked around and smiled at them all with a holy little girl smile. Oh, mummy, she said, and it was impossible to tell whether she spoke to Frida or Rosalind or Celeste, I've just had the funniest dream. No, darling, said Rosalind gently, it's we who had the dream. We've just awakened. The moon is green. Effie. What the devil are you up to? Her husband's voice, chopping through her mood of terrified rapture, made her heart jump like a startled cat, yet by some miracle of feminine self-control her body did not show a tremor. Dear God, she thought, he mustn't see it. It's so beautiful, and he always kills beauty. I'm just looking at the moon, she said listlessly. It's green. Mustn't, mustn't see it. And now, with luck, he wouldn't. For the face, as if it also heard and sensed the menace in the voice, was moving back from the window's glow into the outside dark, but slowly, reluctantly, and still fawn-like, pleading, cajoling. Tempting, and incredibly beautiful. 
Close the shutters at once, you little fool, and come away from the window. Green as a beer bottle, she went on dreamily, green as emeralds, green as leaves with sunshine striking through them and green grass to lie on. She couldn't help saying those last words. They were her token to the face, even though it couldn't hear. Effie. She knew what that last tone meant. Wearily she swung shut the ponderous lead inner shutters and drove home the heavy bolts. That hurt her fingers, it always did, but he mustn't know that. You know that those shutters are not to be touched. Not for five more years at least. I only wanted to look at the moon, she said, turning around, and then it was all gone, the face, the night, the moon, the magic, and she was back in the grubby, stale little hole, facing an angry, stale little man. It was then that the eternal thud of the air conditioning fans and the crackle of the electrostatic precipitators that sieved out the dust reached her consciousness again like the bite of a dentist's drill. Only wanted to look at the moon, he mimicked her in falsetto. Only wanted to die like a little fool and make me that much more ashamed of you. Then his voice went gruff and professional. Here, count yourself. She silently took the Geiger counter he held at arm's length. Waited until it settled down to a steady ticking slower than a clock, due only to cosmic rays and indicating nothing dangerous, and then began to comb her body with the instrument. First her head and shoulders, then out along her arms and back along their underside. There was something oddly voluptuous about her movements, although her features were gray and sagging. The ticking did not change its tempo until she came to her waist. Then it suddenly spurted, clicking faster and faster. Her husband gave an excited grunt, took a quick step forward, froze. She goggled for a moment in fear, then grinned foolishly, dug in the pocket of her grimy apron and guiltily pulled out a wristwatch. He grabbed it as it dangled from her fingers, saw that it had a radium dial, cursed, heaved it up as if to smash it on the floor, but instead put it carefully on the table. You imbecile, you incredible imbecile, he softly chanted to himself through clenched teeth, with eyes half closed. She shrugged faintly, put the Geiger counter on the table, and stood there slumped. He waited until the chanting had soothed his anger, before speaking again. He said quietly, I do suppose you still realize the sort of world you're living in? She nodded slowly, staring at nothingness. Oh, she realized, all right, realized only too well. It was the world that hadn't realized. The world that had gone on stockpiling hydrogen bombs. The world that had put those bombs in cobalt shells, although it had promised it wouldn't, because the cobalt made them much more terrible and cost no more. The world that had started throwing those bombs. Always telling itself that it hadn't thrown enough of them yet to make the air really dangerous with the deadly radioactive dust that came from the cobalt. Thrown them and kept on throwing until the danger point, where air and ground would become fatal to all human life, was approached. Then, for about a month, the two great enemy groups had hesitated. And then each, unknown to the other, had decided it could risk one last gigantic and decisive attack without exceeding the danger point. It had been planned to strip off the cobalt cases, but someone forgot and then there wasn't time. Besides, the military scientists of each group were confident that the lands of the other had got the most dust. The two attacks came within an hour of each other. After that, the fury. The fury of doomed men who think only of taking with them as many as possible of the enemy, and in this case, they hoped, all. The fury of suicides who know they have botched up life for good. The fury of cocksure men who realize they have been outsmarted by fate, the enemy, and themselves. And know that they will never be able to improvise a defense when arraigned before the high court of history, and whose unadmitted hope is that there will be no high court of history left to arraign them. More cobalt bombs were dropped during the fury than in all the preceding years of the war. After the fury, the terror. Men and women with death sifting into their bones through their nostrils and skin, fighting for bare survival under a dust-hazed sky that played fantastic tricks with the light of sun and moon. Like the dust from Krakatoa that drifted around the world for years. Cities, 
countryside, and air were alike poisoned, alive with deadly radiation. The only realistic chance for continued existence was to retire, for the five or ten years the radiation would remain deadly. To some well-sealed and radiation-shielded place that must also be copiously supplied with food, water, power, and a means of air conditioning. Such places were prepared by the far-seeing, seized by the stronger, defended by them in turn against the desperate hordes of the dying, until there were no more of those. After that, only the waiting, the enduring. A mole's existence, without beauty or tenderness, but with fear and guilt as constant companions. Never to see the sun, to walk among the trees, or even know if there were still trees. Oh, yes, she realized what the world was like. You understand, too, I suppose, that we were allowed to reclaim this ground-level apartment only because the committee believed us to be responsible people. And because I've been making a damn good showing lately? Yes, Hank. I thought you were eager for privacy. You want to go back to the basement tenements? God, no. Anything rather than that fetid huddling, that shameless communal sprawl. And yet, was this so much better? The nearness to the surface was meaningless, it only tantalized. And the privacy magnified Hank. She shook her head dutifully and said, No, Hank. Then why aren't you careful? I've told you a million times, Effie, that glass is no protection against the dust that's outside that window. The lead shutter must never be touched. If you make one single slip like that and it gets around, the committee will send us back to the lower levels without blinking an eye. And they'll think twice before trusting me with any important jobs. I'm sorry. Hank. Sorry? What's the good of being sorry? The only thing that counts is never to make a slip. Why the devil do you do such things, Effie? What drives you to it? She swallowed. It's just that it's so dreadful being cooped up like this, she said hesitatingly, shut away from the sky and the sun. I'm just hungry for a little beauty. And do you suppose I'm not? He demanded. Don't you suppose I want to get outside, too, and be carefree and have a good time? But I'm not so damn selfish about it. I want my children to enjoy the sun, and my children's children. Don't you see that that's the all-important thing and that we have to behave like mature adults and make sacrifices for it? Yes, Hank. He surveyed her slumped figure, her lined and listless face. You're a fine one to talk about hunger for beauty he told her. Then his voice grew softer, more deliberate. You haven't forgotten, have you, Effie, that until last month the committee was so concerned about your sterility? That they were about to enter my name on the list of those waiting to be allotted a free woman? Very high on the list, too. She could nod even at that one, but not while looking at him. She turned away. She knew very well that the committee was justified in worrying about the birth rate. When the community finally moved back to the surface again, each additional healthy young person would be an asset, not only in the struggle for bare survival, but in the resumed war against communism which some of the committee members still counted on. It was natural that they should view a sterile woman with disfavor, and not only because of the waste of her husband's germplasm but because sterility might indicate that she had suffered more than the average from radiation. In that case, if she did bear children later on, they would be more apt to carry a defective heredity, producing an undue number of monsters and freaks in future generations. And so contaminating the race. Of course she understood it. She could hardly remember the time when she didn't. Years ago? Centuries? There wasn't much difference in a place where time was endless. His lecture finished, her husband smiled and grew almost cheerful. Now that you're going to have a child, that's all in the background again. Do you know, Effie, that when I first came in, I had some very good news for you? I'm to become a member of the junior committee and the announcement will be made at the banquet tonight. He cut short her mumbled congratulations. So brighten yourself up and put on your best dress. I want the other juniors to see what a handsome wife the new member has got. 
He paused. Well, get a move on. She spoke with difficulty, still not looking at him. I'm terribly sorry, Hank, but you'll have to go alone. I'm not well. He straightened up with an indignant jerk. There you go again. First that infantile, inexcusable business of the shutters, and now this. No feeling for my reputation at all. Don't be ridiculous, Effie. You're coming. Terribly sorry, she repeated blindly, but I really can't. I'd just be sick. I wouldn't make you proud of me at all. Of course you won't, he retorted sharply. As it is, I have to spend half my energy running around making excuses for you, why you're so odd, why you always seem to be ailing, why you're always stupid and snobbish and say the wrong thing. But tonight's really important, Effie. It will cause a lot of bad comment if the new member's wife isn't present. You know how just a hint of sickness starts the old radiation disease rumor going. You've got to come, Effie. She shook her head helplessly. Oh, for heaven's sake, come on, he shouted, advancing on her. This is just a silly mood. As soon as you get going, you'll snap out of it. There's nothing really wrong with you at all. He put his hand on her shoulder to turn her around, and at his touch her face suddenly grew so desperate and grey that for a moment he was alarmed in spite of himself. Really? He asked, almost with a note of concern. She nodded miserably. Hmm. He stepped back and strode about irresolutely. Well, of course, if that's the way it is, he checked himself and a sad smile crossed his face. So you don't care enough about your old husband's success to make one supreme effort in spite of feeling bad? Again the helpless headshake. I just can't go out tonight, under any circumstances. And her gaze stole toward the lead shutters. He was about to say something when he caught the direction of her gaze. His eyebrows jumped. For seconds he stared at her incredulously, as if some completely new and almost unbelievable possibility had popped into his mind. The look of incredulity slowly faded, to be replaced by a harder, more calculating expression. But when he spoke again, his voice was shockingly bright and kind. Well, it can't be helped naturally, and I certainly wouldn't want you to go if you weren't able to enjoy it. So you hop right into bed and get a good rest. I'll run over to the men's dorm to freshen up. No, really, I don't want you to have to make any effort at all. Incidentally, Jim Barnes isn't going to be able to come to the banquet either, touch of the old flu, he tells me, of all things. He watched her closely as he mentioned the other man's name, but she didn't react noticeably. In fact, she hardly seemed to be hearing his chatter. I got a bit sharp with you, I'm afraid, Effie, he continued contritely. I'm sorry about that. I was excited about my new job and I guess that was why things upset me. Made me feel let down when I found you weren't feeling as good as I was. Selfish of me. Now you get into bed right away and get well. Don't worry about me a bit. I know you'd come if you possibly could. And I know you'll be thinking about me. Well, I must be off now. He started toward her, as if to embrace her, then seemed to think better of it. He turned back at the doorway and said, emphasizing the words, you'll be completely alone for the next four hours. He waited for her nod, then bounced out. She stood still until his footsteps died away. Then she straightened up, walked over to where he'd put down the wristwatch, picked it up and smashed it hard on the floor. The crystal shattered, the case flew apart, and something went zing. She stood there breathing heavily. Slowly her sagged features lifted, formed themselves into the beginning of a smile. She stole another look at the shutters. The smile became more definite. She felt her hair, wet her fingers and ran them along her hairline and back over her ears. After wiping her hands on her apron, she took it off. She straightened her dress, lifted her head with a little flourish, and stepped smartly toward the window. Then her face went miserable again and her steps slowed. No, it couldn't be, and it won't be, she told herself. 
It had been just an illusion, a silly romantic dream that she had somehow projected out of her beauty-starved mind and given a moment's false reality. There couldn't be anything alive outside. There hadn't been for two whole years. And if there conceivably were, it would be something altogether horrible. She remembered some of the pariahs, hairless, witless creatures, with radiation welts crawling over their bodies like worms. Who had come begging for succor during the last months of the terror, and been shot down. How they must have hated the people in refuges. But even as she was thinking these things, her fingers were caressing the bolts, gingerly drawing them, and she was opening the shutters gently, apprehensively. No, there couldn't be anything outside, she assured herself wryly, peering out into the green night. Even her fears had been groundless. But the face came floating up toward the window. She started back in terror, then checked herself. For the face wasn't horrible at all, only very thin, with full lips and large eyes and a thin proud nose like the jutting beak of a bird. And no radiation welts or scars marred the skin, olive in the tempered moonlight. It looked, in fact, just as it had when she had seen it the first time. For a long moment the face stared deep, deep into her brain. Then the full lips smiled and a half-clenched, thin-fingered hand materialized itself from the green darkness and rapped twice on the grimy pane. Her heart pounding, she furiously worked the little crank that opened the window. It came unstuck from the frame with a tiny explosion of dust and a zing like that of the watch, only louder. A moment later it swung open wide and a puff of incredibly fresh air caressed her face and the inside of her nostrils, stinging her eyes with unanticipated tears. The man outside balanced on the sill, crouching like a fawn, head high, one elbow on knee. He was dressed in scarred, snug trousers and an old sweater. Is it tears I get for a welcome? He mocked her gently in a musical voice. Or are those only to greet God's own breath, the air? He swung down inside and now she could see he was tall. Turning, he snapped his fingers and called, Come, puss. A black cat with a twisted stump of a tail and feet like small boxing gloves and ears almost as big as rabbits hopped clumsily in view. He lifted it down, gave it a pat. Then, nodding familiarly to Effie, he unstrapped a little pack from his back and laid it on the table. She couldn't move. She even found it hard to breathe. The window, she finally managed to get out. He looked at her inquiringly, caught the direction of her stabbing finger. Moving without haste, he went over and closed it carelessly. The shutters, too, she told him, but he ignored that, looking around. It's a snug enough place you and your man have, he commented. Or is it that this is a free love town or a harem spot, or just a military post? He checked her before she could answer. But let's not be talking about such things now. Soon enough I'll be scared to death for both of us. Best enjoy the kick of meeting, which is always good for twenty minutes at the least. He smiled at her rather shyly. Have you food? Good, then bring it. She set cold meat and some precious canned bread before him and had water heating for coffee. Before he fell to, he shredded a chunk of meat and put it on the floor for the cat, which left off its sniffing inspection of the walls and ran up eagerly mewing. Then the man began to eat, chewing each mouthful slowly and appreciatively. From across the table Effie watched him, drinking in his every deft movement, his every cryptic quirk of expression. She attended to making the coffee, but that took only a moment. Finally she could contain herself no longer. What's it like up there, she asked breathlessly. Outside, I mean. He looked at her oddly for quite a space. Finally, he said flatly, oh, it's a wonderland for sure, more amazing than you tombed folk could ever imagine. A veritable fairyland. And he quickly went on eating. No but really, she pressed. Noting her eagerness, he smiled and his eyes filled with playful tenderness. I mean it, on my oath, he assured her. You think the bombs and the dust made only death and ugliness. That was true at first. But then, just as the doctors foretold, 
they changed the life in the seeds and loins that were brave enough to stay. Wonders bloomed and walked. He broke off suddenly and asked, Do any of you ever venture outside? A few of the men are allowed to, she told him, for short trips in special protective suits, to hunt for canned food and fuels and batteries and things like that. I, and those blind-souled slugs would never see anything but what they're looking for, he said, nodding bitterly. They'd never see the garden where a dozen buds blossom where one did before, and the flowers have petals a yard across, with stingless bees big as sparrows gently supping their nectar. House cats grown spotted and huge as leopards, not little runts like Joe Lewis here, stalk through those gardens. But they're gentle beasts, no more harmful than the rainbow-scaled snakes that glide around their paws, for the dust burned all the murder out of them, as it burned itself out. I've even made up a little poem about that. It starts, fire can hurt me, or water, or the weight of earth. But the dust is my friend. Oh, yes, and then the robins like cockatoos and squirrels like a princess's ermine. All under a treasure chest of sun and moon and stars that the dust's magic powder changes from ruby to emerald and sapphire and amethyst and back again. Oh, and then the new children. You're telling the truth, she interrupted him, her eyes brimming with tears. You're not making it up. I am not, he assured her solemnly. And if you could catch a glimpse of one of the new children, you'd never doubt me again. They have long limbs as brown as this coffee would be if it had lots of fresh cream in it, and smiling delicate faces and the whitish teeth and the finest hair. They're so nimble that I, a sprightly man and somewhat enlivened by the dust, feel like a cripple beside them. And their thoughts dance like flames and make me feel a very imbecile. Of course, they have seven fingers on each hand and eight toes on each foot, but they're the more beautiful for that. They have large pointed ears that the sun shines through. They play in the garden, all day long, slipping among the great leaves and blooms, but they're so swift that you can hardly see them, unless one chooses to stand still and look at you. For that matter, you have to look a bit hard for all these things I'm telling you. But it is true, she pleaded. Every word of it, he said, looking straight into her eyes. He put down his knife and fork. What's your name? he asked softly. Mine's Patrick. Effie, she told him. He shook his head. That can't be, he said. Then his face brightened. Euphemia, he exclaimed. That's what Effie is short for. Your name is Euphemia. As he said that, looking at her, she suddenly felt beautiful. He got up and came around the table and stretched out his hand toward her. Euphemia, he began. Yes? She answered huskily, shrinking from him a little, but looking up sideways, and very flushed. Don't either of you move, Hank said. The voice was flat and nasal because Hank was wearing a nose respirator that was just long enough to suggest an elephant's trunk. In his right hand was a large blue-black automatic pistol. They turned their faces to him. Patrick's was abruptly alert, shifty. But Effie's was still smiling tenderly, as if Hank could not break the spell of the magic garden and should be pitted for not knowing about it. You little, Hank began with an almost gleeful fury, calling her several shameful names. He spoke in short phrases, closing tight his unmasked mouth between them while he sucked in breath through the respirator. His voice rose in a crescendo. And not with a man of the community, but a pariah. A pariah. I hardly know what you're thinking, man, but you're quite wrong, Patrick took the opportunity to put in hurriedly, conciliatingly. I just happened to be coming by hungry tonight, a lonely tramp, and knocked at the window. Your wife was a bit foolish and let kind-heartedness get the better of prudence. Don't think you've pulled the wool over my eyes, Effie, Hank went on with a screechy laugh. Disregarding the other man completely. Don't think I don't know why you're suddenly going to have a child after four long years. At that moment the cat came nosing up to his feet. Patrick watched him narrowly, shifting his weight forward a little, but Hank only kicked the animal aside without taking his eyes off them. 
even that business of carrying the wristwatch in your pocket instead of on your arm, he went on with channeled hysteria. A neat bit of camouflage, Effie. Very neat. And telling me it was my child, when all the while you've been seeing him for months. Man, you're mad, I've not touched her. Patrick denied hotly though still calculatingly, and risked a step forward, stopping when the gun instantly swung his way. Pretending you were going to give me a healthy child, Hank raved on, when all the while you knew it would be, either in body or germ plasm, a thing like that. He waved his gun at the malformed cat, which had leaped to the top of the table and was eating the remains of Patrick's food, though its watchful green eyes were fixed on Hank. I should shoot him down. Hank yelled, between sobbing, chest-racking inhalations through the mask. I should kill him this instant for the contaminated pariah he is. All this while Effie had not ceased to smile compassionately. Now she stood up without haste and went to Patrick's side. Disregarding his warning, apprehensive glance, she put her arm lightly around him and faced her husband. Then you'd be killing the bringer of the best news we've ever had, she said, and her voice was like a flood of some warm sweet liquor in that musty, hate-charged room. Oh, Hank, forget your silly, wrong jealousy and listen to me. Patrick here has something wonderful to tell us. Hank stared at her. For once he screamed no reply. It was obvious that he was seeing for the first time how beautiful she had become, and that the realization jolted him terribly. What do you mean, he finally asked unevenly, almost fearfully. I mean that we no longer need to fear the dust, she said, and now her smile was radiant. It never really did hurt people the way the doctors said it would. Remember how it was with me, Hank, the exposure I had and recovered from, although the doctors said I wouldn't at first, and without even losing my hair? Hank, those who were brave enough to stay outside, and who weren't killed by terror and suggestion and panic, they adapted to the dust. They changed, but they changed for the better. Everything. Effie, he told you lies. Hank interrupted, but still in that same agitated, broken voice, cowed by her beauty. Everything that grew or moved was purified, she went on ringingly. You men going outside have never seen it, because you've never had eyes for it. You've been blinded to beauty, to life itself. And now all the power in the dust has gone and faded, anyway, burned itself out. That's true, isn't it? She smiled at Patrick for confirmation. His face was strangely veiled, as if he were calculating obscure changes. He might have given a little nod, at any rate, Effie assumed that he did, for she turned back to her husband. You see, Hank? We can all go out now. We need never fear the dust again. Patrick is a living proof of that, she continued triumphantly, standing straighter, holding him a little tighter. Look at him. Not a scar or a sign, and he's been out in the dust for years. How could he be this way, if the dust hurt the brave? Oh, believe me, Hank. Believe what you see. Test it if you want. Test Patrick here. Effie, you're all mixed up. You don't know, Hank faltered, but without conviction of any sort. Just test him, Effie repeated with utter confidence, ignoring, not even noticing, Patrick's warning nudge. All right, Hank mumbled. He looked at the stranger dully. Can you count? he asked. Patrick's face was a complete enigma. Then he suddenly spoke, and his voice was like a fencer's foil, light, bright, alert, constantly playing, yet utterly on guard. Can I count? Do you take me for a complete simpleton, man? Of course I can count. Then count yourself, Hank said, barely indicating the table. Count myself, should I? The other retorted with a quick facetious laugh. Is this a kindergarten? But if you want me to, I'm willing. His voice was rapid. I've two arms, and two legs, that's four. And ten fingers and ten toes, you'll take my word for them, that's twenty-four. A head, twenty-five. And two eyes and a nose and a mouth. With this, I mean, Hank said heavily, advanced to the table, 
picked up the Geiger counter, switched it on, and handed it across the table to the other man. But while it was still an arm's length from Patrick, the clicks began to mount furiously, until they were like the chatter of a pygmy machine gun. Abruptly the clicks slowed, but that was only the counter shifting to a new scaling circuit, in which each click stood for 512 of the old ones. With those horrid, rattling little volleys, fear cascaded into the room and filled it, smashing like so much colored glass all the bright barriers of words Effie had raised against it. For no dreams can stand against the Geiger counter, the twentieth century's mouthpiece of ultimate truth. It was as if the dust and all the terrors of the dust had incarnated themselves in one dread invading shape that said in words stronger than audible speech, those were illusions. Whistles in the dark. This is reality, the dreary, pitiless reality of the burrowing years. Hank scuttled back to the wall. Through chattering teeth he babbled, enough radioactives, kill a thousand men, freak, a freak, in his agitation he forgot for a moment to inhale through the respirator. Even Effie, taken off guard, all the fears that had been drilled into her twanging like piano wires, shrank from the skeletal seeming shape beside her, held herself to it only by desperation. Patrick did it for her. He disengaged her arm and stepped briskly away. Then he whirled on them, smiling sardonically, and started to speak, but instead looked with distaste at the chattering Geiger counter he held between fingers and thumb. Have we listened to this racket long enough? he asked. Without waiting for an answer, he put down the instrument on the table. The cat hurried over to it curiously and the clicks began again to mount in a minor crescendo. Effie lunged for it frantically, switched it off, darted back. That's right, Patrick said with another chilling smile. You do well to cringe, for I'm death itself. Even in death I could kill you, like a snake. And with that his voice took on the tones of a circus barker. Yes, I'm a freak, as the gentleman so wisely said. That's what one doctor who dared talk with me for a minute told me before he kicked me out. He couldn't tell me why, but somehow the dust doesn't kill me. Because I'm a freak, you see, just like the men who ate nails and walked on fire and ate arsenic and stuck themselves through with pins. Step right up, ladies and gentlemen, only not too close. And examine the man the dust can't harm. Rappuccini's child, brought up to date, his embrace, death. And now, he said, breathing heavily, I'll get out and leave you in your damned lead cave. He started toward the window. Hank's gun followed him shakingly. Wait. Effie called in an agonized voice. He obeyed. She continued falteringly, when we were together earlier, you didn't act as if. When we were together earlier, I wanted what I wanted, he snarled at her. You don't suppose I'm a bloody saint, do you? And all the beautiful things you told me? That, he said cruelly, is just a line I've found that women fall for. They're all so bored and so starved for beauty, as they generally put it. Even the garden? Her question was barely audible through the sobs that threatened to suffocate her. He looked at her and perhaps his expression softened just a trifle. What's outside, he said flatly, is just a little worse than either of you can imagine. He tapped his temple. The garden's all here. You've killed it, she wept. You've killed it in me. You've both killed everything that's beautiful. But you're worse, she screamed at Patrick, because he only killed beauty once, but you brought it to life just so you could kill it again. Oh, I can't stand it. I won't stand it. And she began to scream. Patrick started toward her, but she broke off and whirled away from him to the window, her eyes crazy. You've been lying to us, she cried. The garden's there. I know it is. But you don't want to share it with anyone. No, no, Euphemia, Patrick protested anxiously. It's hell out there, believe me. I wouldn't lie to you about it. Wouldn't lie to me. She mocked. Are you afraid, too? With a sudden pull, she jerked open the window and stood before the blank green-tinged oblong of darkness that seemed to press into the room like a menacing, 
heavy, wind-urged curtain. At that Hank cried out a shocked, pleading, Effie. She ignored him. I can't be cooped up here any longer, she said. And I won't, now that I know. I'm going to the garden. Both men sprang at her, but they were too late. She leaped lightly to the sill, and by the time they had flung themselves against it, her footsteps were already hurrying off into the darkness. Effie, come back. Come back. Hank shouted after her desperately, no longer thinking to cringe from the man beside him, or how the gun was pointed. I love you, Effie. Come back. Patrick added his voice. Come back, Euphemia. You'll be safe if you come back right away. Come back to your home. No answer to that at all. They both strained their eyes through the greenish murk. They could barely make out a shadowy figure about half a block down the near black canyon of the dismal, dust-blown street, into which the greenish moonlight hardly reached. It seemed to them that the figure was scooping something up from the pavement and letting it sift down along its arms and over its bosom. Go out and get her, man, Patrick urged the other. For if I go out for her, I warn you I won't bring her back. She said something about having stood the dust better than most, and that's enough for me. But Hank, chained by his painfully learned habits and by something else, could not move. And then a ghostly voice came whispering down the street, chanting, Fire can hurt me, or water, or the weight of earth. But the dust is my friend. Patrick spared the other man one more look. Then, without a word, he vaulted up and ran off. Hank stood there. After perhaps a half minute he remembered to close his mouth when he inhaled. Finally he was sure the street was empty. As he started to close the window, there was a little mew. He picked up the cat and gently put it outside. Then he did close the window, and the shutters, and bolted them, and took up the Geiger counter, and mechanically began to count himself. Yesterday House Chapter 1 The narrow cove was quiet as the face of an expectant child, yet so near the ruffled Atlantic that the last push of wind carried the Annie O its full length. The man in grey flannels and sweatshirt let the sail come crumpling down and hurried past its white folds at a gait made comically awkward by his cramped muscles. Slowly the rocky ledge came nearer. Slowly the blue V inscribed on the cove's surface by the sloop's prow died. Sloop and ledge kissed so gently that he hardly had to reach out his hand. He scrambled ashore, dipping a sneaker in the icy water, and threw the line around a boulder. Unkinking himself, he looked back through the cove's high and rocky mouth at the grey-green scattering of islands and the faint dark line that was the coast of Maine. He almost laughed in satisfaction at having disregarded vague warnings and done the thing every man yearns to do once in his lifetime, gone to the farthest island out. He must have looked longer than he realized, because by the time he dropped his gaze the cove was again as glassy as if the Annie O had always been there. And the splotches made by his sneaker on the rock had faded in the hot sun. There was something very unusual about the quietness of this place. As if time, elsewhere hurrying frantically, paused here to rest. As if all changes were erased on this one bit of earth. The man's lean, melancholy face crinkled into a grin at the banal fancy. He turned his back on his new friend, the little green sloop, without one thought for his nets and specimen bottles, and set out to explore. The ground rose steeply at first and the oaks were close. But after a little way things went downhill and the leaves thinned and he came out on more rocks, and realized that he hadn't quite gone to the farthest one out. Joined to this island by a rocky spine, which at the present low tide would have been dry but for the spray, was another green. High island at the first had masked from him all the while he had been sailing. He felt a thrill of discovery, just as he'd wondered back in the woods whether his might not be the first human feet to kick through the underbrush. After all, there were thousands of these islands. Then he was dropping down the rocks, his lanky limbs now moving smoothly enough. To the landward side of the spine, the water was fairly still. It even began with another deep cove, in which he glimpsed the spiny spheres of sea urchins. But from seaward the waves chopped in. 
sprinkling his trousers to the knees and making him wince pleasurably at the thought of what vast wings of spray and towers of solid water must crash up from here in a storm. He crossed the rocks at a trot, ran up a short grassy slope, raced through a fringe of trees, and came straight up against an eight-foot fence of heavy mesh topped with barbed wire and backed at a short distance with high, heavy shrubbery. Without pausing for surprise, in fact, in his holiday mood, using surprise as a goad, he jumped for the branch of an oak whose trunk touched the fence, scorning the easier lower branch on the other side of the tree. Then he drew himself up, worked his way to some higher branches that crossed the fence, and dropped down inside. Suddenly cautious, he gently parted the shrubbery and, before the first surprise could really sink in, had another. A closely mown lawn dotted with more shrubbery ran up to a snug white Cape Cod cottage. The single strand of a radio aerial stretched the length of the roof. Parked on a neat gravel driveway that crossed just in front of the cottage was a short, square-line touring car that he recognized from remembered pictures as an ancient Essex. The whole scene had about it the same odd quietness as the cove. Then, with the air of a clockwork toy coming to life, the white door opened and an elderly woman came out, dressed in a long, lace-edged dress and wide, lacy hat. She climbed into the driver's seat of the Essex, sitting there very stiff and tall. The motor began to chug bravely, gravel skittered, and the car rolled off between the trees. The door of the house opened again and a slim girl emerged. She wore a white silk dress that fell straight from square neckline to hip-height waistline, making the skirt seem very short. Her dark hair was bound with a white bandeau so that it curved close to her cheeks. A dark necklace dangled against the white of the dress. A newspaper was tucked under her arm. She crossed the driveway and tossed the paper down on a rattan table between three rattan chairs and stood watching a squirrel zigzag across the lawn. The man stepped through the wall of shrubbery, called, hello, and walked toward her. She whirled around and stared at him as still as if her heart had stopped beating. Then she darted behind the table and waited for him there. Granting the surprise of his appearance, her alarm seemed not so much excessive as eerie. As if, the man thought, he were not an ordinary stranger, but a visitor from another planet. Approaching closer, he saw that she was trembling and that her breath was coming in rapid, irregular gasps. Yet the slim, sweet, patrician face that stared into his had an underlying expression of expectancy that reminded him of the cove. She couldn't have been more than eighteen. He stopped short of the table. Before he could speak, she stammered out, Are you he? What do you mean? he asked, smiling puzzledly. The one who sends me the little boxes. I was out sailing and I happened to land in the far cove. I didn't dream that anyone lived on this island, or even came here. No one ever does come here, she replied. Her manner had changed, becoming at once more wary and less agitated, though still eerily curious. It startled me tremendously to find this place, he blundered on. Especially the road and the car. Why, this island can't be more than a quarter of a mile wide. The road goes down to the wharf, she explained, and up to the top of the island, where my aunts have a tree house. He tore his mind away from the picture of a woman dressed like Queen Mary clambering up a tree. Was that your aunt I saw driving off? One of them. The others taken the motorboat in for supplies. She looked at him doubtfully. I'm not sure they'll like it if they find someone here. There are just the three of you. He cut in quickly, looking down the empty road that vanished among the oaks. She nodded. I suppose you go into the mainland with your aunts quite often? She shook her head. It must get pretty dull for you. Not very, she said, smiling. My aunts bring me the papers and other things. Even movies. We've got a projector. My favorite stars are Antonio Marino and Alice Terry. I like her better even than Clara Bow. He looked at her hard for a moment. I suppose you read a lot. She nodded. Fitzgerald's my favorite author. She started around the table, hesitated, suddenly grew shy. 
Would you like some lemonade? He'd noticed the dude's silver pitcher, but only now realized his thirst. Yet when she handed him a glass, he held it untasted and said awkwardly, I haven't introduced myself. I'm Jack Barry. She stared at his outstretched right hand, slowly extended her own toward it, shook it up and down exactly once, then quickly dropped it. He chuckled and gulped some lemonade. I'm a biology student. Been working at Woods Hole the first part of the summer. But now I'm here to do research in marine ecology, that sort of sea life patterns, of the inshore islands. Under the direction of Professor Keserich. You know about him, of course? She shook her head. Probably the greatest living biologist, he was proud to inform her. Human physiology as well. Tremendous geneticist. In a class with Carlson and Jacques Loeb. Martin Keserich, he lives over there at town. I'm staying with him. You ought to have heard of him. He grinned. Matter of fact, I'd never have met you if it hadn't been for Mrs. Keserich. The girl looked puzzled. Jack explained, the old boy's been off to Europe on some conferences, won't be back for a couple days more. But I was to get started anyhow. When I went out this morning Mrs. Keserich, she's a drab sort of person, said to me, don't try to sail to the farther islands. So, of course, I had to. By the way, you still haven't told me your name. Mary Alice Pope, she said, speaking slowly and with an odd wonder, as if she were saying it for the first time. You're pretty shy, aren't you? How would I know? The question stopped Jack. He couldn't think of anything to say to this strangely attractive girl dressed almost like a flapper. Will you sit down? she asked him gravely. The rattan chair sighed under his weight. He made another effort to talk. I'll bet you'll be glad when summer's over. Why? So you'll be able to go back to the mainland. But I never go to the mainland. You mean you stay out here all winter, he asked incredulously, his mind filled with a vision of snow and frozen spray and great gray waves. Oh, yes. We get all our supplies on hand before winter. My ants are very capable. They don't always wear long lace dresses. And now I help them. But that's impossible. He said with sudden sympathetic anger. You can't be shut off this way from people your own age. You're the first one I ever met. She hesitated. I never saw a boy or a man before, except in movies. You're joking. No, it's true. But why are they doing it to you, he demanded, leaning forward. Why are they inflicting this loneliness on you, Mary? She seemed to have gained poise from his loss of it. I don't know why. I'm to find out soon. But actually I'm not lonely. May I tell you a secret? She touched his hand, this time with only the faintest trembling. Every night the loneliness gathers in around me, you're right about that. But then every morning new life comes to me in a little box. What's that? he said sharply. Sometimes there's a poem in the box, sometimes a book, or pictures, or flowers, or a ring, but always a note. Next to the notes I like the poems best. My favorite is the one by Matthew Arnold that ends. Ah, love, let us be true. To one another. For the world, which seems. To lie before us like a land of dreams. So various, so beautiful, so new. Hath really neither joy, nor love, nor light. Nor certitude. Wait a minute, he interrupted. Who sends you these boxes? I don't know. But how are the notes signed? They're wonderful notes, she said. So wise, so gay, so tender you'd imagine them being written by John Barrymore or Lindbergh. Yes, but how are they signed? She hesitated. Never anything but, your lover. And so when you first saw me, you thought, he began, then stopped because she was blushing. How long have you been getting them? Ever since I can remember. 
I have two closets of the boxes. The new ones are either by my bed when I wake or at my place at breakfast. But how does this, person get these boxes to you out here? Does he give them to your aunts and do they put them there? I'm not sure. But how can they get them in winter? I don't know. Look here, he said, pouring himself more lemonade, how long is it since you've been to the mainland? Almost eighteen years. My aunts tell me I was born there in the middle of the war. What war? he asked startledly, spilling some lemonade. The World War, of course. What's the matter? Jack Barr was staring down at the spilled lemonade and feeling a kind of terror he'd never experienced in his waking life. Nothing around him had changed. He could still feel the same hot sun on his shoulders, the same icy glass in his hand, sent the same lemon acid odor in his nostrils. He could still hear the faint chop chop of the waves. And yet everything had changed, gone dark and dizzy as a landscape glimpse just before a faint. All the little false notes had come to a sudden focus. For the lemonade had spilled on the headline of the newspaper the girl had tossed down. And the headline read Hitler in New Defiance. Under the big black banner of that head swam smaller ones. Foes of Machado Riot in Havana. Big N. R.A. Parade Planned. Balba speaks in New York. Suddenly he felt a surge of relief. He had noticed that the paper was yellow and brittle-edged. Why are you so interested in old newspapers? He asked. I wouldn't call day before yesterday's paper old, the girl objected, pointing at the dateline, July 20, 1933. You're trying to joke, Jack told her. No, I'm not. But it's 1953. Now it's you who are joking. But the paper's yellow. The paper's always yellow. He laughed uneasily. Well, if you actually think it's 1933, perhaps you're to be envied, he said, with a sardonic humor he didn't quite feel. Then you can't know anything about the Second World War, or television, or the V-2S, or bikini bathing suits, or the atomic bomb, or... Stop. She had sprung up and retreated around her chair, white-faced. I don't like what you're saying. But. No, please. Jokes that may be quite harmless on the mainland sound different here. I'm really not joking, he said after a moment. She grew quite frantic at that. I can show you all last week's papers. I can show you magazines and other things. I can prove it. She started toward the house. He followed. He felt his heart begin to pound. At the white door she paused, looking worriedly down the road. Jack thought he could hear the faint chug of a motorboat. She pushed open the door and he followed her inside. The small windowed room was dark after the sunlight. Jack got an impression of solid old furniture, a fireplace with brass andirons. Flash! Croaked a gritty voice. After their disastrous break day before yesterday, stocks are recovering. Leading issues. Jack realized that he had started and had involuntarily put his arm around the girl's shoulders. At the same time he noticed that the voice was coming from the curved brown trumpet of an old-fashioned radio loudspeaker. The girl didn't pull away from him. He turned toward her. Although her gray eyes were on him, her attention had gone elsewhere. I can hear the car. They're coming back. They won't like it that you're here. All right, they won't like it. Her agitation grew. No, you must go. I'll come back tomorrow, he heard himself saying. Flash. It looks as if the World Economic Conference may soon adjourn, mouthing jeers at old Uncle Sam who is generally referred to as Uncle Shylock. Jack felt a numbness on his neck. The room seemed to be darkening, the girl growing stranger still. You must go before they see you. Flash. Wiley Post has just completed his solo circuit of the globe, after a record-breaking flight of seven days, eighteen hours and forty-five minutes. Asked how he felt after the energy-draining feat, Post quipped. 
He was halfway across the lawn before he realized the terror into which the grating radio voice had thrown him. He leaped for the branch overhanging the fence, vaulted up with the risky help of a foot on the barbed top. A surprised squirrel, lacking time to make its escape up the trunk, sprang to the ground ahead of him. With terrible suddenness, two steel-jawed semicircles clanked together just over the squirrel's head. Jack landed with one foot to either side of the sprung trap, while the squirrel darted off with a squeak. Jack plunged down the slope to the rocky spine and ran across it, spray from the rising waves spattering him to the waist. Panting now, he stumbled up into the oaks and undergrowth of the first island, fought his way through it, finally reached the silent cove. He loosed the line of the Annie O. Dragged it as near to the cove's mouth as he could, plunged knee-deep in freezing water to give it a final shove, scrambled aboard, snatched up the boat hook and punched at the rocks. As soon as the Annie O was nosing out of the cove into the cross waves, he yanked up the sail. The freshening wind filled it and sent the sloop heeling over, with inches of white water over the lee rail, and plunging ahead. For a long while, Jack was satisfied to think of nothing but the wind and the waves and the sail and speed and danger, to have all his attention taken up balancing one against the other. So that he wouldn't have to ask himself what year it was and whether time was an illusion, and wonder about flappers and hidden traps. When he finally looked back at the island, he was amazed to see how tiny it had grown, as distant as the mainland. Then he saw a grey motorboat astern. He watched it as it slowly overtook him. It was built like a lifeboat, with a sturdy low cabin in the bow and will amidship. Whoever was at the wheel had long grey hair that whipped in the wind. The longer he looked, the surer he was that it was a woman wearing a lace dress. Something that stuck up inches over the cabin flashed darkly beside her. Only when she lifted it to the roof of the cabin did it occur to him that it might be a rifle. But just then the motorboat swung around in a turn that sent waves drenching over it, and headed back toward the island. He watched it for a minute in wonder, then his attention was jolted by an angry hail. Three fishing smacks, also headed toward town, were about to cross his bow. He came around into the wind and waited with shaking sail, watching a man in a lumpy sweater shake a fist at him. Then he turned and gratefully followed the dark, wide, fan-like sterns and age-yellowed sails. Chapter 2 The exterior of Martin Kessrich's home, a weathered white cube with narrow, sharp-paned windows, topped by a cupola, was nothing like its lavish interior. In much the same way, Mrs. Kesserich clashed with the darkly gleaming furniture, Persian rugs and bronze vases around her. Her shapeless black form, poised awkwardly on the edge of a huge sofa, made Jack think of a cow that had strayed into the drawing room. He wondered again how a man like Kesserich had come to marry such a creature. Yet when she lifted up her little eyes from the shadows, he had the uneasy feeling that she knew a great deal about him. The eyes were still those of a domestic animal, but of a wise one that has been watching the house a long, long while from the barnyard. He asked abruptly, Do you know anything of a girl around here named Mary Alice Pope? The silence lasted so long that he began to think she'd gone into some bovine trance. Then, without a word, she got up and went over to a tall cabinet. Feeling on a ledge behind it for a key, she opened a panel, opened a cardboard box inside it, took something from the box and handed him a photograph. He held it up to the failing light and sucked in his breath with surprise. It was a picture of the girl he'd met that afternoon. Same flat bosom dress, flowered rather than white, no bandeau, same beads. Same proud, demure expression, perhaps a bit happier. That is Mary Alice Pope, Mrs. Kesserich said in a strangely flat voice. She was Martin's fiancée. She was killed in a railway accident in 1933. The small sound of the cabinet door closing brought Jack back to reality. He realized that he no longer had the photograph. Against the gloom by the cabinet, Mrs. Kesrich's white face looked at him with what seemed a malicious eagerness. Sit down, she said, and I'll tell you about it. Without a thought as to why she hadn't asked him a single question, he was much too dazed for that, he obeyed. 
Mrs. Keserich resumed her position on the edge of the sofa. You must understand, Mr. Barr, that Mary Alice Pope was the one love of Martin's life. He is a man of very deep and strong feelings, yet as you probably know, anything but kindly or demonstrative. Even when he first came here from Hungary with his older sisters Hani and Hilda, there was a cloak of loneliness about him, or rather about the three of them. Hani and Hilda were athletic outdoor women, yet fiercely proud, I don't imagine they ever spoke to anyone in America except as to a servant, and with a seething distaste for all men except Martin. They showered all their devotion on him. So of course, though Martin didn't realize it, they were consumed with jealousy when he fell in love with Mary Alice Pope. They'd thought that since he'd reached forty without marrying, he was safe. Mary Alice came from a purebred, or as a biologist would say, inbred British stock. She was very young, but very sweet, and up to a point very wise. She sensed Hani and Hilda's feelings right away and did everything she could to win them over. For instance, though she was afraid of horses, she took up horseback riding, because that was Hani and Hilda's favorite pastime. Naturally, Martin knew nothing of her fear, and naturally his sisters knew about it from the first. But, and here is where Mary's wisdom fell short, her brave gesture did not pacify them, it only increased their hatred. Except for his research, Martin was blind to everything but his love. It was a beautiful and yet frightening passion, an insane cherishing as narrow and intense as his sister's hatred. With a start, Jack remembered that it was Mrs. Keserich telling him all this. She went on, Martin's love directed his every move. He was building a home for himself and Mary, and in his mind he was building a wonderful future for them as well, not vaguely, if you know Martin, but year by year, month by month. This winter, he'd plan, they would visit Buenos Aires, next summer they would sail down the inland passage and he would teach Mary Hungarian for their trip to Budapest the year after where he would occupy a chair at the university for a few months, and so on. Finally the time for their marriage drew near. Martin had been away. His research was keeping him very busy. Jack broke in with, wasn't that about the time he did his definitive work on growth and fertilization? Mrs. Keserich nodded with solemn appreciation in the gathering darkness. But now he was coming home, his work done. It was early evening, very chilly, but Hani and Hilda felt they had to ride down to the station to meet their brother. And although she dreaded it, Mary rode with them, for she knew how delighted he would be at her cantering to the puffing train and his running up to lift her down from the saddle to welcome him home. Of course there was Martin's luggage to be considered, so the station wagon had to be sent down for that. She looked defiantly at Jack. I drove the station wagon. I was Martin's laboratory assistant. She paused. It was almost dark, but there was still a white cold line of sky to the west. Hani and Hilda, with Mary between them, were waiting on their horses at the top of the hill that led down to the station. The train had whistled and its headlight was graying the gravel of the crossing. Suddenly Mary's horse squealed and plunged down the hill. Hani and Hilda followed, to try to catch her, they said but they didn't manage that, only kept her horse from veering off. Mary never screamed, but as her horse reared on the tracks, I saw her face in the headlights glare. Martin must have guessed, or at least feared what had happened, for he was out of the train and running along the track before it stopped. In fact, he was the first to kneel down beside Mary, I mean, what had been Mary, and was holding her all bloody and shattered in his arms. A door slammed. There were steps in the hall. Mrs. Keserich stiffened and was silent. Jack turned. The blur of a face hung in the doorway to the hall, a seemingly young, sensitive, suavely handsome face with aristocratic jaw. Then there was a click and the lights flared up and Jack saw the close-cropped gray hair and the lines around the eyes and nostrils, while the sensitive mouth grew sardonic. Yet the handsomeness stayed, and somehow the youth, too, or at least a tremendous inner vibrancy. Hello, Bar, Martin Keserich said, ignoring his wife. 
the great biologist had come home. Chapter 3 Oh, yes, and Jameson had a feeble paper on what he called individualization in marine worms. Barr, have you ever thought much about the larger aspects of the problem of individuality? Jack jumped slightly. He had let his thoughts wander very far. Not especially, sir, he mumbled. The house was still. A few minutes after the professor's arrival, Mrs. Keserich had gone off with an anxious glance at Jack. He knew why and wished he could reassure her that he would not mention their conversation to the professor. Keserich had spent perhaps a half hour briefing him on the more important papers delivered at the conferences. Then, almost as if it were a teacher's trick to show up a pupil's inattention, he had suddenly posed this question about individuality. You know what I mean, of course, Keserich pressed. The factors that make you you, and me me. Heredity and environment, Jack parroted like a freshman. Keserich nodded. Suppose, this is just speculation, that we could control heredity and environment. Then we could recreate the same individual at will. Jack felt a shiver go through him. To get exactly the same pattern of hereditary traits. That'd be far beyond us. What about identical twins? Keserich pointed out. And then there's parthenogenesis to be considered. One might produce a duplicate of the mother without the intervention of the male. Although his voice had grown more idly speculative, Keserich seemed to Jack to be smiling secretly. There are many examples in the lower animal forms, to say nothing of the technique by which Loeb caused a sea urchin to reproduce with no more stimulus than a salt solution. Jack felt the hair rising on his neck. Even then you wouldn't get exactly the same pattern of hereditary traits. Not if the parent were of very pure stock. Not if there were some special technique for selecting ova that would reproduce all the mother's traits. But environment would change things, Jack objected. The duplicate would be bound to develop differently. Is environment so important? Newman tells about a pair of identical twins separated from birth, unaware of each other's existence. They met by accident when they were twenty-one. Each was a telephone repairman. Each had a wife the same age. Each had a baby son. And each had a fox terrier called Trixie. That's without trying to make environment similar. But suppose you did try. Suppose you saw to it that each of them had exactly the same experiences at the same times. For a moment it seemed to Jack that the room was dimming and wavering. Becoming a dark pool in which the only motionless thing was Kesrich's sphinx-like face. Well, we've escaped quite far enough from Jameson's marine worms, the biologist said, all brisk again. He said it as if Jack were the one who had led the conversation down wild and unprofitable channels. Let's get on to your project. I want to talk it over now, because I won't have any time for it tomorrow. Jack looked at him blankly. Tomorrow I must attend to a very important matter, the biologist explained. Chapter 4 Morning sunlight brightened the colors of the wax flowers under glass on the high bureau that always seemed to emit the faint odor of old hair combings. Jack pulled back the diamond-patterned quilt and blinked the sleep from his eyes. He expected his mind to be busy wondering about Keserich and his wife, things said and half said last night, but found instead that his thoughts swung instantly to Mary Alice Pope. As if to a farthest island in a world of people. Downstairs, the house was empty. After a long look at the cabinet, he felt behind it, but the key was gone, he hurried down to the waterfront. He stopped only for a bowl of chowder and, as an afterthought, to buy half a dozen newspapers. The sea was bright, the brisk wind just right for the Annie O. There was eagerness in the way it smacked the sail and in the creak of the mast. And when he reached the cove, it was no longer still but nervous with faint ripples, as if time had finally begun to stir. After the same struggle with the underbrush, he came out on the rocky spine and passed the cove of the sea urchins. The spiny creatures struck an uncomfortable chord in his memory. This time he climbed the second island cautiously, 
scraping the innocent seeming ground ahead of him intently with a boat hook he'd brought along for the purpose. He was only a few yards from the fence when he saw Mary Alice Pope standing behind it. He hadn't realized that his heart would begin to pound or that, at the same time, a shiver of almost supernatural dread would go through him. The girl eyed him with an uneasy hostility and immediately began to speak in a hushed, hurried voice. You must go away at once and never come back. You're a wicked man, but I don't want you to be hurt. I've been watching for you all morning. He tossed the newspapers over the fence. You don't have to read them now, he told her. Just look at the datelines and a few of the headlines. When she finally lifted her eyes to his again, she was trembling. She tried unsuccessfully to speak. Listen to me, he said. You've been the victim of a scheme to make you believe you were born around 1916 instead of 1933, and that it's 1933 now instead of 1951. I'm not sure why it's been done, though I think I know who you really are. But, the girl faltered, my aunts tell me it's 1933. They would. And there are the papers, the magazines, the radio. The papers are old ones. The radio's faked, some sort of recording. I could show you if I could get at it. These papers might be faked, she said, pointing to where she'd let them drop on the ground. They're new, he said. Only old papers get yellow. But why would they do it to me? Why? Come with me to the mainland, Mary. That'll set you straight quicker than anything. I couldn't, she said, drawing back. He's coming tonight. He? The man who sends me the boxes, and my life. Jack shivered. When he spoke, his voice was rough and quick. A life that's completely a lie, that's cut you off from the world. Come with me, Mary. She looked up at him wonderingly. For perhaps ten seconds the silence held and the spell of her eerie sweetness deepened. I love you, Mary, Jack said softly. She took a step back. Really, Mary, I do. She shook her head. I don't know what's true. Go away. Mary, he pleaded, read the papers I've given you. Think things through. I'll wait for you here. You can't. My aunts would find you. Then I'll go away and come back. About sunset. Will you give me an answer? She looked at him. Suddenly she whirled around. He, too, heard the chuff of the Essex. They'll find us, she said. And if they find you, I don't know what they'll do. Quick, run. And she darted off herself, only to turn back to scramble for the papers. But will you give me an answer, he pressed. She looked frantically up from the papers. I don't know. You mustn't risk coming back. I will, no matter what you say. I can't promise. Please go. Just one question, he begged. What are your aunt's names? Hani and Hilda, she told him, and then she was gone. The hedge shook where she darted through. Jack hesitated, then started for the cove. He thought for a moment of staying on the island, but decided against it. He could probably conceal himself successfully, but whoever found his boat would have him at a disadvantage. Besides, there were things he must try to find out on the mainland. As he entered the oaks, his spine tightened for a moment, as if someone were watching him. He hurried to the rippling cove, wasted no time getting the Annie O underway. With the wind still in the west, he knew it would be a hard sail. He'd need half a dozen tacks to reach the mainland. When he was about a quarter of a mile out from the cove, there was a sharp smack beside him. He jerked around, heard a distant crack and saw a foot-long splinter of fresh wood dangling from the edge of the sloop's cockpit, about a foot from his head. He felt his skin tighten. He was the bullseye of a great watery target. All the air between him and the island was tainted with menace. Water splashed a yard from the side. There was another distant crack. He lay on his back in the cockpit, steering by the sail, 
taking advantage of what little cover there was. There were several more cracks. After the second, there was a hole in the sail. Finally Jack looked back. The island was more than a mile astern. He anxiously scanned the sea ahead for craft. There were none. Then he settled down to nurse more speed from the sloop and wait for the motorboat. But it didn't come out to follow him. Chapter 5 Same as yesterday, Mrs. Keserich was sitting on the edge of the couch in the living room, yet from the first Jack was aware of a great change. Something had filled the domestic animal with grief and fury. Where's Dyar? Keserich, he asked. Not here. Mrs. Keserich, he said, dropping down beside her, you were telling me something yesterday when we were interrupted. She looked at him. You have found the girl, she almost shouted. Yes, Jack was surprised into answering. A look of slyness came into Mrs. Keserich's bovine face. Then I'll tell you everything. I can now. When Martin found Mary dying, he didn't go to pieces. You know how controlled he can be when he chooses. He lifted Mary's body as if the crowd and the railway men weren't there, and carried it to the station wagon. Hani and Hilda were sitting on their horses nearby. He gave them one look. It was as if he had said, murderers. He told me to drive home as fast as I dared, but when I got there, he stayed sitting by Mary in the back. I knew he must have given up what hope he had for her life, or else she was dead already. I looked at him. In the dome light, his face had the most deadly and proud expression I've ever seen on a man. I worshipped him, you know, though he had never shown me one ounce of feeling. So I was completely unprepared for the naked appeal in his voice. Yet all he said at first was, Will you do something for me? I told him, surely, and as we carried Mary in, he told me the rest. He wanted me to be the mother of Mary's child. Jack stared at her blankly. Mrs. Keserich nodded. He wanted to remove an ovum from Mary's body and nurture it in mine, so that Mary, in a way, could live on. But that's impossible. Jack objected. The technique is being tried now on cattle, I know, so that a prize heifer can have several calves a year, all nurtured in scrub heifers, as they're called. But no one's ever dreamed of trying it on human beings. Mrs. Keserich looked at him contemptuously. Martin had mastered the technique twenty years ago. He was willing to take the chance. And so was I, partly because he fired my scientific imagination and reverence, but mostly because he said he would marry me. He barred the doors. We worked swiftly. As far as anyone was concerned, Martin, in a wild fit of grief, had locked himself up for several hours to mourn over the body of his fiancée. Within a month we were married, and I finally gave birth to the child. Jack shook his head. You gave birth to your own child. She smiled bitterly. No, it was Mary's. Martin did not keep his whole bargain with me, I was nothing more than his scrub wife, in every way. You think you gave birth to Mary's child? Mrs. Keserich turned on Jack in anger. I've been wounded by him, day in and day out, for years, but I've never failed to recognize his genius. Besides, you've seen the girl, haven't you? Jack had to nod. What confounded him most was that, granting the near-impossible physiological feat Mrs. Keserich had described, the girl should look so much like the mother. Mothers and daughters don't look that much alike, only identical twins did. With a thrill of fear, he remembered Keserich's casual words, parthenogenesis, pure stock, special techniques. Very well, he forced himself to say. Granting that the child was Mary's and Martin's. No. Mary's alone. Jack suppressed a shudder. He continued quickly, what became of the child? Mrs. Keserich lowered her head. The day it was born, it was taken away from me. After that, I never saw Hilda and Hani, either. You mean, Jack asked, that Martin sent them away to bring up the child? Mrs. Keserich turned away. Yes. 
Jack asked incredulously, he trusted the child with the two people he suspected of having caused the mother's death? Once when I was his assistant, Mrs. Keserich said softly, I carelessly broke some laboratory glassware. He kept me up all night building a new setup, though I'm rather poor at working with glass and usually get burned. Bringing up the child was his sister's punishment. And they went to that house on the farthest island? I suppose it was the house he'd been building for Mary and himself. Yes. And they were to bring up the child as his daughter? Mrs. Keserich started up, but when she spoke it was as if she had to force out each word. As his wife, as soon as she was grown. How can you know that? Jack asked shakily. The rising wind rattled the windowpane. Because today, eighteen years after, Martin broke all of his promise to me. He told me he was leaving me. Chapter 6 White waves shooting up like dancing ghosts in the moon sketched, spray swept dark were Jack's first beacon of the island and brought a sense of physical danger. Breaking the trance like yet frantic mood he had felt ever since he had spoken with Mrs. Keserich. Coming around farther into the wind, he scudded past the end of the island into the choppy sea on the landward side. A little later he let down the reefed sail in the cove of the sea urchins, where the water was barely moving. Although the air was shaken by the pounding of the surf on the spine between the two islands. After making fast, he paused a moment for a scrap of cloud to pass the moon. The thought of the spiny creatures in the black fathoms under the Annie O sent an odd quiver of terror through him. The moon came out and he started across the glistening rocks of the spine. But he had forgotten the rising tide. Midway, a wave clamped around his ankles, tried to carry him off, almost made him drop the heavy object he was carrying. Sprawling and drenched, he clung to the rough rock until the surge was past. Making it finally up to the fence, he snipped a wide gate with the wire cutters. The windows of the house were alight. Hardly aware of his shivering, he crossed the lawn, slipping from one clump of shrubbery to another, until he reached one just across the drive from the doorway. At that moment he heard the approaching chuff of the Essex, the door of the cottage opened, and Mary Alice Pope stepped out, closely followed by Hani or Hilda. Jack shrank close to the shrubbery. Mary looked pale and blank-faced, as if she had retreated within herself. He was acutely conscious of the inadequacy of his screen as the ghostly headlights of the Essex began to probe through the leaves. But then he sensed that something more was about to happen than just the car arriving. It was a change in the expression of the face behind Mary that gave him the cue, a widening and sidewise flickering of the cold eyes, the puckered lips thinning into a cruel smile. The Essex shifted into second and, without any warning, accelerated. Simultaneously, the woman behind Mary gave her a violent shove. But at almost exactly the same instant, Jack ran. He caught Mary as she sprawled toward the gravel, and lunged ahead without checking. The Essex bore down upon them, a square snout, roaring monster. It swerved viciously, missed them by inches, threw up gravel in a skid, and rocked to a stop, stalled. The first, incredulous voice that broke the pulsing silence, Jack recognized as Martin Keserich's. It came from the car, which was slewed around so that it almost faced Jack and Mary. Honey, you tried to kill her. You and Hilda tried to kill her again. The woman slumped over the wheel slowly lifted her head. In the indistinct light, she looked the twin of the woman behind Jack and Mary. Did you really think we wouldn't? she asked in a voice that spat with passion. Did you actually believe that Hilda and I would serve this eighteen years penance just to watch you go off with her? She began to laugh wildly. You've never understood your sisters at all. Suddenly she broke off, stiffly stepped down from the car. Lifting her skirts a little, she strode past Jack and Mary. Martin Keserich followed her. In passing, he said, Thanks, Bar. It occurred to Jack that Keserich made no more question of his appearance on the island than of his presence in the laboratory. Like Mrs. Keserich, the great biologist took him for granted. Keserich stopped a few feet short of Hani and Hilda. 
Without shrinking from him, the sisters drew closer together. They looked like two gaunt hawks. But you waited eighteen years, he said. You could have killed her at any time, yet you chose to throw away so much of your lives just to have this moment. How do you know we didn't like waiting eighteen years? Hani answered him. Why shouldn't we want to make as strong an impression on you as anyone? And as for throwing our lives away, that was your doing. Oh, Martin, you'll never know anything about how your sisters feel. He raised his hands baffledly. Even assuming that you hate me, at the word, hate, both Hani and Hilda laughed softly, and that you were prepared to strike at both my love and my work, still. That you should have waited. Hani and Hilda said nothing. Keserich shrugged. Very well, he said in a voice that had lost all its tension. You've wasted a third of a lifetime looking forward to an irrational revenge. And you've failed. That should be sufficient punishment. Very slowly, he turned around and for the first time looked at Mary. His face was clearly revealed by the twin beams from the stalled car. Jack grew cold. He fought against accepting the feelings of wonder, of poignant triumph, of love, of renewed youth he saw entering the face in the headlights. But most of all he fought against the sense that Martin Keserich was successfully drawing them all back into the past, to 1933 and another accident. There was a distant hoot and Jack shook. For a moment he had thought it a railway whistle and not a ship's horn. The biologist said tenderly, Come, Mary. Jack's trembling arm tightened a trifle on Mary's waist. He could feel her trembling. Come, Mary, Keserich repeated. Still she didn't reply. Jack wet his lips. Mary isn't going with you, Professor, he said. Quiet, Bar, Keserich ordered absently. Mary, it is necessary that you and I leave the island at once. Please come. But Mary isn't coming. Jack repeated. Keserich looked at him for the first time. I'm grateful to you for the unusual sense of loyalty, or whatever motive it may have been, that led you to follow me out here tonight. And of course I'm profoundly grateful to you for saving Mary's life. But I must ask you not to interfere further in a matter which you can't possibly understand. He turned to Mary. I know how shocked and frightened you must feel. Living two lives and then having to face two deaths, it must be more terrible than anyone can realize. I expected this meeting to take place under very different circumstances. I wanted to explain everything to you very naturally and gently, like the messages I've sent you every day of your second life. Unfortunately, that can't be. You and I must leave the island right now. Mary stared at him, then turned wonderingly toward Jack who felt his heart begin to pound warmly. You still don't understand what I'm trying to tell you, Professor, he said, boldly now. Mary is not going with you. You've deceived her all her life. You've taken a fantastic amount of pains to bring her up under the delusion that she is Mary Alice Pope, who died in. She is Mary Alice Pope, Keserich thundered at him. He advanced toward them swiftly. Mary darling, you're confused, but you must realize who you are and who I am and the relationship between us. Keep away, Jack warned, swinging Mary half behind him. Mary doesn't love you. She can't marry you, at any rate. How could she, when you're her father? Bar. Keep off. Jack shot out the flat of his hand and Keserich went staggering backward. I've talked with your wife, your wife on the mainland. She told me the whole thing. Keserich seemed about to rush forward again, then controlled himself. You've got everything wrong. You hardly deserve to be told, but under the circumstances I have no choice. Mary is not my daughter. To be precise, she has no father at all. Do you remember the work that Jacques Loeb did with sea urchins? Jack frowned angrily. You mean what we were talking about last night? Exactly. Loeb was able to cause the egg of a sea urchin to develop normally without union with a male germ cell. I have done the same thing with a human being. This girl is Mary Alice Pope. 
she has exactly the same heredity. She has had exactly the same life, so far as it could be reconstructed. She's heard and read the same things at exactly the same times. There have been the old newspapers, the books, even the old recorded radio programs. Hani and Hilda have had their daily instructions, to the letter. She's retraced the same time trail. Rot. Jack interrupted. I don't for a moment believe what you say about her birth. She's Mary's daughter, or the daughter of your wife on the mainland. And as for retracing the same time trail, that's senile self-delusion. Mary Alice Pope had a normal life. This girl has been brought up in cruel imprisonment by two insane, vindictive old women. In your own frustrated desire, you've pretended to yourself that you've recreated the girl you lost. You haven't. You couldn't. Nobody could, the great Martin Keserich or anyone else. Keserich, his features working, shifted his point of attack. Who are you, Mary? Don't answer him, Jack said. He's trying to confuse you. Who are you? Keserich insisted. Mary Alice Pope, she said rapidly in a breathy whisper before Jack could speak again. And when were you born? Keserich pressed on. You've been tricked all your life about that, Jack warned. But already the girl was saying, in 1916. And who am I then? Keserich demanded eagerly. Who am I? The girl swayed. She brushed her head with her hand. It's so strange, she said, with a dreamy, almost laughing throb in her voice that turned Jack's heart cold. I'm sure I've never seen you before in my life, and yet it's as if I'd known you forever. As if you were closer to me then. Stop it. Jack shouted at Keserich. Mary loves me. She loves me because I've shown her the lie her life has been, and because she's coming away with me now. Aren't you, Mary? He swung her around so that her blank face was inches from his own. It's me you love, isn't it, Mary? She blinked doubtfully. At that moment Keserich charged at them, went sprawling as Jack's fist shot out. Jack swept up Mary and ran with her across the lawn. Behind him he heard an agonized cry, Keserich's, and cruel, mounting laughter from Hani and Hilda. Once through the ragged doorway in the fence, he made his way more slowly, gasping. Out of the shelter of the trees, the wind tore at them and the ocean roared. Moonlight glistened, now on the spine of black wet rocks, now on the foaming surf. Jack realized that the girl in his arms was speaking rapidly, disjointedly, but he couldn't quite make out the sense of the words and then they were lost in the crash of the surf. She struggled, but he told himself that it was only because she was afraid of the menacing waters. He pushed recklessly into the breaking surf, raced gasping across the middle of the spine as the rocks uncovered, sprang to the higher ones as the next wave crashed behind. Showering them with spray. His chest burning with exertion, he carried the girl the few remaining yards to where the Annie O was tossing. A sudden great gust of wind almost did what the waves had failed to do, but he kept his footing and lowered the girl into the boat, then jumped in after. She stared at him wildly. What's that? He, too, had caught the faint shout. Looking back along the spine just as the moon came clear again, he saw white spray rise and fall and then the figure of Keserich stumbling through it. Mary, wait for me. The figure was halfway across when it lurched, started forward again, then was jerked back as if something had caught its ankle. Out of the darkness, the next wave sent a line of white at it neck high, crashed. Jack hesitated, but another great gust of wind tore at the half-raised sail, and it was all he could do to keep the sloop from capsizing and head her into the wind again. Mary was tugging at his shoulder. You must help him, she was saying. He's caught in the rocks. He heard a voice crying, screaming crazily above the surf. Ah, love, let us be true. To one another. For the world. The sloop rocked. Jack had it finally headed into the wind. He looked around for Mary. She had jumped out and was hurrying back 
scrambling across the rocks toward the dark, struggling figure that even as he watched was once more engulfed in the surf. Letting go the lines, Jack sprang toward the stern of the sloop. But just then another giant blow came, struck the sail like a great fist of air, and sent the boom slashing at the back of his head. His last recollection was being toppled out onto the rocks and wondering how he could cling to them while unconscious. Chapter 7 The little cove was once again as quiet as time's heart. Once again the Annie O was a sloop embedded in a mirror. Once again the rocks were warm underfoot. Jack Barr lifted his fiercely aching head and looked at the distant line of the mainland, as tiny and yet as clear as something viewed through the wrong end of a telescope. He was very tired. Searching the island, in his present shaky condition, had taken all the strength out of him. He looked at the peacefully rippling sea outside the cove and thought of what a churning pot it had been during the storm. He thought wonderingly of his rescue, a man wedged unconscious between two rock teeth, kept somehow from being washed away by the merest chance. He thought of Mrs. Kesserich sitting alone in her house, scanning the newspapers that had nothing to tell. He thought of the empty island behind him and the vanished motorboat. He wondered if the sea had pulled down Martin Kesserich and Mary Alice Pope. He wondered if only Hani and Hilda had sailed away. He winced, remembering what he had done to Martin and Mary by his blundering infatuation. In his way, he told himself, he had been as bad as the two old women. He thought of death, and of time, and of love that defies them. He stepped limpingly into the Annie O to set sail, and realized that philosophy is only for the unhappy. Mary was asleep in the stern. A bad day for sails. The big bright doors of the office building parted with a pneumatic whoosh and Roby glided onto Times Square. The crowd that had been watching the fifty-foot-tall girl on the clothing billboard get dressed, or reading the latest news about the hot truce scrawl itself in yard-high script, hurried to look. Roby was still a novelty. Roby was fun. For a little while yet, he could steal the show. But the attention did not make Roby proud. He had no more emotions than the pink plastic giantess, who dressed and undressed endlessly whether there was a crowd or the street was empty, and who never once blinked her blue mechanical eyes. But she merely drew business while Roby went out after it. For Roby was the logical conclusion of the development of vending machines. All the earlier ones had stood in one place, on a floor or hanging on a wall, and blankly delivered merchandise in return for coins, whereas Roby searched for customers. He was the demonstration model of a line of sales robots to be manufactured by Schuler vending machines. Provided the public invested enough in stocks to give the company capital to go into mass production. The publicity Roby drew stimulated investments handsomely. It was amusing to see the TV and newspaper coverage of Roby selling, but not a fraction as much fun as being approached personally by him. Those who were usually bought anywhere from one to five hundred shares. If they had any money and foresight enough to see that sales robots would eventually be on every street and highway in the country. Roby radared the crowd, found that it surrounded him solidly, and stopped. With a carefully built-in sense of timing, he waited for the tension and expectation to mount before he began talking. Say, Ma, he doesn't look like a robot at all, a child said. He looks like a turtle. Which was not completely inaccurate. The lower part of Roby's body was a metal hemisphere hemmed with sponge rubber and not quite touching the sidewalk. The upper was a metal box with black holes in it. The box could swivel and duck. A chromium bright hoop skirt with a turret on top. Reminds me too much of the little Joe Para tanks, a legless veteran of the Persian War muttered, and rapidly rolled himself away on wheels rather like Roby's. His departure made it easier for some of those who knew about Roby to open a path in the crowd. Roby headed straight for the gap. The crowd hooped. Roby glided very slowly down the path, deftly jogging aside whenever he got too close to ankles in Skylon or Sakassans. The rubber buffer on his hoop skirt was merely an added safeguard. The boy who had called Roby a turtle jumped in the middle of the path and stood his ground, 
grinning foxily. Roby stopped two feet short of him. The turret ducked. The crowd got quiet. Hello, youngster, Roby said in a voice that was smooth as that of a TV star, and was, in fact, a recording of one. The boy stopped smiling. Hello, he whispered. How old are you? Roby asked. Nine. No, eight. That's nice, Roby observed. A metal arm shot down from his neck, stopped just short of the boy. The boy jerked back. For you, Roby said. The boy gingerly took the red polylop from the neatly fashioned blunt metal claws, and began to unwrap it. Nothing to say, asked Roby. Uh, thank you. After a suitable pause, Roby continued. And how about a nice refreshing drink of poppy pop to go with your polylop? The boy lifted his eyes, but didn't stop licking the candy. Roby waggled his claws slightly. Just give me a quarter and within five seconds. A little girl wriggled out of the forest of legs. Give me a polylop, too, Roby, she demanded. Rita, come back here, a woman in the third rank of the crowd called angrily. Roby scanned the newcomer gravely. His reference silhouettes were not good enough to let him distinguish the sex of children, so he merely repeated, Hello, youngster. Rita. Give me a polylop. Disregarding both remarks, for a good salesman is single-minded and does not waste bait, Roby said winningly, I'll bet you read Junior Space Killers. Now I have here. Uh uh, I'm a girl. He got a polylop. At the word, girl, Roby broke off. Rather ponderously, he said, I'll bet you read G. G. Jones, Space Stripper. Now I have here the latest issue of that thrilling comic, not yet in the stationary vending machines. Just give me fifty cents and within five. Please let me through. I'm her mother. A young woman in the front rank drawled over her powder-sprayed shoulder, I'll get her for you, and slithered out on six-inch platform shoes. Run away, children, she said nonchalantly. Lifting her arms behind her head, she pirouetted slowly before Roby to show how much she did for her bolero half-jacket and her form-fitting slacks that melted into Skylon just above the knees. The little girl glared at her. She ended the pirouette in profile. At this age level, Roby's reference silhouettes permitted him to distinguish sex, though with occasional amusing and embarrassing miscalls. He whistled admiringly. The crowd cheered. Someone remarked critically to a friend, it would go over better if he was built more like a real robot. You know, like a man. The friend shook his head. This way it's subtler. No one in the crowd was watching the new script overhead as it scribbled, ice pack for hot truce. Vanadin hints Russ may yield on Pakistan. Roby was saying, in the savage new glamour tint we have christened Mars blood, complete with spray applicator and fit all finger stalls that mask each finger completely except for the nail. Just give me five dollars, uncrumpled bills may be fed into the revolving rollers you see beside my arm, and within five seconds. No, thanks, Roby, the young woman yawned. Remember, Roby persisted, for three more weeks, seductivizing Mars blood will be unobtainable from any other robot or human vendor. No, thanks. Roby scanned the crowd resourcefully. Is there any gentleman here, he began just as a woman elbowed her way through the front rank. I told you to come back, she snapped at the little girl. But I didn't get my polylop. Who would care to? Rita. Roby cheated. Ow. Meanwhile, the young woman in the half bolero had scanned the nearby gentleman on her own. Deciding that there was less than a 50% chance of any of them accepting the proposition Roby seemed about to make. She took advantage of the scuffle to slither gracefully back into the ranks. Once again the path was clear before Roby. He paused, however, for a brief recapitulation of the more magical properties of Mars' blood, including a telling phrase about the passionate claws of a Martian sunrise. But no one bought. It wasn't quite time. 
soon enough silver coins would be clinking, bills going through the rollers faster than laundry. And 500 people struggling for the privilege of having their money taken away from them by America's first mobile sales robot. But there were still some tricks that Roby had to do free, and one certainly should enjoy those before starting the more expensive fun. So Roby moved on until he reached the curb. The variation in level was instantly sensed by his underscanners. He stopped. His head began to swivel. The crowd watched in eager silence. This was Roby's best trick. Roby's head stopped swiveling. His scanners had found the traffic light. It was green. Roby edged forward. But then the light turned red. Roby stopped again, still on the curb. The crowd softly awed its delight. It was wonderful to be alive and watching Roby on such an exciting day. Alive and amused in the fresh, weather-controlled air between the lines of bright skyscrapers with their winking windows and under a sky so blue you could almost call it dark. But way, way up, where the crowd could not see, the sky was darker still. Purple dark, with stars showing. And in that purple dark, a silver-green something, the color of a bud, plunged down at better than three miles a second. The silver-green was a newly developed paint that foiled radar. Roby was saying, while we wait for the light, there's time for you youngsters to enjoy a nice refreshing poppy pop. Or for you adults, only those over five feet tall are eligible to buy, to enjoy an exciting poppy pop fizz. Just give me a quarter or, in the case of adults, one dollar and a quarter. I'm licensed to dispense intoxicating liquors, and within five seconds. But that was not cutting it quite fine enough. Just three seconds later, the silver-green bud bloomed above Manhattan into a globular orange flower. The skyscrapers grew brighter and brighter still, the brightness of the inside of the sun. The windows winked blossoming white fire flowers. The crowd around Roby bloomed, too. Their clothes puffed into petals of flame. Their heads of hair were torches. The orange flower grew, stem and blossom. The blast came. The winking windows shattered tier by tier, became black holes. The walls bent, rocked, cracked. A stony dandruff flaked from their cornices. The flaming flowers on the sidewalk were all leveled at once. Roby was shoved ten feet. His metal hoopskirt dimpled, regained its shape. The blast ended. The orange flower, grown vast, vanished overhead on its huge, magic beanstalk. It grew dark and very still. The cornice dandruff pattered down. A few small fragments rebounded from the metal hoopskirt. Roby made some small, uncertain movements, as if feeling for broken bones. He was hunting for the traffic light, but it no longer shone either red or green. He slowly scanned a full circle. There was nothing anywhere to interest his reference silhouettes. Yet whenever he tried to move, his underscanners warned him of low obstructions. It was very puzzling. The silence was disturbed by moans and a crackling sound, as faint at first as the scampering of distant rats. A seared man, his charred clothes fuming where the blast had blown out the fire, rose from the curb. Roby scanned him. Good day, sir, Roby said. Would you care for a smoke? A truly cool smoke? Now I have here a yet unmarketed brand. But the customer had run away, screaming, and Roby never ran after customers, though he could follow them at a medium brisk roll. He worked his way along the curb where the man had sprawled, carefully keeping his distance from the low obstructions, some of which writhed now and then, forcing him to jog. Shortly he reached a fire hydrant. He scanned it. His electronic vision, though it still worked, had been somewhat blurred by the blast. Hello, youngster, Roby said. Then, after a long pause, Cat got your tongue? Well, I have a little present for you. A nice, lovely polylop. Take it, youngster, he said after another pause. It's for you. Don't be afraid. 
His attention was distracted by other customers, who began to rise up oddly here and there, twisting forms that confused his reference silhouettes and would not stay to be scanned properly. One cried, water, but no quarter clinked in Roby's claws when he caught the word and suggested, how about a nice refreshing drink of poppy pop? The rat crackling of the flames had become a jungle muttering. The blind windows began to wink fire again. A little girl marched, stepping neatly over arms and legs she did not look at. A white dress and the once taller bodies around her had shielded her from the brilliance and the blast. Her eyes were fixed on Roby. In them was the same imperious confidence, though none of the delight, with which she had watched him earlier. Help me, Roby, she said. I want my mother. Hello, youngster, Roby said. What would you like? Comics? Candy? Where is she, Roby? Take me to her. Balloons? Would you like to watch me blow up a balloon? The little girl began to cry. The sound triggered off another of Roby's novelty circuits, a service feature that had brought in a lot of favorable publicity. Is something wrong? he asked. Are you in trouble? Are you lost? Yes, Roby. Take me to my mother. Stay right here, Roby said reassuringly, and don't be frightened. I will call a policeman. He whistled shrilly, twice. Time passed. Roby whistled again. The windows flared and roared. The little girl begged, Take me away, Roby, and jumped onto a little step in his hoop skirt. Give me a dime, Roby said. The little girl found one in her pocket and put it in his claws. Your weight, Roby said, is fifty-four and one-half pounds. Have you seen my daughter, have you seen her? A woman was crying somewhere. I left her watching that thing while I stepped inside, Rita. Roby helped me, the little girl began babbling at her. He knew I was lost. He even called the police, but they didn't come. He weighed me, too. Didn't you, Roby? But Roby had gone off to peddle Poppy Pop to the members of a rescue squad which had just come around the corner, more robot-like in their asbestos suits than he in his metal skin. Friends and enemies. The sun hadn't quite risen, but now that the five men were out from under the trees it already felt hot. Far ahead, off to the left of the road, the spires of New Angeles gleamed dusky blue against the departing night. The two unarmed men gazed back wistfully at the little town, dark and asleep under its moist leafy umbrellas. The one who was thin and had hair flecked with gray looked all intellect. The other, young and with a curly mop, looked all feeling. The fat man barring their way back to town mopped his head. The two young men flanking him with shotgun and squirt gun hadn't started to sweat yet. The fat man stuffed the big handkerchief back in his pocket, wiped his hands on his shirt, rested his wrists lightly on the pistols holstered either side his stomach, looked at the two unarmed men. Indicated the hot road with a nod, and said, There's your way, professors. Get going. The thin man looked at the hand smears on the fat man's shirt. But you haven't even explained to me, he protested softly, why I'm being turned out of Ozona College. Look here, Mr. Ellenby, I've tried to make it easy for you, the fat man said. I'm doing it before the town wakes up. Would you rather be chased by a mob? But why? Because we found out you weren't just a math teacher, Mr. Ellenby. The fat man's voice went hard. You'd been a physicist once. Nuclear physicist. The young man with the shotgun spat. Ellenby watched the spittle curl in the dust like a little brown worm. He shifted his gaze to a dead eucalyptus leaf. I'd like to talk to the college board of regents, he said tonelessly. I'm the board of regents, the fat man told him. Didn't you even know that? At this point the other unarmed man spoke up loudly. But that doesn't explain my case. I've devoted my whole life to warning people against physicists and other scientists. How they'd smash us with their bombs. How they were destroying our minds with 3D and telefax and handies. 
how they were blaspheming against nature, killing all imagination, crushing all beauty out of life. I'd shut my mouth if I were you, Madsen, the fat man said critically, or at least lower my voice. When I mentioned a mob, I wasn't fooling. I saw them burn Caltech. In fact, I got a bit excited and helped. The young man with the shotgun grinned. Caltech, Ellenby murmured, his eyes growing distant. Caltech burns and Ozona stands. Ozona stands for the decencies of life, the fat man grated, not alphabet bombs and pituitary gas. Its purpose is to save a town, not help kill a world. But why should I be driven out? Madsen persisted. I'm just a poet singing the beauties of the simple life unmarred by science. Not simple enough for Ozona, the fat man snorted. We happen to know, Mr. Poet Madsen, that you've written some stories about free love. We don't want anyone telling Ozona girls it's all right to be careless. But those were just ideas, ideas in a story, Madsen protested. I wasn't advocating. No difference, the fat man cut him short. Talk to a woman about ideas and pretty soon she gets some. His voice became almost kindly. Look here, if you wanted a woman without getting hitched to her, why didn't you go to Shantytown? Madsen squared his shoulders. You've missed the whole point. I'd never do such a thing. I never have. Then you shouldn't have boasted, the fat man said. And you shouldn't have fooled around with Councilman Classen's daughter. At the name, Ellenby came out of his trance and looked sharply at Madsen, who said indignantly, I wasn't fooling around with Vera Ellen, whatever her crazy father says. She came to my office because she has poetic ability and I wanted to encourage it. Yeah, so she'd encourage you, the fat man finished. That girl's wild enough already, which I suppose is what you mean by poetic ability. And in this town, her father's word counts. He hitched up his belt. And now, professors, it's time you started. Madsen and Ellenby looked at each other doubtfully. The young man with the squirt gun raised its acid-etched muzzle. The fat man looked hard at Madsen and Ellenby. I think I hear alarm clocks going off, he said quietly. They watched the two men trudge a hundred yards, watched Ellenby shift the rolled-up towel under his elbow to the other side. Watched Madsen pause to thumb tobacco into a pipe and glance carelessly back, then shove the pipe in his pocket and go on hurriedly. Couple of pretty harmless coots, if you ask me, the young man with the shotgun observed. Sure, the fat man agreed, but we got to remember people's feelings and keep Ozona straight. We don't like mobs or fear or girls gone wild. The young man with the shotgun grinned. That Vera Ellen, he murmured, shaking his head. You better keep your mind off her too, the fat man said sourly. She's wild enough without anybody to encourage her poetic ability or anything else. It's a good thing we gave those two their walking papers. They'll probably walk right into the arms of the Harvey gang, the young man with the squirt gun remarked, especially if they try to shortcut. Pretty small pickings for Harvey, those two, the young man with the shotgun countered. Which won't please him at all. The fat man shrugged. Their own fault. If only they'd had sense enough to keep their mouths shut. Early in life. They don't seem to realize it's 1993, said the young man with the shotgun. The fat man nodded. Come on, he said, turning back toward the town and the coolness. We've done our duty. The young man with the squirt gun took a last look. There they go, art and science, he observed with satisfaction. Those two subjects always did make my head ache. On the hot road Madsen began to stride briskly. His nostrils flared. Smell the morning air, he commanded. It's good, good. Ellenby, matching his stride with longer if older legs, looked at him with mild wonder. Smell the hot sour grass, Madsen continued. It's things like this man was meant for, not machines and formulas. Look at the dew. Have you seen the dew in years? 
look at it on that spider web. The physicist paused obediently to observe the softly twinkling strands. Perfect catenaries, he murmured. What? A kind of curve, Ellenby explained. The locus of the focus of a parabola rolling on a straight line. Locus focus hocus pocus. Madsen snorted. Reducing the wonders of nature to chalk marks. It's disgusting. Suddenly each tiny drop of dew turned blood red. Ellenby turned his back on the spiderweb, whipped a crooked little brass tube from an inside pocket and squinted through it. What's that? Madsen asked. Spectroscope, Ellenby explained. Early morning spectra of the sun are fascinating. Madsen huffed. There you go. Analyzing. Tearing beauty apart. It's a disease. He paused. Say, won't you hurt your eyes? Turning back, Ellenby shook his head. I keep a smoked glass on it, he said. I'm always hoping that someday I'll get a glimpse of an atomic bomb explosion. You mean to say you've missed all the dozens they dropped on this country? That's too bad. The ball of fire's quite fleeting. The opportunities haven't been as good as you think. But you're a physicist, aren't you? Don't you people have all sorts of lovely photographs to gloat over in your laboratories? Atomic bomb spectra were never declassified, Ellenby told him wistfully. At least not in my part of the project. I've never seen one. Well, you'll probably get your chance, Madsen told him harshly. If you've been reading your dirty telefax, you'll know the hot truce is coming to a boil. And the Angeles area will be a prime target. Ellenby nodded mutely. They trudged on. The sun began to beat on their backs like an open fire. Ellenby turned up his collar. He watched his companion thoughtfully. Finally he said, so you're the Madsen who wrote those enemies of science stories about a world ruled by poets. It never occurred to me back at Ozona. And that non-fiction book about us, what was it called? Murderers of Imagination, Madsen growled. And it would have been a good thing if you'd listened to my warnings instead of going on building machines and dissecting nature and destroying all the lovely myths that make life worthwhile. Are you sure that nature is so lovely and kind? Ellenby ventured. Madsen did not deign to answer. They passed a crossroad leading, the battered sign said, one way to Palmdale, the other to San Bernardino. They were perhaps a hundred yards beyond it when Ellenby let go a little chuckle. I have a confession to make. When I was very young I wrote an article about how children shouldn't be taught the Santa Claus myth or any similar fictions. Madsen laughed sardonically. A perfect member of your dry soul tribe. Worrying about Santa Claus, when all the while something very different was about to come flying down from over the North Pole and land on our housetops. We did try to warn people about the intercontinental missiles, Ellenby reminded him. Yes, without any success. The last two reindeer, Donner and Blitzen. Ellenby nodded glumly but he couldn't keep a smile off his face for long. I wrote another article too, it was never published, about how poetry is completely pointless, how rhymes inevitably distort meanings, and so on. Madsen whirled on him with a peal of laughter. So you even thought you were big enough to wreck poetry? He jerked a limp, thinnish volume from his coat pocket. You thought you could destroy this? Ellenby's expression changed. He reached for the book, but Madsen held it away from him. Ellenby said, that's Keats, isn't it? How would you know? Ellenby hesitated. Oh, I got to like some of his poetry, quite a while after I wrote the article. He paused again and looked squarely at Madsen. Also, Vera Ellen was reading me some pieces out of that volume. I guess you'd loaned it to her. Vera Ellen? Madsen's jaw dropped. Ellenby nodded. She had trouble with her geometry. Some conferences were necessary. He smiled. We physicists aren't such a dry soul tribe, you know. Madsen looked outraged. Why, you're old enough to be her father. 
or her husband, Ellenby replied coolly. Young women are often attracted to father images. But all that can't make any difference to us now. You're right, Matson said shortly. He shoved the poetry volume back in his pocket, flirted the sweat out of his eyes, and looked around with impatience. Say, you're going to New Angeles, aren't you? He asked, and when Ellenby nodded uncertainly, said, then let's cut across the fields. This road is taking us out of our way. And without waiting for a reply he jumped across the little ditch to the left of the road and into the yellowing wheat field. Ellenby watched him for a moment, then hitched his rolled towel further up under his arm and followed. It was stifling in the field. The wheat seemed to paralyze any stray breezes. Their boots hissed against the dry stems. Far off they heard a lazy drumming. After a while they came to a wide, brimful irrigation ditch. They could see that some hundreds of feet ahead it was crossed by a little bridge. They followed the ditch. Ellenby felt strangely giddy, as if he were looking at everything through a microscope. That may have been due to the tremendous size of the wheat, its spikes almost as big as corn cobs, the spikelets bigger than kernels, rich orange stuff taut with flour. But then they came to a section marred by larger and larger splotches of a powdery purple blight. The lazy drumming became louder. Ellenby was the first to see the low-swinging helicopter with its thick, trailing plume of greenish mist. He knocked Madsen on the shoulder and both men started to run. Purple dust puffed. Once Ellenby stumbled and Madsen stopped to jerk him to his feet. Still they would have escaped except that the copter swerved toward them. A moment later they were enveloped in sweet oily fumes. Madsen heard jeering laughter, glimpsed a grotesquely long-nosed face peering down from above. Then, through the cloud, Ellenby squeaked, don't breathe. And Madsen felt himself dragged roughly into the ditch. The water closed over him with a splash. Puffing and blowing, he came to his feet, the water hardly reached his waist, to find himself being dragged by Ellenby toward the bridge. It was all he could do to keep his footing on the muddy bottom. By the time he got breath enough to voice his indignation, Ellenby was saying, that's far enough. The stuff's settling away from us. Now strip and scrub yourself. Ellenby unrolled the towel he'd held tightly clutched to his side all the while, and produced a bar of soap. In response to Madsen's question he explained, that fungicide was probably TTTR or some other relative of the nerve gas family. They are absorbed through the skin. Seconds later Madsen was scouring his head and chest. He hesitated at his trousers, muttering, they'll probably have me for indecent exposure. Claim I was trying to start a nudist colony as well as a free love cult. But Ellenby's warning had been a chilly one. Ellenby soaped Madsen's back and he in turn soaped the older man's ridgy one. I suppose that's why he had an elephant's nose, Madsen mused. What? Man in the copter, Madsen explained. Wearing a respirator. Ellenby nodded and made them move nearer the bridge for a change of water. They started to scrub their clothes, rinse and wring them, and lay them on the bank to dry. They watched the copter buzzing along in the distance, but it didn't seem inclined to come near again. Madsen felt impelled to say, you know, it's your chemist friends who have introduced that viciousness into the common man's spirit, giving him horrible poisons to use against nature. Otherwise he wouldn't have tried to douse us with that stuff. He just acted like an ordinary farmer to me, Ellenby replied, scrubbing vigorously. Think we're safe? Madsen asked. Ellenby shrugged. We'll discover, he said briefly. Madsen shivered, but the rhythmic job was soothing. After a bit he began to feel almost playful. Lathering his shirt, he got some fine large bubbles, held them so he could see their colors flow in the sunlight. Tiny perfect worlds of every hue, he murmured. Violet, blue, green, yellow, orange, red. And dead black, Ellenby added. You would say something like that. Madsen grunted. What did you think I was talking about? Bubbles. Maybe some of your friend's poisons have black bubbles, 
Matson said bitingly. But I was talking about these. So was I. Give me your pipe. The authority in Ellenby's voice made Matson look around startledly. Give me your pipe, Ellenby repeated firmly, holding out his hand. Matson fished it out of the pocket of the trousers he was about to wash and handed it over. Ellenby knocked out the soggy tobacco, swished it in the water a few times, and began to soap the inside of the bowl. Madsen started to object, but, you'd be washing it anyway, Ellenby assured him. Now look here, Madsen, I'm going to blow a bubble and I want you to watch, I want you to observe nature for all you're worth. If poets and physicists have one thing in common it's that they're both supposed to be able to observe. Accurately. He took a breath. Now see, I'm going to hold the pipe mouth down and let the bubble hang from it, but with one side of the bowl tipped up a bit, so that the strain on the bubble's skin will be greatest on that side. He blew a big bubble, held the pipe with one hand and pointed with a finger of the other. There's the place to watch now. There. The bubble burst. What was that? Madsen asked in a new voice. It really was black for an instant, dull like soot. A bubble bursts because its skin gets thinner and thinner, Ellenby said. When it gets thin enough it shows colors, as interference eliminates different wavelengths. With yellow eliminated it shows violet, and so on. But finally, just for a moment at the place where it's going to break, the skin becomes only one molecule thick. Such a monomolecular layer absorbs all light, hence shows as dead black. Everything's got a black lining, eh? Black can be beautiful. Here, I'll do it again. Madsen put his hand on Ellenby's shoulder to steady himself. They were standing hip-deep in water, their bodies still flecked with suds. Their heads were inches from the new bubble. As it burst a voice floated down to them. Is this the Ozona faculty kindergarten? They whirled around, simultaneously crouching in the water. Vera Ellen, what are you doing here? Madsen demanded. Watching the kiddies play, the girl on the bridge replied, running a hand through her tousled violet hair. She looked down at her slacks and jacket. Wish I'd brought my swim suit, though I gather it wouldn't be expected. Vera Ellen. Madsen said apprehensively. It doesn't look very inviting down there, though, she mused. Guess I'll wait for Aqua Heaven at New Angeles. You're going to New Angeles? Ellenby put in. It is not easy to be conversationally brilliant while squatting chest deep in muddy water, acutely conscious of the absence of clothes. Vera Ellen nodded lazily, leaning on the railing. Going to get me a city job. With its reduced faculty Ozona holds no more intellectual interest for me. Did you know math's going to be made part of the home ec department, Mr. Ellenby? But how did you know that we? Daughter of the man who got you run out of town ought to know what the old bully's up to. And if you're worrying that they'll come after me and find us together, I'll just head along by myself. Madsen and Ellenby both protested, though it is even harder to protest effectively than to be conversationally brilliant while squatting naked in coffee-colored water. Vera Ellen said, All right, so quit playing and let's get on. You have to tell me all about New Angeles and the kind of jobs we'll get. But? Modest, eh? I'm afraid Pa wouldn't count it in your favor. But all right. She turned her back and sauntered to the other side of the bridge. Madsen and Ellenby cautiously climbed out of the ditch, brushed the water from their skins, and wormed into their soggy clothes. We've got to persuade her to go back, Madsen whispered. Vera Ellen? Ellenby replied and raised his eyebrows. Madsen groaned softly. Cheer up, Ellenby said. And he seemed in a cheerful humor himself when they climbed to the bridge. Vera Ellen, he said, we've been having an argument as to whether man ruined nature or nature ruined man to start with. Is this a class, Mr. Ellenby? Of sorts, he told her. Behind him Madsen snorted, flipping his keats to dry the pages. They started off together. Well, said Vera Ellen, I like nature and I like human beings. 
and I don't feel ruined at all. Where's the argument? What about the bombs? Madsen demanded automatically. By man our physicist here means technology. Whereas I mean. Oh, the bombs, she said with a shrug. What sort of job do you think I should get in New Angeles? Well, Madsen began. Say, I'm getting hungry, she raced on, turning to Ellenby. So am I, he agreed. They looked at the road ahead. A jagged hill now hid all but the tips of the spires of New Angeles. On the top of the hill was a tremendous house with sagging roofs of cracked tiles, stucco walls dark with rain stains and green with moss yet also showing cracks, and windows of age blued glass. Some splintered, flashing in the sun, which tempted Ellenby to whip out his spectroscope. Curving down from the house came a weedy and balding expanse that had obviously once been a well-tended lawn. A few stalwart patches of thick grass held out tenaciously. Pale-trunked eucalyptus trees towered behind the house and to either side of the road where it curved over the hill. In a hollow at the foot of the one-time lawn, just where it met the road, something gleamed. As Madsen, Ellenby and Vera Ellen tramped forward, they saw it was an old automobile, one of the jet antiques that were the rage around 1970, in fact, a Lunar 69. Coming closer Ellenby realized that it had custom-built features, such as jet brakes and collision springs. A man with an odd cap was poking a probe into the air intake, while in the back seat a woman was sitting, shadowed by a hat four feet across. At the sound of their footsteps the man whirled to his feet, quickly enough though unsteadily. He stared at them, wagging the probe. Just at that moment something that looked like an animated orange fur piece leaped from the tonneau. George, the woman cried. Widges got away. The small flattish creature came on in undulating bounds. It was past the man in the cap before he could turn. It headed for Ellenby, then changed direction. Madsen made an impulsive dive for it, but it widened itself still more and sailed over him straight into Vera Ellen's arms. They walked toward the car. Widgie wriggled, Vera Ellen stroked his ears. He seemed to be a flying fox of some sort. The man eyed them hostily, raising the probe. Madsen stared puzzledly at the cap. Out of his older knowledge Ellenby whispered an explanation, chauffeur. The woman stood in the back seat, swaying slightly. She was wearing a white swim suit and dark teleglasses under her hat. At first she seemed a somewhat ravaged thirty. Then they began to see the rest of the wrinkles. She received Widgie from Vera Ellen, shook him out and tucked him under her arm, where he hung limply, moving his tiny red eyes. Come in with me, my dear, she told Vera Ellen. George, put down that crazy pole. Pay no attention to George, he can't recognize gentlefolk when he sees them, especially when he's drunk. Gentlemen, she continued, waving graciously to Madsen and Ellenby, you have the thanks of Ricky Vick's son. As she pronounced the name she surveyed them sharply. Her gaze settled on Ellenby. You know me, don't you? Certainly, he answered instantly. You were my first, my favorite straight 3D star. Are you in 3D? Vera Ellen asked, a sudden gleam in her eyes. Was, my dear, Ricky said grandly. She ogled Ellenby through the fisheye glasses. Ah. Straight 3D, she sighed. Simple video audio in depth, there was a great art form. She began to sway again and they caught the reek of alcohol. You know, gentlemen, it was Handy's that ruined my career. I had the looks and the voice, but I lacked the touch. Something in me shrank from the whole idea, be still, widgy, and the girls with itchy fingers took over. But I'm talking too much about myself. It's hot and you wonderful gentlemen must be thirsty. Here, have a. The chauffeur glared at her as she reached fumblingly down into the tonneau. She caught the look and quailed slightly. Sandwich, she finished, coming up with a shiny can. Madsen accepted it from her, clicking the catch. The top popped four feet in the air, followed lazily by the uppermost sandwich which he caught deftly. 
He handed the can to Ellenby, who served himself and handed it up to Vera Ellen. Soon all three of them were munching. Miss Vixon, Vera Ellen asked between mouthfuls, do you think I could get a job in broadcast entertainment? Ricky looked at her sideways, leaning away to focus. Not with that ghastly Adam Glow hair, she said. Violet is old hat this year, it's either black, blonde, or bald. But give me your hand, my dear. Going to tell my fortune? After a fashion. She held up Vera Ellen's hand, squeezing and prodding it thoughtfully, as if she were testing the carcass of an alleged spring chicken. Then she nodded. You'll do. Good strong hand, that's all that's needed, so you can really crunch the knuckles of the bohunks. They love it rough. Of course the technicians could step up the power when they broadcast your hand squeeze, but the addicts don't feel it's the same thing. She looked sourly at her own delicate claws. Yes, my dear, you'll have a chance in handies if you don't mind cuddling with two million dirty-minded bohunks every night and if Ricky Vixen still got any atre at the studios. She made a face and dipped again into the tonneau, apparently to gulp something, for the chauffeur's glare was intensified. You're from New Angeles? Madsen asked politely when Ricky came up beaming. Old Angeles, she corrected. My home's in a contaminated area. After 3D lighting I've never been afraid of hard radiations. But this time my psychic counselor told me, Widgie, I'm going to put you away in a nice little urn, that the bombs are going to miss New Angeles and fall on old. That's why George is jetting me to the mountains. Others drink to still their fears. I do something about it, too. You mean you're going away from the studio? Vera Ellen demanded incredulously while Ellenby mumbled bombs, through a mouthful of sandwich. Of course, Ricky nodded. Don't you know? Russia's touched a match to the hot truce. You charming gentlemen should keep up with these things. You see, I told you. Madsen said to Ellenby. One more victory for science. Miss Vixon, we better be getting on, the chauffeur interrupted, speaking for the first time. His voice was drunkenly thick. We aren't out of the fusion fringe by a long shot and I don't like the looks of this place. Ricky ignored him. Ellenby asked, was the news about Russia telefaxed? Of course not. Ricky's smile was scornful. They never tell the real truth these days. But they said to get out of our houses, and what else could that mean? Miss Vixon, we better, George began again. Quiet, George, Ricky ordered. George groaned faintly, shrugged his shoulders, and reached out an arm to her without looking. Ricky handed him a red, limp plastic bottle. Just as he was putting it to his lips, he jerked as if stung, vaulted into the car, and began to stamp and punch at the controls. With a mighty poof the jet took hold. Ellenby skittered away from the hot blast. The Lunar 69 jumped forward. Things hissed and snicked through the air. From nowhere, men began to appear. With a great lurch the car gained the road, roared toward the bridge. Vera Ellen jumped up as if to get out, then was thrown back into the tonneau. Ricky lunged forward across the seat to save the red bottle. Her forefoot hat leaped upward, hesitated, and then spun off like a flying saucer. A man rose from the wheat near the bridge. As the car jounced across it, he leveled a rapid-fire weapon. But just as he got it trained on the car, Ricky's hat landed on him. He went over backwards, firing at the sky. Madsen and Ellenby looked around in bewilderment. There must have been a dozen men. As they stared, another bunch came hurrying down the ruined lawn from the house on the hill. The man by the bridge got up, went over to Ricky's hat and stamped on it. Madsen and Ellenby jumped as the sky-climbing missiles from his gun pattered down around them. When they looked around again, the men from the house on the hill were closing in. Their leader was about five feet tall, but thick. His head had been formed in a bullet mold, his features looked drop-forged. I'm Harvey, he told them blankly. What you got? 
Harvey's people wore everything from evening dress to shorts. There were even two women, who drifted toward Harvey, one in a gold kimono, the other in an off-the-bosom frock of filthy white lace. Everybody was armed. What you got? Harvey repeated sharply. I know you're loaded, I saw you talking with that rich witch in the jet. He looked them over and grabbed at Madsen's side pocket. Books, huh? He said like a hangman, dangling the Keats by a stray page. Then he turned to Ellenby. Come on, skinny, he said, shell out. When Ellenby hesitated, two of Harvey's men grabbed him, dumped him, and passed the contents of his pockets to their chief. When the spectroscope turned up, Harvey grinned. The eyes of his people twinkled in anticipation. Science gadget, huh, he said. Folks, there's been too much science in the world and too many words. Any minute now, more bombs are gonna fall. I do my humble bit to help them. I'm a great little junkman. He let the brass tube fall to the ground and lifted his foot. Blow it a goodbye kiss, skinny. Wait, Madsen said abruptly, taking a step toward Harvey. Don't do it. Then the poet's eyes grew wide and alarmed, as if he hadn't known he was going to say it. Breath sucked in around them. Harvey's turret head slowly turned toward Madsen, its expression seemingly vacuous. Why not? Harvey whispered. Don't pay any attention to my friend, Ellenby interjected rapidly. He just said that on account of me. Actually he hates science as much as you do. Don't. Shut up. Harvey roared. Then his voice instantly went low again. Ain't nobody hates science more than me, but ain't nobody tells me so. Shoulda kept your mouth shut, skinny. Now there's gonna be more n gadgets stomped, more n books tore. Silence came except for the faint sucks of breath, the faint scuffle of shoes on grit as Harvey's people slowly moved in. Ellen B. stood helplessly, yet at the same time he felt a widening and intensification of his sensory powers. He was aware of the delicately lace-edged tree shadows cast from the hill ahead by the westering sun. At the other limit of his vision the copter no longer trailed its green caterpillar. For some reason it was buzzing closer along the road. At the same time he was conscious with a feverish clarity of the page by which Harvey dangled the Keats, and without reading the words he saw the lines. Beauty is truth. Truth beauty, that is all. Ye know on earth, and all ye need to know. Suddenly the slowly advancing faces seemed to freeze and Ellenby was aware of something spectral and ominous about the yellowing sunlight and the whole acid-etched scene around him. It was something more than the physical threat to him and Madsen, it was something that seemed to well up menacingly from the ground under his feet. There was a sudden faint thunder and even as something inside Ellenby said, that isn't it, that isn't what the sky's waiting for. He saw the chrome muzzle of the Lunar 69 bulleting toward them across the bridge with Vera Ellen's violet mop above the wheel. But even as the braking blasts gout out redly from under the hood and the car crunched toward a stop in their midst. Even as Harvey's people broke to either side and pistols popped with queerly toy-like reports, the thunder multiplied until it was impossible that the Lunar 69 was causing it. Until it was like the thunder of a thousand invisible jets crushing the air around them. The sky shifted, rocked. The road shook. There came a shock that numbed Ellenby's feet and sent everyone around him reeling, and a pounding, smashing sound that made any remembered noise seem puny. The Lunar 69, which had stopped a dozen feet from Ellenby, was pitching and tossing like a silver ship in a storm. Vera Ellen was gripping the steering wheel with one hand and motioning to him frantically with the other. In the seat beyond her Ricky Vixon was jouncing as if in a merry-go-round chariot. Ellenby lurched as a hand clutched his shoulder and a staggering Madsen howled in his ear through the tumult, now you've got your rotten bombs. Between him and the car Harvey's bullet head reared up and as suddenly dropped away. Looking down, Ellenby saw that a chasm four feet wide had split the road between him and the car. Its walls were raw, smoking earth and rock. Down it Ellenby saw vanishing, in one frozen moment, 
Harvey, and the Keats and the Little Brass Spectroscope. Then Ellenby realized he had grabbed Madsen by the shoulder and thrown the two of them forward and shouted, Jump! For a moment the chasm gaped beneath them and a white little face stared upward. Then the chasm closed with a giant crunch and Ellenby's hand caught the side of the heaving car and he pitched into the back seat. Through the diminishing thunder and shaking there came the toy roar of the car's jet and a new movement tipped him backward and he was looking toward the hill and it was getting bigger. He tried to put his feet down and felt something bulk under them. For a moment he thought it was Madsen, but Madsen was beside him on the seat, and then he saw it was George. He looked up and Ricky Vixon was watching him from where she was crouched in the front seat, her eyes without the teleglasses looking as foxy as Widge's. Whom she was holding close to her wrinkle-etched cheek. Vera Ellen had to conk him, she explained, her gaze dipping to George. The bum tried to betray us. The pitching of the car had given way to a steady forward lunge. Ellenby nodded dully at Ricky and hitched himself around and looked back. Harvey's people were scattering like ants through a dust cloud rising from the road. The house on the hill still stood, though there were more and larger cracks in it and a nimbus of whiter dust around it. By the bridge the copter had crashed and was flaming brightly. A tiny figure was running away from it. Ellenby's face slowly lightened with understanding. We were on the San Andreas Rift, he said softly. Madsen, that wasn't the bombs at all. That wasn't technology or man. A smile trembled on his lips. That was nature. An earthquake. Madsen was the first to comment. All right, he said, it was nature, nature showing her disgust for man. An idea like that is the sheerest animism, Ellenby reacted automatically. Now if you try analyzing. Analyzing. Madsen snorted with a touch of the old fire. You scientists are always. Whoa, boys, Ricky Vixon interrupted. If it hadn't been for that little quake to confuse things, Vera Ellen couldn't have snatched you out no matter how pretty she tried. And I'm in no mood for arguments now. I'm not the arty type and all the science I know is what my psychic counselor tells me. Widgie, quit pounding your heart, it's all over now. Ellenby touched her arm. Do I understand, he asked, that Vera Ellen made you turn back just to save us? Of course not, Ricky assured him. Her father and his pals tried to stop us a couple of miles back. They'd been radioed by a farmer in a copter and had the road blocked. George wanted to hand you all over to Vera Ellen's father, but we conked George, he's such a weakling, and got away. Picking you up was an afterthought. Vera Ellen flashed a wicked smile over her shoulder. Ellenby realized he was feeling vastly contented. He started to lift his feet off George, then settled them more comfortably. He looked at the violet-topped new chauffeur handling the lunar as if she'd never done anything else, and she picked that moment to flash him another half-friendly, half-insulting grin. He nudged Matson and said, We'll continue our argument later, all our argument. Madsen looked at him sharply and almost grinned too. Ellenby wondered idly what jobs they had for poets and physicists in 3D and handy studios. Ricky Vixen's eyes widened. Say, she said, if they were just warning us about that little old earthquake, then Old Angeles isn't radioactive, I mean any more radioactive than it's ever been. Oh boy, Vera Ellen crowed as the car topped the hill and the blue spires came back in sight. New Angeles, here we come. Time in the round. From the other end of the avenue of wisdom that led across the Peace Park, a gray, hairless, heavily built dog was barking soundlessly at the towering crystal glory of the Time Theater. For a moment, the effect was almost frightening, a silent picture of the beginning of civilization challenging the end of it. Then a small boy caught up with the dog and it rolled over enthusiastically at his feet and the scene was normal again. The small boy, however, seemed definitely pre-civilization. He studied the dog coldly and then inserted a thin metal tube under its eyelid and poked. The dog wagged its stumpy tail. The boy frowned, tightened his grip on the tube and jabbed hard. 
The dog's tail thumped the cushiony pavement and the four paws beat the air. The boy shortened his grip and suddenly jabbed the dog several times in the stomach. The stiff tube rebounded from the gray, hairless hide. The dog's face split in an upside-down grin, revealing formidable ivory fangs across which a long black tongue lolled. The boy regarded the tongue speculatively and pocketed the metal tube with a grimace of utter disgust. He did not look up when someone called, Hi, Butch. Sick M, Darter, Sick M. A larger small boy and a somewhat older one were approaching across the luxurious, neatly cropped grass, preceded by a hurtling shape that, except for a black hide, was a replica of Butch's gray dog. Butch shrugged his shoulders resignedly and said in a bored voice, Kill them, brute. The gray dog hurled itself on Darter. Jaws gaped to get a hold on necks so short and thick as to be mere courtesy terms. They whirled like a fanged merry-go-round. Three more dogs, one white, one slate blue and one pink, hurried up and tried to climb aboard. Butch yawned. What's the matter? inquired Darter's master. I thought you liked dog fights, Butch. I do like dog fights, Butch said somberly, without looking around. I don't like Yuninch fights. They're just a pretend, like everything else. Nobody gets hurt. And look here, Joggy, and you, too, Hal, when you talk to me, don't just say Butch. It's the Butcher, see? That's not exactly a functional name, Hal observed with the judiciousness of budding maturity, while Joggy said agreeably, All right, Butcher. I suppose you'd like to have lived way back when people were hurting each other all the time so the blood came out? I certainly would, the Butcher replied. As Joggy and Hal turned back skeptically to watch the fight, he took out the metal tube, screwed up his face in a dreadful frown and jabbed himself in the hand. He squeaked with pain and whisked the tube out of sight. A kid can't do anything anymore, he announced dramatically. Can't break anything except the breakables they give him to break on purpose. Can't get dirty except in the dirt pen, and they graduate him from that when he's two. Can't even be bitten by an uninge, it's contra-programmed. Where'd you ever get so fixated on dirt? Hal asked in a gentle voice acquired from a robot adolescer. I've been reading a book about a kid called Huckleberry Finn, the butcher replied airily. A swell book. That guy got dirtier than anything. His eyes became dreamy. He even ate out of a garbage pail. What's a garbage pail? I don't know, but it sounds great. The battling on ninjas careened into them. Brute had darter by the ear and was whirling him around hilariously. Ah, quit it. Brute, the butcher said in annoyance. Brute obediently loosed his hold and returned to his master, paying no attention to his adversary's efforts to renew the fight. The butcher looked Brute squarely in the eyes. You're making too much of a rumpus, he said. I want to think. He kicked Brute in the face. The dog squirmed joyously at his feet. Look, Joggy said, you wouldn't hurt an Yuninge, for instance, would you? How can you hurt something that's uninjurable? the butcher demanded scathingly. An Yuninge isn't really a dog. It's just a lot of circuits and a micropack bedded in hyperplastic. He looked at Brute with guarded wistfulness. I don't know about that, Hal put in. I've heard an Yuninge is programmed with so many genuine canine reactions that it practically has racial memory. I mean if you could hurt an Yuninge, Joggy amended. Well, maybe I wouldn't, the butcher admitted grudgingly. But shut up, I want to think. About what? Hal asked with saintly reasonableness. The butcher achieved a fearful frown. When I'm world director, he said slowly, I'm going to have warfare again. You think so now, Hal told him. We all do at your age. We do not, the butcher retorted. I bet you didn't. Oh, yes, I was foolish, too, the older boy confessed readily. All newborn organisms are self-centered and inconsiderate and ruthless. They have to be. That's why we have uninjas to work out on, 
and death games and fear houses, so that our emotions are cleared for adult conditioning. And it's just the same with newborn civilizations. Why, long after atom power and the space drive were discovered, people kept having wars and revolutions. It took ages to condition them differently. Of course, you can't appreciate it this year, but man's greatest achievement was when he learned to automatically reject all violent solutions to problems. You'll realize that when you're older. I will not, the butcher countered hotly. I'm not going to be a sissy. Hal and Joggy blinked at the unfamiliar word. And what if we were attacked by bloodthirsty monsters from outside the solar system? The space fleet would take care of them, Hal replied calmly. That's what it's for. Adults aren't conditioned to reject violent solutions to problems where non-human enemies are concerned. Look at what we did to viruses. But what if somebody got at us through the time bubble? They can't. It's impossible. Yes, but suppose they did all the same. You've never been inside the time theater, you're not old enough yet, so you just can't know anything about it or about the reasons why it's impossible, Hal replied with friendly factuality. The time bubble is just a viewer. You can only look through it, and just into the past, at that. But you can't travel through it because you can't change the past. Time traveling is a lot of kid stuff. I don't care, the butcher asserted obstinately. I'm still going to have warfare when I'm world director. They'll condition you out of the idea, Hal assured him. They will not. I won't let, M. It doesn't matter what you think now, Hal said with finality. You'll have an altogether different opinion when you're six. Well, what if I will, the butcher snapped back. You don't have to keep telling me about it, do you? The others were silent. Joggy began to bounce up and down abstractedly on the resilient pavement. Hal called in his three uninjas and said in soothing tones, Joggy and I are going to swim over to the time theater. Want to walk us there, Butch? Butch scowled. How about it, Butch? Still Butch did not seem to hear. The older boy shrugged and said, Oh, well, how about it, Butcher? The butcher swung around. They won't let me in the time theater. You said so yourself. You could walk us over there. Well, maybe I will and maybe I won't. While you're deciding, we'll get swimming. Come along, Joggy. Still scowling, the butcher took a white soapy crayon from the bulging pocket in his silver shorts. Pressed into the pavement, it made a black mark. He scrawled pensively keep on the grass. He gazed at his handiwork. No, darn it, that was just what grown-ups wanted you to do. This grass couldn't be hurt. You couldn't pull it up or tear it off, it hurt your fingers to try. A rub with the side of the crayon removed the sign. He thought for a moment, then wrote, keep off the grass. With an untroubled countenance, he sprang up and hurried after the others. Joggy and the older boy were swimming lazily through the air at shoulder height. In the pavement directly under each of them was a wide, saucer-shaped depression which swam along with them. The uninjas avoided the depressions. Darter was strutting on his hind legs, looking up inquiringly at his master. Gimme a ride, Hal, gimme a ride, the butcher called. The older boy ignored him. Ah, gimme a ride, Joggy. Oh, all right. Joggy touched the small box attached to the front of his broad metal harness and dropped lightly to the ground. The butcher climbed on his back. There was a moment of rocking and pitching, during which each boy accused the other of trying to upset them. Then the butcher got his balance and they began to swim along securely, though at a level several inches lower. Brute sprang up after his master and was invisibly rebuffed. He retired baffled, but a few minutes later, he was amusing himself by furious futile efforts to climb the hemispherical repulsor field. Slowly the little cavalcade of boys and uninjas proceeded down the avenue of wisdom. Hal amused himself by stroking toward a tree. When he was about four feet from it, he was gently bounced away. 
it was really a more tiring method of transportation than walking and quite useless against the wind. True, by rocking the repulsor hemisphere backward, you could get a brief forward push, but it would be nullified when you rocked forward. A slow swimming stroke was the simplest way to make progress. The general sensation, however, was delightful and levitators were among the most prized of toys. There's the theater, Joggy announced. I know, the butcher said irritably. But even he sounded a little solemn and subdued. From the great ramp to the topmost airy finial, the time theater was the dream of a god realized in unearthly substance. It imparted the aura of demigods to the adults drifting up and down the ramp. My father remembers when there wasn't a time theater, Hal said softly as he scanned the facade's glowing charts and maps. Say, they're viewing Earth, somewhere in Scandinavia around zero in the BCAD time scale. It should be interesting. Will it be about Napoleon? the butcher asked eagerly. Or Hitler? A red-headed adult heard and smiled and paused to watch. A lock of hair had fallen down the middle of the butcher's forehead, and as he sat joggy like a charger, he did bear a faint resemblance to one of the grim little egomaniacs of the Dawn era. Wrong millennium, Hal said. Tamerlane then, the butcher pressed. He killed cities and piled the skulls. Bloodbath stuff. Oh, yes, and Tamerlane was a scan of the navies. Hal looked puzzled and then quickly erased the expression. Well, even if it is about Tamerlane, you can't see it. How about it, Joggy? They won't let me in either. Yes, they will. You're five years old now. But I don't feel any older, Joggy replied doubtfully. The feeling comes at six. Don't worry, the usher will notice the difference. Hal and Joggy switched off their levitators and dropped to their feet. The butcher came down rather hard, twisting an ankle. He opened his mouth to cry, then abruptly closed it hard, bearing his pain in tight-lipped silence like an ancient soldier, like Stalin, maybe, he thought. The red-headed adult's face twitched in half-humorous sympathy. Hal and Joggy mounted the ramp and entered a twilit corridor which drank their faint footsteps and returned pulses of light. The butcher limped manfully after them, but when he got inside, he forgot his battle injury. Hal looked back. Honestly, the usher will stop you. The butcher shook his head. I'm going to think my way in. I'm going to think old. You won't be able to fool the usher, butcher. You under five simply aren't allowed in the time theater. There's a good reason for it, something dangerous might happen if an under five got inside. Why? I don't exactly know, but something. Ha! Huh. I bet they're scared we'd go traveling in the time bubble and have some excitement. They are not. I guess they just know you'd get bored and wander away from your seats and maybe disturb the adults or upset the electronics or something. But don't worry about it, butcher. The usher will take care of you. Shut up, I'm thinking I'm world director, the butcher informed them, contorting his face diabolically. Hal spoke to the uninjas, pointing to the side of the corridor. Obediently four of them lined up. But Brute was peering down the corridor toward where it merged into a deeper darkness. His short legs stiffened, his necklace head seemed to retreat even further between his powerful shoulders, his lips writhed back to show his gleaming fangs. And a completely unfamiliar sound issued from his throat. A choked, grating sound. A growl. The other uninjas moved uneasily. Do you suppose something's the matter with his circuits? Joggy whispered. Maybe he's getting racial memories from the scans. Of course not, Hal said irritably. Brute, get over there, the butcher commanded. Unwillingly, eyes still fixed on the blackness ahead, Brute obeyed. The three boys started on. Hal and Joggy experienced a vaguely electrical tingling that vanished almost immediately. They looked back. The butcher had been stopped by an invisible wall. I told you you couldn't fool the usher, Hal said. The butcher hurled himself forward. The wall gave a little, then bounced him back with equal force. 
I bet it'll be a bum time view anyway, the butcher said, not giving up, but not trying again. And I still don't think the usher can tell how old you are. I bet there's an overage teacher spying on you through a hole, and if he doesn't like your looks, he switches on the usher. But the others had disappeared in the blackness. The butcher waited and then sat down beside the uninjas. Brute laid his head on his knee and growled faintly down the corridor. Take it easy, Brute, the butcher consoled him. I don't think Tamerlane was really a scan of the navies anyhow. Two chattering girls hardly bigger than himself stepped through the usher as if it weren't there. The butcher grimly slipped out the metal tube and put it to his lips. There were two closely spaced faint plops and a large green stain appeared on the bare back of one girl, while purple fluid dripped from the close-cropped hair of the other. They glared at him and one of them said, a cub. But he had his arms folded and wasn't looking at them. Meanwhile, subordinate ushers had guided Hal and Joggy away from the main entrance to the time theater. A sphincter dilated and they found themselves in a small transparent cubicle from which they could watch the show without disturbing the adult audience. They unstrapped their levitators, laid them on the floor and sat down. The darkened auditorium was circular. Rising from a low central platform was a huge bubble of light, its lower surface somewhat flattened. The audience was seated in concentric rows around the bubble, their keen and compassionate faces dimly revealed by the pale central glow. But it was the scene within the bubble that riveted the attention of the boys. Great brooding trees, the trunks of the nearer ones sliced by the bubble's surface, formed the background. Through the dark, wet foliage appeared glimpses of a murky sky, while from the ceiling of the bubble, a ceaseless rain dripped mournfully. A hooded figure crouched beside a little fire partly shielded by a gnarled trunk. Squatting round about were wiry, blue-eyed men with shoulder-length blonde hair and full blonde beards. They were clothed in furs and metal-studded leather. Here and there were scattered weapons and armor, long swords glistening with oil to guard them from rust, crudely painted circular shields, and helmets from which curved the horns of beasts. Back and forth, lean, wolf-like dogs paced with restless monotony. Sometimes the men seemed to speak together, or one would rise to peer down the misty forest vistas, but mostly they were motionless. Only the hooded figure, which they seemed to regard with a mingled wonder and fear, swayed incessantly to the rhythm of some unheard chant. The time bubble has been brought to rest in one of the barbaric cultures of the dawn era, a soft voice explained, so casually that Joggy looked around for the speaker. Until Hal nudged him sharply, whispering with barely perceptible embarrassment, Don't do that, Joggy. It's just the electronic interpreter. It senses our development and hears our questions and then it automats background and answers. But it's no more alive than an adolescer or a kinderobot. Got a billion microtapes, though. The interpreter continued, the skin-clad men we are viewing in time in the round seem to be a group of warriors of the sort who lived by pillage and rapine. The hooded figure is a most unusual find. We believe it to be that of a sorcerer who pretended to control the forces of nature and see into the future. Joggy whispered, how is it that we can't see the audience through the other side of the bubble? We can see through this side, all right. The bubble only shines light out, Hal told him hurriedly, to show he knew some things as well as the interpreter. Nothing, not even light, can get into the bubble from outside. The audience on the other side of the bubble sees into it just as we do, only they're seeing the other way, for instance, they can't see the fire because the tree is in the way. And instead of seeing us beyond, they see more trees and sky. Joggy nodded. You mean that whatever way you look at the bubble, it's a kind of hole through time? That's right. Hal cleared his throat and recited, the bubble is the locus of an infinite number of one-way holes, all centering around two points in space-time, one now and one then. The bubble looks completely open, but if you tried to step inside, you'd be stopped, and so would an atom beam. It takes more energy than an atom beam just to maintain the bubble, let alone maneuver it. I see, I guess, Joggy whispered. But if the hole works for light, why can't the people inside the bubble step out of it into our world? 
Why, er, you see, Joggy. The interpreter took over. The holes are one way for light, but no way for matter. If one of the individuals inside the bubble walked toward you, he would cross-section and disappear. But to the audience on the opposite side of the bubble, it would be obvious that he had walked away along the vista down which they are peering. As if to provide an example, a figure suddenly materialized on their side of the bubble. The wolf-like dogs bared their fangs. For an instant, there was only an eerie, distorted, rapidly growing silhouette, changing from blood red to black as the boundary of the bubble cross-sectioned the intruding figure. Then they recognized the back of another long-haired warrior and realized that the audience on the other side of the bubble had probably seen him approaching for some time. He bowed to the hooded figure and handed him a small bag. More atavistic cubs, big and little. Hold still, Cynthia, a new voice cut in. Hal turned and saw that two cold-eyed girls had been ushered into the cubicle. One was wiping her close cropped hair with one hand while mopping a green stain from her friend's back with the other. Hal nudged Joggy and whispered, Butch. But Joggy was still hypnotized by the time bubble. Then how is it, Hal, he asked, that light comes out of the bubble, if the people don't? What I mean is, if one of the people walks toward us, he shrinks to a red blot and disappears. Why doesn't the light coming our way disappear, too? Well, you see, Joggy, it isn't real light. It's. Once more the interpreter helped him out. The light that comes from the bubble is an isotope. Like atoms of one element, Photons of a single frequency also have isotopes. It's more than a matter of polarization. One of these isotopes of light tends to leak futureward through holes in spacetime. Most of the light goes down the vistas visible to the other side of the audience. But one isotope is diverted through the walls of the bubble into the time theater. Perhaps, because of the intense darkness of the theater, you haven't realized how dimly lit the scene is. That's because we're getting only a single isotope of the original light. Incidentally, no isotopes have been discovered that leak past Ward, though attempts are being made to synthesize them. Oh, explanations, murmured one of the newly arrived girls. The cubs are always angling for them. Apple polishers. I like this show, a familiar voice announced serenely. They cut anybody yet with those choppers? Hal looked down beside him. Butch. How did you manage to get in? I don't see any blood. Where's the bodies? But how did you get in, Butcher? The Butcher replied airily, a red-headed man talked to me and said it certainly was sad for a future dictator not to be able to enjoy scenes of carnage in his youth. So I told him I'd been inside the time theater and just come out to get a drink of water and go to the eliminator. But then my sprained ankle had got worse. I kind of tried to get up and fell down again, so he picked me up and carried me right through the usher. Butcher, that wasn't honest, Hal said a little worriedly. You tricked him into thinking you were older and his brain waves blanketed yours, going through the usher. I really have heard it's dangerous for you under fives to be in here. The way those cubs beg for babying and get it, one of the girls commented. Talk about sex favoritism. She and her companion withdrew to the far end of the cubicle. The butcher grinned at them briefly and concentrated his attention on the scene in the time bubble. Those big dogs, he began suddenly. Brute must have smelled them. Don't be silly, Hal said. Smells can't come out of the time bubble. Smells haven't any isotopes and. I don't care, the butcher asserted. I bet somebody'll figure out someday how to use the bubble for time traveling. You can't travel in a point of view, Hal contradicted, and that's all the bubble is. Besides, some scientists think the bubble isn't real at all, but uh, uh. I believe, the interpreter cut in smoothly. That you're thinking of the theory that the time bubble operates by hypermemory. Some scientists would have us believe that all memory is time traveling and that the basic location of the bubble is not space time at all, but ever present eternity. Some of them go so far as to state that it is only a mental inability that prevents the time bubble from being used for time traveling, 
just as it may be a similar disability that keeps a robot with the same or even more scopeful memories from being a real man or animal. It is because of this minority theory that underage individuals and other beings with impulsive mentalities are barred from the time theater. But do not be alarmed. Even if the minority theory should prove true, and no evidence for it has ever appeared, there are automatically operating safeguards to protect the audience from any harmful consequences of time traveling, almost certainly impossible. Remember, in either direction. Sissies, was the butcher's comment. You're rather young to be here, aren't you? the interpreter inquired. The butcher folded his arms and scowled. The interpreter hesitated almost humanly, probably snatching through a quarter million microtapes. Well, you wouldn't have got in unless a qualified adult had certified you as plus age. Enjoy yourself. There was no need for the last injunction. The scene within the bubble had acquired a gripping interest. The shaggy warriors were taking up their swords, gathering about the hooded sorcerer. The hood fell back, revealing a face with hawk-like, disturbing eyes that seemed to be looking straight out of the bubble at the future. This is getting good, the butcher said, squirming toward the edge of his seat. Stop being an impulsive mentality, Hal warned him a little nervously. Ha! Huh. The sorcerer emptied the small bag on the fire and a thick cloud of smoke puffed toward the ceiling of the bubble. A claw-like hand waved wildly. The sorcerer appeared to be expostulating, commanding. The warriors stared uncomprehendingly, which seemed to exasperate the sorcerer. That's right, the butcher approved loudly. Socket to M. Butcher. Hal admonished. Suddenly the bubble grew very bright, as if the sun had just shone forth in the ancient world, though the rain still dripped down. A viewing anomaly has occurred, the interpreter announced. It may be necessary to collapse the time bubble for a short period. In a frenzy, his ragged robes twisting like smoke, the sorcerer rushed at one of the warriors, pushing him backward so that in a moment he must cross-section. Attaboy, the butcher encouraged. Then the warrior was standing outside the bubble, blinking toward the shadows, rain dripping from his beard and furs. Oh, boy, the butcher cheered in ecstasy. Butcher, you've done it. Hal said, aghast. I sure did, the butcher agreed blandly, but that old guy in the bubble helped me. Must take two to work it. Keep your seats, the interpreter said loudly. We are energizing the safeguards. The warriors inside the bubble stared in stupid astonishment after the one who had disappeared from their view. The sorcerer leaped about, pushing them in his direction. Abrupt light flooded the time theater. The warriors who had emerged from the bubble stiffened themselves, baring their teeth. The safeguards are now energized, the interpreter said. A woman in a short golden tunic stood up uncertainly from the front row of the audience. The first warrior looked her up and down, took one hesitant step forward, then another, then suddenly grabbed her and flung her over his left shoulder. Looking around menacingly and swinging his sword in his right hand. I repeat, the safeguards have been fully energized. Keep your seats, the interpreter enjoined. In the cubicle, Hal and Joggy gasped, the two girls squeaked, but the butcher yelled a, hey! Of disapproval snatched up something from the floor and darted out through the sphincter. Here and there in the audience, other adults stood up. The emerged warriors formed a ring of swinging swords and questing eyes. Between their legs their wolfish dogs, emerged with them, crouched and snarled. Then the warriors began to fan out. There has been an unavoidable delay in energizing the safeguards, the interpreter said. Please be patient. At that moment, the butcher entered the main auditorium, brandishing a levitator above his head and striding purposefully down the aisle. At his heels, five stocky forms trotted. In a definitely pre-civilization voice, or at least with pre-civilization volume, he bellowed, Hey, you! You quit that! The first warrior looked toward him, gave his left shoulder a shake to quiet his wriggling captive, gave his right shoulder one to supple his sword arm and waited until the dwarfish challenger came into range. 
then his sword swished down in a flashing arc. Next moment, the butcher was on his knees and the warrior was staring at him open-mouthed. The sword had rebounded from something invisible an arm's length above the gnome-like creature's head. The warrior backed a step. The butcher stayed down, crouching half behind an aisle seat and digging for something in his pocket. But he didn't stay quiet. Sick, M, brute, he shrilled. Sick, M, darter. Sick, M, pinky and whitey and blue. Then he stopped shouting and raised his hand to his mouth. Growling quite unmechanically, the five uninjas hurled themselves forward and closed with the warrior's wolf-like dogs. At the first encounter, Brute and Pinky were grabbed by the throats, shaken, and tossed a dozen feet. The warriors snarled approval and advanced. But then Brute and Pinky raced back eagerly to the fight, and suddenly the face of the leading warrior was drenched with scarlet. He blinked and touched his fingers to it, then looked at his hand in horror. The butcher spared a second to repeat his command to the uninjas. But already the battle was going against the larger dogs. The latter had the advantage of weight and could toss the smaller dogs like so many foxes. But their terrible fangs did no damage, and whenever an uninj clamped on a throat, that throat was torn out. Meanwhile, great bloody stains had appeared on the bodies of all the warriors. They drew back in a knot, looking at each other fearfully. That was when the butcher got to his feet and strode forward, hand clenching the levitator above his head. Get back where you belong, you big jerks. And drop that lady. The first warrior pointed toward him and hissed something. Immediately, a half dozen swords were smiting at the butcher. We are working to energize the safeguards, the interpreter said in mechanical panic. Remain patient and in your seats. The uninjas leaped into the melee, at first tearing more fur than flesh. Swords caught them and sent them spinning through the air. They came yapping back for more. Brute fixed on the first warrior's ankle. He dropped the woman, stamped unavailingly on the uninj, and let out a screech. Swords were still rebounding from the invisible shield under which the butcher crouched, making terrible faces at his attackers. They drew back looked again at their bloodstains, goggled at the demon dogs. At their leader's screech, they broke and plunged back into the time bubble, their leader stumbling limpingly after them. There they wasted no time on their own ragged sorcerer. Their swords rose and fell, and no repulsor field stayed them. Brute, come back, the butcher yelled. The grey Yunij let go his hold on the leader's ankle and scampered out of the time bubble, which swiftly dimmed to its original light intensity and then winked out. For once in their very mature lives, all of the adults in the auditorium began to jabber at each other simultaneously. We are sorry, but the anomaly has made it necessary to collapse the time bubble, the interpreter said. There will be no viewing until further announcement. Thank you for your patience. Hal and Joggy caught up with the butcher just as Brute jumped into his arms and the woman in gold picked him up and hugged him fiercely. The butcher started to pull away, then grudgingly submitted. Cubs, came a small cold voice from behind Hal and Joggy. Always playing hero. Say, what's that awful smell, Cynthia? It must have come from those dirty past men. Hal and Joggy were shouting at the butcher but he wasn't listening to them or to the older voices clamoring about revised theories of reality and other important things. He didn't even squirm as Brute licked his cheek and the woman in gold planted a big kiss practically on his mouth. He smiled dreamily and stroked Brute's muzzle and murmured softly, We came, we saw, we conquered, didn't we, Brute? What's he doing in there? The professor was congratulating Earth's first visitor from another planet on his wisdom in getting in touch with a cultural anthropologist before contacting any other scientists or governments. God forbid. And in learning English from radio and TV before landing from his orbit parked rocket, when the Martian stood up and said hesitantly, Excuse me, please, but where is it? That baffled the professor and the Martian seemed to grow anxious, at least his long mouth curved upward and he had earlier explained that it curling downward was his smile, and he repeated. Please, 
where is it? He was surprisingly humanoid in most respects, but his complexion was textured so like the rich dark armchair he'd just been occupying that the professor's pinstriped gray suit, which he had eagerly consented to wear, seemed an arbitrary interruption between him and the chair, a sort of Mother Hubbard dress on a phantom conjured from its leather. The professor's wife, always a perceptive hostess, came to her husband's rescue by saying with equal rapidity, top of the stairs, end of the hall, last door. The Martian's mouth curled happily downward and he said, thank you very much, and was off. Comprehension burst on the professor. He caught up with his guest at the foot of the stairs. Here, I'll show you the way, he said. No, I can find it myself, thank you, the Martian assured him. Something rather final in the Martian's tone made the professor desist, and after watching his visitor sway up the stairs with an almost hypnotic softly jogging movement. He rejoined his wife in the study, saying wonderingly, who'd have thought it, by George. Function taboos as strict as our own. I'm glad some of your professional visitors maintained them, his wife said darkly. But this one's from Mars, darling, and to find out he's, well, similar in an aspect of his life is as thrilling as the discovery that water is burned hydrogen. When I think of the day not far distant when I'll put his entries in the cross-cultural index. He was still rhapsodizing when the professor's little son raced in. Pop, the Martian's gone to the bathroom. Hush, dear. Manners. Now it's perfectly natural, darling, that the boy should notice and be excited. Yes, son, the Martian's not so very different from us. Oh, certainly, the professor's wife said with a trace of bitterness. I don't imagine his turquoise complexion will cause any comment at all when you bring him to a faculty reception. They'll just figure he's had a hard night, and that he got that baby elephant nose sniffing around for assistant professorships. Really, darling. He probably thinks of our noses as disagreeably amputated and paralyzed. Well, anyway, Pop, he's in the bathroom. I followed him when he squiggled upstairs. Now, son, you shouldn't have done that. He's on a strange planet and it might make him nervous if he thought he was being spied on. We must show him every courtesy. By George, I can't wait to discuss these things with Ackerley Ramsbottom. When I think of how much more this encounter has to give the anthropologist than even the physicist or astronomer. He was still going strong on his second rhapsody when he was interrupted by another high-speed entrance. It was the professor's cultish daughter. Mom, Pop, the Martians. Hush, dear. We know. The professor's cultish daughter regained her adolescent poise, which was considerable. Well, he's still in there, she said. I just tried the door and it was locked. I'm glad it was, the professor said while his wife added, yes, you can't be sure what, and caught herself. Really, dear, that was very bad manners. I thought he'd come downstairs long ago, her daughter explained. He's been in there an awfully long time. It must have been a half hour ago that I saw him gyre and gimbal upstairs in that real gone way he has, with Nosy here following him. The professor's cultish daughter was currently soaking up both Jive and Alice. When the professor checked his wristwatch, his expression grew troubled. By George, he is taking his time. Though, of course, we don't know how much time Martians. I wonder. I listened for a while, Pop his son volunteered. He was running the water a lot. Running the water, eh? We know Mars is a water-starved planet. I suppose that in the presence of unlimited water, he might be seized by a kind of madness and. But he seemed so well adjusted. Then his wife spoke, voicing all their thoughts. Her outlook on life gave her a naturally sepulchral voice. What's he doing in there? Twenty minutes and at least as many fantastic suggestions later, the professor glanced again at his watch and nerved himself for action. Motioning his family aside, he mounted the stairs and tiptoed down the hall. He paused only once to shake his head and mutter under his breath, By George, I wish I had Fenchich or von Gottschalk here. 
They're a shade better than I am on intercultural contracts, especially taboo breakings and affronts. His family followed him at a short distance. The professor stopped in front of the bathroom door. Everything was quiet as death. He listened for a minute and then rapped measuredly, steadying his hand by clutching its wrist with the other. There was a faint splashing, but no other sound. Another minute passed. The professor rapped again. Now there was no response at all. He very gingerly tried the knob. The door was still locked. When they had retreated to the stairs, it was the professor's wife who once more voiced their thoughts. This time her voice carried overtones of supernatural horror. What's he doing in there? He may be dead or dying, the professor's cultish daughter suggested briskly. Maybe we ought to call the fire department, like they did for old Mrs. Frisbee. The professor winced. I'm afraid you haven't visualized the complications, dear, he said gently. No one but ourselves knows that the Martian is on Earth, or has even the slightest inkling that interplanetary travel has been achieved. Whatever we do, it will have to be on our own. But to break in on a creature engaged in, well, we don't know what primal private activity, is against all anthropological practice. Still. Dying's a primal activity, his daughter said crisply. So's ritual bathing before mass murder, his wife added. Please. Still, as I was about to say, we do have the moral duty to succor him if, as you all too reasonably suggest, he has been incapacitated by a germ or virus or, more likely, by some simple environmental factor such as Earth's greater gravity. Tell you what, Pop, I can look in the bathroom window and see what he's doing. All I have to do is crawl out my bedroom window and along the gutter a little ways. It's safe as houses. The professor's question beginning with, Son, how do you know, died unuttered and he refused to notice the words his daughter was voicing silently at her brother. He glanced at his wife's sardonically composed face, thought once more of the fire department and of other and larger and even more jealous, or would it be skeptical? Government agencies, and clutched at the straw offered him. Ten minutes later, he was quite unnecessarily assisting his son back through the bedroom window. Gee, Pop, I couldn't see a sign of him. That's why I took so long. Hey, Pop, don't look so scared. He's in there, sure enough. It's just that the bathtub's under the window and you have to get real close up to see into it. The Martian's taking a bath? Yep. Got it full up and just the end of his little old schnozzle sticking out. Your suit, Pop, was hanging on the door. The one word the professor's wife spoke was like a death knell. Drowned. No, Ma, I don't think so. His schnozzel was opening and closing regular-like. Maybe he's a shape-changer, the professor's cultish daughter said in a burst of evil fantasy. Maybe he softens in water and thins out after a while until he's like an eel and then he'll go exploring through the sewer pipes. Wouldn't it be funny if he went under the street and knocked on the stopper from underneath and crawled into the bathtub with President Rexford, or Mrs. President Rexford, or maybe right into the middle of one of Janie Rexford's um so sexy bubble baths? Please. The professor put his hand to his eyebrows and kept it there, cuddling the elbow in his other hand. Well, have you thought of something? The professor's wife asked him after a bit. What are you going to do? The professor dropped his hand and blinked his eyes hard and took a deep breath. Telegraph Fenchich and Ackerlirem's bottom and then break in, he said in a resigned voice, into which, nevertheless, a note of hope seemed also to have come. First, however, I'm going to wait until morning. And he sat down cross-legged in the hall a few yards from the bathroom door and folded his arms. So the long vigil commenced. The professor's family shared it and he offered no objection. Other and sterner men, he told himself, might claim to be able successfully to order their children to go to bed when there was a Martian locked in the bathroom. But he would like to see them faced with the situation. Finally dawn began to seep from the bedrooms. When the bulb in the hall had grown quite dim, the professor unfolded his arms. 
Just then, there was a loud splashing in the bathroom. The professor's family looked toward the door. The splashing stopped and they heard the Martian moving around. Then the door opened and the Martian appeared in the professor's gray pinstripe suit. His mouth curled sharply downward in a broad alien smile as he saw the professor. Good morning, the Martian said happily. I never slept better in my life, even in my own little wet bed back on Mars. He looked around more closely and his mouth straightened. But where did you all sleep? he asked. Don't tell me you stayed dry all night. You didn't give up your only bed to me? His mouth curled upward in misery. Oh, dear, he said, I'm afraid I've made a mistake somehow. Yet I don't understand how. Before I studied you, I didn't know what your sleeping habits would be, but that question was answered for me, in fact. It looked so reassuringly homelike, when I saw those brief TV scenes of your females ready for sleep in their little tubs. Of course, on Mars, only the fortunate can always be sure of sleeping wet, but here, with your abundance of water, I thought there would be wet beds for all. He paused. It's true I had some doubts last night, wondering if I'd use the right words and all, but then when you rapped good night to me, I splashed the sentiment back at you and went to sleep in a wink. But I'm afraid that somewhere I've blundered in. No, no, dear chap, the professor managed to say. He had been waving his hand in a gentle circle for some time in token that he wanted to interrupt. Everything is quite all right. It's true we stayed up all night, but please consider that as a watch, an honor guard, by George, which we kept to indicate our esteem. Bread overhead. As a blisteringly hot but guaranteed weather-controlled future summer day dawned on the Mississippi Valley, the walking mills of puffy products, spiked to loaf in one operation, began to tread delicately on their centipede legs across the wheat fields of Kansas. The walking mills resembled fat metal serpents, rather larger than those Chinese paper dragons animated by files of men in procession. Sensory robot devices in their noses informed them that the waiting wheat had reached ripe perfection. As they advanced, their heads swung lazily from side to side, very much like snakes, gobbling the yellow grain. In their throats, it was threshed, the chaff bundled and burped aside for pickup by the crawl trucks of a chemical corporation. The kernels quick dried and blown along into the mighty chests of the machines. There, the tireless mills ground the kernels to flour which was instantly sifted, the bran being packaged and dropped like the chaff for pickup. A cluster of tanks which gave the metal serpents a decidedly humpbacked appearance added water, shortening, salt and other ingredients, some named and some not. The dough was at the same time infused with gas from a tank conspicuously labeled, carbon dioxide, no yeast creatures in your bread. Thus instantly risen, the dough was clipped into loaves and shot into radionic ovens forming the midsections of the metal serpents. There the bread was baked in a matter of seconds, a fierce heat front browning the crusts. And the piping hot loaves sealed in transparent plastic bearing the proud puffy loaf emblem, two cherubs circling a floating loaf, and ejected onto the delivery platform at each serpent's rear end. Where a cluster of pickup machines, like hungry piglets, snatched at the loaves with hygienic claws. A few loaves would be hurried off for the day's consumption, the majority stored for winter in strategically located mammoth deep freezes. But now, behold a wonder. As loaves began to appear on the delivery platform of the first walking mill to get into action, they did not linger on the conveyor belt. But rose gently into the air and slowly traveled off downwind across the hot rippling fields. The robot claws of the pickup machines clutched in vain, and, not noticing the difference, proceeded carefully to stack emptiness, tier by tier. One errant loaf, rising more sluggishly than its fellows, was snagged by a thrusting claw. The machine paused, clumsily wiped off the injured loaf, set it aside, where it bobbed on one corner, unable to take off again, and went back to the work of storing nothingness. A flock of crows rose from the trees of a nearby shelter belt as the flight of loaves approached. The crows swooped to investigate and then suddenly scattered, screeching in panic. 
the helicopter of a hangoverish Sunday traveler bound for Wichita shied very similarly from the brown flyers and did not return for a second look. A black-haired housewife spied them over her back fence, crossed herself and grabbed her walkie-talkie from the laundry basket. Seconds later, the yawning correspondent of a regional newspaper was jotting down the lead of a humorous news story which, recalling the old flying saucer scares, stated that now apparently bread was to be included in the mad aerial tea party. The congregation of an open-walled country church, standing up to recite the most familiar of Christian prayers, had just reached the petition for daily sustenance, when a subflight of the loaves, either forced down by a vagrant wind or lacking the natural buoyancy of the rest, came coasting silently as the sunbeams between the graceful pillars at the altar end of the building. Meanwhile, the main flight, now augmented by other bread flocks from scores and hundreds of walking mills that had started work a little later, mounted slowly and majestically into the cirrus-flecked upper air, where a steady wind was blowing strongly toward the east. About 1,000 miles farther on in that direction, where a cluster of stratosphere-tickling towers marked the location of the metropolis of New New York. A tender scene was being enacted in the pressurized penthouse managerial suite of puffy products. Megara Winterly, secretary-in-chief to the managerial board and referred to by her underlings as the Blonde Icicle, was dealing with the advances of Roger, Racehorse, Sneddon. Assistant secretary to the board and often indistinguishable from any passing office boy. Why don't you jump out the window, Roger, remembering to shut the airlock after you, the Golden Glacier said in tones not unkind. When are your high-strung, thoroughbred nerves going to accept the fact that I would never consider marriage with a business inferior? You have about as much chance as a starving Ukrainian kolok now that Moscow's clapped on the interdict. Roger's voice was calm although his eyes were feverishly bright, as he replied, a lot of things are going to be different around here, Meg. As soon as the board is forced to admit that only my quick thinking made it possible to bring the name of Puffyloaf in front of the whole world. Puffyloaf could do with a little of that, the business girl observed judiciously. The way sales have been plummeting, it won't be long before the government deeds our desks to the managers of fairy bread and asks us to take the big jump. But just where does your quick thinking come into this, Mr. Sneddon? You can't be referring to the helium, that was Rose Thinker's brainwave. She studied him suspiciously. You've birthed another promotional bumble, Roger. I can see it in your eyes. I only hope it's not as big a one as when you put the Martian ambassador on 3D and he thanked you profusely for the gross of puffy loaves. Assuring you that he'd never slept on a softer mattress in all his life on two planets. Listen to me, Meg. Today, yes, today, you're going to see the board eating out of my hand. Ha! Huh. I guarantee you won't have any fingers left. You're bold enough now, but when Mr. Grice and those two big machines come through that door. Now wait a minute, Meg. Hush. They're coming now. Roger leaped three feet in the air, but managed to land without a sound and edged toward his stool. Through the dilating iris of the door strode Phineas T. Grice, flanked by Rose Thinker and Tin Philosopher. The man approached the conference table in the center of the room with measured pace and gravely expressionless face. The rose-tinted machine on his left did a couple of impulsive pirouettes on the way and twittered a greeting to Meg and Roger. The other machine quietly took the third of the high seats and lifted a claw at Meg, who now occupied a stool twice the height of Roger's. Miss Winterly, please, our theme. The blonde icicle's face thawed into a little girl's smile as she chanted bubblingly. Made up of tiny wheaten motes. And reinforced with sturdy oats. It rises through the air and floats. The bread on which all Terra dotes. Thank you, Miss Winterly, said Tin Philosopher. Though a purely figurative statement, that bit about rising through the air always gets me, here. He wrapped his midsection, which gave off a high musical clang. Ladies, he inclined his photocells toward Rose Thinker and Meg, and gentlemen. This is a historic occasion in Old Puffy's long history, the inauguration of the helium-filled loaf, so light it almost floats away. 
in which that inert and heaven-aspiring gas replaces old-fashioned carbon dioxide. Later, there will be kudos for Rose Thinker, whose bright relays genius sparked the idea, and also for Roger Snedden, who took care of the details. By the by, Racehorse, that was a brilliant piece of work getting the helium out of the government, they've been pretty stuffy lately about their monopoly. But first I want to throw wide the casement in your minds that opens on the long view of things. Rose Thinker spun twice on her chair and opened her photocells wide. Tin Philosopher coughed to limber up the diaphragm of his speaker and continued. Ever since the first cave wife boasted to her next-end neighbor about the superior paleness and fluffiness of her tortillas. Mankind has sought lighter, whiter bread. Indeed, thinkers wiser than myself have equated the whole upward course of culture with this poignant quest. Yeast was a wonderful discovery, for its primitive day. Sifting the bran and wheat germ from the flour was an even more important advance. Early bleaching and preserving chemicals played their humble parts. For a while, barbarous fattists, blind to the deeply spiritual nature of bread, which is recognized by all great religions, held back our march toward perfection with their hair-splitting insistence on the vitamin content of the wheat germ. But their case collapsed when tasteless colorless substitutes were triumphantly synthesized and introduced into the loaf, which for flawless purity. Unequaled airiness and sheer intangible goodness was rapidly becoming mankind's supreme gustatory experience. I wonder what the stuff tastes like, Rose Thinker said out of a clear sky. I wonder what taste tastes like, Tin Philosopher echoed dreamily. Recovering himself, he continued. Then, early in the 21st century, came the epical researches of Everett Whitehead, Puffyloaf Chemist. Culminating in his paper The Structural Bubble in Cereal Masses and making possible the baking of airtight bread twenty times stronger, for its weight, than steel and of a lightness that would have been incredible even to the advanced chemist bakers of the twentieth century, a lightness so great that, besides forming the backbone of our own promotion, it has forever since been capitalized on by our conscienceless competitors of fairy bread with their enduring slogan, It Makes Ghost Toast. That's a beaut, all right, that ectodo blurb, Rose Thinker admitted, bugging her photocell sadly. Wait a sec. How about? There'll be bread. Overhead. When you're dead. It is said. Phineas T. Grice wrinkled his nostrils at the pink machine as if he smelled her insulation smoldering. He said mildly, a somewhat unhappy jingle, Rose, referring as it does to the end of the customer as consumer. Moreover, we shouldn't overplay the figurative, rises through the air angle. What inspired you? She shrugged. I don't know, oh, yes, I do. I was remembering one of the workers' songs we machines used to chant during the big strike. Work and pray. Live on hay. You'll get pie. In the sky. When you die. It's a lie. I don't know why we chanted it she added. We didn't want pie, or hay, for that matter. And machines don't pray, except Tibetan prayer wheels. Phineas T. Grice shook his head. Labor relations are another topic we should stay far away from. However, dear Rose, I'm glad you keep trying to out-jingle those dirty crooks at fairy bread. He scowled, turning back his attention to Tin Philosopher. I get whopping mad, old machine, whenever I hear that other slogan of theirs, the discriminatory one, untouched by robot claws. Just because they employ a few filthy androids in their factories. Tin Philosopher lifted one of his own sets of bright talons. Thanks, P.T. But to continue my historical resume, the next great advance in the baking art was the substitution of purified carbon dioxide, recovered from coal smoke. For the gas generated by yeast organisms indwelling in the dough and later killed by the heat of baking, their corpses remaining in situ. But even purified carbon dioxide is itself a rather repugnant gas, a product of metabolism whether fast or slow, and forever associated with those life processes which are obnoxious to the fastidious. Here the machine shuddered with delicate clinkings. Therefore, 
we of Puffyloaf are taking today what may be the ultimate step toward purity, we are aerating our loaves with the noble gas helium. An element which remains virginal in the face of all chemical temptations and whose slim molecules are eleven times lighter than obese carbon dioxide, yes, noble uncontaminable helium, which, if it be a kind of ash, is yet the ash only of radioactive burning, accomplished or initiated entirely on the sun, a safe 93 million miles from this planet. Let's have a cheer for the helium loaf. Without changing expression, Phineas T. Grice rapped the table thrice in solemn applause, while the others bowed their heads. Thanks, T. P. P. T. Then said. And now for the moment of truth. Miss Winterly, how is the helium loaf selling? The business girl clapped on a pair of earphones and whispered into a lapel mic. Her gaze grew abstracted as she mentally translated flurries of brief squawks into coherent messages. Suddenly a single vertical furrow creased her matchlessly smooth brow. It isn't, Mr. Grice. She gasped in horror. Fairy bread is outselling puffy loaves by an infinity factor. So far this morning, there has not been one single delivery of puffy loaves to any sales spot. Complaints about non-delivery are pouring in from both walking stores and Cecil shops. Mr. Snedden. Grice barked. What bug in the new helium process might account for this delay? Roger was on his feet, looking bewildered. I can't imagine, sir, unless, just possibly, there's been some unforeseeable difficulty involving the new metal foil wrappers. Metal foil wrappers? Were you responsible for those? Yes, sir. Last-minute recalculations showed that the extra lightness of the new loaf might be great enough to cause drift during stackage. Drafts in stores might topple sales pyramids. Metal foil wrappers, by their added weight, took care of the difficulty. And you ordered them without consulting the board? Yes, sir. There was hardly time and. Why, you fool. I noticed that order for metal foil wrappers, assumed it was some sub-secretary's mistake, and cancelled it last night. Roger Snedden turned pale. You cancelled it, he quavered. And told them to go back to the lighter plastic wrappers? Of course. Just what is behind all this, Mr. Snedden? What recalculations were you trusting, when our physicists had demonstrated months ago that the helium loaf was safely stackable in light airs and gentle breezes, winds up to Beaufort scale 3. Why should a change from heavier to lighter wrappers result in complete non-delivery? Roger Snedden's paleness became tinged with an interesting green. He cleared his throat and made strange gulping noises. Tin philosopher's photocells focused on him calmly, rose thinkers with unfeigned excitement. P. T. Grice's frown grew blacker by the moment, while Megara Winterly's Venus mask showed an odd dawning of dismay and awe. She was getting new squawks in her earphones. Air, ah, uh, er, Roger said in winning tones. Well, you see, the fact is that I. Hold it, Meg interrupted crisply. Triple urgent from Public Relations, Safety Division. Tulsa Topeka Aero Express makes emergency landing after being buffeted in encounter with vast flight of objects first described as brown birds. Although no failures reported in Airways electronic anti-bird fences. After grounding safely near Emporia, no fatalities, pilot's windshield found thinly plastered with soft white and brown material. Emblems on plastic wrappers embedded in material identify it incontrovertibly as an undetermined number of puffy loaves cruising at 3,000 feet. Eyes and photocells turned inquisitorially upon Roger Snedden. He went from green to puffy loaf white and blurted, All right, I did it, but it was the only way out. Yesterday morning, due to the Ukrainian crisis, the government stopped sales and deliveries of all strategic stockpiled materials, including helium gas. Puffy's new program of advertising and promotion, based on the lighter loaf, was already rolling. There was only one thing to do, there being only one other gas comparable in lightness to helium. 
I diverted the necessary quantity of hydrogen gas from the hydrogenated oil section of our magnamargarine division and substituted it for the helium. You substituted, hydrogen, for the, helium? Phineas T. Grice faltered in low mechanical tones, taking four steps backward. Hydrogen is twice as light as helium, tin philosopher remarked judiciously. And many times cheaper, did you know that? Roger countered feebly. Yes, I substituted hydrogen. The metal foil wrapping would have added just enough weight to counteract the greater buoyancy of the hydrogen loaf. But. So, when this morning's loaves began to arrive on the delivery platforms of the walking mills, Tin Philosopher left the remark unfinished. Exactly, Roger agreed dismally. Let me ask you, Mr. Snedden, Grice interjected, still in low tones, if you expected people to jump to the kitchen ceiling for their puffy bread after taking off the metal wrapper. Or reach for the sky if they happen to unwrap the stuff outdoors. Mr. Grice, Roger said reproachfully, you have often assured me that what people do with puffy bread after they buy it is no concern of ours. I seem to recall, Rose Thinker chirped somewhat unkindly. That dictum was created to answer inquiries after Roger put the famous sculptures in miniature artist on 3D and he testified that he always molded his first attempts from puffy bread. One jumbo loaf squeezing down to approximately the size of a peanut. Her photocells dimmed and brightened. Oh, boy, hydrogen. The loaf's unwrapped. After a while, in spite of the crust seal, a little oxygen diffuses in. An explosive mixture. Housewife in curlers and kimono pops a couple slices in the toaster. Boom. The three human beings in the room winced. Tin philosopher kicked her under the table, while observing, so you see, Roger, that the non-delivery of the hydrogen loaf carries some consolations. And I must confess that one aspect of the affair gives me great satisfaction, not as a board member but as a private machine. You have at last made a reality of the rises through the air part of Puffybread's theme. They can't ever take that away from you. By now, half the inhabitants of the Great Plains must have observed our flying loaves rising high. Phineas T. Grice shot a frightened look at the west windows and found his full voice. Stop the mills, he roared at Meg Winterly, who nodded and whispered urgently into her mic. A sensible suggestion, Tin Philosopher said. But it comes a trifle late in the day. If the mills are still walking and grinding, approximately seven billion puffy loaves are at this moment cruising eastward over Middle America. Remember that a six-month supply for deep freeze is involved and that the current consumption of bread, due to its matchless airiness, is eight and one-half loaves per person per day. Phineas T. Grice carefully inserted both hands into his scanty hair, feeling for a good grip. He leaned menacingly toward Roger who, chin resting on the table, regarded him apathetically. Hold it. Meg called sharply. Flock of multiple urgents coming in. News liaison, information bureaus swamped with flying bread inquiries. Aero Express lines, clear our airways or face lawsuit. U.S. Army, why do loaves flame when hit by incendiary bullets? U.S. Customs, if bread intended for export, get export license or face prosecution. Russian consulate in Chicago, advise on destination of breadlift. And some Kansas church is accusing us of a hoax inciting to blasphemy, of faking miracles, I don't know why. The business girl tore off her headphones. Roger Snedden, she cried with a hysteria that would have dumbfounded her underlings, you've brought the name of Puffyloaf in front of the whole world, all right. Now do something about the situation. Roger nodded obediently. But his pallor increased a shade, the pupils of his eyes disappeared under the upper lids, and his head burrowed beneath his forearms. Oh, boy, Rose Thinker called gaily to Tin Philosopher, this looks like the start of a real crisis session. Did you remember to bring spare batteries? Meanwhile, the monstrous flight of puffy loaves, filling Midwestern skies as no small flyers had since the days of the passenger pigeon, soared steadily onward. 
Private flyers approached the brown and glistening breadfront in curiosity and dipped back in awe. Aero Express Lines organized sightseeing flights along the flanks. Planes of the government forestry and agricultural services and copters bearing the puffy loaf emblem hovered on the fringes, watching developments and waiting for orders. A squadron of supersonic fighters hung menacingly above. The behavior of birds varied considerably. Most fled or gave the loaves a wide berth, but some bolder species, discovering the minimal nutritive nature of the translucent brown objects, attacked them furiously with beaks and claws. Hydrogen diffusing slowly through the crusts had now distended most of the sealed plastic wrappers into little balloons, which ruptured, when pierced, with disconcerting pops. Below, neck-craning citizens crowded streets and backyards, cranks and cultists had a field day, while local and national governments raged indiscriminately at Puffyloaf and at each other. Rumors that a fusion weapon would be exploded in the midst of the flying bread drew angry protests from conservationists and a flood of Telefax pamphlets titled H. Loaf or H. Bomb. Stockholm sent a mystifying note of praise to the United Nations Food Organization. Delhi issued nervous denials of a millet blight that no one had heard of until that moment and reaffirmed India's ability to feed her population with no outside help except the usual. Radio Moscow asserted that the Kremlin would brook no interference in its treatment of the Ukrainians. Jokingly referred to the flying bread as a farce perpetrated by mad internationalists inhabiting cloud cuckoo land. Added contradictory references to airborne bread booby trapped by capitalist gangsters, and then fell moodily silent on the whole topic. Radio Venus reported to its winged audience that Earth's inhabitants were establishing food depots in the upper air. Preparatory to taking up permanent aerial residence such as we have always enjoyed on Venus. New New York made feverish preparations for the passage of the flying bread. Tickets for sightseeing space in skyscrapers were sold at high prices. Cold meats and potted spreads were hawked to viewers with the assurance that they would be able to snag the bread out of the air and enjoy a historic sandwich. Phineas T. Grice, escaping from his own managerial suite, raged about the city, demanding general cooperation in the stretching of great nets between the skyscrapers to trap the errant loaves. He was captured by Tin Philosopher, escaped again, and was found posted with oxygen mask and submachine gun on the topmost spire of Puffyloaf Tower. Apparently determined to shoot down the loaves as they appeared and before they involved his company in more trouble with customs and the State Department. Recaptured by Tin Philosopher, who suffered only minor bullet holes, he was given a series of mild electroshocks and returned to the conference table, calm and clear-headed as ever. But the bread flight, swinging away from a hurricane moving up the Atlantic coast, crossed a clouded in Boston by night and disappeared into a high Atlantic overcast. Also thereby evading a local storm generated by the weather department in a last-minute effort to bring down or at least disperse the H loaves. Warnings and counterwarnings by communist and capitalist governments seriously interfered with military trailing of the flight during this period and it was actually lost in touch with for several days. At scattered points, seagulls were observed fighting over individual loaves floating down from the gray roof, that was all. A mood of spirituality strongly tinged with humor seized the people of the world. Ministers sermonized about the bread, variously interpreting it as a call to charity, a warning against gluttony, a parable of the evanescence of all earthly things, and a divine joke. Husbands and wives, facing each other across their walls of breakfast toast, burst into laughter. The mere sight of a loaf of bread anywhere was enough to evoke guffaws. An obscure sect, having as part of its creed the injunction, don't take yourself so damn seriously, won new adherents. The bread flight, rising above an Atlantic storm widely reported to have destroyed it, passed unobserved across a foggy England and rose out of the overcast only over Middle Europa. The loaves had at last reached their maximum altitude. The sun's rays beat through the rarefied air on the distended plastic wrappers, increasing still further the pressure of the confined hydrogen. They burst by the millions and tens of millions. A high-flying Bulgarian evangelist, 
who had happened to mistake the up lever for the east lever in the cockpit of his flyer and who was the sole witness of the event. Afterward described it as, the foaming of a sea of diamonds, the crackle of God's knuckles. By the millions and tens of millions, the loaves coasted down into the starving Ukraine. Shaken by a week of humor that threatened to invade even its own grim precincts, the Kremlin made a sudden about-face. A new policy was instituted of communal ownership of the produce of communal farms, and teams of hunger fighters and caravans of trucks loaded with pumpernickel were dispatched into the Ukraine. World distribution was given to a series of photographs showing peasants queuing up to trade scavenged puffy loaves for traditional black bread. Recently aerated itself but still extra solid by comparison, the rate of exchange demanded by the Moscow teams being 20 puffy loaves to one of pumpernickel. Another series of photographs, picturing chubby workers' children being blown to bits by booby-trapped bread, was quietly destroyed. Congratulatory notes were exchanged by various national governments and world organizations, including the Brotherhood of Free Business Machines. The Great Bread Flight was over, though for several weeks afterward scattered falls of loaves occurred, giving rise to a new folklore of manna among lonely Arabian tribesmen. And in one well-authenticated instance in Tibet, sustaining life in a party of mountaineers cut off by a snow slide. Back in New New York, the managerial board of Puffy Products slumped in utter collapse around the conference table, the long crisis session at last ended. Empty coffee cartons were scattered around the chairs of the three humans, dead batteries around those of the two machines. For a while, there was no movement whatsoever. Then Roger Snedden reached out wearily for the earphones where Megara Winterly had hurled them down, adjusted them to his head, pushed a button and listened apathetically. After a bit, his gaze brightened. He pushed more buttons and listened more eagerly. Soon he was sitting tensely upright on his stool, eyes bright and lower face all a smile, muttering terse comments and questions into the lapel mic torn from Meg's fair neck. The others, reviving, watched him, at first dully, then with quickening interest, especially when he jerked off the earphones with a happy shout and sprang to his feet. Listen to this. He cried in a ringing voice. As a result of the worldwide publicity, puffy loaves are outselling fairy bread three to one, and that's just the old carbon dioxide stock from our freezers. It's almost exhausted, but the government, now that the Ukrainian crisis is over, has taken the ban off helium and will also sell a stockpiled wheat if we need it. We can have our walking mills burrowing into the wheat caves in a matter of hours. But that isn't all. The far greater demand everywhere is for puffy loaves that will actually float. Public Relations, Child Liaison Division, reports that the kiddies are making their mothers' lives miserable about it. If only we can figure out some way to make hydrogen non-explosive or the helium loaf float just a little. I'm sure we can take care of that quite handily, Tin Philosopher interrupted briskly. Puffyloaf has kept it a corporation secret, even you've never been told about it, but just before he went crazy. Everett Whitehead discovered a way to make bread using only half as much flour as we do in the present loaf. Using this secret technique, which we've been saving for just such an emergency, it will be possible to bake a helium loaf as buoyant in every respect as the hydrogen loaf. Good. Roger cried. We'll tether M on strings and sell M like balloons. No mother-child shopping team will leave the store without a cluster. Buying bread balloons will be the big event of the day for kitties. It'll make the carry-home shopping load lighter too. I'll issue orders at once. He broke off, looking at Phineas T. Grice, said with quiet assurance, Excuse me, sir, if I seem to be taking too much upon myself. Not at all, son, go straight ahead, the great manager said approvingly. You're, he laughed in anticipation of getting off a memorable remark, rising to the challenging situation like a genuine puffy loaf. Megara Winterly looked from the older man to the younger. Then in a single leap she was upon Roger, her arms wrapped tightly around him. My sweet little ever-victorious, self-propelled monkey wrench, she crooned in his ear. Roger looked fatuously over her soft shoulder at Tin Philosopher who, 
as if moved by some similar feeling, reached over and touched Claus with Rose Thinker. This, however, was what he telegraphed silently to his fellow machine across the circuit so completed. Good o, Rosie. That makes another victory for robot engineered world unity, though you almost gave us away at the start with that bread overhead jingle. We've struck another blow against the next world war, in which, as we know only too well, we machines would suffer the most. Now if we can only arrange, say, a fur famine in Alaska and a migration of long-haired Siberian lemmings across Bering Straits, we'd have to swing the Japanese current up there so it'd be warm enough for the little fellows. Anyhow, Rosie, with a spot of help from the Brotherhood, those humans will paint themselves into the peace corner yet. Meanwhile, he and Rose Thinker quietly watched the blonde icicle melt. The Last Letter On 10th Month 1, 2457 AD, at exactly 9 a.m. Planetary Federation time, but with a permissible error of a millionth of a second either way, in the fifth sublevel of New New York Robot Postal Station 68. Black Sorter gulped down 10,000 pieces of first-class mail. This breakfast tidbit did not agree with the mail-sorting machine. It was as if a robust dog had been fed a large chunk of good red meat with a strychnine pill in it. Black Sorter's innards went were clunk, a blue electric glow enveloped him, and he began to shake as if he might break loose from the concrete. He desperately spat back over his shoulder a single envelope, gave a great huff and blew out toward the sorting tubes a medium-sized snowstorm consisting of the other 9,000. 999 pieces of first-class mail chewed to confetti. Then, still convulsed, he snapped up a fresh 10,000 and proceeded to chomp and grind on them. Black Sorter was rugged. The rejected envelope was tongued up by Red Subsorter, who growled deep in his throat, said a very bad word, and passed it to Yellow Rerouter, who passed it to Green Rerouter, who passed it to Brown Study, who passed it to Pink Wastebasket. Unlike Black Sorter, Pink Wastebasket was very delicate, though highly intuitive, the machine equivalent of a white Russian countess. She was designed to scan in 3137 codes, route special delivery space mail to interplanetary liners by messenger rocket, and distinguish nines from upside-down SXS. Pink Wastebasket haughtily inhaled the offending envelope and almost instantly turned a bright crimson and began to tremble. After a few minutes, small atomic flames started to flicker from her midsection. White Nursemaid Seven and Greasy Joe both received Pink Wastebasket's distress signal and got there as fast as their wheels would roll them. But the highborn machine's malady was beyond their simple skills of oil can and electroshock. They summoned other machine tending and repairing machines, ones far more expert than themselves, but all were baffled. It was clear that Pink Wastebasket, who continued to tremble and flicker uncontrollably, was suffering from the equivalent of a major psychosis with severe psychosomatic symptoms. She spat a stream of filthy ions at Gray Psychiatrist, not recognizing her old friend. Meanwhile, the paper blizzard from Black Sorter was piling up in great drifts between the dark pillars of the sublevel, and flurries had reached Pink Wastebasket's aristocratic area. An expedition of sturdy machines, headed by two hastily summoned snowplows, was dispatched to immobilize Black Sorter at all costs. Pink Wastebasket, quivering like a demented hula dancer, was clearly approaching a crisis. Finally Gray Psychiatrist, after consulting with Green Surgeon, and even then with an irritated reluctance, as if he were calling in a witch doctor, summoned a human being. The human being walked respectfully around Pink Wastebasket several times and then gave her a nervous little poke with a rubber-handled probe. Pink Wastebasket gently regurgitated her last snack, turned dead white, gave a last flicker and shake, and expired. Black Coroner recorded the immediate cause of death as tinkering by a human being. The human being, a bald and scrawny one named Pot Shelter, picked up the envelope responsible for all the trouble, stared at it incredulously, opened it with trembling fingers. Scanned the contents briefly, gave a great shriek and ran off at top speed, forgetting to hop on his perambulator, which followed him making anxious clucking noises. 
the nearest human representative of the Solar Bureau of Investigation, a rather wooden-looking man named Crumbine, also bald. Recognized Pot Shelter as soon as the latter burst gasping into his office, squeezing through the door while it was still dilating. The human beings whose work took them among the top brass, as the upper echelon machines were sometimes referred to, formed a kind of human elite, just one big nervous family. Sit down, Pot Shelter, the SBI man said. Hold still a second so the chair can grab you. Hitch onto the hookah and choose a tranquilizer from the tray at your elbow. Whatever deviation you've uncovered can't be that much of a danger to the planets. I imagine that when you leave this office, the solar battle fleet will still be orbiting peacefully around Luna. I seriously doubt that. Pot Shelter gulped a large lavender pill and took a deep breath. Crumbine, a letter turned up in the first-class mail this morning. Great Scott! It is a letter from one person to another person. Good Lord! The flow of advertising has been seriously interfered with. At a modest estimate, 300 million pieces of expensive first-class advertising have already been chewed to rags and I'm not sure the steel helms, God bless them. Have the trouble in hand yet. Judas Priest. Naturally the poor machines weren't able to cope with the letter. It was utterly outside their experience, beyond the furthest reach of their programming. It threw them into a terrible spasm. Pink Wastebasket is dead and at this very instant, if we're lucky, three police machines of the toughest blued steel are holding down Black Sorter and putting a muzzle on him. Great Scott! It's incredible, Pot Shelter. And Pink Wastebasket dead? Take another tranquilizer, Pot Shelter, and hand over the tray. Crumbine received it with trembling fingers, started to pick up a big pink pill but drew back his hand from it in sudden revulsion at its color and swallowed two blue oval ones instead. The man was obviously fighting to control himself. He said unsteadily, I almost never take doubles, but this news you bring, good lord. I seem to recall a case where someone tried to send a sound tape through the mails, but that was before my time. Incidentally, is there any possibility that this is a letter sent by one group of persons to another group? A hive or a therapy group or a social club? That would be bad enough, of course, but... No, just one single person sending to another. Pot Shelter's expression set in grimly solicitous lines. I can see you don't quite understand, Crumbine. This is not a sound tape, but a letter written in letters. You know, letters, characters, like books. Don't mention books in this office. Crumbine drew himself up angrily and then slumped back. Excuse me, Pot Shelter, but I find this very difficult to face squarely. Do I understand you to say that one person has tried to use the mails to send a printed sheet of some sort to another? Worse than that. A written letter. Written? I don't recognize the word. It's a way of making characters, of forming visual equivalents of sound, without using electricity. The writer, as he's called, employs a black liquid and a pointed stick called a pen. I know about this because one hobby of mine is ancient means of communication. Crumbine frowned and shook his head. Communication is a dangerous business, pot shelter, especially at the personal level. With you and me, it's all right because we know what we're doing. He picked up a third blue tranquilizer. But with most of the hive folk, person-to-person -person communication is only a morbid form of advertising, a dangerous travesty of normal newscasting, catharsis without the analyst. Recitation without the teacher, a perversion of promotion employed in betraying and subverting. The frown deepened as he put the blue pill in his mouth and chewed it. But about this pen, do you mean the fellow glues the pointed stick to his tongue and then speaks, and the black liquid traces the vibrations on the paper? A primitive non-electrical oscilloscope? Sloppy but conceivable, and producing a record of sorts of the spoken word. No, no, Crumbine. Pot Shelter nervously popped a square orange tablet into his mouth. It's a handwritten letter. Crumbine watched him. I never mix tranquilizers, he boasted absently. 
handwritten, eh? You mean that the message was imprinted on a hand? And the skin or the entire hand afterward detached and sent through the mails in the fashion of a Martian reproach? A grisly find indeed, pot shelter. You still don't quite grasp it, crumbine. The fingers of the hand move the stick that applies the ink, producing a crude imitation of the printed word. Diabolical. Crumbine smashed his fist down on the desk so that the four phones and two score microphones rattled. I tell you, Pot Shelter, the SBI, is ready to cope with the subtlest modern deceptions, but when fiends search out and revive tricks from the pre atomic cave era, it's almost too much. But, great Scott, I dally while the planets are in danger. What's the sender's code on this hellish letter? No code, Pot Shelter said darkly preferring the envelope. The return address is, handwritten. Crumbine blanched as his eyes slowly traced the uneven lines in the upper left-hand corner. From Richard Rowe. 215 West 10th Street. Horizontal. 2837 Rocket Court, Vertical. Hive 37, New New York 319, New York. Columbia, Terra. Ugh. Crumbine said, shivering. Those crawling characters, those letters, as you call them, those things barely enough like print to be readable, they seem to be on the verge of awakening all sorts of horrid racial memories. I find myself thinking of fur-clad witch doctors dipping long pointed sticks in bubbling black cauldrons. No wonder Pink Wastebasket couldn't take it, brave girl. Firming himself behind his desk, he pushed a number of buttons and spoke long numbers and meaningful alphabetical syllables into several microphones. Banks of colored lights around the desk began to blink like a theater marquee sending Morse code. While phosphorescent arrows crawled purposefully across maps and space charts and through three-dimensional street diagrams. There, he said at last. The sender of the letter is being apprehended and will be brought directly here. We'll see what sort of man this Richard Rowe is, if we can assume he's human. Seven precautionary cordons are being drawn around his population station, three composed of machines, two of SBI agents, and two consisting of human and mechanical medical combat teams. Same goes for the intended recipient of the letter. Meanwhile, a destroyer squadron of the Solar Fleet has been detached to orbit over New New York. In case it becomes necessary to Z-bomb? Pot Shelter asked grimly. Crumbine nodded. With all those villains lurking just outside the solar system in their invisible black ships, with planeticide in their hearts, we can't be too careful. One word transmitted from one spy to another and anything may happen. And we must bomb before they do, so as to contain our losses. Better one city destroyed than a traitor on the loose who may destroy many cities. One hundred years ago, three person-to-person -person postcards went through the mails, just three postcards, pot shelter. And PFT went Schenectady, Hoboken, Cicero, and Walla Walla. Here, as long as you're mixing them, try one of these oval blues, I find them best for steady swallowing. Bells jangled. Crumbine grabbed up two phones, holding one to each ear. Pot Shelter automatically picked up a third. The ringing continued. Crumbine started to wedge one of his phones under his chin, nodded sharply at Pot Shelter and then toward a cluster of microphones at the end of the table. Pot Shelter picked up a fourth phone from behind them. The ringing stopped. The two men listened, looking doped, Crumbine with an eye fixed on the sweep second hand of the large wall clock. When it had made one revolution, he cradled his phones. Pot Shelter followed suit. I do like the simplicity of the new on the hour puffy loaf phono commercial, the latter remarked thoughtfully. The bread that's lighter than air. Nice. Crumbine nodded. I hear they've had to add mass to the lead foil wrapping to keep the loaves from floating off the shelves. Fact. He cleared his throat. Too bad we can't listen to more phono commercials, but even when there isn't a crisis on the agenda, I find I have to budget my listening time. One minute per hour strikes a reasonable balance between duty and self-indulgence. 
the nearest wall began to sing. Mr. J. Augustus Crumbine. We all think you're fine, 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 fine. Now out of the skyey blue. Come some telegrams for you. The wall opened to a small heart shape toward the center and a sheaf of pale yellow envelopes arced out and plopped on the middle of the desk. Crumbine started to leaf through them, scanning the little transparent windows. Hmm, electronic soap. Better homes and landing platforms. Psycho blinkers. Your girl next door. Poppy whoppies. Poopsie whoopsies. He started to open an envelope, then. After a quick look around and an apologetic smile at pot shelter, dumped them all on the disposal hopper, which gargled briefly. After all, there is a crisis this morning, he said in a defensive voice. Pot shelter nodded absently. I can remember back before personalized delivery and rhyming robots, he observed. But how I'd miss them now, so much more distingue than the hives with their non-personalized radio, TV and stereo advertising. For that matter. I believe there are some backward areas on Terra where the great advertising potential of telephones and telegrams hasn't been fully realized and they are still used in part for personal communication. Now me, I've never in my life sent or received a message except on my walkie-talkie. He patted his breast pocket. Crumbine nodded, but he was a trifle shocked and inclined to revise his estimate of Potshelter's social status. Crumbine conducted his own social correspondence solely by telepathy. He shared with three other SBI officials a private telepath, a charming albino girl named Agnes. Yes, and it's a very handsome walkie-talkie, he assured Pot Shelter a little falsely. Suits you. I like the upswept antenna. He drummed on the desk and swallowed another blue tranquilizer. Damn it, what's happened to those machines? They ought to have the two spies here by now. Did you notice that the second, the intended recipient of the letter, I mean, seems to be female? Another good Terran name, too, Jane Doe. Hive in Upper Manhattan. He began to tap the envelope sharply against the desk. Damn it, where are they? Excuse me, Pot Shelter said hesitantly, but I'm wondering why you haven't read the message inside the envelope. Crumbine looked at him blankly. Great Scott, I assumed that at least it was in some secret code, of course. Normally I'd have asked you to have Pink Wastebasket try her skill on it, but, his eyes widened and his voice sank. You don't mean to tell me that it's... Pot Shelter nodded grimly. Handwritten, too. Yes. Crumbine winced. I keep trying to forget that aspect of the case. He dug out the message with shaking fingers, fumbled it open and read. Dear Jane. It must surprise you that I know your name, for our hives are widely separated. Do you recall day before yesterday when your guided tour of Grand Central Spaceport got stalled because the guide blew a fuse? I was the young man with hair in the tour behind yours. You were a little frightened and a group mistress was reassuring you. The machine spoke your name. Since then I have been unable to forget you. When I go to sleep, I dream of your face looking up sadly at the mistress's kindly photocells. I don't know how to get in touch with you. But my grandfather has told me stories his grandfather told him that his grandfather told him about young men writing what he calls love letters to young ladies. So I am writing you a love letter. I work in a first-class advertising house and I will slip this love letter into an outgoing 10,000-pack and hope. Do not be frightened of me, Jane. I am no caveman except for my hair. I am not insane. I am emotionally disturbed, but in a way that no machine has ever described to me. I want only your happiness. Sincerely. Richard Rowe. Crumbine slumped back in his chair, which braced itself manfully against him, and looked long and thoughtfully at Pot Shelter. Well, if that's a code, it's certainly a fiendishly subtle one. You'd think he was talking to his girl next door. Pot Shelter nodded wonderingly. I only read as far as where they were planning to blow up Grand Central Spaceport and all the guides in it. 
Judas Priest, I think I have it. Crumbine shot up. It's a pilot advertisement, boy next door or, that kind of thing, printed to look like handwritten, which would make all the difference. And the pilot copy got mailed by accident, which would mean there is no real Richard Rowe. At that instant, the door dilated and two blue detective engines hustled a struggling young man into the office. He was slim, rather handsome, had a bushy head of hair that had somehow survived evolution and radioactive fallout. And across the chest and back of his paper singlet was neatly stamped, Richard Rowe. When he saw the two men, he stopped struggling and straightened up. Excuse me, gentlemen, he said, but these police machines must have made a mistake. I've committed no crime. Then his gaze fell on the hand-addressed envelope on Crumbine's desk and he turned pale. Crumbine laughed harshly. No crime. No, not at all. Merely using the mails to communicate. Ha! Huh. The young man shrank back. I'm sorry, sir. Sorry, he says. Do you realize that your insane prank has resulted in the destruction of perhaps a half billion pieces of first-class advertising? In the strangulation of a postal station and the paralysis of Lower Manhattan, in the mobilization of SBI reserves, the demothballing of two divisions of GI machines and the redeployment of the solar battle fleet? Good lord, boy, why did you do it? Richard Rowe continued to shrink but he squared his shoulders. I'm sorry, sir, but I just had to. I just had to get in touch with Jane Doe. A girl from another hive? A girl you'd merely gazed at because a guide happened to blow a fuse? Crumbine stood up, shaking an angry finger. Great Scott, boy, where was your girl next door? Richard Rowe stared bravely at the finger, which made him look a trifle cross-eyed. She died, sir, both of them. But there should be at least six. I know, sir, but of the other four, two have been shipped to the Adirondacks on vacation and two recently got married and haven't been replaced. Pot Shelter, a faraway look in his eyes, said softly, I think I'm beginning to understand. But Crumbine thundered on at Richard Rowe with, Good Lord, I can see you've had your troubles, boy. It isn't often we have these shortages of girls next door, so that temporarily a boy can't marry the girl next door, as he always should. But, Judas Priest, why didn't you take your troubles to your psychiatrist, your groupmaster, your socializer, your queen mother? My psychiatrist is being overhauled, sir, and his replacement short circuits every time he hears the word, trouble. My groupmaster and socializer are on vacation duty in the Adirondacks. My queen mother is busy replacing girls next door. Yes, it all fits, Potshelter proclaimed excitedly. Don't you see, Crumbine? Except for a set of mischances that would only occur once in a billion billion times, the letter would never have been conceived or sent. You may have something there, Crumbine concurred. But in any case, boy, why did you, er, written this letter to this particular girl? What is there about Jane Doe that made you do it? Well, you see, sir, she's. Just then, the door redilated and a blue matron machine conducted a young woman into the office. She was slim and she had a head of hair that would have graced a museum beauty, while across the back end, well, chest, is an inadequate word, of her paper chemise. Jane Doe was silk-screened in the palest pink. Crumbine did not repeat his last question. He had to admit to himself that it had been answered fully. Pot Shelter whistled respectfully. The blue detective engines gave hard-boiled grunts. Even the blue matron machine seemed awed by the girl's beauty. But she had eyes only for Richard Rowe. My grand central man, she breathed in amazement. The man I've dreamed of ever since. My man with hair. She noticed the way he was looking at her and she breathed harder. Oh, darling, what have you done? I tried to send you a letter. A letter? For me? Oh, darling. Crumbine cleared his throat. Pot shelter, I'm going to wind this up fast. Miss Doe, could you transfer to this young man's hive? 
Oh, yes, sir. Mine has an overplus of girls next door. Good. Mr. Rowe, there's a sky pilot two levels up, look for the usual white collar just below the photocells. Marry this girl and take her home to your hive. If your queen mother objects refer her to, er, pot shelter here. He cut short the young people's thanks. Just one thing, he said, wagging a finger at Ro. Don't written any more letters. Why ever would I? Richard answered. Already my action is beginning to seem like a mad dream. Not to me, dear, Jane corrected him. Oh, sir, could I have the letter he sent me? Not to do anything with. Not to show anyone. Just to keep. Well, I don't know, Crumbine began. Oh, please, sir. Well, I don't know why not, I was going to say. Here you are, miss. Just see that this husband of yours never writtens another. He turned back as the contracting door shut the young couple from view. You were right, pot shelter, he said briskly. It was one of those combinations of mischances that come up only once in a billion billion times. But we're going to have to issue recommendations for new procedures and safeguards that will reduce the possibilities to one in a trillion trillion. It will undoubtedly up the Terran income tax a healthy percentage, but we can't have something like this happening again. Every boy must marry the girl next door. And the first-class males must not be interfered with. The advertising must go through. I'd almost like to see it happen again, Pot Shelter murmured dreamily, if there were another Jane Doe in it. Outside, Richard and Jane had halted to allow a small cortege of machines to pass. First came a squad of police machines with Black Sorter in their midst, unmuzzled and docile enough, though still gnashing his teeth softly. Then, stretched out horizontally and borne on the shoulders of grey psychiatrist, black coroner, white nursemaid Seven and Greasy Joe, there passed the slim form of pink wastebasket. Snow White in death. The machines were keening softly, mournfully. Round about the black pillars, little mechomops were scurrying like mice, cleaning up the last of the first-class male bits of confetti. Richard winced at this evidence of his aberration, but Jane squeezed his hand comfortingly, which produced in him a truly amazing sensation that changed his whole appearance. I know how you feel, darling, she told him. But don't worry about it. Just think, dear, I'll always be able to tell your friend's wives something no other woman in the world can boast of, that my husband once wrote me a letter. Bullet with his name. The invisible being shifted his anchorage a bit in Earth's gravitational field, which felt like a push rather than a pull to him, and said. This featherless biped seems to satisfy Galaxy Center's requirements. I'd say he's a suitable recipient for the gifts. His coadjutor, equally invisible and negatively masked, chewed that over. Mature by his length and mass. Artificial plumage neither overly gaudy nor utterly drab, indicating median social level, which is confirmed by the size of his bachelor nest. Inward maps of his environment not fantastically inaccurate. Feelings reasonably meshed, at least neither volcanic nor frozen. Thoughts and values in reasonable order. Yes, I agree, a satisfactory test subject. Except. Except what? Except we can never be sure of that, reasonable, part. Of course not. Thank your stars that's beyond the reach of Galaxy Center's keenest telepathy, or even ours on the spot. Otherwise you and I'd be out of a job. And have to scheme up some other excuse for free touring the cosmos with backtracking permitted. Exactly. The being and his coadjutor understood each other very well and were the best of friends. Well, how many gifts would you suggest for the test? How about two little and one big? The coadjutor ventured. Um, statistically adequate but spiritually unsatisfying. Remember, the fate of his race hangs on his reactions to them. I'd be inclined to increase your suggestion by one each and add a great. No, at least I question the last. After all, the great gifts aren't as important, really, as the big gifts. Besides. Besides what? 
Come on, spit it out. The invisible being was the bluff, blunt type. Well, said his less hearty but unswervingly honest companion. I'm always afraid that you'll use the granting of a great gift as an excuse for some sardonic trick, that you'll put a sting in its tail. And why shouldn't I, if I want to? Snakes have stings in their tails, or do they on this planet, and I'm a sort of snake. If he fails the test, he fails. And aren't both of us malicious, plaguing spirits, eager to knock holes in the inward armor of provincial entities? It's in the nature of our job. But we can argue about that in due course. What little gifts would you suggest? That's something I want to talk about. Many of the little gifts are already well within his race's reach, if not his. After all, they've already got atomic power. Which as you very well know scores them nothing one way or the other on a galaxy center test. We're agreed on the nature and the number of our gifts, three little, two big, and one great. Yes, his coadjutor responded resignedly. And we're agreed on our subject? Yes to that too. All right, then, let's get started. This isn't the only solar system we have to visit on this circuit. Ernie Meeker, of Chicago, Illinois, U.S. of A. Occident, Terra, Sol, Stars Warm 37, Rim Sector, Milky Way Galaxy, rubbed his chin and slanted across the street to a drugstore. Package of Blades. Double Edge. 5. Cheapest. At one point during the transaction, the clerk lost sight of the tiny packet he'd placed on the coin whitened glass between them. He gave a suspicious look, as if the customer had palmed them. Ernie blinked. After a moment, he pointed toward the center of the counter. There they are, he said, dropping a coin beside them. The clerk's face didn't get any less suspicious. Customer who could sneak something without your seeing could sneak it back the same way. He rang up the sale and closed the register fast. Ernie Meeker went home and shaved. Five days, and shaves, later, he pushed the first blade, uncomfortably dull now, through the tiny slot beside the bathroom mirror. He unwrapped the second blade from the packet. Five shaves later, he cut himself under the chin with the second blade, although he was drawing it as gently through his soaked beard as if it were only his second shave with it or at most his third. He looked at it sourly and checked the packet. Wouldn't have been the first time he'd absent-mindedly changed blades ahead of schedule. But there were still three blades in their waxed wrappings. Maybe, he thought, he'd still had one of the blades from the last packet and shuffled it into this series. Or maybe, although the manufacturers undoubtedly had inspectors to prevent it from happening, he'd got a decent blade for once. Two or three shaves later, it still seemed as sharp as ever, or almost so. Funny thing, he remarked to Bill at lunch, sometimes you get a blade that shaves a lot better. Looks exactly like the others, but shaves better. Or worse sometimes, of course. And sometimes, his office mate said, you wear out a blade fast by not soaking your beard enough. For me, one shave with a stiff beard and the blades through. On the other hand, if you're careful to soak your beard real good, for, five minutes at least, have the water steaming hot, get the soap really into it, one blade can last a long time. That's true, all right, Ernie agreed, trying to remember how well he had been soaking his beard lately. Shaving was a good topic for light conversation, warm and agreeable, like most bathroom and kitchen topics. But next morning in the bathroom, Looking at the reflection of his unremarkable face, there was something chilly in his feelings that he couldn't quite analyze. He flipped his razor open and suspiciously studied the bright metal wafer, then flipped it closed with an irritated shrug. As he shaved, it occurred to him that a good detective story murder method would be to substitute a very sharp razor blade for one the victim knew was extremely dull. He'd whip it across his throat putting a lot of muscle into the stroke to get through the tangle, and, irk. Ridiculous, of course. Wouldn't work except with a straight razor. Wouldn't even work with a straight razor, unless, oh, well. He told himself the blade was noticeably duller today. 
Next morning, he was still using the freak blade, but with a persistent though very slight uneasiness. Things should behave as you expected them to, in accordance with their flimsy souls, he told himself at the barely conscious level. Men should die, hearts should break, girls should tell, nations perish, curtains get dirty, milk sour, and razor blades grow dull. It was the comfortable, expected, reassuring way. He told himself the blade was duller still. Just a bit. The third morning, face lathered, he flipped open the razor and lifted it out. You're through, he said to it silently. I've had the experience before of getting bum shaves by trying to save a penny by pretending to myself that a worn-out blade was still sharp enough, when it obviously couldn't be. Or maybe, he grinned a little wryly, maybe I'd almost get one more shave out of you and then you'd fall to pieces like the wonderful one-horse shea and leave me with a chin full of steel porcupine. Quills. No, thanks. So Ernie Meeker pushed through the little slot beside the mirror and heard tinkle faintly down and away the first of the little gifts, the everlasting razor blade. One hundred and fifty thousand years later, it turned up, bright and shining. In the midst of a small knob of red iron oxide excavated by an archaeological expedition of multibrox from Antares Gamma. Those wise history-mad beings handed it about wonderingly, from tentacle to impatient tentacle. That day, Ernie felt a little sick, somehow. After dinner, he decided it was the Thuringer sausage he'd eaten at lunch. He hurried up to the bathroom with a spoon, but as he clutched the box of bicarbonate of soda, preparatory to plunging the spoon into it, it seemed to him that the box said distinctly. In a small inward-outward voice. No, no, no. Ernie sat down suddenly on the toilet seat. The spoon rattled against the porcelain finish of the washbowl as he laid it down. He held the box firmly in both hands and studied it. Size, shape, materials, blue color, closure, etc., were exactly as they should be. But the white lettering on the blue background read. Aqueous Fuel Catalyst Dissociates H2O into hemiquasi-stable HNO. Furnishing a serviceable fuel anoxidizer mix for most motorcycles, automobiles, trucks, motorboats, airplanes, stationary motors, torque twisters, translators. And rockets, exhaust velocity up to 6,000 meters per second. Operates safely within and outside of all normal atmospheres. No special adapter needed on oxygenizer atmosphere motors. Directions, place one pinch in fuel tank. Fill with water. Add water as needed. AF catalyst should generally be renewed when objective tests show fuel quality has deteriorated 50%. U.S. and foreign patents pending. After reading that several times, with suitable mind checking and eye testing in between, Ernie took up a little of the white powder on the end of a nail file. He had thought of tasting it but had instantly abandoned the notion and even refrained from sniffing the stuff, after all, the human body is mostly water. After reducing the quantity several times, he gingerly dumped at most four or five grains on the flat edge of the washbowl and then used the broad end of the nail file to maneuver a large bead of water over to the almost invisible white deposit. He closed the box, put it and the nail file carefully on the window ledge, lit a match and touched it to the drop, at the last moment ducking his head a little below the level of the washbowl. Nothing happened. After a moment, he slowly withdrew the match, shaking it out, and looked. There was nothing to see. He reached out to touch the stupid squashed ovoid of water. Ouch! He withdrew his fingers much faster than the match, shook them more sharply. Something was there, all right. Heat. Heat enough to hurt. He cautiously explored the boundaries of the heat. It became noticeable about 18 inches above the drop and almost an inch to each side, an invisible slim vertical cylinder. Crouching close, eyes level with the top of the washbowl, he could make out the flame, a thin finger of crinkled light. He noticed that a corner of the drop was seething, but only a corner. 
as if the heat were sharply bounded in that direction and perhaps as if the catalyst were only transforming the water to fuel a bit at a time. He reached up and tugged off the light. Now he could see the flame, ghostly, about four inches high, hardly thicker than a string, and colored not blue but pale green. A spectral green needle. He blew at it softly. It shimmied gracefully, but not, he thought, as much as the flame of a match or candle. It had character. He switched on the light. The drop was more than half gone now. The part that was left was all seething. And the bathroom was markedly warmer. Ernie! Are you going to be much longer? The knock hadn't been loud and his widowed sister's voice was more apologetic than peremptory, but he jumped, of course. I am testing something, he started to say and changed it midway. It came out, I am be out in a minute. He turned off the light again. The flame was a little shorter now and it shrank as he watched, about a quarter inch a second. As soon as it died, he switched on the light. The drop was gone. He scrubbed off the spot with a dry wash rag, on second thought put a dab of Vaseline on the wash rag. Scrubbed the spot again with that, he didn't like to think of even a grain of the powder getting in the drains or touching any water. He folded the wash rag, tucked it in his pocket, put the blue box, after a final check of the lettering, in his other coat pocket, and opened the door. I was taking some bicarb, he told his sister. Thuringer sausage at lunch. She nodded absently. Sleep refused even to flirt with Ernie, his mind was full of so many things, especially calculations involving the distance between his car and the house and the length of the garden hose. In desperation, as the white hours accumulated and his thoughts began to squirm, he grabbed up the detective story he'd bought at the corner newsstand. He had read thirty pages before he realized that he was turning them as rapidly as he could focus just once on each facing page. He jumped out of bed. My God, he thought, at that rate he'd finished the book under three minutes and here it wasn't even two o'clock yet. He selected the thickest book on the shelf, an overpoweringly dull historical treatise in small print. He turned two pages, three, then closed it with a clap and looked at the wall with frightened eyes. Ernie Meeker had discovered, inside the birthday box that was himself, the first of the big gifts. The trouble was that in that wee hour, lonely bedroom, it didn't seem like a gift at all. How would he ever keep himself in books, he wondered, if he read them so fast. And think how full to bursting his mind would get, right now, the seven pages of fine print history were churning in it, vividly clear, along with the first chapters of the new detective story. If he kept on absorbing information that fast, he'd have to be revising all his opinions and beliefs every couple of days at least, maybe every couple of hours. It seemed a dreadful, literally maddening prospect, his mind would ultimately become a universe of squirming macaroni. Even the wallpaper he was staring at, which imitated the grain of wood, had in an instant become so fully part of his consciousness that he felt he could turn his back on it right now and draw a picture of it correct to the tiniest detail. But who would ever want to do such a thing, or want to be able to? It was an abnormal, dangerous, temporary sensitivity, he told himself, generated by the excitement of the crazy discovery he'd made in the bathroom. Like the thoughts of a drowning man, riffling an infinity-paneled adventure comic of his life as he bolts his last rough ration of air. Or like the feeling a psychotic must have that he's on the verge of visualizing the whole universe. Having its ultimate secrets patter down into the palm of his outstretched hand, just before the walls close in. Ernie Meeker was not a drinking man, then. A pint had stood a week on his closet shelf and only been diminished three shots. But now he did a good job on the sturdy remainder. Pretty soon the unbearable, edge of doom clarity in his mind faded, the universe macaroni cooked down to a thick white soup uniform as fog. And the words of the detective story were sliding into his mind individually, or at most in strings of three and four. Which, if it wasn't as it ideally should be in an ambitious man's mind, was at least darn comfortable. He had not rejected the big gift of page-at-a-glance reading. Not quite. 
but he had dislocated for tonight at least the imposed nervous field on which it depended. For want of a better place, Ernie dropped the rubber tube from the bathtub spray into the scrub bucket half full of odorous pink fluid and stared doubtfully at the uncapped gas tank. The tank had been almost empty when he'd last driven his car, he knew, because he'd been waiting until payday to gas up. Now he had used the tube to siphon out what he could of the remainder, he still could taste the stuff, and he'd emptied the fuel line and carburetor, more or less. Further than that, in the way of engine hygiene, Ernie's strictly kitchen mechanics did not go, but he felt that a catalyst used in pinches shouldn't be too particular about contaminants. Besides, the directions on the box hadn't said anything about cleaning the fuel tank, had they? He hesitated. At his feet, the garden hose gurgled noisily over the curb into the gutter. It had vindicated his midnight estimate, proving just long enough. He looked uneasily up and down the dawning street and was relieved to find it still empty. He wished fervently, not for the first time this Saturday morning, that he had a garage. Then he sighed, squared his shoulders a little, and lifted the box out of his pocket. Making to check the directions the umpteenth time, he received a body blow. The white lettering on the box had disappeared. The box didn't proclaim itself sodium bicarbonate again, there was just no lettering at all, only blue background. He turned it over several times. Right there died his tentative plan of eventually sharing his secret with some friend who knew more than himself about motors, he hadn't decided anyway who that would be. It would be just too silly to approach anyone he knew with a more than wild story and featureless blue box. For a moment, he came very close to dropping the box between the wide set bars of the street drain and pouring the pink gas back in the tank. It had hit him, in a way for the first time, just how crazy this all was, how jarringly implausible even on such hypotheses as practical jokes, secret product perhaps military. Or mad inventor, except himself. For how the devil should the stuff get into his bathroom disguised as bicarb? That circumstance seemed beyond imagination. Green flames, vanishing letters. Torque twisters, translators, a box that talked. At that point, simple faith came to Ernie's rescue, in the same bathroom. He had seen the green flame. It had burned his fingers. Quickly he dipped up a little of the white powder on the edge of a fifty-cent piece, dumped it in the gas tank without quibbling as to quantity, wrapped the coin on the edge of the opening. Closed and pocketed the blue box, and picked up the spurting hose and jabbed it into the round hole. His heart was pounding and his breath was coming fast. That had taken real effort. So he was slow in hearing the footsteps behind him. His neighbor's gate was open and Mr. Jones stood open-mouthed a few feet behind him. All ready for his day's work as streetcar motorman and wearing the dark blue uniform that always made him look for a moment unpleasantly like a policeman. Ernie swung the hose around, flipping his thumb over the end to make a spray, and nonchalantly began to water the little rectangle of lawn between sidewalk and curb. The first things he watered were the bottoms of Mr. Jones's pants legs. Mr. Jones voiced no complaint. He backed off several steps, stared intently at Ernie, rather palely, it seemed to the latter. Then he turned and made off for the streetcar tracks at a very fast shuffle, shaking his feet a little now and then and glancing back several times over his shoulder without slowing down. Ernie felt lightheaded. He decided there was enough water in the gas tank, capped it, and momentarily continued to water the lawn. Ernie! Come on in and have breakfast. He heeded his sister's call, telling himself it would be a good idea to give the stuff time to mix before testing the engine. He had divined her question and was ready with an answer. I've just found out that we're supposed to water our lawns only before seven in the morning or after seven in the evenings. It's the law. It was the day for their monthly drive out to Wheaton to visit Uncle Fabius. On the whole, Ernie was glad his sister was in the car when he turned the key in the starter, it forced him to be calm and collected. Though he didn't feel exactly right about exposing her to the danger of being blown up without first explaining to her the risk. But the motor started right up and began purring powerfully. 
Ernie's sister commented on it favorably. Then she went on to ask, did you remember to buy gas yesterday? No, he said without thinking, then, realizing his mistake, quickly added, I'll buy some in Wheaton. There's enough to get us there. You didn't think so yesterday, she objected. You said the tank was nearly empty. I was wrong. Look, the gauge shows it's half full. But then how? Ernie, didn't you once tell me the gauge doesn't work? Did I? Yes. Look, there's a station. Why don't you buy gas now? No, I'll wait for Wheaton, I know a place there I can get it cheaper, he insisted, rather lamely, he feared. His sister looked at him steadily. He settled his head between his shoulders and concentrated on driving. His feeling of excitement was spoiled, but a few minutes of silence brought it back. He thought of the blur of green flashes inside the purring motor. If the passing drivers only knew. Uncle Fabius, retired perhaps a few years too early and opinionated, was a trial, but he did know something about the automobile industry. Ernie chose a moment when his sister was out of the room to ask if he'd ever heard of a white powder that would turn water into gasoline or some usable fuel. Who's been getting at you? Uncle Fabius demanded sharply, to Ernie's surprise and embarrassment. That's one of the oldest swindles. They always tell this story about how this man had a white powder or something and demonstrated it once with a pail of water and then disappeared. You're supposed to believe that Detroit or the big oil companies got rid of him. It's just another of those malicious legends, concocted, by Russia, I imagine, to weaken your faith in American industry, like the everlasting battery or the razor blade that never gets dull. You're looking pale, Ernie, don't tell me you've already put money in this white powder. I suppose someone's approached you with a proposition, though? With considerable difficulty, Ernie convinced his uncle that he had just heard the story from a friend. In that case, Uncle Fabius opined, you can be sure some fuel powder swindler has been getting at him. When you see him, and be sure to make that soon, tell him from me that, and Uncle Fabius began an impassioned 90-minute defense of big business, small business, prosperity, America, money. Know-how, and a number of other institutions that defended pretty easily, so that the situation was wholly normal when Ernie's sister returned. As soon as the car pulled away from the curb on their way back to Chicago, she reminded him about the gas. Oh, I've already done that, he assured her. Made a special trip so I wouldn't forget. It was while you were out of the room. Didn't you hear me? No, she said, I didn't, and she looked at him steadily, as she had that morning. He similarly retreated to driving. Stopping for a railroad crossing, he braked too hard and the car stalled. His sister grabbed his arm. I knew that was going to happen, she said. I knew that for some reason you lied to me when, the motor, starting readily again, cut short her remark and Ernie didn't press his small triumph by asking her what she was about to say. To tell the truth, Ernie wasn't feeling as elated about today's fifty-mile drive as he'd imagined he would. Now he thought he could put his finger on the reason, it was the completely, well, arbitrary way in which the white powder had come into his possession. If he'd concocted it himself, or been given it by a shady promoter, or even seen the box fall out of the pocket of a suspicious-looking man in a trench coat, then he'd have felt more able to do something about it, whether in the general line of starting a fuel powder company or of going to the F. B. I. But just having the stuff drop into his hands from the sky, so to speak, as if in a crazy dream. And for that same reason not feeling able to talk about it and assure himself he wasn't going crazy, oh, it is rough when you can't share things, really rough. Not being able to share depressing news corrodes the spirit, but not being able to share exciting news can sometimes be even more corroding. Maybe, he told himself, he could figure out someone to tell. But who? And how? His mind shied away from the problem, rather decisively. When he checked the blue box that night, the original sodium bicarbonate lettering had returned with all its humdrum paragraphs. Not one word about exhaust velocities. From that moment, 
the fuel powder became a trial to Ernie rather than a secret glory. He'd wake in the middle of the night doubting that he had ever really read the mind-dizzying lettering. Ever really tested the stuff, perhaps he'd bring from sleep the chilling notion that in the dimness and excitement of Saturday morning he'd put the water in some other car's gas tank, perhaps Mr. Jones's. He could usually argue such ideas away, but they kept coming back. And yet he did no more bathroom testing. Of course the car still ran. He even fueled it once again with the garden hose, sniffing the nozzle to make sure it hadn't somehow got connected to the basement furnace oil tank. He picked three o'clock in the morning for the act, but nevertheless as he was returning indoors he heard a window in Mr. Jones's house slam loudly. It unsettled him. Coming home the next day, he caught his sister and Mr. Jones consulting about something on the latter's doorsteps, which unsettled him further. He couldn't decide on a safe place to keep the box and took to carrying it around with him day and night. Bill spotted it once down at the office and by an unhappy coincidence needed some bicarb just then for a troubled stomach. Ernie explained on the spur of the moment that he was using the box to carry plaster of Paris which involved him in further lies that he felt were quite unconvincing as well as making him appear decidedly eccentric, even butter-brained. Bill took to calling him, the sculptor. Meanwhile, besides the problem of the white powder, Ernie was having other unsettling experiences. Stemming, though of course he didn't know that, from the other gifts, and not just the big gift of page at a glance reading. Though that still returned from time to time to shock his consciousness and send him hurrying for a few quick shots. Like many another car-owning commuter. Ernie found the traffic and parking problems a bit too much for comfort and so used the fast electric train to carry him five times a week to the heart of the city. During those brief, swift, crowded trips Ernie, generally looking steadily out the window at the brown buildings and black stanchions whipping past enjoyed a kind of anonymity and privacy more refreshing to his spirit than he realized. But now all that had been suddenly changed. People had started to talk to him, total strangers struck up conversations almost every morning and afternoon. Ernie couldn't figure out the reason and wasn't at all sure he liked it, except for Vivian. She was the sort of girl Ernie dreamed about, improperly. Tall, blonde and knowing, excitedly curved but armored in a black suit, friendly and funny but given to making almost cruelly deflating remarks. As if the neatly furled short umbrella dangling from her wrist might better be a black dog whip. She worked in an office too, a fancier one than Ernie's, as he found out from their morning conversations. He hadn't got to the point of asking her to lunch, but he was prodding himself. Why such a girl should ever have asked him for a match in the first place and then put up with his clumsy babblings on subsequent mornings was a mystery to him. He finally asked her about it in what he hoped was a joking way, though she seemed to know a lot more about joking than he did. Don't you know, she countered. I mean what makes you attractive to people? Me attractive? No. Well, I'll tell you then, Ernie and I've got to admit it's something quite out of the ordinary. I've never noticed it in anyone else. Ernie, I'm sure your knowledge of romantic novels is shamefully deficient, it's clear from your manners, but in the earlier ones, not in style now, the hero is described as tall, manly. Broad-shouldered, Anglo-Saxon features, etc., etc., but there's one thing he always has, something that sounds like poetic over-enthusiasm if you stop to analyze it, a physical impossibility. But that I have to admit you, Ernie, actually have. Flashing eyes. Flashing eyes? Me? She nodded solemnly. He thought her long straight lips trembled on the verge of a grin, but he couldn't be sure. How do you mean, flashing eyes? He protested. How can eyes flash, except by reflecting light? In that case, I guess they'd seem to flash more if a person opened them wide but kept blinking them a lot. Is that what I do? No, Ernie, though you're doing it now, she told him, shaking her head. No, Ernie, your eyes just give a tiny flash of their own about every five seconds, like a lighthouse, but barely, barely bright enough for another person to notice. It makes you irresistible. 
Of course I've never seen you in the dark, maybe they wouldn't flash in the dark. You're joking. Vivian frowned a little at that remark, as if she were puzzled herself. Well, maybe I am and maybe I'm not, she said. In any case, don't get conceited about your flashing eyes, because I'm sure you'll never know how to take advantage of them. When he parted from her downtown, pausing a moment to watch her walk away with feline majesty, he muttered, flashing eyes, with a shrug of the shoulders and a skeptical growl. Just the same, he ducked his head as he moved off and he pulled the brim of his hat down sharply. Afternoons, hurtling home in the five o'clock rush, it was not Vivian but Verna who frequently occupied the seat beside him, taking up rather more space in it than the panther princess. Verna was another of his newly acquired and not altogether welcome conversation pals, along with Jacob the barber, Mr. Willis the druggist and Herman the health food manufacturer, inventor of soybean mush, conquests of his flashing eyes or whatever it was. Verna was stocky, pasty-faced, voluble, with him, coy. And had bad breath, he could see the tiny triangles of pale food between her incisors and canines whenever her conversations became particularly vehement and confidential, which was often. She always had a stack of books hugged to her stomach. She worked in a fur storage vault, she said, and could snatch quite a bit of time for reading, rather heavy reading, it seemed. It wasn't very long before Verna was head over heels, fearful picture, infatuated with him. Somehow his friendliness had touched a hidden spring in this ugly, friendless, clumsy girl and for once she had lost her fear of the world's ridicule and opened her hulking heart to another human being. It was touching but rather overpowering, especially since she always opened her mouth too. He learned a great deal about herself, her invalid father, Elizabethan and Restoration poetry, paleontology, an organization known as the Working Girls' Front, Mr. A Brugian, and a brassy Miss Minkin who sounded like a fiendish caricature of Vivian. He felt that deliberately avoiding Verna would be a dirtier trick than he liked to think himself capable of. Nevertheless there were times when he seriously wished he'd never acquired whatever power it was, except for Vivian, of course. What the devil, he asked himself for the nth time, could that power be? That night, in the bathroom, the question came back to him and he impulsively switched off the light and looked into the mirror. He gasped and seemed on the point of shrieking out something, but he only grasped the washbowl more tightly and stared into the mirror more intently. After about a minute, he tugged on the light again. He was pale. He had convinced himself of the actual existence of the phenomenon that was in reality the third of the little gifts, flashing eyes. He couldn't notice anything in the light but in the dark his eyes gave off a faint blue flash about every five seconds, just as Vivian had said. Lighting up his cheeks and eyebrows like some comic book vampire. It might be attractive by day, when it just registered as an impalpable hint, but it was damn sinister in the dark. It wasn't much, but it was there, unless the flashes were inside his head and he was projecting them, blue, something called the Purkinje effect? But then Vivian had actually seen, oh, damn. Suddenly he wildly looked around, a little like a trapped animal. Why did it always have to happen in the bathroom, he asked himself, the bicarb, the flame, the blade, if that counted, and now this. Could there be something wrong about the bathroom, something either in the room itself or in his childhood associations? But neither the bathroom walls nor his minutely searched memory returned an answer. It was dark in the hall outside and he almost bumped into his sister. He recoiled, stared at her a moment, then threw his hand over his eyes, darted into his bedroom and shut the door. Is there something wrong, Ernie? she called after him. Wrong? The door muffled his voice. How do you mean? I mean about your eyes. My eyes? It was almost a scream. What about my eyes? Don't shout, Ernie. I mean are they painful? Painful? Why should they be painful? I really don't know, Ernie. She was being very patient and calm. I mean did you notice anything about them? He was trying to be the same without much success. Just that you put your hand up to them as if they hurt. 
Oh. Great relief. Yes, they do smart a little. I guess I've been using them too much. I'm putting some eye drops in them now. Can I help you, Ernie? And shouldn't you see an opto, OQ, optha? I mean an eye doctor. Ernie answered no to both those questions. But of course it took a lot more lying and improvising and general smoothing out before his sister would even pretend to be satisfied and stop her general nagging for the evening. She was getting uncomfortably cagey and curious lately, addicted to asking such questions out of a blue sky as. Ernie, when we were visiting Uncle Fabius. Did you actually believe that you went out and bought gas? That one momentarily brought Ernie's stammer back, something which hadn't troubled him for years. And when she wasn't asking questions, her quiet studying of him for long minutes was even more upsetting. Next morning, on the way to the electric train, Ernie made a purchase at the drugstore. When he sat down beside Vivian, she took one look at him and gave a very deliberate sounding hollow laugh. Black glasses, she said. I tell him he's attractive because he has flashing eyes and within two days he's wearing black glasses. I suppose I should have guessed it. But my eyes hurt, Ernie protested. Sensitive to sunlight, I think. He wished he could explain to her that he'd bought the glasses not only in case he got caught out at night, but also to convince his sister he hadn't been lying about sore eyes. He hadn't intended to wear them by day and hardly knew why he'd put them on before joining Vivian. Spare me your rationalizations, she said. Your motives are clear to me, Ernie, and they happen to be very commonplace. She leaned toward him and her voice, little more than a whisper, took on an unexpectedly gloomy, chilling, hopeless tone. See these people all around us, Ernie? They're suicides, every one of them. Day by day, in every way, they're killing themselves. People love them, admire them, and it only makes them uneasy. They have abilities and charms by the bushel, yes, they do, even that man with the one on his neck, and they only try to hide them. The spotlight turns their way and they goof. They think they're running away from failure, but actually they're running away from success. Ernie looked at them, he couldn't help it, her voice made him, and the ability of page at a glance reading chose that moment to come back to him, only applied to faces instead of letters. And there seemed to be another ability along with it, unclear as yet but frightening. He felt like a very old detective scanning the lineup for the thousandth time. The black glasses didn't interfere a bit, the dozens of faces in this speeding electric car were suddenly as familiar as the court cards in a deck, and he had the feeling that. Like a bunch of pink pasteboards, they were about to be hurled in his face. My God, he asked himself, flinching, how could you go on living with so many faces so close to you, so completely known? Each street you turned into, each store you entered, each gathering you joined, another deluge of unique features. Ugly, pretty, strong, weak, those words didn't mean anything anymore in this drenching of individuality he was getting and that showed no signs of stopping. So he hardly heard Vivian saying, and it's true of you, Ernie, in spades, for your black glasses, and he hardly remembered parting from her. And when he found himself alone he did something unprecedented for him at that time of day, he went to a bar and drank two double whiskies. The drinks brought the downtown landscape back to normal and stopped the faces printing themselves on his mind, but they left him very disturbed. And the suspiciousness with which he was treated at the office didn't improve that, and Ernie began to wish for ordinariness and commonplaceness in himself more than anything in the whole world. If only, he silently implored, there were some way of junking everything that had happened to him in the past few weeks, except maybe Vivian. Verna on the train home positively terrified him. She was unusually talkative and engulfing this evening and he thought that if the faces forever feeling came to him just as she was bearing her food triangles and all, he wouldn't be able to stand it. Somehow, it didn't. Yet the very intensity of his distaste frightened him. Not for the first time, the word, insanity, appeared in his mind, pulsing in pale yellowish-green. Half a block from home, passing his parked car, with an unconscious little veer of avoidance, 
he spotted three figures in close conference in front of his house, his sister. A man in dark blue, yes, Mr. Jones, and, a man in a white coat. Almost before he knew it, he was in his car and driving away. He truly didn't know what he was going to do, only that he was going to do it, and found a trivial interest in trying to guess what it was going to be. Whatever it was, it was going to dim that yellowish-green word, decrease its type size, make him a little more able to face the crisis waiting him at home, or somewhere. He had a picture of himself getting on an airplane, another of renting a room in a slum, another of stopping the car on a lonely, treeless country road and getting out and looking up to the coldly glimmering Milky Way, why? That last picture was the most vivid, and when he realized he had actually stopped his car, it was a moment before it would go away. Then he saw he was parked in front of a demolished old apartment building a few blocks from his home. Only yesterday he'd watched the last wall going down. Now, just across the littered sidewalk from him, the old cellar gaped, flimsily guarded in front by a makeshift rail and surrounded on the other three sides by great hillocks of battered bricks. Tomorrow probably, and in fact that was the way it happened, a bulldozer would tumble them forward, filling the cellar with old bricks and brick dust, leveling the lot. Now he knew what he was going to do. He unlatched the top over the windshield and pushed the button. Slowly the top folded back over his head, showing the smoke-dark sky, almost night. He hitched up a little in the seat, reached inside his coat, pulled out the blue box he always carried and pitched it into the dark pit across the sidewalk. He was driving away almost before it landed. Yet through the hum of the motor he thought he heard something call faintly, goodbye. The material of the filled-in cellar stayed fairly dry for many years and the atom bombing, when it finally came, created a partial surface seal of fused stone over that area. However, the bicarb box fell apart in time, water reached it in little seepings and was accumulated as a non-evaporating fuel and oxidizer mix. The amount of this strange fluid grew and grew, eventually invading and filling a now-blind section of the city's old sewer system. Many tens of thousands of years after that, the buried pool was sensed by the fuel finders of a spaceship from up Polaris Way, which had made an emergency landing on the ruined planet. A well was drilled and the mix pumped up and the centipedal Polarians, scuttling about the bleak landscape, had a fine time trying to explain how such a sophisticated fluid should occur in a seeming state of nature. However, they were grateful to the cosmic All-Father. Long before that, Ernie had arrived home in something of a daze. He told himself that he had cast off the most tangible element of his insanity, but he didn't feel any the better for it. In fact, he felt distinctly apathetic when his sister confronted him and only with an effort did he manage to brace himself for the trial he knew she had in store for him. Ernie, she said hesitatingly, I've come to a decision about something, about a change in our arrangements here, to tell you the truth, and I've gone ahead with it without consulting you. I do hope you won't mind. No, he said heavily, I guess I won't mind. I'm doing it partly on Mr. Jones's advice, she added slowly. As a matter of fact he suggested it. Ernie nodded. Yes, I've noticed the two of you conferring together. You have? Then maybe you know what I'm talking about. Oh, yes. Ernie nodded again and smiled grimly. The man in white? She laughed. Exactly, the man in white. For a long time, I've thought it was just too much bother for either of us to carry the milk home, and the eggs and my yogurt too. So I decided to have the milkman that Mr. Jones uses make deliveries. Mr. Jones brought him over half an hour ago and it's all arranged. For quarts a week, one dozen eggs, and yogurt Tuesdays and Fridays. The invisible being and his coadjutor, backtracking for a checkup, summarized the situation. The latter said, so he's already thrown away the everlasting cosmetic knife and the water splitter. He seems to be trying to reject the third little gift and the first big one, while he still isn't even conscious of the other two gifts. Cheer up, said the invisible being. It's his life and he's doing what he thinks best. Yes, the coadjutor said, 
but he doesn't know he's making these decisions for his race as well as himself. Sometimes I think Galaxy Center makes it too hard for chaps like him. For instance, that trick of having the images on the box fade back to the old ones. Nonsense. We have to take all reasonable precautions that our activities remain secret. He knew that the powder worked. He should have had faith. Sometimes it takes a lot of faith. You're right, it does. The invisible being smiled his Cheshire smile. You feel a lot for these test subjects, don't you? That's fine, but you've got to remember you can't accept the gifts for them, that's one thing they have to do themselves, however long they take about it. Which reminds me, I think we ought to set up a recorder here to report the final outcome of the test to Galaxy Center. Good idea. And cheer up, I say. This test isn't over yet and our featherless biped isn't necessarily licked. If he thinks to link up the third little gift with the two big ones, he has a pretty sweet setup for making psychic progress, and his race will be galactic citizens in a jiffy. You're right. Moreover, it stands to reason he's soon going to become aware of the great gift, and that generally gives a person a jolt and makes him think seriously about other things. True enough, though I still have the feeling you intend some sardonic trick in conjunction with the great gift. Are you sure you're not planning to leave some other setup here along with the recorder? I notice you've got a spare juxtaposer in the ship and it bothers me. That, dear coadjutor, is my business. Whatever I do, it won't interfere in any way with the fairness of the tests. Sometimes I think the tests are too fair, the coadjutor observed. I'd like to be able to ease them up a bit in special cases. Confidentially, my friend, so would I. The great gift announced itself to Ernie next morning at 7.53 sharp, when the special slowed to 40 miles an hour to swing past the platform on which he was waiting for the express. One moment he was standing morning weary on the thick wooden planks, looking down through the quarter-inch gaps between them at the cinders five feet below. Vaguely conscious of a woman's white polka-dotted black skirt on one side of his field of vision and a man's brown shoes and briefcase to the other. Next moment he was in a small cab under which steel rails were vanishing at an alarming speed, and way ahead he could just make out the platform on which he was standing. And something was hurting his head and he was slumping forward and everything was darkening and the cab was leaping forward more swiftly still. The third moment he was back on the platform, running furiously to get off it. He didn't care who yelled at him or whom he bumped, so long as it didn't slow him down. The people were just blurs anyway and soon he was beyond them. He took in two strides the short flight of wooden steps leading down off the platform proper and spurted the last sixty feet to the stairs leading down to street level. There he stumbled, recovered himself, and chanced a hasty backward look. There was a tall man at his heels, hugging a briefcase and panting hard. Then, beyond the tall man, he saw the platform rear up like a wooden caterpillar, spilling people against the bright gray morning sky. There was a cosmic crunch and the battered special, still coming strong. Burst through the upreared platform in a blossoming broken matchstick crown of planks and beams, and big blue sparks were a writhing power wire, snagged by the uprearing platform was grounding against the first car. Ernie ducked his head and plunged down the steps ahead. That was how I came to meet Ernie Meeker. I was the tall man. As you can imagine. It's quite strange to be standing in a huddle of fresh-washed morning commuters and have the one beside you close his eyes and slump a little and then take off like a bat out of hell, without a word spoken or a thing happened to explain it. I started to laugh but then I got the funniest feeling of curiosity and terror and I took off after him. It saved my life. Afterward, Ernie and I went back to help with the ghastliness, but pretty soon there were more than enough train men, firemen, police, and whatnot, and we got chased off. We had a couple of drinks together and met a few times after and that's how I got some of this story. But my chief sources of information I am not permitted to disclose. As the invisible being had predicted, Ernie's first brush with the great gift gave him a considerable jolt, though he didn't suspect at first that it was a permanent gift. He analyzed what had happened, quite reasonably, 
I believe, as a case of second sight. Somehow his mind had been projected into the brain of the motorman of the special just at the moment the latter had his stroke, the final official explanation too, and blindly put on more speed. Instead of reducing it for the approaching curve and station. His second sight saved his life by getting him off the platform before the special jumped the tracks and plowed through it. It certainly gave a jolt to Ernie's habit patterns, as it temporarily did of a great many other people. He started driving his car to work, for one thing, and he took to drinking regularly in the evenings, though not excessively as yet. He also had the feeling, which he did not try to analyze, that his miraculous escape marked the end of the strange weeks, in his life. When he'd had such odd illusions or been the victim of such odd circumstances. And, true enough, that first week or so there were no recurrences of his chillingly weird experiences. But jolts have their infallible law of diminishing effects. After a few days, Ernie found the traffic and parking problems as nervous and wearisome as ever and he grew envious of the snug commuters meditating luxuriously in their electric coaches. Come the first morning of the third week and he was standing on the rebuilt platform, studying the new planks, ties and rails with a pleasantly morbid interest. Vivian was not in her accustomed seat nor on the train, as far as he could tell, which did not surprise him, though it disappointed him sharply. The panther princess had a stronger hold on his feelings, or at least on his imagination, than he'd realized. But Verna was on the train home all right. In fact, she gave a small whoop of pleasure when she spotted him. And he had barely sat down beside her when who should come prowling smoothly along but Vivian in a charcoal version of her tailored black armor. Ernie jumped up and blurted out introductions. Vivian accepted his seat with a certain deliberateness and with a smile that seemed to Ernie to say, so I'm his morning light badinage girl, but this is the girl Mr. Meeker goes home with. It's another instance of black glasses behavior, don't you think? He puts her on whenever he gets afraid he's getting attractive. The two women started to chat easily enough, however, and shortly Ernie got over his confusion and... Smiling down at them from where he swayed in his aisle with his hand lightly touching the back of the seat ahead, was even thinking quite smugly that here in one seat, by gosh, were the woman he wanted and the woman who wanted him. Very interesting to be the man in the middle. Just at that moment, the power came back to him that made everything feverishly real, expanding his center of attention to his visual horizons, and this time it was only a prelude. For a second gateway opened behind the first, a window into all human hearts and minds, the power of human insight fantastically sharpened and enlarged. He could read minds, or at least he knew the motives, the core of values and consciousness, of any person he cared to look at. Most especially, he knew the motives of Verna and Vivian almost as if he were them. The big thing about Vivian was her fear, no, her conviction, that she wasn't attractive. Every glance her way knocked a hole in the armor of artificial attractiveness she built around herself, and all the hours she devoted to perfecting it. Even the desperate worship she lavished on her body, were all utterly lost. A simple relationship with another human being was unthinkable, her armor got in the way and under her armor she knew she was worthless. A man was sometimes attracted to her armor, never to herself. But as soon as he started to scrutinize it, it began to tarnish and crumple. She hoped that other people, men especially, had a trace of her own weaknesses, and she sniped away at them constantly to get under the armor to find out. Ernie was one in a long series of such men. She was actually in love with him, but only as one loves a dream, not the real Ernie at all. Physically he was disgusting to her, like most men. Verna, on the other hand, had absolute confidence that she was sufficiently attractive for all practical purposes. She wasn't in love with Ernie at all. She wanted to make an intellectual conquest of him, add him to her private brain trust, her cultured entourage that won Mr. Abrosian seldom tendered admiration and broke Miss Minkin's heart, and finally get Ernie to join the working boy's front. He was one of her projects. If it became tactically necessary during her campaign, she knew that Ernie would be only too happy to jump in bed with her, food triangles and all. 
now in other circumstances, who really knows? Ernie might have found the courage to accept Vivian and Verna as they really were and work on from there, ruthlessly discarding his false pictures of them, and of himself. He might conceivably have found the strength to accept all people not as shadowy projections of himself, fabricated targets of his desires and aversions. Puppets in his private chess games and circuses, but as complete persons with inexhaustible surprises and contradictions, each a microcosm, a universe in little with his or her own earth and stars. Spaceflight and crawling, heaven and hell. But under the present circumstances, Ernie was confused. His knowledge of the real Vivian spoiled completely the titillating picture of the panther princess. Who might submit to him contemptuously in the end, he needed that sex idol more than he needed truth. As for Verna, her stalwart self-reliance and her accurate appraisal of his own motives and possible future behavior were both unbearably humiliating to him. And the delight of really knowing people was completely outweighed, in his tired spirit, by the thought of the lifetime of work that would be involved in adjusting himself to this new knowledge. It was so much more comfortable to work with stereotypes. The express was slowing for his station. Both girls were looking at him puzzledly. Goodbye, Verna. Goodbye, Vivian, he said in a set sort of voice. This is where I get off. He moved stiffly toward the door. They watched him go, and turned to each other with a frown. That evening marked the beginning of Ernie's serious drinking. He never saw either of the V-girls again. He took his car or the bus to work. Then, for a short period, he took taxicabs, then he lost his job and was working in another part of the city. He became mixed up with a number of other women in crowds, but they are not part of this or any story. Among other things, his drinking eventually completely confused his memories of abnormal personal powers with his entirely normal illusions of alcoholic ones. And it also seemed to be blotting out the former. Once, at a party, he bet twenty dollars that his eyes glowed in the dark. Next morning he was relieved to discover, after making several anxious phone calls, that he'd lost his bet. When he finally pulled out of it, some five years later, because of a growing aversion to liquor that he only understood later. The two big gifts of page at a glance and mind reading were gone forever. The great gift had a more durable lodgment in him. From his alcoholic years, he brought hazy memories of accidents avoided because of sudden wrong-ended visions of onrushing cars. Ali Rawlings missed because he'd seen himself reeling along a block away through the eyes of lounging hoodlums. Now, sober again. He had a clear confirmation of it when he left a banquet on a trumped-up excuse because of a disturbing vision of inexplicable rod-like shapes, and read the next day that a hundred of the guests, of whom four finally died, had come down with bacterial food poisoning. Another time, hiking in dry woods, he'd smelled smoke that his companions couldn't, and persuaded them to turn back, avoiding a disastrous flash fire that broke out soon afterward. He had to admit to himself that he certainly seemed to have the gift of second sight, warning him against threats to his life. All right, he told himself, so forget it. Gifts are upsetting. Even as a kid, you sweated more about your birthday presents than you ever got fun out of them. Our story has already jumped five years, now it must jump twenty. Ernie is living with his sister again, while he was drinking, they pulled apart, and now they've once more pulled together. They're having dinner, have arrived at dessert, a big piece of chocolate cake each with satiny thick creamy frosting and filling. Ernie looks at his piece, and sees himself climbing stairs and clutching at his heart. He thinks of warning his sister, but she's already halfway through her piece. Then she goes on and eats Ernie's. Ernie's sister didn't get food poisoning, she only got fat. But the incident of the chocolate cake was for Ernie the beginning of a series of peculiar food revulsions and diet experiments that eventually made Ernie instead of his sister the family yogurt fiend and a regular customer of his old acquaintance. Herman, the health food manufacturer. Herman had to admit that Ernie had cooked himself up a pretty good longevity diet for an amateur. Though there were some items in it that made the old man shake his head, 
and he always asserted that Ernie was passing up a good thing in soybean mush. Ernie got his diet tailored to fit his tastes and stuck to it. He had a strong suspicion of what had happened, though he tried not to think about it too often, that his gift of second sight had taken to warning him of the longer-range dangers to his existence. After all, chocolate cake can be as deadly as atomic bombs in the long run. More years passed. Friends and relatives began to remark quietly to each other that his sister was aging faster. Ernie, they had to admit, was a remarkably well-preserved old gent. Ironic, considering what a drunk he'd been and what strange junk he insisted on eating now. One day Ernie's self-styled health diet began to pall on him. It didn't revolt him, it merely left him unsatisfied, yet with no yearning for any particular food he could think of. He lived with this yearning for some weeks, meditating on it and trying to guess its nature. Finally he had an inspiration. He headed for Mr. Willis's drugstore. The bent, silvery-haired man greeted him eagerly. Somehow there was a special warmth about the friendships Ernie had made during the strange weeks, Verna and Vivian accepted, that put them in a different class from any other of his human relationships. Now what can I give you, Ernie? Mr. Willis asked. Anything in the place within reason. I'll tell you, Bert I'd like to go back in your dispensary, you with me, if you want, and just shop around. That's a sort of screwy idea, Ernie. I couldn't sell you any narcotics or sleeping pills, of course, well, maybe a few sleeping pills. I wouldn't want any. What's the idea, Ernie? Getting interested in chemistry in your old. You know, Ernie, you just don't look your years. Secret of mine. Yes, in a way I've got interested in chemistry. Won't talk, eh? I remember, when I first met you, I tagged you for an evening inventor. Well, come on back and shop around. Just don't ask me for elixir vitae, or impotable, or ground philosopher's stone. Not unless I see, M. Afterward, Bert Willis used to say it was one of the most mystifying experiences of his life. For a good half a day, Ernie Meeker studied the rows of jars, canisters and glass-stoppered bottles, sometimes lifting two down together and contemplating them, one in each hand. As if he could weigh the difference. Often he'd take out a stopper and sniff, and maybe, asking permission of Bert with a glance, take up a dab of some powder and taste it. You know that game, Bert would say, where someone goes out of the room and you all decide on an object, or hide one. And he comes back and tries to find it by telepathy or muscle reading or something? That was exactly the way Ernie was acting. Dog on a difficult scent. A couple of times, especially when the customers came in, Bert wanted to chase him out, except that Ernie was such a special friend and Bert was so darn curious about it all himself. In the end, Ernie made a good twenty purchases, including a mortar and pestle and two poisons for which Bert made him sign, though the amounts were less than a lethal dose. Actually none of the chemicals he bought were very dangerous, Bert would say. And none of them were terribly unusual. The thing about them was that, put together, they just didn't make sense, as a medicine or anything else. Let me see, there was sulfur, bismuth, a bit of mercury, one of the sulfur drugs, a tiny packet of auric chloride, and I had M all on a list once, but I've lost it. After that, Ernie always mixed a little grayish paste in his cup of yogurt at suppertime. Ernie stopped aging altogether. After his sister's coffin was lowered past the margins of green matting into the ground, Ernie shook hands with the minister. Walked Bert Willis and Herman Shover to their car and told them he thought he'd better drive home with some relatives who'd turned up. Actually he just wanted to stay behind a while. It was a beautiful blue and white summer day, the tidy suburban cemetery had caught his fancy, and now he felt like a quiet stroll. Ernie followed his little impulses these days. As he sometimes said, I figure I've got plenty of time. I just don't feel the pressure like I used to. The last car chugged away. Ernie stretched and started to stroll, slowly, but not like an old man, now that he was alone. 
His hair had grown whiter in the last few years and his face a little wrinkled. But that was due to the very judicious use of silvering and theatrical liner, people's comments about his youthfulness had gotten wearisome and would, he knew, eventually become suspicious. Keeping himself oriented by a white tower at the cemetery gate, he arrived at an area that had no graves as yet, no trees either, just lawn. He made his way to the center of it, where there was a gently swelling hummock, and sat down in the warm crinkly grass, resting his back against the slope. The sky was lovely, enough clouds to be interesting, but a great oval of pure blue just overhead, a pear-shaped gateway to space. He felt no grief at his sister's death, only the desire to think a bit, have a quiet look at his past and another at the great future. Alone like this, he dared to face his fate for a moment and admit to himself that, all wishful thinking aside, it really began to look as if he were going to live forever. Or at least for a very long time. Live forever. That was a phrase to give you a chill, he told himself. And what to do, he asked himself, with all that time. Back in the strange weeks, he'd have had little trouble in answering that question, if only he'd known then what he did now and realized what was being offered him. For, during his sober decades, Ernie had gradually come to a shrewdly accurate estimate of what had happened to him then. He thought of it in terms of having been offered six gifts and turned down five of them. Back in the strange weeks, and armed with the five rejected gifts, page at a glance and mind reading were the only ones that counted, though, he could easily have said. Live forever by all means. Increase your knowledge and understanding until your mind bursts or is transfigured. Plunge forever into the unending variety of the cosmos. Open yourself to everything. But now, equipped to travel only as a snail. Still, even snails get somewhere. With forever to work with, even forwards at a glance gets you through many, many books. Patient love and dispassionate thought give you human insight in the end, can finally open the tightest shutter on the darkest human heart. But that would take so very long and Ernie felt tired. Not old, just tired, tired. Best simply to watch the soft clouds, the pear-shaped gateway had become almost circular. To do anything but drift through life, a stereotype among stereotypes, was simply, too, much, work. At that very moment, as if his thought had summoned the experience into being. Another scene filmed over the blue sky and white clouds above him. The sudden humming in his ears, a kind of audible silence, informed him that his second sight was at work, warning him of some deadly danger. But this was a more gentle instance of it, for not all his consciousness jumped somewhere else. All through the experience, he was still aware of himself leaning against the grassy hummock, of the restful melancholy of the scene around him, and of the sky overhead. The second scene only superimposed itself on the first. He was poised many hundreds of miles above the earth, a ghost ernie immune to the airlessness and the sun's untempered beams. At his back was black night filled with stars. Below him stretched the granulated dry brown of earth's surface, tinged here and there with green, clumped with white cloud, and everywhere faintly hazed with blue. Up there in space with him, right at his elbow, so close that he could reach out and touch it, was a tiny silver cylinder about as big as a hazelnut, domed at one end. Reflecting sunlight from one point in a way that would have been blinding enough except that Ernie's ghost eyes were immune to brightness. As he reached out to examine it, the thing darted away from him as if at some imperious summons, like a bit of iron jumping through a magnetic field. But in spite of its enormous acceleration, Ernie's ghost was able to follow it in its downward plunge. It kept just ahead of his outstretched fingertips. The brown granules that were Earth's surface grew in size. The tiny metal cylinder began to glow with more than reflected sunlight. It turned red, orange, yellow and then blazing white as atmospheric friction transformed it into a meteor. Ernie's ghost, immune to friction and incandescence alike, followed it as it dove toward its target, for even though Ernie had never heard of a juxtaposer and how it brought objects together. He had the feeling, from the dizzy speed of the meteor's plunge, that it yearned for something. He knew most meteors vaporized or exploded, but this did not, 
even when Earth's brown surface grew rivers and roads. Suddenly there was a cloud bank ahead. Then, in the white, there appeared an almost circular hole toward the very center of which the meteorite plunged. Everything was happening very fast now, but his ghost senses were able to keep pace. As they plunged through the cloud ring and the green landscape below grew explosively, he saw the white tower, the trees, the curving drives, and the clearing which was now the target. There was still time to escape. Lying on the warm grass, with death lancing down from the sky at miles a second, he had merely to roll over. But it was simply, too, much, work. Elsewhere near Earth, a recorder sped toward Galaxy Center a message which ended, six gifts tendered, all finally refused. I will now sign off and await pickup with one juxtaposer. A little later, a receiver in Galaxy Center passed the message to a central recorder, which filed it in the Star's Warm 37 section with this addition, spiritual immaturity of Terran bipeds indicated. Advise against enlightenment and admission to galactic citizenship. Test subject humanely released. Police, digging into the turf under Ernie's shattered head two days later found the bright bullet, cold now, of course, and untarnished. Looks like silver, one cop said, scratching his head. Haven't I heard somewhere that the mafia use silver bullets? So bright, though. Lieutenant Padilla, later on, lifting the bullet in his forceps to re-examine it for rifling marks, had the same thought about its brightness. By now, however, he knew it was not silver. What alloy was never satisfactorily determined. Actually it was made of the same substance as the everlasting razor blade. This time, although he still found no rifling marks, a tiny dull stretch on the flat end of the cylinder caught his attention. He took up a magnifier and examined it carefully. A moment later, he put down the magnifier, snatched up the pocketbook found on the dead man and rechecked some cards in it. The bullet dropped from the forceps, rolled a few inches. The lieutenant sat back in his chair, breathing a little hard. This is one for the books, all right, he told himself. I've heard a lot of people, soldiers especially, talk about such bullets, but I never expected to see one. For under the magnifying glass, finely engraved in very tiny letters, he had read the words, Ernest Wenceslas Meeker. Pipe Dream Simon Grew found a two-inch mermaid in his bathtub. It had arms, hips, a finny tail, and, here the real trouble began, a face that reminded him irresistibly of Grushenka Stolnikov Gurevich. It wasn't until the mermaid turned up in his bathtub that Simon Grew seriously began to wonder what the Russians were doing on the roof next door. The old house next door together with its spacious tar-papered roof, which held a sort of pent shack, a cylindrical old water tank, and several chicken wire enclosures. Had always been a focus of curiosity in this region of Greenwich Village, especially to whoever happened to be renting Simon's studio. The north window come skylight of which looked down upon it, if you were exceptionally tall or if, like Simon, you stood halfway up a stepladder and peered. During the 1920s, old-timers told Simon, the house had been owned by a bootlegger, who had installed a costly pipe organ and used the water tank to store hooch. Later there had been a colony of shaven-headed Buddhist monks, who had strolled about the roof in their orange and yellow robes, meditating and eating raw vegetables. There had followed a Commedia dell'arte theatrical group, a fencing salon, a school of the organ, the bootlegger's organ was always one of the prime renting points of the house. An Arabian restaurant, several art schools and silver craft shops of course, and an existentialist coffee house. The last occupants had been two bony-cheeked Swedish blondes who sunbathed interminably and had built the chicken wire enclosures to cage a large number of sinister smoke-colored dogs, Simon decided they were breeding werewolves. And one of his most successful abstractions, Grey Hunger, had been painted to the inspiration of an eldritch howling. The dogs and their owners had departed abruptly one night in a closed van. Without any of the dogs ever having been offered for sale or either of the girls having responded with anything more than a raised eyebrow to Simon's brave greetings of Skoll. The Russians had taken possession about six months ago, four brothers apparently, and one sister, 
who never stirred from the house but could occasionally be seen peering dreamily from a window. A white card with a boldly inked Stolnikov Gorevich had been thumbtacked to the peeling green painted front door. Lefkadio Smits, the interior decorator, told Simon that the newcomers were clearly white Russians, he could tell it by their bushy beards. Lester Flegius maintained that they were red Russians passing as white, and talked alarmingly of spying, sabotage and suitcase bombs. Simon, who had the advantages of living on the spot and having been introduced to one of the brothers, Vasily, at a neighboring art gallery, came to believe that they were both red and white and something more, solid, complete Slavs in any case, double Dostoevsky Russians if one may be permitted the expression. They ordered vodka, caviar, and soda crackers by the case. They argued interminably, loudly in Russian, softly in English, they went on mysterious silent errands, they gloomed about on the roof. They made melancholy music with their deep harmonious voices and several large guitars. Once Simon though they even had the bootlegger's organ going, but there had been a bad storm at the time and he hadn't been sure. They were not quite as tight-lipped as the Swedish girls. Gradually a curt front sidewalk acquaintance developed and Simon came to know their names. There was Vasily, of course, who wore thick glasses, the most scholarly-looking of the lot and certainly the most bibulous, Simon came to think of Vasily as the vodka breather. Occasionally he could be glimpsed holding Erlenmeyer flasks, trays of culture dishes, and other pieces of biological equipment, or absent-mindedly wiping off a glass slide with his beard. Then there was Ivan, the dourest of the four, though none of them save Vasily seemed very amiable. Simon's private names for Ivan were the Nihilist and the Bomber, since he sometimes lugged about with him a heavy globular leather case. With it and his beard, a square black one, he had more than once created a mild sensation in the narrow streets of the village. Next there was Mikhail, who wore a large crucifix on a silver chain around his neck and looked like a more spiritual Rasputin. However, Simon thought of him less as the religious than as the whistler, for his inveterate habit of whistling into his straggly beard a strange tune that obeyed no common harmonic laws. Somehow Mikhail seemed to carry a chilly breeze around with him, a perpetual cold draft. So that Simon had to check himself in order not to clutch together his coat collar whenever he heard the approach of the eerie piping. Finally there was Lev, beardless, shorter by several inches, and certainly the most elusive of the brothers. He always moved at a scurry, frequently dipping his head, so that it was some time before Simon assured himself that he had the Stolnikov Gurevich face. He did, unmistakably. Lev seemed to be away on trips a good deal. On his returns he was frequently accompanied by furtive but important-looking men, a different one on each occasion. There would be much bustle at such times, among other things, the shades would be drawn. Then in a few hours Lev would be off again, and his man about town companion too. And of course there was the indoors keeping sister. Several times Simon had heard one of the brothers calling, Grushenka, so he assumed that was her name. She had the Stolnikov Gurevich face too, though on her, almost incredibly, it was strangely attractive. She never ventured on the roof but she often sat in the pent shack. As far as Simon could make out, she always wore some dark Victorian costume, at least it had a high neck, long sleeves, and puffed shoulders. Pale-faced in the greenish gloom, she would stare for hours out of the pent shack's single window, though never in Simon's direction. Occasionally she would part and close her lips, but not exactly as if she were speaking, at least aloud, he thought of calling her the bubble blower. The effect was as odd as Mikhail's whistling but not as unpleasant. In fact, Simon found himself studying Grushenka for ridiculously long periods of time. His mild obsession began to irk him and one day he decided henceforth to stay away altogether from his north window and the stepladder. As a result he saw little of the alterations the Russians began to make on the roof at this point. Though he did notice that they lugged up among other things a length of large diameter transparent plastic piping. So much for the Russians, now for the mermaid. Late one night Simon started to fill his bathtub with cold water to soak his brushes and rags, he was working with a kind of calcimine at the time. 
experimenting with portable murals painted on large plaster-faced wooden panels. Heavily laden, he got back to the bathroom just in time to shut off the water, and to see a tiny fish of some sort splashing around in it. He was not unduly surprised. Fish up to four or five inches in length were not unheard of apparitions in the cold water supply of the area, and this specimen looked as if it displaced no more than a teaspoon of water. He made a lucky grab and the next moment he was holding in his firmly clenched right hand the bottom half of a slim wriggling creature hardly two inches long, and now Simon was surprised indeed. To begin with, it was not greenish-white nor any common fish color, but palely pinkish, flesh-colored in fact. And it didn't seem so much a fish as a tadpole, at least its visible half had a slightly oversized head shaped like a bullet that has mushroomed a little and two tiny writhing arms or appendages of some sort, and it felt as if it had rather large hips for a fish or even a tadpole. Equip a two-months human embryo with a finny tail, give it in addition a precocious feminine sexiness, and you'd get something of the same effect. But all that was nothing. The trouble was that it had a face, a tiny face, of course, and rather goggly ghostly like a planarian's, but a face nevertheless, a human-looking face. And also, here was the real trouble, a face that bore a grotesque but striking resemblance to that of Grushenka stolnikov gorevich Simon's fingers tightened convulsively. Simultaneously the slippery creature gave a desperate wriggle. It shot into the air in a high curve and fell into the scant inch of space between the bathtub and the wall. The next half hour was hectic in a groveling sort of way. Retrieving anything from behind Simon's ancient claw-footed bathtub was a most difficult feat. There was barely space to get an arm under it and at one point the warping of the floorboards prevented even that. Besides, there was the host of dust-shrouded objects it had previously been too much trouble to tease out, an accumulation of decades. At first Simon tried to guide himself by the faint flopping noises along the hidden base of the wall, but these soon ceased. Being on your knees and your chest with an ear against the floor and an arm strainingly outstretched is probably not the best position to assume while weird trains of thought go hooting through your head. But sometimes it has to happen that way. First came a remembered piece of neighborhood lore that supported the possibility of a connection between the house next door and the tiny pink aquatic creature now suffering minute agonies behind. The bathtub. No one knew what ancient and probably larceny-minded amateur plumber was responsible. But the old-timers assured Simon there was a link between the water supply of the Russian's house with its aerial cistern and that of the building containing Simon's studio and several smaller apartments. At any rate they maintained that there had been a time during the period when the bootlegger was storing hooch in the water tank that several neighborhood cold water taps were dispensing a weak butt. Nonetheless authoritative mixture of bourbon and branch water. So, thought Simon as he groped and strained, if the Russians were somehow responsible for this weird fishlet, there was no insuperable difficulty in understanding how it might have gotten here. But that was the least of Simon's preoccupations. He scrabbled wildly and unsuccessfully for several minutes, and then realizing he would never get anywhere in this unsystematic manner. He began to remove the accumulated debris piece by piece, dark cracked ends of soap, wash rags dried out in tortured attitudes, innumerable dark-dyed cigarette stumps. Several pocket magazines with bleached wrinkled pages, empty and near-empty medicine bottles and pill vials, rusty hairpins, bobby pins, safety pins. Crumpled toothpaste tubes, and a couple for oil paint, a gray toothbrush, a fifty-cent piece and several pennies, the mummy of a mouse, a letter from Picasso, and last of all. From the dark corner behind the bathtub's inside claw, the limp pitiful thing he was seeking. It was even tinier than he'd thought. He carefully washed the dust and flug off it, but it was clearly dead and its resemblance to Grushenka stolnikov gorevich had become problematical, indeed. Simon decided that someone seeing it now for the first time would think it a freak minnow or monstrous tadpole and nothing more, though mutation or disease had obviously been at work. The illusion of a miniature mermaid still existed in the tapering tail and arm-like appendages, but it was faint. He tried to remember what he knew about salamanders, almost nothing, it turned out. 
He thought of embryos, but his mind veered away from the subject. He wandered back into the studio carrying the thing in his hand. He climbed the stepladder by the north window and studied the house next door. What windows he could see were dark. He got a very vague impression that the roof had changed. After he had strained his eyes for some time he fancied he could see a faint path of greenish luminescence streaming between the pent shack and the water tank. But it was very faint indeed and might only be his vision swimming. He climbed down the stepladder and stood for a moment weighing the tiny dead thing in his hand. It occurred to him that one of his friends at the university could dig up a zoologist to pass on his find. But Simon's curiosity was more artistic than scientific. In the end he twisted a bit of cellophane around the thing, placed it on the ledge of his easel and went off to bed, and to a series of disturbingly erotic dreams. Next day he got up late and, after breakfasting on black coffee, gloomed around the studio for a while, picking things up and putting them down. He glanced frequently at the stepladder, but resisted the temptation to climb up and have another look next door. Sighing, he thumbtacked a sheet of paper to a drawing board and half-heartedly began blocking in a female figure. It was insipid and lifeless. Stabbing irritably at the heavy curve of the figure's hip, he broke his charcoal. Damn, he said, glaring around the room. Abandoning all pretense, he threw the charcoal on the floor and climbed the stepladder. He pressed his nose against the glass. In daylight, the adjoining roof looked bare and grimy. There was a big transparent pipe running between the water tank and the shack, braced in two places by improvised-looking wooden scaffolding. Listening intently, Simon thought he could hear a motor going in the shack. The water looked sallow green. It reminded Simon of those futuristic algae farms where the stuff is supposed to be pumped through transparent pipes to expose it to sunlight. There seemed to be a transparent top on the water tank too, it was too high for Simon to see, but there was a gleam around the edge. Staring at the pipe again, Simon got the impression there were little things traveling in the water, but he couldn't make them out. Climbing down in some excitement, Simon got the twist of cellophane from the ledge of the easel and stared at its contents. Wild thoughts were tumbling through his head as he got back up on the stepladder. Sunlight flashed on the greenish water pipe between the tank and the shack, but after the first glance he had no eyes for it. Grushenka Stolnikov Gurevich had her face tragically pressed to the window of the shack. She was wearing the black dress with high neck and puffed shoulders. At that moment she looked straight at him. She lifted her hands and seemed to speak imploringly. Then she slowly sank from sight as if, it horridly occurred to Simon, into quicksand. Simon sprang from his chair, heart beating wildly, and ran down the stairs to the street. Two or three passers-by paused to study him as he alternately pounded the flaking green door of the Russian's house and leaned on the button. Also watching was the shirt-sleeve driver of a moving van, emblazoned, Stolnikov Gurevich Enterprises, which almost filled the street in front of the house. The door opened narrowly. A man with a square black beard frowned out of it. He topped Simon by almost a head. Yes? Ivan the bomber asked, in a deep, exasperated voice. I must see the lady of the house immediately, Simon cried. Your sister, I believe. She's in danger. He surged forward. The butt of the bomber's right palm took him firmly in the chest and he staggered back. The bomber said coldly, my sister is, ha, huh, taking a bath. Simon cried, in that case she's drowning. And surged forward again, but the bomber's hand stopped him short. I'll call the police. Simon shouted, flailing his limbs. The hand at his chest suddenly stopped pushing and began to pull. Gripped by the front of his shirt, Simon felt himself being drawn rapidly inside. Let go. Help, a kidnapping, he shouted to the inquisitive faces outside, before the door banged shut. No police. Rumbled the bomber, assisting Simon upstairs. Now look here, Simon protested futilely. In the two-story high living room to his right, the pipes of an organ gleamed golden from the shadows. 
At the second landing, a disheveled figure met them, glasses twinkling, Vasily the vodka breather. He spoke querulously in Russian to Ivan, who replied shortly, then Vasily turned and the three of them crowded up the narrow third flight to the pent shack. This housed a small noisy machine, perhaps an aerator of some sort, for bubbles were streaming into the transparent pipe where it was connected to the machine. And under the pipe, sitting with an idiot smile on a chair of red plush and gilt, was a pale black mustached man. An empty clear glass bottle with a red and gold label lay on the floor at his feet. The opposite side of the room was hidden by a heavy plastic shower curtain. Grushenka Stolnikov Gurevich was not in view. Ivan said something explosive, picking up the bottle and staring at it. Vodka, he went on. I have told you not to mix the pipe and the vodka. Now see what you have done. To me it seemed hospitable, said Vasily with an apologetic gesture. Besides, only one bottle. Ducking under the pipe where it crossed the pent shack, Ivan picked up the pale man and dumped him crosswise in the chair. With his patent leather shoes sticking up on one side and his plump hands crossed over his chest. Let him sleep. First we must take down all the apparatus, before the capitalistic police arrive. Now, what to do with this one? He looked at Simon, and clenched one large and hairy fist. Nyet nyet nyet, said the vodka breather, and went to whisper in Ivan's ear. They both stared at Simon, who felt uncomfortable and began to back toward the door. But Ivan ducked agilely under the pipe and grasped him by the arm, pulling him effortlessly toward the roof exit. Just come this way if you please, Mr. Gruai, said Vasily, hurrying after. As they left the shack, he picked up a kitchen chair. Crossing the roof, Simon made a sudden effort and wrenched himself free. They caught him again at the edge of the roof, where he had run with nothing clearly in mind, but with his mouth open to yell. Suspended in the grip of the two Russians, with Ivan's meaty palm over his mouth, Simon had a momentary glimpse of the street below. A third bearded figure, Mikhail the Religious, was staring up at them from the sunny sidewalk. The melancholy face, the deep-socketed tormented eyes, and the narrow beard tangled with the dangling crucifix combined to give the effect of a Tolstoy novel's dust jacket. As they hauled Simon away, he had the impression that a chilly breeze had sprung up and the street had darkened. In his ears was Mikhail's distant, oddly discordant whistling. Grunting, the two brothers set Simon down on the kitchen chair and slid him across the roof until something hard but resilient touched the top of his head. It was the plastic pipe, through which, peering upward, he could see myriads of tiny polywog shapes flitting back and forth. Do us a kindness not to make noise, said Ivan, removing his palm. My brother Vasily will now explain. He went away. Curiosity as much as shock kept Simon in his chair. Vasily, bobbing his head and smiling, sat down tailor fashion on the roof in front of him. First I must tell you, Mr. Gruai, that I am specialist in biological sciences. Here you see results of my most successful experiment. He withdrew a round clear glass bottle from his pocket and unscrewed the top. Ah, said Simon tentatively. Indeed yes. In my researches, Mr. Gruai, I discovered a chemical which will inhibit growth at any level of embryonic development, producing a viable organism at that point. The basic effect of this chemical is always toward survival at whatever level of development, one cell, a blastula, a worm, a fish, a four-legger. This research, which Lysenko scoffed at when I told him of it, I had no trouble in keeping secret, though at the time I was working as the unhappy collaborator of the godless Soviets. But perhaps I am being too technical? Not at all, Simon assured him. Good, Vasily said with simple satisfaction and gulped at his bottle. Meanwhile my brother Mikhail was a religious brother at a monastery near Mount Athos, my nihilist brother Ivan was in Central Europe, while my third brother Lev, who is of commercial talents, had preceded us to the New World, where we always felt it would someday be our destiny to join one another. With the aid of brother Ivan, I and my sister Grushenka escaped from Russia. 
we picked up Mikhail from his monastery and proceeded here, where Lev had become a capitalist business magnate. My brothers, Ivan especially, were interested in my research. He had a theory that we could eventually produce hosts of men in this way, whole armies and political parties, all nihilist and all of them Stolnikov Gureviches. I assured him that this was impossible, that I could not play Cadmus, for free swimming forms are one thing, we have the way to feed them in the aqueous medium. But to make fully developed mammals placental nourishment is necessary, that I cannot provide. Yet to please him I begin with, pardon me. The egg of my sister, that was as good a beginning as any and perhaps it intrigued my vanity. Ivan dreamed his dreams of a nihilist Stolnikov Gurevich humanity, it was harmless, as I told myself. Simon stared at him glassy eyed. Something rather peculiar was beginning to happen inside his head, about an inch under the point where the cool water filled plastic pipe pressed down on his scalp. Little ghostly images were darting, delightfully wispy little girl things, smiling down at him impudently, then flirting away with a quick motion of their mermaid tails. The sky had been growing steadily darker and now there came the growl of thunder. Against the purple-gray cloud Simon could barely make out the semi-transparent shapes of the polywogs in the pipe over his head, but the images inside his mind were growing clearer by the minute. Ah, we have a storm, Vasily observed as the thunder growled again. That reminds me of Mikhail, who is much influenced by our Finnish grandmother. He had the belief as a child that he could call up the winds by whistling for them, he even learned special wind musics from her. Later he became a Christian religious, there are great struggles in him. Mikhail objected to my researches when he heard I used the egg of my sister. He said we will produce millions of souls who are not baptized. I asked him how about the water they are in, he replied this is not the same thing, these little swimmers will wriggle in hell eternally. This worried him greatly. We tried to tell him I had not used the egg of my sister, only the egg of a fish. But he did not believe this, because my sister changed greatly at the time. She no longer spoke. She put on my mother's bathing costume, we are a family people, and retired to the bathtub all day long. I accepted this, at least in the water she is not violent. Mikhail said, see, her soul is now split into many unredeemed subsouls, one each for the little swimmers. There is a sympathy between them, a hypnotic vibration. So long as you keep them near her, in that tank on the roof, this will be. If they were gone from there, far from there, the subsouls would reunite and Grushenka's soul would be one again. He begged me to stop my research, to dump it in the sea, to scatter it away, but Lev and Ivan demand I keep on. Yet Mikhail warned me that works of evil end in the whirlwind. I am torn and undecided. He gulped at his vodka. Thunder growled louder. Simon was thinking, dreamily, that if the soul of Grushenka Stolnikov Gurevich were split into thousands of subsouls, vibrating hypnotically in the nearby water tank. With at least one of them escaping as far as his bathtub, then it was no wonder if Grushenka had a strange attraction for him. But that is not yet the worst, Vasily continued. The hypnotic vibrations of the free swimming ones in their multitude turn out to have a stimulating effect on any male who is near. Their subminds induce dreams of the piquant sort. Lev says that to make money for the work we must sell these dreams to rich men. I protest, but to no avail. Lev is maddened for money. Now besides selling the dreams I find he plans to sell the creatures themselves, sell them one by one, but keep enough to sell the dreams too. It is a madness. The darkness had become that of night. The thunder continued to growl and now it seemed to Simon that it had music in it. Vision swam through his mind to its rhythm, hordes of swimming pygmy souls, of unborn water babies, migrations of miniature mermaids. The pipe hanging between water tank and pent shack became in his imagination a giant umbilicus or a canal for a monstrous multiple birth. Sitting beneath it, helpless to move, he focused his attention with increasing pleasure on the active, supple, ever more human girl bodies that swam across his mind. Now more mermaid than tadpole, 
with bright smiling lips and eyes, long Lorelei hair trailing behind them, they darted and hovered caressingly. In their wide-cheeked oval faces, he discovered without shock, there was a transcendent resemblance to the features of Grushenka Stolnikov Gurevich, a younger, milk-skinned maiden of the steppes. With challenging eyes and fingers that brushed against him with delightful shocks. So it is for me the great problem, Vasily's distant voice continued. I see in my work only the pure research, the play of the mind. Lev sees money, Ivan sees dragon teeth, fodder for his political cannon, Mikhail sees unshriven souls, Grushenka sees, who knows? Madness. It is indeed one great problem. Thunder came again, crashingly this time. The door of the pent shack opened. Framed in it stood Ivan the bomber. Vasily, he roared. Do you know what that idiot is doing now? As the thunder and his voice trailed off together, Simon became aware at last of the identity of the other sound, which had been growing in volume all the time. Simultaneously Vasily struggled to his feet. The organ, he cried. Mikhail is playing the whirlwind music. We must stop him. Pausing only for a last pull at the bottle, he charged into the pent shack, following Ivan. Wind was shaking the heavy pipe over Simon's head, tossing him back and forth in the chair. Looking with an effort toward the west, Simon saw the reason, a spinning black pencil of wind that was riding its way toward them in wreckage across the intervening roofs. The chair fell under him. Stumbling across the roof, he tugged futilely at the door to the pent shack, then threw himself flat, clawing at the tar paper. There was a mounting roar. The top of the water tank went spinning off like a flying saucer. Momentarily, as if it were a giant syringe, the whirlwind dipped into the tank. Simon felt himself sliding across the roof, felt his legs lifting. He fetched up against the roof's low wall and at that moment the wind let go of him and his legs touched tar paper again. Gaining his feet numbly, Simon staggered into the leaning pent shack. The pale man was nowhere to be seen, the plush chair empty. The curtain at the other side of the room had fallen with its rods, revealing a bathtub more antique than Simon's. In the tub, under the window, sat Grushenka. The lightning flares showed her with her chin level with the water, her eyes placidly staring, her mouth opening and closing. Simon found himself putting his arms around the black-clad figure. With a straining effort he lifted her out of the tub, water sloshing all over his legs, and half carried, half slid with her down the stairs. He fetched up panting and disheveled at the top landing, his attention riveted by the lightning-illuminated scene in the two-story high living room below. At the far end of it a dark-robed figure crouched at the console of the mighty organ, like a giant bat at the base of the portico of a black and gold temple. In the center of the room Ivan was in the act of heaving above his head his globular leather case. Mikhail darted a look over his shoulder and sprang to one side. The projectile crashed against the organ. Mikhail picked himself up, tearing something from his neck. Ivan lunged forward with a roar. Mikhail crashed a fist against his jaw. The bomber went down and didn't come up. Mikhail unwrapped his crucifix from his fingers and resumed playing. With a wild cry Simon heaved himself to his feet, stumbled over Grushenka's sodden garments, and pitched headlong down the stairs. When he came to, the house was empty and the Stolnikov moving van was gone. At the front door he was met by a poker-faced young man who identified himself as a member of the FBI. Simon showed him the globular case Ivan had thrown at the organ. It proved to contain a bowling ball. The young gentleman listened to his story without changing expression, thanked him warmly, and shooed him out. The Stolnikov Gureviches disappeared for good, though not quite without a trace. Simon found this item in the next evening's paper, the first of many he accumulated yearningly in a scrapbook during the following months. Mermaid Rain A Hoax, Scientist Declares. Milford, Pennsylvania. The Mermaid Rain, reported here has been declared a fraud by an eminent European biologist. Vasily Stolnikov Gurevich, formerly professor of genetics at Peer University, Latvia, passing through here on a cross-country trip, 
declared the miniature mermaids were albino tadpoles. Probably scattered about as a hoax by schoolboys. The professor added, I would like to know where they got them, however. There is clear evidence of mutation, due perhaps to fallout. Dar. Stolnikov directed his party in a brief but intensive search for overlooked specimens. His charming silent sister, Grushenka Stolnikov, wearing a quaint Latvian swimming costume, explored the shallows of the Delaware. After collecting as many specimens as possible, the professor and his assistants continued their trip in their unusual camping car. Dar. Stolnikov intends to found a biological research center, in the calm and tolerant atmosphere of the West Coast, he declared.